The Hauler by Guy de Maupassant Translated by Charlotte Mandel May the 8th. What a wonderful day. I spent all morning stretched out on the grass in front of my house, beneath the huge plane tree that completely covers, shelters and shades the lawn. I love the country here, and I love living here because this is where I have my roots, those profound and delicate roots that attach a man to the land where his ancestors were born and died, and that attach him to what one should think and what one should eat, to customs as well as to foods, to local idioms and peasant intonations, to the smells of the earth, of the villages, of the air itself. I love my house. I grew up in it. From my windows I can see the Seine flowing along the whole length of my garden, behind the road, almost in my backyard, the great wide Seine, which goes from Rouen to Le Havre, covered with boats passing by. To the left, over there, Rouen, the vast blue-roofed city beneath the peaked crowd of Gothic bell towers. They are countless, slender or broad, dominated by the iron spire of the cathedral, and full of bells that ring in the blue air on fine mornings, carrying towards me their gentle, distant metal drone, their bronze song the breeze carries to me, now stronger, now weaker, depending on whether the wind is awakening or growing drowsy. How fine it was this morning. Around eleven o'clock, a long procession of ships pulled by a tugboat, fat as a fly, groaning from the effort and vomiting a thick plume of smoke, filed past my gate. After two English schooners, whose red flags rippled on the sky, came a superb Brazilian three-master, all white, admirably clean and gleaming. I saluted it. I don't know why. It made me so happy to see this ship. May the 11th. I've been a little feverish for a few days now. I feel unwell. Or rather, I feel sad. Where do these mysterious influences come from that change our happiness into despondency and our confidence into distress? You might say that the air, the invisible air, is full of unknowable powers from whose mysterious closeness we suffer. I wake up full of joy with songs welling up in my throat. Why? I go down to the water and suddenly, after a short walk, I come back disheartened, as if some misfortune were awaiting me at home. Why? Is it a shiver of cold that brushing against my skin has affected my nerves and darkened my soul? Or is it the shape of the clouds or the colour of the daylight, the colour of things, so changeable that in passing in front of my eyes has disturbed my thoughts? How can we know? Everything that surrounds us, everything we see without looking at it, everything we brush against without recognizing it, everything we touch without feeling it, everything we encounter without discerning it, everything has on us, on our organs and through them, on our ideas, on our heart itself, swift, surprising and inexplicable effects. How profound this mystery of the invisible is. We cannot fathom it with our wretched senses, with our eyes that don't know how to perceive either the too small or the too big, the too close or the too far, the inhabitants of a star or the inhabitants of a drop of water, with our ears that deceive us, for they transmit to us the vibrations of the air as ringing tones. They are fairies that perform the miracle of changing this movement into a sound, and by this metamorphosis give birth to music which makes the mute agitation of nature into a song. With our sense of smell weaker than a dog's, with our sense of taste, which can scarcely tell the age of a wine. If only we had other organs that could work other miracles for us, how many things we would then discover around us. May 16th. I'm sick, no doubt about it. And I was feeling so healthy last month. I have a fever, a terrible fever, or rather a feverish nervous exhaustion which makes my soul as sick as my body. I keep having this terrifying feeling of some danger threatening, this apprehension of a misfortune on the way, or of death approaching. This premonition that must be the onset of a sickness still unknown, germinating in the blood and the flesh. May the 18th. I've just gone to consult my doctor since I could no longer sleep. He found my pulse was rapid, my eyes dilated, my nerves vibrating, but without any alarming symptom. 
I must submit to taking showers and drinking potassium bromide. May 25th. No change. Really? I'm in a strange condition. As evening approaches, an incomprehensible anxiety invades me, as if night hid a terrible threat for me. I dine quickly, then I try to read, but I do not understand the words. I can scarcely make out the letters. Then I walk back and forth in my living room, under the oppression of a confused and irresistible fear, the fear of sleep and fear of my bed. Around 10 o'clock, I climb up to my bedroom. As soon as I'm inside, I turn the key twice and bolt the locks. I am afraid. Of what? I never feared anything till now. I open my wardrobes, look under the bed, listen, listen. For what? Is it strange that a simple illness, a circulatory disorder perhaps, an irritated nerve ending, a little congestion, a tiny perturbation in the all too imperfect and delicate functioning of our living mechanism can turn the happiest of men into a melancholic and the bravest into a coward. Then I go to bed and I wait for sleep like someone waiting for the executioner. I wait for it with terror at its arrival and my heart beats, my legs tremble and my whole body trembles in the warmth of the bedclothes till the moment I suddenly fall into repose the way one drowns oneself, dropping into an abyss of stagnant water. I don't feel it coming as I used to, this treacherous sleep hidden beside me that lies in wait for me, that is about to seize me by the head, close my eyes, annihilate me. I sleep for a long time, two or three hours, then a dream, no, a nightmare grips me. I'm fully aware that I'm lying down and sleeping, I feel it and I know it, and I also feel that someone is approaching me, looking at me, feeling me. He's climbing into my bed, kneeling on my chest, taking my neck in his hands and squeezing, squeezing with all his strength to strangle me. And I struggle with myself, bound by the atrocious powerlessness that paralyzes us in dreams. I want to cry out. I cannot. I want to move. I cannot, I try, with terrible efforts, gasping for breath, to turn over, to throw off this being that is crushing me and suffocating me. I can't. And all of a sudden I wake up panic-stricken, covered with sweat. I light a candle. I am alone. After this crisis, which is renewed every night, I finally sleep calmly until dawn. June 2nd. My condition has become even worse. What do I have? The bromide does nothing for it. The showers do nothing. This afternoon, in order to tire out my body, which was weary to begin with, I went to the forest of Rumer for a walk. First, I thought that the fresh air, gentle and sweet, full of the fragrance of grass and leaves, would imbue my veins with a new blood, my heart with a new energy. I took a broad avenue we used for hunting, then turned towards La Bouille by a narrow path between two armies of unusually tall trees that set a thick, green, almost black roof between the sky and me. Suddenly, I was seized by a shiver, but not of cold, a strange shiver of anxiety. I quickened my step, uneasy at being alone in this wood, frightened for no reason, stupid, because of the profound solitude. All of a sudden, it seemed to me I was being followed, that someone was walking just behind me, very close, very close, close enough to touch me. I turned around suddenly. I was alone. Behind me, I saw only the straight, wide lane, empty, high, terribly empty. And in the other direction, it also stretched away out of sight, exactly the same. Terrifying. I closed my eyes. Why? And I began to spin on one heel very quickly like a top. I almost fell. I opened my eyes again. The trees were dancing. The earth was floating. I had to sit down and then, I no longer knew how I'd gotten there. Strange idea, strange, strange idea. I didn't know anymore. I left by the path that was at my right and I returned to the avenue that had brought me to the middle of the forest. June the 3rd. The night was horrible. I'm going to go away for a few weeks. A little journey will surely set me to rights. July the 2nd. I have returned. I am cured. And I've had a delightful excursion too. I visited Mont Saint-Michel, which I've never seen before. 
What a vision when you arrive as I did in Avranche towards the end of the day. The city is on a hill, and I was led into the public garden on the edge of the city. I let out a cry of astonishment. A vast bay stretched out in front of me as far as the eye could see, between two coasts far apart from each other, disappearing in the distance into the mist. And in the middle of this immense yellow bay, beneath a luminous golden sky, there rose up, dark and sharp-pointed, a strange mountain in the middle of the sands. The sun had just disappeared, and on the still blazing horizon the outline of this fantastic rock stood out, bearing on its summit a fantastic monument. At dawn I went towards it. The sea was low as it had been the night before, and I watched the surprising abbey rise before me as I approached it. After several hours of walking, I reached the massive hill of stones that supports this little city dominated by the great church. After climbing the narrow steep street, I entered the most wonderful Gothic dwelling built for God on earth. Vast as a city, full of low chambers crushed beneath vaults and high galleries supported by frail columns. I entered this giant granite jewel, light as lace, covered with towers and slim pinnacles in which winding staircases rise up and which hurl into the blue sky of the day and the dark sky of night, their strange heads bristling with chimeras, devils, fantastic animals, monstrous flowers, and which are linked to each other by slender, finely carved arches. When I was at the summit, I said to the monk who was with me, Father, how happy you must be to be here. He answered, and it is very windy, monsieur, and we set to talking as we watched the sea rise as it came running onto the sand and covering it with a breastplate of steel. And the monk told me stories, all the old stories of this place, legends, what was more legends. One of them particularly struck me. The local people, the ones who live on the hill, claim they hear voices at night in the sands. They say they hear two goats bleating, one with a strong voice, the other with a feeble voice. Scoffers assert they're the cries of seabirds, which sometimes resemble bleating, and sometimes human moans. But late-night fishermen swear they've seen, roaming about on the dunes, between the two tides, around a little town cast so far from the world, an old shepherd, whose head, covered with his cloak, could never be seen, and who led, walking in front of them, a billy goat with a man's face, and a nanny goat with a woman's face, both with long white hair, talking ceaselessly, arguing with each other in an unknown language, then suddenly stopping to bleat with all their might. I said to the monk, Do you believe this? He murmured, I don't know. I said, if other beings beside us exist on earth, why didn't we meet them a long time ago? Why haven't you yourself seen them? Why haven't I seen them myself? He replied, do we see the hundred thousandth part of what exists? Look, here is the wind, which is the strongest force in nature, which knocks men down, destroys buildings, uproots trees, whips up the sea into mountains of water, destroys cliffs and throws great ships onto the shoals. Here is the wind that kills, whistles, groans, howls. Have you ever seen it? And can you see it? Yet, it exists. I fell silent before this simple reasoning. This man was a wise man, or perhaps an idiot. I wasn't able rightly to tell, but I fell silent. What he said then, I had often thought. July the 3rd, I slept badly. There must indeed be a feverish influence here, for my coachman suffers from the same illness as I do. When I returned yesterday, I noticed his unusual pallor. I asked him, What's wrong with you, Jean? I can no longer rest, monsieur. My nights are eating up my days since monsieur left. That's what's been sticking to me like a curse. The other servants are doing well, though. But I'm very afraid of a relapse. July the 4th. Without doubt, I've caught it again. My old nightmares are coming back. Last night I felt someone squatting over me who, with his mouth over mine, was drinking in my life through his lips. Yes, he was sucking it in from my throat, just like a leech. Then he rose, sated, and I woke up so wounded, broken and annihilated, that I could no longer move. If that goes on for a few more days, I will definitely go away again. July the 5th. Have I lost my reason? What I saw last night is so strange that my head spins when I think of it. As I do now, each evening I had locked my door. Then, since I was thirsty, 
I drank half a glass of water, and I noted by chance that my carafe was full to its crystal stopper. Then I went to bed, and I fell into one of my dreadful sleeps, from which I was snatched after about two hours by an even more frightful shock. Imagine a man asleep who is being killed, and who wakes up with a knife in his lung, with a death rattle, covered in blood, who can no longer breathe, who will die, and doesn't understand why. That's what it was like. Having finally come to my senses, I was thirsty again. I lit a candle and went towards the table where my carafe was. I raised it and tipped it over my glass. Nothing poured out. It was empty. It was completely empty. First, I was at a complete loss. Then, all of a sudden, I experienced such a terrible emotion that I had to sit down or rather fall into a chair. Then I bounded up again to look around me. Then I sat down again, overcome with astonishment and fear before the transparent crystal. I contemplated it fixedly, trying to comprehend. My hands were trembling. Someone must have drunk this water. Who? Me? It must be me. It could only be me. So, I was a sleepwalker then, and was living without knowing it this double, mysterious life, which makes us suspect that there are two beings inside us, or that a foreign being, unknowable and invisible, animates our captive body when our soul is dulled and our body obeys this other being as it does ourselves, or obeys it more than ourselves. Who can understand my abominable anguish? Who can understand the emotion of a man of healthy mind, wide awake, full of reason, who looks through the glass of a carafe, terrified that a little water has disappeared while he slept? And I stayed there till daylight without daring to return to my bed. July the 6th. I'm going mad. Again, someone drank the entire contents of my carafe last night, or rather I drank it. But is it me? Is it me? Who could it be? Who? Oh my God, I'm going mad. Who can save me? July the 10th. I have just carried out some surprising experiments. Without a doubt, I am mad and, and yet. On July the 6th, before I went to bed, I placed on my table some wine, some milk, some water, some bread, and some strawberries. Someone drank, I, I drank, all the water and a little milk. They didn't touch the wine or the bread or the strawberries. On July the 7th, I repeated the same test, which gave the same result. On July the 8th, I didn't include the water and the milk. They touched nothing. Finally, on July the 9th, I put on my table just the water and the milk, taking care to wrap the carafes in pieces of white muslin and to tie down the stoppers. Then I rubbed my lips, beard and hands with graphite, and I went to bed. The invincible sleep seized me, followed soon by the atrocious awakening. I had not moved at all. My covers themselves did not have any stains. I rushed over to my table. The pieces of cloth enclosing the bottles had remained spotless. I undid the strings, quivering with fear. Someone had drunk all the water and all the milk. Oh my God, I'm going to leave soon for Paris. July the 12th, Paris. I must have lost my head those last few days. I must have been the plaything of my exhausted imagination, unless I am actually a sleepwalker, or have undergone one of those influences which have been observed, but are yet to be explained, that are called a suggestive. In any case, my panic was bordering on madness, but 24 hours in Paris have sufficed to restore my composure. Yesterday, after I did some shopping and paid some visits which made me enter into the mood of the fresh, invigorating air, I ended my evening at the Théâtre Français. They were performing a play by Alexandre Dumas the Younger, and that alert, powerful wit completed my cure. Solitude is indeed dangerous for working intelligence. We need to have around us people who think and speak. When we're alone for a long time, we people the void with phantoms. I came back to the hotel very happy by way of the boulevards, rubbing shoulders with the crowd I thought not without irony and my recent terrors and surmises, when I believed, yes, I believed, an invisible being was living beneath my roof. How weak our head is, how easily alarmed it is, how quickly it wanders as soon as a little incomprehensible fact strikes us. Instead of concluding with these simple words, I do not understand because the cause escapes me, we immediately imagine terrifying mysteries and supernatural powers. July the 14th, Bastille Day. I walked about in the streets. I was delighted by the firecrackers and flags as a child. It's idiotic, though, to be happy on schedule on a day decreed by the government. 
The people are an imbecilic herd, sometimes stupidly patient and sometimes ferociously rebellious. They are told, have fun. They have fun. They are told, go fight with your neighbor. They go fight. They are told, vote for the emperor. They vote for the emperor. Then they're told, vote for the republic. And they vote for the republic. Those who run it are also fools. But instead of obeying people, they obey principles which can only be inane, impotent and false because of the very fact that they are principles. That is, ideas imagined to be definite and immutable in this world where we are sure of nothing, since light is an illusion, since sound is an illusion. July the 16th. I saw some things yesterday that troubled me very much. I was dining at my cousin's, Madame Sable, whose husband is in command of the 76 chasseurs in Limoges. I was there as a guest along with two young women, one of whom had married a doctor, Dr. Parent, who spends much of his time studying nervous illnesses and the extraordinary symptoms that experiments with hypnotism and suggestion are producing these days. He told us a great length about the incredible results obtained by English scholars and by doctors in the Nancy School. The facts he mentioned seemed to me so bizarre that I told him I didn't believe him at all. We are, he asserted, on the verge of discovering one of the most important secrets of nature. I mean, one of its most important secrets on this earth, for nature must have far more important ones up there in the stars. Ever since man has thought, ever since he has known how to speak and write his thoughts, he has felt touched by a mystery impenetrable to his coarse and imperfect senses and he has tried by the effort of his intelligence to compensate for the powerlessness of his organs. When this intelligence was still in its rudimentary state, this haunting by invisible phenomena took frightening forms of the most commonplace kind. Hence, popular beliefs in the supernatural were born. Legends of wandering spirits, fairies, gnomes, ghosts. I will even say the legend of God. For our concepts of the artificer creator, from whatever religion they come to us, are indeed the most mediocre inventions, the stupidest, the most unacceptable ones ever to have come from the frightened brains of creatures. Nothing is truer than this saying of Voltaire's, God made man in his image, but man has returned favor. But for a little more than a century there's been a presentiment of something new. Mesmer and a few others have put us on an unexpected track and we have truly arrived, especially in the last four or five years, at surprising results. My cousin, also very skeptical, smiled. Dr. Parent said to her, And you want me to try to put you to sleep, madame? Yes, I'd like that very much. She sat down in an armchair and he began to look at her fixedly, hypnotizing her. I felt all of a sudden a little troubled. My heart was beating and my throat tightened. I saw Madame Sable's eyes becoming heavier, her mouth clenching, her chest heaving. After ten minutes, she was asleep. Position yourself behind her, the doctor said to me. So I sat down behind her. He placed in her hands a visiting card and said to her, This is a mirror. What do you see in it? She replied, I see my cousin. What is he doing? And he's twisting his moustache. And now? He's taking a photograph out of his pocket. What does this photograph show? Himself. It was true, and this photograph had just been delivered to me that very evening at the hotel. How is he shown in this portrait? He's standing with his hat in his hand. So she could see in this card, in this white pasteboard, as she would have seen in a mirror. The other young women, terrified, said, that's enough, enough, enough. But the doctor commanded, you will get up tomorrow at eight o'clock, then you will go find your cousin at his hotel, and you will beg him to lend you five thousand francs, which your husband asks you for, and which he needs to get from you for his next trip. Then he woke her up. As I was returning to the hotel, I thought about this curious seance, and I began to be assailed by doubts, not about the absolute, unquestionable good faith of my cousin, whom I have known like my sister since childhood, but about the possible trickery of the doctor. Might he not have been hiding a mirror in his hand which he was showing to the young woman asleep at the same time as his visiting card? Professional magicians are known to do even more unusual things. I returned then and went to bed. This morning, around 8.30, I was awakened by my valet who said to me, Madame Sable is here, asking to speak to Monsieur right away. I dressed myself in haste and invited her in. 
She sat down, very agitated, her eyes lowered, and without raising her veil, she said to me, My dear cousin, I have a great favour to ask you. What is it, cousin? It embarrasses me very much to tell you, but I must. I am in need, in dire need, of uh, five thousand francs. Really? You? Yes, me, or, or, or rather my husband, who has asked me to get them. I was so stupefied that I stammered out my replies. I wondered if she and Dr. Parent weren't making fun of me, if this weren't simply a farce prepared in advance and very well played. But as I looked at her attentively, all my doubts disappeared. She was trembling with anxiety, so painful was this task to her, and I could tell that her throat was choking with sobs. I knew she was very wealthy, and I continued, But doesn't your husband have five thousand francs at his disposal? Think about it. Are you really sure he told you to ask me for them? She hesitated for a few seconds, as if she were making a great effort to search through her memory, then replied, Yes, yes, I, I'm, I'm sure. He wrote to you? She hesitated again, thinking. I could see how hard it was for her to think. She didn't know. She just knew that she had to borrow 5,000 francs from me for her husband. So she dared to lie. Yes, he wrote to me. When? You never mentioned it to me yesterday. I only received his letter this morning. Can you show it to me? No, no, no. It contained private matters. Too personal. I... I burned it. So, your husband has debts then? She hesitated again, then murmured. I, I don't know. I stated flatly. The fact is, I can't give you 5,000 francs right now, my dear cousin. She let out a sort of cry of anguish. Oh, I implore you, I implore you, find them! She became distraught, joining her hands together as if she were praying to me. I heard her voice change tone. She cried and stammered tormented, dominated by the irresistible order she had received. Oh, I beg you, if you only knew how much I'm suffering, I must have the money today. I took pity on her. You'll have it this afternoon, I swear to you. She cried out, oh, thank you, thank you, how good you are. I continued, do you remember what happened yesterday at your house? Yes. Do you remember that Dr. Parham put you to sleep? Yes. Well... He ordered you to come to me this morning to borrow 5,000 francs from me. And you're obeying his suggestion right now. She thought for a few seconds, then she replied. But it's my husband who wants them. I tried to convince her for an hour, but didn't succeed. When she had left, I ran over to the doctor's. He was about to go out, and he listened to me smiling. Then he said, Do you believe now? Yes, I'm compelled to. Let's go to your cousin's. She was already napping on a chaise longue, overwhelmed with fatigue. The doctor took her pulse, looked at her for some time, then raised his hand over her eyes. Gradually they closed under the irresistible force of this magnetic power. When she had fallen asleep, your husband no longer needs the 5,000 francs. You're going to forget that you begged your cousin to lend them to you. If he speaks to you about it, you will not understand. Then he woke her up. I took the wallet out of my pocket. Here, dear cousin, is what you asked me for this morning. She was so surprised that I didn't dare insist. I did try to revive her memory, but she strongly denied anything. Thought I was making fun of her, and in the end, almost became angry. There you have it. I have just returned. I couldn't eat lunch, so upsetting this experience was for me. Many people to whom I reported this adventure made fun of me. I no longer know what to think. The wise man says... Perhaps. July 21st. I went out to dine in Bougival. Then I spent the evening at a dance at the rowing club. Decidedly, everything depends on places and environments. To believe in the supernatural on the Ile de la Grenouillère would be the height of folly, but on top of Mont Saint Michel or in India, we are appallingly subject to the influence of our surroundings. I will return to my house next week. July the 30th. I've been back home since yesterday. Everything is fine. August the 2nd. Nothing new. The weather is superb. I spend my days watching the Seine flow by. August the 4th. Quarrels among the servants. They claim someone is breaking the glasses at night in the china closets. The valet blames the cook who blames the laundress who blames the other two. Who is guilty? Who can say in the end? August the 6th. This time, I'm not mad. I saw, I saw, I saw... 
I can no longer doubt. I saw. I am still cold down to my fingertips. I am still afraid to the marrow of my bones. I saw. I was taking a walk at two o'clock in the full sunlight in my rose garden, in the lane of autumn roses which are beginning to flower. As I was pausing to look at a géant des bâtés, which bore three magnificent flowers, I saw very distinctly, quite close to me, the stem of one of these roses bend itself, as if an invisible hand were twisting it, then break off, as if this hand had plucked it. Then the flower rose up, following the curve an arm would have described when carrying it toward a mouth, and it remained suspended in the transparent air, all alone, immobile, a terrifying red shape three feet from my eyes. Agitated, I threw myself on it to seize it. I found nothing. It had disappeared. Then I was overcome with a furious rage at myself, for a reasonable, serious man may not permit himself such hallucinations. But was this truly a hallucination? I turned back to look for the stem, and I found it immediately on the shrub, freshly broken, between the two other roses that remained on the branch. Then I returned to my house, my soul in turmoil, for I am certain now. Certain as I am of the alternation of day and night that there exists close to me, an invisible being who feeds on milk and water, who can touch things, hold them, and make them change places. He is gifted, consequently, with a material nature, though it is imperceptible to our senses, and he is living as I am, beneath my roof. August the 7th. I slept calmly. He drank the water from my carafe, but did not trouble my sleep at all. I wonder if I'm crazy. As I was walking just now in the full sunshine along the river, doubts about my reason came to me, not vague doubts as I've had till now, but precise, absolute doubts. I've seen madmen, I've known some, who remained intelligent, lucid, even perceptive about all matters of life except on one point. They speak of everything with clarity, agility and profundity, and suddenly, as their thoughts turn to the stumbling block of their madness, the thought processes shatter, scatter and sink into that terrifying and furious ocean full of leaping waves, fogs and squalls which we call dementia. Surely I would think myself crazy, absolutely crazy, if I weren't aware of my condition and if I weren't completely familiar with it, if I didn't probe it by means of the most complete and lucid analysis. So I am in fact just a rational person suffering from hallucinations. An unknown distress has been produced in my brain one of those distresses that the physiologists of today try to observe and explain. This distress has established a profound divide in my mind, in the order and logic of my ideas. Similar phenomena occur in dreams, which parade us through the most implausible phantasmagoria without our being surprised, since the verifying apparatus, the sense of control, is asleep, while the imaginative faculty is awake and at work. Isn't it possible that one of those imperceptible keys on the cerebral keyboard has become paralyzed in me. After an accident, people can lose their memory of proper names or verbs or numbers or just dates. The localizations of all those fragments of thought have now been proven. So what is so surprising about the fact that my faculty of controlling the unreality of certain hallucinations has been numbed in me for the moment? I was thinking about all of that as I followed the water's edge. The sun was coating the river with brightness, making the land delightful, filling my gaze with love for life. For the swallows, whose agility is a joy to my eyes, for the grasses on the shore, whose rustling is a delight to my ears. Little by little, however, an inexplicable uneasiness penetrated me. A force, it seemed to me, an occult force, was making me go numb, stopping me, preventing me from going further, was calling me back. I felt that painful need to return that oppresses you when you have left an ailing loved one at home and you suddenly feel a premonition that the sickness has grown worse. So I returned despite myself certain that I was going to find in my house some piece of bad news, a letter or a telegram. There was nothing there, yet I was more surprised and anxious than if it had been another fantastic vision. August the 8th, I had a frightful evening yesterday. It no longer manifests itself, but I feel it, close to me, spying on me, watching me, penetrating me, dominating me, being all the more dreadful by hiding itself than if it gave some sign of its invisible and constant presence by means of supernatural phenomena. Yet, I slept. August the 9th, nothing. But I'm afraid. August the 10th, nothing. What will happen tomorrow? 
August the 11th. Still nothing. I can no longer remain at home with this fear and this thought always in my soul. I'm going to go away. August the 12th, 10 o'clock in the evening. All day I wanted to leave. I couldn't. I wanted to perform this act of freedom that's so easy, so simple, going out, climbing to my carriage to go to Rouen, but I could not. Why? August 13th. When one is stricken with certain illnesses, all the resources of the physical being seem to be destroyed, all energies annihilated, all muscles limp. The bones seem to have become soft as flesh, and the flesh liquid as water. I am experiencing exactly that in my moral fibre, in a strange and distressing way. I have lost all strength, all courage, all self-control, even all power to put my will in motion. I can no longer want anything, but someone wants for me, and I obey. August the 14th, I'm lost. Someone possesses my soul and governs it. Someone controls all my actions, all my movements, all my thoughts. I'm nothing inside, nothing but a slave, spectator, terrified of all the things I do. I want to go out, I cannot, it doesn't want to. So I remain distraught, trembling, in the armchair where it's keeping me seated. I just want to get up to stand up just to believe I'm still master of myself. I can't. I'm riveted to my chair, my chair sticks to the floor so that no strength can raise us. Then, all of a sudden, I must, I must go to the back of my garden, pick strawberries and eat them. And I go, I pick strawberries and eat them. Oh my God, my God, is there a God? If there is, set me free, save me, help me, forgive me, have pity on me, mercy, save me, save me from this suffering, this torture, this horror. August the 15th. Surely this is how my poor cousin was possessed and dominated when she came to borrow 5,000 francs from me. She was undergoing a strange will that had entered her like another soul, like a parasitic and dominating soul. Is the world about to end? But the one that is governing me, what is it? This invisible thing, this unknowable thing, this prowler from a supernatural race. So invisible beings do exist. But why haven't they ever revealed themselves in a clear way since the beginning of the world as they're doing for me? I've never read anything that resembles what has been going on in my house. If only I could leave it, if only I could go out, flee and not come back, I would be saved. But I cannot. August the 16th. I was able to escape today for two hours, like a prisoner who finds a door of his dungeon left open by chance. I felt I was free, all of a sudden, and that he was far away. I ordered the carriage to be harnessed quickly and I reached Rouen. What joy it was to be able to say to someone else who obeys, go to Rouen. I had him stop in front of the library, and I asked them to lend me the great treatise by Dr. Hermann Herestaus on the unknown inhabitants of the ancient and modern world. Then... As I was climbing back into my carriage, I wanted to say, to the train station. But I shouted, not said, but shouted, in such a loud voice that a passerby turned round. Home! And I fell, stricken with anguish, onto the cushion of my car. He had found me, and recaptured me. August the 17th, what a night, what a night. And yet it feels as if I should rejoice, until one in the morning I read... Hermann Herestaus, the doctor of philosophy and theogony, has written about the history and manifestations of all the invisible beings that prowl around mankind, or that we dream of. He describes their origins, their dwelling places, their powers. But not one of them resembles the one that's haunting me. We might reason that ever since man began to think, he has had a premonition and a dread of some new being, stronger than he, his successor in this world. And that, feeling him nearby, yet being unable to foresee the nature of this master, he has created, in his terror, the entire fantastic population of occult beings, vague phantoms born from fear. After reading till one in the morning, I went to sit down near my open window in order to cool my forehead and my thoughts in the calm night breeze. It was fine and warm out. How I would have loved this night once upon a time. No moon. The stars in the depths of the black sky twinkled quaveringly. Who lives in those worlds? What forms, what living beings, what animals, what plants are there? What do the sentient beings in those distant universes know more than we do? What more are they capable of doing than we? What do they see that we have not the least knowledge of? 
Some day or other won't one of them crossing space appear on our earth to conquer it, just as long ago the Normans crossed the sea to subjugate people who were weaker. We are so infirm, so helpless, so ignorant, so small, we others on this spinning grain of mud mixed with a drop of water. I dozed off musing like that in the cool evening wind. After sleeping for about forty minutes, though, I reopened my eyes without making a movement, awakened by some confused, strange emotion. At first I saw nothing, then, all of a sudden, it seemed to me that the page of the book that I had left open on my table had just turned, all by itself. No breath of air had entered through my window. I was surprised, and I waited. After about four minutes I saw, yes, I saw with my own eyes, another page rise up and fall back on the one before, as if a finger had turned it. My armchair was empty, seemed empty, but I understood that he was there, seated in my place, and that he was reading. With a furious leap, the leap of a rebellious animal who was about to disembowel his tamer, I crossed my room to seize and strangle him, kill him, but before I could reach it, my chair was knocked over, as if someone were fleeing before me. My table rocked back and forth, my lamp fell and went out, and my window slammed, as if a surprised thief had rushed out into the night, grabbing the shutters. So he had run away, he had been afraid, he afraid of me. Then, then tomorrow, or the day after, or some day, I'll be able to hold him in my fists and crush him to the ground. Don't dogs sometimes bite and choke their masters? August the 18th, I've been thinking all day. Oh yes, I will obey him, follow his impulses, accomplish all his wishes, make myself humble, submissive, cowardly. He is a stronger one, but a time will come. August the 19th. I know, I know, I know everything. I have just read this in the Revue du Monde Scientifique. A rather curious piece of news has reached us from Rio de Janeiro. A madness, an epidemic of madness, like the contagious dementias that attacked the population of Europe in the Middle Ages, is raging now in the province of Sao Paulo. The inhabitants distraught are leaving their houses, deserting their villages, abandoning their crops, claiming they are pursued, possessed, ruled like human livestock by invisible but tangible beings, sorts of vampires, which feed on their life while they sleep and which drink water and milk without seeming to touch any other food. Professor Don Pedro Enriquez, accompanied by several learned doctors, has left for the province of São Paulo in order to study on-site the origins and manifestations of this surprising madness, and to suggest to the emperor the measures he thinks best suited to restore these delirious populations to reason. And now I remember it. I remember the fine Brazilian three-master that passed by my windows as it went up the Seine, last May the 8th, and I thought it was so pretty, so white, so cheerful. The being was on it, coming from down there where his race was born, and he saw me. He saw my white house too, and he jumped from the ship onto the shore. Oh my God! Now I know, I have guessed! The reign of mankind is over. He has come. The one the primal terrors of primitive tribes dreaded, the one anxious priests exorcised, the one magicians summoned on dark nights without ever seeing him appear, the one to whom the premonitions of adepts wandering through the world attributed all the monstrous or gracious forms of gnomes, spirits, genies, fairies, elves. After the coarse imaginings of primitive horror, more perspicacious men had a clear representment of him, Mesmer guessed his existence, and for ten years now, doctors have discovered in an accurate way the nature of his power before he himself ever exercised it. They have played with this weapon of the new lord, the domination of a mysterious will over a human soul which turns into a slave. They called it magnetism, hypnotism, suggestion. What do I know? I have seen them amuse themselves like foolish children with this terrible power. We are cursed. Mankind is cursed. He has come. The, the, what's his name? The, he seems to be shouting out his name to me, and I cannot hear it. The, yeah, yes, he's shouting it. I'm trying to hear. I can't. Again, the hauler. I heard the hauler. It is he, the hauler. He has come. Now, 
The vulture has eaten the dove, the wolf has eaten the lamb, the lion has devoured the sharp-horned buffalo. The man has killed the lion with the arrow, with the sword, with powder. But the hauler will make man into what we made, the horse and the steer, his thing, his servant, and his food. By the simple power of his will, our woe is upon us. But the animal sometimes rebels and kills the ones who tamed him. I too want to do this, I could, but I must recognize him, touch him, see him. Scholars say that the eyes of an animal different from our own cannot distinguish objects as our eyes do. And my eyes cannot distinguish this newcomer who oppresses me. Why? Now I remember the words of the monk of Mont Saint-Michel. Do we see the hundred thousandth part of what exists? Look, here is the wind, which is the strongest force in nature, which knocks men down, destroys buildings, uproots trees, whips the sea into mountains of water, destroys cliffs and throws great ships onto the shoals. Here is the wind that kills, whistles, groans, howls. Have you ever seen it? And can you see it? Yet it exists. And I thought further. My eye is so weak, so imperfect, that I cannot even make out solid objects if they are transparent as glass. If a two-way mirror bars my way, it knocks me down, just as a bird who has flown into a room breaks his neck on the window panes. A thousand other things deceive our sight and lead it astray. What is so surprising about our not knowing how to perceive a new body, one that light can pass through? A new being, why not? Surely it had to come. Why should we be the last people? If we can't distinguish him as we can all the other creatures before us, it's because his nature is more perfect, his body finer and more absolute than ours, which is so weak, so clumsily conceived, encumbered with organs that are always weary, always strained, like machinery that's too complex. Our body, which lives like a plant, like an animal, feeding with difficulty on air, grass and meat. An animal machine, prey to sicknesses, deformations, putrefactions, short-winded, unstable, simple and strangely, naively, poorly made. A coarse and delicate work, a rough outline of a being that could become intelligent and superb. There are just a few of us in this world, so few species between oysters and men, why not one more entity now that the era is over, when all the various species appeared in orderly succession? Why not one more, and why not other trees with immense dazzling flowers perfuming entire regions? And why not other elements besides fire, air, earth and water? There are four of them, just four, those foster parents of beings. What a pity, why aren't there forty elements instead, or four hundred, or four thousand? How paltry everything is, how miserly, how wretched. Stingily given, aridly invented, heavily made. Look at the elephant, the hippopotamus, such grace. The camel, such elegance. But you'll say, what about the butterfly? A flower that flies. I dream of one that would be as large as a hundred universes. With wings whose shape, beauty, colour and movement I cannot even describe. But I can see it. It goes from star to star, refreshing them and soothing them with the harmonious and light breath of its journey. And the peoples up there, ecstatic and ravished, watch it go by. What is wrong with me? It is he, the hauler, who is haunting me, making me think these mad thoughts. He's inside me. He is becoming my soul. I will kill him. August the 19th, I will kill him. I've seen him. I had sat down at my table last night and I pretended to write with great concentration. I was well aware that he would come prowl around me quite close, so close that I might perhaps be able to touch him, to seize him, and then, and then I would have the strength of the desperate. I would have my hands, my knees, my chest, my forehead, and my teeth to strangle him, crush him, bite him, tear him apart. And I watched for him with all my overexcited organs. I had lit both my lamps along with the eight candles on my mantelpiece, as if, in this brightness, I might expose him. Opposite me, my bed, an old oaken four-poster. To my right, my fireplace. To my left, my door, which I had carefully shut, after having left it open for a long time, in order to lure him in. Behind me, a very high wardrobe with a mirror, which I used every day to shave and dress, and in which I had the habit of looking at myself from head to foot every time I passed in front of it. I was just pretending to write in order to trick him, for he too was spying on me, 
Suddenly, I felt I was sure that he was reading over my shoulder, that he was there grazing my ear. I stood up with my hands outstretched, turning round so quickly that I almost fell down, and everything there was as clear as in full daylight, but I could not see myself in my mirror. It was empty, clear, profound, full of light. My image was not inside it, yet I myself was facing it. I could see the large clear glass from top to bottom. I looked at it with terrified eyes, but dared not move forward. I did not dare to make any movement, fully aware that he was there but that he would escape me again, he whose imperceptible body had devoured my reflection. I was terrified, then suddenly I began to see myself in a mist, in the depths of the mirror, in a mist as if through a sheet of water. It seemed to me that this water shimmered from left to right, slowly making my image more precise from second to second. It was like the end of an eclipse. Whatever was obscuring me seemed not to possess any clearly defined outlines, but just a sort of opaque transparency, little by little, becoming clearer. Finally, I could distinguish myself completely, just as I do every day when I look at myself. I had seen him. The terror of it has remained with me and makes me tremble still. August the 20th. How can I kill him if I can't touch him? Poison? but he would see me mixing it in the water. And besides, will our poisons even have any effect on an imperceptible body? No, no, they cannot. What then? August the 21st. I have had a locksmith come from Rouen and ordered iron shutters in my bedroom, the kind certain mansions have in Paris on the ground floor because of fear of thieves. He will also make me a door of the same material. I let him think me a coward, but I don't care. September the 10th, Rouen, Hotel Continental. It is done, it is done, but is he dead? My soul is in turmoil over what I have seen. Yesterday, after the locksmith had installed my iron shutters and door, I left everything open until midnight, although it was beginning to turn cold. All of a sudden I felt that he was there, and a joy, a mad joy, seized me. I rose up slowly and paced back and forth for a long time, so that he wouldn't guess anything was amiss. Then I took off my shoes and nonchalantly put on my slippers. Then I closed the iron shutters and quietly walking to the door, closed it too with a double turn of the lock. Then I came back to the window, locked it with the padlock and put the key in my pocket. All of a sudden I knew that he was getting agitated near me, that it was his turn to be afraid that he was commanding me to open the window. I almost gave in. I did not give in. Instead, leaning back against the door, I half opened it, just enough to let me slip through backwards. Since I'm very tall, my head touched the lintel. I was certain he had been unable to escape and I shut him in, all alone, all alone. At last I had him. Then I ran downstairs, I picked up both the lamps in my drawing room, which was underneath my bedroom, and poured out all the oil onto the rug, the furniture everywhere. Then I set fire to it and I ran out, after having carefully closed the large front door with a double turn of the lock. I ran to the back of my garden to hide in a clump of bay trees. How long it took, how long it took. Everything was dark, silent, motionless, not a breath of air, not a star, just mountains of clouds that couldn't be seen, but that weighed so heavy, so heavy on my soul. I watched my house and I waited. How long it took. I was beginning to think the fire had put itself out of it, he had put it out. He, when one of the windows on the ground floor caved in under the pressure from the fire, and a flame, a huge red and yellow flame, tall, soft, caressing, soared up along the white wall and kissed it all the way up to the roof. A glow ran through the trees, the branches, the leaves, and a shiver, a shiver of fear too. The birds woke up, a dog began to bark. It looked as if dawn were breaking. Immediately two other windows shattered, and I saw that the entire ground floor of my house was nothing more than a terrifying inferno. But a scream, a horrible high-pitched penetrating scream, a woman's scream rent the night, and two garret windows opened. I had forgotten my servants. I saw their terrified faces and their waving arms. Then, beside myself with horror, I began to run towards the village shouting, Help! Help! Fire! Fire! I met some people who were already on the way, and I went back with them to see. The house now was nothing more than a terrible and magnificent pyre 
a monstrous pyre illuminating all the land around, a pyre where people were burning and where he was burning too. He, he, my prisoner, the new being, the new master, the hauler. Suddenly, the entire roof caved in between the walls and a volcano of flame shot up to the sky. Through all the windows opening onto the furnace, I could see the pit of fire, and I thought about him in there, in his oven, dead. Dead! Maybe not. What about his body? It wasn't his body which daylight could go right through, indestructible by all the methods that kill our own bodies. What if he wasn't dead? Maybe only time holds sway over that invisible and dreadful being. Why should this body, that is transparent, this unknowable body, this spirit body, have to fear illnesses, wounds, infirmities, and premature destruction? Premature destruction. All the horrors of humanity stem from that alone. After mankind, the hauler. After our race that can die any day, at any hour, at any minute, from any number of accidents has come that one. He will only die on his day, at his hour, at his minute, when he has reached the term of his existence. No, no, of course not. Of course he's not dead. So then, it's me. It's me that I have to kill. May 1887. Turn of the Screw by Henry James. Introduction. The story had held us round the fire, sufficiently breathless, but except the obvious remark that it was gruesome as on Christmas Eve in an old house, a strange tale should essentially be, I remember no comment uttered till somebody happened to say that it was the only case he had met in which such a visitation had fallen on a child. The case I may mention was that of an apparition in just such an old house as had gathered us for the occasion, an appearance of a dreadful kind, to a little boy sleeping in the room with his mother and waking her up in the terror of it, waking her not to dissipate his dread and soothe him to sleep again, but to encounter also herself before she had succeeded in doing so, the same sight that had shaken him. It was this observation that drew from Douglas, not immediately, but later in the evening, a reply that had the interesting consequence to which I call attention. Someone else told a story not particularly effective, which I saw he was not following. This I took for a sign that he had himself something to produce, and that we should only have to wait. We waited, in fact, till two nights later, but that same evening, before we scattered, he brought out what was on his mind. I quite agree in regard to Griffin's ghost, or whatever it was, that its appearing first to the little boy at so tender an age adds a particular touch. But it's not the first occurrence of its charming kind that I know to have involved a child. If the child gives the effect another turn of the screw, what do you say to two children? We say, of course, somebody exclaimed, that they give two turns, also that we want to hear about them. I can see Douglas there before the fire to which he had got up to present his back, looking down at his interlocutor with his hands in his pockets. Nobody but me till now has ever heard. It's quite too horrible. This, naturally, was declared by several voices to give the thing the utmost price, and our friend, with quiet art, prepared his triumph by turning his eyes over the rest of us and going on. It's beyond everything. Nothing at all that I know touches it. Or sheer terror, I remember asking. 
He seemed to say it was not so simple as that, to be really at a loss how to qualify it. He passed his hand over his eyes, made a little wincing grimace. For dreadful, dreadfulness. Oh, how delicious, cried one of the women. He took no notice of her. He looked at me. But, as if instead of me he saw what he spoke of, for general uncanny ugliness and horror and pain. Well then, I said, just sit right down and begin. He looked round to the fire, gave a kick to a log, watched it an instant. Then, as he faced us again, I can't begin. I shall have to send to town. There was a unanimous groan at this and much reproach, after which, in his preoccupied way, he explained, The story's written. It's in a locked drawer. It's not been out for years. I could write to my man and close the key. He could send down the packet as he finds it. It was to me in particular that he appeared to propound this, appeared almost to appeal for aid not to hesitate. He had broken a thickness of ice, the formation of many a winter, had his reasons for a long silence. The others resented postponement, but it was just his scruples that charmed me. I adjured him to write by the first post and to agree with us for an early hearing. Then I asked him if the experience in question had been his own. To this his answer was prompt. Oh, thank God, no. And is the record yours? You took the thing down. Nothing but the impression. I took that here, he tapped his heart. I never lost it. Then your manuscript is in old faded ink and in the most beautiful hand, he hung fire again, a woman's. She has been dead these twenty years. She sent me the pages in question before she died. They were all listening now, and of course there was somebody to be arch or at any rate to draw the inference, but if he put the inference by without a smile, it was also without irritation. She was a most charming person, but she was ten years older than I. She was my sister's governess, he quietly said. She was the most agreeable woman I have ever known in her position. She would have been worthy of any whatever. It was long ago, and this episode was long before. I was at Trinity, and I found her at home on my coming down the second summer. I was much there that year. It was a beautiful one, and we had, in her off hours, some strolls and talks in the garden. Talks in which she struck me as awfully clever and nice. Oh yes, don't grin. I liked her extremely, and I'm glad to this day to think she liked me too. If she hadn't, she wouldn't have told me. She had never told anyone. It wasn't simply that she said so, but that I knew she hadn't. I was sure. I could see. You'll easily judge why when you're here. Because the thing had been such a scare. He continued to fix me. You'll easily judge, he repeated. You will. I fixed him too. I see. She was in love. He laughed for the first time. You are acute. Yes, she was in love. That is, she had been. That came out. She couldn't tell her story without its coming out. I saw it, and she saw I saw it, but neither of us spoke of it. I remember the time and the place, the corner of the lawn, the shade of the great beaches and the long, hot summer afternoon. It wasn't a scene for a shudder, but, oh, he quitted the fire and dropped back into his chair. He received the packet Thursday morning, I inquired. Probably not till the second post. Well, then, after dinner. You'll all meet me here, he looked us round again. Isn't anybody going? It was almost a tone of hope. Everybody will stay. I will, and I will, cried the ladies whose departure had been fixed. Mrs. Griffin, however, expressed the need for a little more light. Who was it she was in love with? The story will tell, I took upon myself to reply. Oh, I can't wait for the story. The story won't tell, said Douglas, not in a literal, vulgar way. More's the pity, then. That's the only way I ever understand. Won't you tell, Douglas? Somebody else inquired. He sprang to his feet again. Yes, tomorrow. Now I must go to bed. Good night. And quickly, catching up a candlestick, he left us slightly bewildered. From our end of the great brown hall, we heard his step on the stair, whereupon Mrs. Griffin spoke. Well, if I don't know who she was in love with, I know who he was. She was ten years older, said her husband. Raison de plus at that age, but it's rather nice, his long reticence. Forty years, Griffin put in, with this outbreak at last. The outbreak, I returned, will make a tremendous occasion of Thursday night. 
and everyone so agreed with me that in the light of it, we lost all attention for everything else. The last story, however incomplete and like the mere opening of a serial had been told, we hand shook and candle stuck, as somebody said, and went to bed. I knew the next day that a letter containing the key had, by the first post, gone off to his London apartments, but in spite of, or perhaps just on account of, the eventual diffusion of this knowledge, we quite let him alone till after dinner, till such an hour of the evening, in fact, as might best accord with the kind of emotion on which our hopes were fixed. Then he became as communicative as we could desire, and indeed gave us his best reason for being so. We had it from him again before the fire in the hall, as we had had our mild wonders of the previous night. It appeared that the narrative he had promised to read us really required for a proper intelligence a few words of prologue. Let me say here distinctly to have done with it that this narrative from an exact transcript of my own made much later is what I shall presently give. Poor Douglas before his death, when it was in sight, committed to me the manuscript that reached him on the third of these days, and that on the same spot with immense effect he began to read to our hushed little circle on the night of the fourth. The departing ladies who said they wouldn't stay didn't, of course, thank heaven, stay. They departed, in consequence of arrangements made in a rage of curiosity, as they professed, produced by the touches with which he had already worked us up. But that only made his little final auditory more compact and select, kept it round the hearth, subject to a common thrill. The first of these touches conveyed that the written statement took up the tale at the point after it had in a manner begun. The fact to be in possession of was, therefore, that his old friend, the youngest of several daughters of a poor country parson, had, at the age of twenty, on taking service for the first time in the schoolroom, come up to London in trepidation to answer in person an advertisement that had already placed her in brief correspondence with the advertiser. This person proved, on her presenting herself for judgment at a house in Harley Street that impressed her as vast and imposing, this prospective patron proved a gentleman, a bachelor in the prime of life, such a figure as had never risen, save in a dream or an old novel, before a fluttered, anxious girl out of a Hampshire vicarage. One could easily fix his type. It never happily dies out. He was handsome and bold and pleasant, offhand and gay and kind. He struck her inevitably as gallant and splendid. But what took her most of all and gave her the courage she afterwards showed was that he put the whole thing to her as a kind of favour, an obligation he should gratefully incur. She conceived him as rich, but as fearfully extravagant, saw him in all the glow of high fashion, good looks of expensive habits, charming ways with women, he had for his own town residence a big house filled with the spoils of travel and the trophies of the chase. But it was to his country home, an old family place in Essex, that he wished her immediately to proceed. He had been left by the death of their parents in India, guardian to a small nephew and a small niece, children of a younger, a military brother, whom he had lost two years before. These children were by the strangest of chances for a man in his position, a lone man without the right sort of experience or a grain of patience, very heavily on his hands. It had all been a great worry, and on his own part doubtless a series of blunders, but he immensely pitied the poor chicks, and had done all he could, had in particular sent them down to his other house, the proper place for them being, of course, the country, and kept them there from the first, with the best people he could find to look after them, parting even with his own servants to wait on them, and going down himself whenever he might to see how they were doing. The awkward thing was that they had practically no other relations, and that his own affairs took up all his time. He had put them in possession of Bly, which was healthy and secure, and had placed at the head of their little establishment, a bit below stairs only, an excellent woman, Mrs. Gross, whom he was sure his visitor would like, and who, had formerly been made to his mother. She was now housekeeper and was also acting for the time as superintendent to the little girl, of whom, without children of her own, she was, by good luck, extremely fond. There were plenty of people to help, but of course the young lady who should go down as governess would be in supreme authority. 
She would also have in holidays to look after the small boy who had been for a term at school, young as he was to be sent. But what else could be done? And who, as the holidays were about to begin, would be back from one day to the other? There had been for the two children at first the young lady whom they had the misfortune to lose. She had done for them quite beautifully. She was a most respectable person till her death. The great awkwardness of which had precisely left no alternative but the school for little Miles. Mrs. Gross, since then, in the way of manners and things, had done as she could for Flora, and there were further a cook, a housemaid, a dairywoman, an old pony, an old broom, and an old gardener, all likewise thoroughly respectable. So far had Douglas presented his picture when someone put a question. And what did the former governess die of? Of so much respectability? Our friend's answer was prompt. That will come out. I don't anticipate. Excuse me, I thought that was just what you're doing. In her successor's place, I suggested, I should have wished to learn if the office brought with it uh, necessary danger to life. Douglas completed my thought. She did wish to learn, and she did learn. You shall hear tomorrow what she learned. Meanwhile, of course, the prospect struck her as slightly grim. She was young, untried, nervous. It was a vision of serious duties and little company, of really great loneliness. She hesitated, it took a couple of days to consult and consider, but the salary offered much exceeded her modest measure, and on a second interview she faced the music, she engaged, and Douglas, with this, made a pause that for the benefit of the company moved me to throw in, the moral of which was, of course, the seduction exercised by the splendid young man. She succumbed to it. He got up, and as he had done the night before, went to the fire, gave a stir to the log with his foot, then stood a moment with his back to us. She saw him only twice. Yes, but that's just the beauty of her passion. A little to my surprise, on this, Douglas turned round to me. It was the beauty of it. There were others, he went on, who hadn't succumbed. He told her frankly all his difficulty, that for several applicants the conditions had been prohibitive. They were, somehow, simply afraid. It sounded dull, it sounded strange, and all the more so because of his main condition, which was that she should never trouble him, but never, never, neither appeal nor complain nor write about anything only meet all questions herself, receive all monies from his solicitor, take the whole thing over and let him alone. She promised to do this and she mentioned to me that when for a moment, disburdened, delighted, he held her hand thanking her for the sacrifice, she already felt rewarded. But was that all her reward? One of the ladies asked. She never saw him again. Oh, said the lady, which as our friend immediately left us again was the only other word of importance contributed on the subject till the next night, by the corner of the hearth, in the best chair, he opened the red, faded cover of a thin, old-fashioned, gilt-edged album. The whole thing took indeed more nights than one, but on the first occasion, the same lady put another question. Well, what's your title? I haven't one. Oh, I have, I said, but Douglas, without heeding me, had begun to read with a fine clearness that was like a rendering to the ear of the beauty of his author's hand. Chapter One I remember the whole beginning as a succession of flights and drops, a little seesaw of the right throbs and the wrong. After rising in town to meet his appeal, I had at all events a couple of very bad days found myself doubtful again, felt indeed sure I had made a mistake. In this state of mind, I spent the long hours of bumping, swinging coach that carried me to the stopping place, at which I was to be met by a vehicle from the house. This convenience, I was told, had been ordered, and I found, toward the close of the June afternoon, a commodious fly in waiting for me. Driving at that hour on a lovely day through a country to which the summer's sweetness seemed to offer me a friendly welcome, my fortitude mounted afresh, and as we turned into the avenue encountered a reprieve that was probably but a proof of the point to which it had sunk. I suppose I had expected or had dreaded something so melancholy that what greeted me was a good surprise. I remember as a most pleasant impression the broad, clear front, its open windows and fresh curtains, and the pair of maids looking out. 
I remember the lawn and the bright flowers and the crunch of my wheels on the gravel and the clustered treetops over which the rooks circled and cawed in the golden sky. The scene had a greatness that made it a different affair from my own scant home, and there immediately appeared at the door with a little girl in her hand, a civil person who dropped me as decent a curtsy as if I had been the mistress or a distinguished visitor. I had received in Harley Street a narrower notion of the place, and that, as I recalled it, made me think the proprietor still more of a gentleman, suggested that what I was to enjoy might be something beyond his promise. I had no drop again till the next day, for I was carried triumphantly through the following hours by my introduction to the younger of my pupils. The little girl who accompanied Mrs. Gross appeared to me on the spot a creature so charming as to make it a great fortune to have to do with her. She was the most beautiful child I had ever seen, and afterward wondered that my employer had not told me more of her. I slept little that night. I was too much excited, and this astonished me too, I recollect, remained with me, adding to my sense of the liberality with which I was treated. The large, impressive room, one of the best in the house. The great state bed, as I almost felt it, the full-figured draperies, the long glasses in which, for the first time, I could see myself from head to foot, all struck me like the extraordinary charm of my small charge, as so many things thrown in. It was thrown in as well from the first moment, that I should get on with Mrs. Gross in a relation over which, on my way in the coach, I fear I had rather brooded. The only thing, indeed, in this early outlook that might have made me shrink again was the clear circumstance of her being so glad to see me. I perceived within half an hour that she was so glad, stout, simple, plain, clean, wholesome woman, as to be positively on her guard against showing it too much. I wondered even then a little why she should wish not to show it, and that, with reflection, with suspicion, might of course have made me uneasy. But it was a comfort that there could be no uneasiness in the connection with anything so beatific as the radiant image of my little girl, the vision of whose angelic beauty had probably more than anything else to do with the restlessness that before morning made me several times rise and wander about my room to take in the whole picture and prospect, to watch from my open window the faint summer dawn to look at such portions of the rest of the house as I could catch, and to listen while in the fading dusk the first birds begin to twitter for the possible recurrence of a sound or two less natural and not without, but within, that I had fancied I heard. There had been a moment when I believed I recognised faint and far the cry of a child. There had been another when I found myself just consciously starting as at the passage before my door of a light footstep. But these fancies were not marked enough not to be thrown off, and it is only in the light or the gloom, I should rather say, of other and subsequent matters that they now come back to me. To watch, teach, form little Flora would too evidently be the making of a happy and useful life. It had been agreed between us downstairs that after this first occasion I should have her as a matter of course at night, a small white bed being already arranged to that end in my room. What I had undertaken was the whole care of her, and she had remained just this last time with Mrs. Gross only as an effect of our consideration for my inevitable strangeness and her natural timidity. In spite of this timidity, which the child herself in the oddest way in the world had been perfectly frank and brave about, allowing it without a sign of uncomfortable consciousness, with the deep, sweet serenity indeed of one of Raphael's holy infants, to be discussed, to be imputed to her, and to determine us, I feel quite sure she would presently like me. It was part of what I already liked Mrs. Gross herself for, the pleasure I could see her feel in my admiration and wonder as I sat at supper with four tall candles and with my pupil in a high chair and bib brightly facing me, between them over bread and milk. There were naturally things that in Flora's presence could pass between us only as prodigious and gratified looks, obscure and roundabout illusions. And the little boy, does he look like her? Is he too so very remarkable? One wouldn't flatter a child. Oh, miss, most remarkable, if you think well of this one. And she stood there with the plate in her hand, beaming at our companion, who looked from one of us to the other, with placid, heavenly eyes that contained nothing to check us. Yes, if I do... You will be carried away by the little gentleman. 
Well, that, I think, is what I came for, to be carried away. I'm afraid, however, I remember feeling the impulse to add, I'm rather easily carried away. I was carried away in London. I can still see Mrs. Gross's broad face as she took this in. In Harley Street. In Harley Street. Well, miss, you're not the first, and you won't be the last. Oh, I've no pretension. I could laugh to being the only one. My other pupil, at any rate, as I understand, comes back tomorrow. Not tomorrow, Friday, miss. He arrives, as you did, by the coach under care of the guard, and is to be met by the same carriage. I forthwith expressed that the proper, as well as the pleasant and friendly thing, would be, therefore, that on the arrival of the public conveyance, I should be in waiting for him with his little sister, an idea in which Mrs. Gross concurred so heartily that I somehow took her manner as a kind of comforting pledge, never falsified, thank heaven, that we should, on every question, be quite at one. Oh, she was glad I was there. What I felt the next day was, I suppose, nothing that could fairly be called a reaction from the cheer of my arrival. It was probably at the most only a slight oppression produced by a fuller measure of the scale as I walked round them, gazed up at them, took them in of my new circumstances. They had, as it were, an extent and mass for which I had not been prepared, and in the presence of which I found myself freshly a little scared as well as a little proud. Lessons in this agitation certainly suffered some delay. I reflected that my first duty was, by the gentlest arts I could contrive, to win the child into the sense of knowing me. I spent the day with her out of doors. I arranged with her, to her great satisfaction, that it should be she, she only, who might show me the place. She showed it step by step and room by room and secret by secret, with droll, delightful, childish talk about it, and with the result in half an hour of our becoming immense friends. Young as she was, I was struck throughout our little tour with her confidence and courage with the way in empty chambers and dull corridors, on crooked staircases that made me pause, and even on the summit of an old maculated square tower that made me feel dizzy, a morning music, a disposition to tell me so many more things than she asked, rang out and led me on. I have not seen Bly since the day I left it, and I dare say that to my older and more informed eyes it would now appear sufficiently contracted, but as my little conductress, with her hair of gold and a frock of blue, danced before me round corners and pattered down passages, I had the view of a castle of romance inhabited by a rosy sprite, such a place as would somehow, by diversion of the young idea, take all colour out of storybooks and fairy tales. Or wasn't it just a storybook over which I had fallen a doze and a dream? No, it was a big, ugly, antique, but convenient house, embodying a few features of a building still older, half replaced and half utilised, in which I had the fancy of our being almost as lost as a handful of passengers in a great drifting ship, while I was strangely at the helm. Chapter 2 This came home to me when two days later I drove over with Flora to meet, as Mrs. Gross said, a little gentleman, and all the more for an incident that presenting itself the second evening had deeply disconcerted me. The first day had been on the whole, as I have expressed, reassuring, but I was to see it wind up in keen apprehension. The post bag that evening, it came late, contained a letter for me, which, however, in the hand of my employer, I found to be composed, but of a few words enclosing another, addressed to himself with the seal still unbroken. This I recognise as from the headmaster, and the headmaster's an awful bore. Read him, please, deal with him, but mind you don't report, not a word. I'm off. I broke the seal with a great effort, so great a one that I was a long time coming to it, took the unopened missive at last up to my room, and only attacked it just before going to bed. I had better have let it wait till the morning, but it gave me a second sleepless night. With no counsel to take the next day, I was full of distress, and it finally got so the better of me that I determined to open myself at least to Mrs. Gross. What does it mean? The child dismissed his school. He 
He gave me a look that I remarked at the moment, then, visibly, with a quick blankness, seemed to try to take it back. But aren't they all? Send home, yes, but only for the holidays. Miles may never go back at all. Consciously under my attention, she reddened. They won't take him. They absolutely decline. At this, she raised her eyes, which she had turned from me. I saw them filled with good tears. What has he done? I hesitated, then I judged best to simply hand her the letter, which, however, had the effect of making her, without taking it, simply put her hands behind her. She shook her head sadly. Such things are not for me, miss. My counsellor couldn't read. I winced at my mistake, which I attenuated as I could, and opened my letter again to repeat it to her, then, faltering in the act and folding it up once more. I put it back in my pocket. Is he really bad? The tears were still in her eyes. Do the gentlemen say so? They go into no particulars. They simply express their regret that it should be impossible to keep him. That can only have one meaning. Mrs. Gross listened with dumb emotion. She forbore to ask me what this meaning might be, so that presently, to put the thing with some coherence and with the mere aid of her presence to my own mind, I went on, that he's an injury to the others. At this, with one of the quick turns of simple folk, she suddenly flamed up. Master Miles, him an injury? There was such a flood of good faith in it, that though I had not yet seen the child, my very fears made me jump to the absurdity of the idea. I found myself to meet my friend the better, offering it on the spot sarcastically to his poor little innocent mates. It's too dreadful, cried Mrs. Gross, to say such cruel things. Why, he's scarce ten years old. Yes, yes, it would be incredible. She was evidently grateful for such a profession. See him miss first, then believe it. I felt forthwith a new impatience to see him. It was the beginning of a curiosity that for all the next hours I was to deepen, almost to pain. Mrs. Gross was aware, as I could judge, of what she had produced in me, and she followed it up with the assurance, you might as well believe it of the little lady, bless her, she added the next morning. Look at her. I turned and saw that Flora, whom ten minutes before I had established in the schoolroom with a sheet of white paper, a pencil and a copy of nice round O's, now presented herself to view at the open door. She expressed in her little way an extraordinary detachment from disagreeable duties, looking to me, however, with a great childish light that seemed to offer it as a mere result of the affection she had conceived for my person, which had rendered necessary that she should follow me. I needed nothing more than this to feel the full force of Mrs. Gross' comparison. And catching my pupil in my arms, covered her with kisses in which there was a sob of atonement. Nevertheless, the rest of the day I watched for further occasion to approach my colleague, especially toward evening. I began to fancy she rather sought to avoid me. I overtook her, I remember, on the staircase. We went down together, and at the bottom I detained her, holding her there with a hand on her arm. I take what you said to me at noon as declaration that you've never known him to be bad. She threw back her head. She had clearly by this time and very honestly adopted an attitude. Oh, never known him. I don't pretend that. I was upset again. Then you have known him. Yes, indeed, miss. Thank God. A reflection I accepted is, you mean that a boy who never is, is no boy for me. I held her tighter. You like them with the spirit to be naughty. Then, keeping pace with her answer, so do I, I eagerly brought out, but not to the degree to contaminate. To contaminate? My big word left her at a loss, I explained it, to corrupt. She stared, taking my meaning in, but it produced in her an odd laugh. Are you afraid he'll corrupt you? She put the question with such a fine, bold humour that with a laugh a little silly doubtless to match her own, I gave way for the time to the apprehension of ridicule. But the next day, as the hour for my drive approached, I cropped up in another place. What was the lady who was here before? The last governess. She was also young and pretty, almost as young and almost as pretty, Miss Even as you. And then I hope her youth and her beauty helped her. I recollect throwing it off. He seems to like us young and pretty. Oh, he did, Mrs. Gross assented. It was the way he liked everyone. She had no sooner spoken, indeed, that she caught herself up. I mean, that's his way. The masters. I was struck. But of whom did you speak first? She looked blank, but she coloured. Why of him? Of the master? Of who else? 
There was so obviously no one else that the next moment I had lost my impression of her having accidentally said more than she meant, and I merely asked what I wanted to know. Did she see anything in the boy that wasn't right? She never told me. I had a scruple, but I overcame it. Was she careful, particular? Mrs. Gross appeared to try to be conscientious. About some things, yes, but not about all. Again, she considered. Well, miss, she's gone. I won't tell tales. I, I quite understand your feeling, I hastened to reply, but I thought it, after an instant, not opposed to this concession to pursue. Did she die here? No. She went off. I don't know what there was in this brevity of Mrs. Gross's that struck me as ambiguous. Went off to die. Mrs. Gross looked straight out of the window, but I felt that hypothetically I had the right to know what young persons engaged for Bly were expected to do. She was taken ill, you mean, and went home. She wasn't taken ill, as far as appeared, in this house. She left it at the end of the year to go home, as she said, for a short holiday, to which the time she had put in had certainly given her a right. We had then a young woman, a nursemaid, who stayed on, and who was a good girl and clever, and she took the children all together for the interval. But our young lady never came back. And at the very moment I was expecting her, I heard from the master that she was dead. I turned this over. But of what? He never told me. But please, miss, said Mrs. Gross, I must get to my work. Chapter 3 her thus turning her back on me was fortunately not for my just preoccupations a snub that could check the growth of our mutual esteem. We met, after I had brought home little Miles, more intimately than ever on the ground of my stupefaction, my general emotion, so monstrous was I then ready to pronounce it that such a child as had now been revealed to me should be under an interdict. I was a little late on the scene. And I felt, as he stood wistfully looking out for me before the door of the inn at which the coach had put him down, that I had seen him, on the instant, without and within, in the great glow of freshness, the same positive fragrance of purity in which I had, from the first moment, seen his little sister. He was incredibly beautiful, and Mrs. Gross had put her finger on it. Everything but a sort of passion of tenderness for him was swept away by his presence. When I then and there took him to my heart, for was something divine that I have never found to the same degree in any child, his indescribable little air of knowing nothing in the world but love, it would have been impossible to carry a bad name with a greater sweetness of innocence, and by the time I had got back to Bly with him, I remained merely bewildered, so far, that is, as I was not outraged by the sense of the horrible letter locked up in my room in a drawer. As soon as I could compass a private word with Mrs. Gross, I declared to her that it was grotesque. She promptly understood me. You mean the cruel charge. It doesn't live an instant, my dear woman. Look at him. She smiled at my pretension to have discovered his charm. I assure you, miss, I do nothing else. What will you say then? She immediately added. In answer to the letter, I had made up my mind. Nothing. And to his uncle? I was incisive. Nothing. And to the boy himself? I was wonderful. Nothing. She gave with her apron a great wipe to her mouth. Then I'll stand by you. We'll see it out. We'll see it out, I ardently echoed, giving her my hand to make it a vow. She held me there a moment, then whisked up her apron again with her detached hand. Would you mind, miss, if I used the freedom to kiss me? No. I took the good creature in my arms, and after we had embraced like sisters, felt still more fortified and indignant. This, at all events, was for the time, a time so full that, as I recall the way it went, reminds me of all the art I need now to make it a little distinct. What I look back at with amazement is the situation I accepted. I had undertaken with my companion to see it out, and I was under a charm, apparently, that could smooth away the extent and the far and difficult connections of such an effort. I was lifted aloft on a great wave of infatuation and pity. I found it simple, in my ignorance, my confusion, and perhaps my conceit, to assume that I could deal with a boy whose education for the world was all on the point of beginning. 
I am unable even to remember at this day what proposal I frame for the end of his holidays and the resumption of his studies. Lessons with me, indeed, that charming summer, we all had a theory that he was to have, but I now feel that for weeks the lessons must have been rather my own. I learned something at first, certainly, that had not been one of the teachings of my small, smothered life, learned to be amused and even amusing, and not to think for the morrow. It was the first time in a manner that I had known space and air and freedom, all the music of summer and all the mystery of nature. And then there was a consideration, and consideration was sweet. Oh, it was a trap, not designed, but deep to my imagination, to my delicacy, perhaps to my vanity, to whatever in me was most excitable. The best way to picture it all is to say that I was off my guard. They gave me so little trouble. They were of a gentleness so extraordinary. I used to speculate, but even this was a dim disconnectedness, as to how the rough future, for all futures are rough, would handle them and might bruise them. They had the bloom of health and happiness, and yet, as if I had been in charge of a pair of little grandees, of princes of the blood, for whom everything to be right would have to be enclosed and protected, the only form that in my fancy the after years could take for them was that of a romantic, a really royal extension of the garden and the park. It may be, of course, above all, that what suddenly broke into this gives the previous time a charm of stillness, that hush in which something gathers or crouches. The change was actually like the spring of a beast. In the first weeks, the days were long. They often, at their finest, gave me what I used to call my own hour, the hour when, for my pupils, tea time and bedtime having come and gone, I had, before my final retirement, a small interval alone, much as I liked my companions, this hour was the thing in the day I liked most, and I liked it best of all when, as the light faded, or rather, I should say, the day lingered, and the last calls of the last birds sounded, in a flushed sky from the old trees, I could take a turn into the grounds and enjoy, almost with a sense of property that amused and flattered me, the beauty and dignity of the place. It was a pleasure at these moments to feel myself tranquil and justified, doubtless perhaps also to reflect that by my discretion, my quiet good sense and general high propriety, I was giving pleasure, if he ever thought of it, to the person to whose pressure I had responded. What I was doing was what he had earnestly hoped and directly asked of me, and that I could, after all, do it, proved even a greater joy than I had expected. I dare say I fancied myself, in short, a remarkable young woman and took comfort in the faith that this would more publicly appear. Well, I needed to be remarkable to offer a front to the remarkable things that presently gave their first sign. It was plump one afternoon in the middle of my very hour. The children were tucked away and I had come out for my stroll. One of the thoughts that, as I don't in the least shrink now from noting, used to be with me in these wanderings, that it would be as charming as a charming story to suddenly meet someone. Someone would appear there at the turn of the path and would stand before me and smile and approve. I didn't ask more than that. I only asked that he should know, and the only way to be sure he knew would be to see it and the kind light of it in his handsome face. That was exactly present to me, by which I mean the face was when, on the very first of the occasions, at the end of a long June day, I stopped short on emerging from one of the plantations and coming into view of the house. What arrested me on the spot, and with a shock much greater than any vision had allowed for, was the sense that my imagination had, in a flash, turned real. He did stand there, but high up, beyond the lawn, and the very top of the tower to which on that first morning little Flora had conducted me. This tower was one of a pair, square, incongruous, crenellated structures that were distinguished for some reason, though I could see little difference, as the new and the old. They flanked opposite ends of the house and were probably architectural absurdities, redeemed in a measure indeed by not being wholly disengaged nor of a height too pretentious, dating in their gingerbread antiquity from a romantic revival that was already a respectable past. I admired them, had fancies about them, 
for we could all profit in the degree, especially when they loom through the dusk, by the grandeur of their actual battlements. Yet it was not at such an elevation that the figure I had so often invoked seemed most in place. It produced in me this figure. In the clear twilight, I remember two distinct gasps of emotion, which were sharply the shock of my first and that of my second surprise. My second was a violent perception of the mistake of my first. The man who met my eyes was not the person I had precipitately supposed. There came to me thus a bewilderment of vision of which, after these years, there is no living view that I can hope to give. An unknown man in a lonely place is the permitted object of fear to a young woman privately bred, and the figure that faced me was, a few more seconds assured me, as little anyone else I knew as it was the image that had been in my mind. I had not seen it in Harley Street. I had not seen it anywhere. The place, moreover, in the strangest way in the world, had on the instant, and by the very fact of its appearance, become a solitude, to me at least, making my statement here with the deliberation with which I have never made it, the whole feeling of the moment returns. It was as if, while I took in what I did take in, all the rest of the scene had been stricken with death. I can hear again, as I write, the intense hush in which the sounds of evening dropped. The rooks stopped cawing in the golden sky, and the friendly hour lost, for the minute, all its voice. But there was no other change in nature, unless indeed it were a change that I saw with a stranger sharpness. The gold was still in the sky, the clearness in the air, and the man who looked at me over the battlements was as definite as a picture in a frame. That's how I thought, with extraordinary quickness of each person, that he might have been, and that he was not. We were confronted across our distance quite long enough for me to ask myself with intensity who then he was, and to feel, as an effect of my inability to say, a wonder that in a few instants more became intense. The great question, or one of these, is afterward, I know, with regard to certain matters, the question of how long they have lasted. Well, this is a matter of mine, think what you will of it. Lasted while I caught at a dozen possibilities, none of which made a difference for the better that I could see in their having been in the house, and for how long, above all, a person of whom I was in ignorance. It lasted while I just bridled a little, with the sense that my office demanded that there should be no such ignorance and no such person. It lasted while this visitant, at all events, and there was a touch of the strange freedom, as I remember, in the sign of familiarity of his wearing no hat, seemed to fix me from his position with just the question, just the scrutiny through the fading light that his own presence provoked. We were too far apart to call to each other, but there was a moment at which, at shorter range, some challenge between us breaking the hush would have been the right result of our straight mutual stare. He was in one of the angles, the one away from the house, very erect as it struck me, and with both hands on the ledge. So I saw him as I see the letters I form on this page then, exactly, after a minute, as if to add to the spectacle, he slowly changed his place, passed, looking at me hard all the while, to the opposite corner of the platform. Yes, I had the sharpest sense that during this transit he never took his eyes from me and I can see at this moment the way his hand, as he went, passed from one of the crenellations to the next. He stopped at the other corner, but less long, and even as he turned away, still markedly fixed me. He turned away. That was all I knew. Chapter 4 It was not that I didn't wait, on this occasion for more, for I was rooted as deeply as I was shaken. Was there a secret at Bly, a mystery of Adolfo, or an insane and unmentionable relative kept in unsuspected confinement? I can't say how long I turned it over, or how long, in the confusion of curiosity and dread, I remained where I had had my collision. I only recall that when I re-entered the house, darkness had quite closed in. 
agitation in the interval certainly had held me and driven me, for I must, in circling about the place, have walked three miles. But I was to be, later on, so much more overwhelmed that this mere dawn of alarm was a comparatively human chill. The most singular part of it, in fact, singular as the rest had been, was the part I became, in the hall, aware of in meeting Mrs. Gross. This picture comes back to me in the general train. The impression, as I received it on my return, of the wide, white, panelled space, bright in the lamplight, and with its portrait and red carpet, and of the good, surprised look of my friend, which immediately told me she had missed me. It came to me straight away under her contact that, with plain heartiness, mere relieved anxiety at my appearance, she knew nothing whatever that could bear upon the incident I had there ready for her. I had not suspected in advance that her comfortable face would pull me up, and I somehow measured the importance of what I had seen by my thus finding myself hesitate to mention it. Scarce anything in the whole history seems to me so odd as this fact that my real beginning of fear was one, as I may say, with the instinct of sparing my companion. On the spot, accordingly, in the pleasant hall, and with her eyes on me, I, for a reason that I couldn't then have phrased, achieved an inward resolution, offered a vague pretext for my lateness, and with the plea of the beauty of the night and of the heavy dew and wet feet, went as soon as possible to my room. Here it was another affair, for many days after, it was a queer affair enough. There were hours from day to day, or at least there were moments snatched even from clear duties, when I had to shut myself up to think. It was not so much yet that I was more nervous than I could bear to be, as that I was remarkably afraid of becoming so, for the truth I had now to turn over was, simply and clearly, the truth that I could arrive at no account whatever of the visitor with whom I had been so inexplicably, and yet, as it seemed to me, so intimately concerned. It took little time to see that I could sound without forms of inquiry and without exciting remark any domestic complications. The shock I had suffered must have sharpened all my senses. I felt sure at the end of three days, and as the result of mere closer attention, that I had not been practised upon by the servants nor made the object of any game. Of whatever it was that I knew, nothing was known around me. There was but one sane inference. Someone had taken a liberty rather gross. That was what repeatedly I dipped into my room and locked the door to say to myself. We had been collectively subject to an intrusion. Some unscrupulous traveller, curious in old houses, had made his way in unobserved, enjoyed the prospect from the best point of view, and then stolen out as he came. If he had given me such a bold, hard stare, that was but a part of his indiscretion. The good thing, after all, was that we should surely see no more of him. This was not so good a thing, I admit, as not to leave me to judge that what essentially made nothing else much signify was simply my charming work. My charming work was just my life with Miles and Flora, and through nothing could I so like it as through feeling that I could throw myself into it in trouble. The attraction of my small charges was a constant joy, leading me to wonder afresh at the vanity of my original fears. The distaste I had begun by entertaining for the probable grey prose of my office. There was to be no grey prose, it appeared, and no long grind. So how could work not be charming that presented itself as daily beauty? It was all the romance of the nursery and the poetry of the schoolroom. I don't mean by this, of course, that we studied only fiction and verse. I mean I can express no otherwise the sort of interest my companions inspired. How can I describe that except by saying that instead of growing used to them, and it's a marvel for a governess, I call the sisterhood to witness, I made constant fresh discoveries. There was one direction assuredly in which these discoveries stopped. Deep obscurity continued to cover the region of the boy's conduct at school. It had been promptly given me, I have noted, to face the mystery without a pang. Perhaps, even it would be nearer the truth to say that, without a word, he himself had cleared it up. He had made the whole charge absurd. My conclusion bloomed there with the real rose flush of his innocence. 
He was only too fine and fair for the little horrid, unclean school world, and he had paid a price for it. I reflected acutely that the sense of such differences, such superiorities of quality always on the part of the majority, which could include even stupid, sordid headmasters, turn infallibly to the vindictive. Both the children had a gentleness, it was their only fault, and it never made Miles a muff, that kept them, how should I express it, almost impersonal and certainly quite unpunishable. They were like the cherubs of the anecdote, who had, morally at any rate, nothing to whack. I remember feeling with Miles in a special, as if we had had, as it were, no history. We expect of a small child a scant one, but there was in this beautiful little boy something extraordinarily sensitive, yet extraordinarily happy, that more than any creature of his age I have seen struck me as beginning anew each day. He had never for a second suffered. I took this as a direct disproof of his having really been chastised. If he had been wicked, he would have caught it, and I should have caught it by the rebound. I should have found the trace. I found nothing at all, and he was therefore an angel. He never spoke of his school, never mentioned a comrade or a master, and I, for my part, was quite too much disgusted to allude to them. Of course, I was under the spell, and the wonderful part is that even at the time I perfectly knew I was, but I gave myself up to it. It was an antidote to any pain, and I had more pains than one. I was in receipt in those days of disturbing letters from home where things were not going well. But with my children, what things in the world mattered? That was the question I used to put to my scrappy retirements. I was dazzled by their loveliness. There was a Sunday to get on when it rained with such force and for so many hours that there could be no procession to church in consequence of which, as the day declined, I had arranged with Mrs. Gross that should the evening show improvement, we would attend together the late service. The rain happily stopped, and I prepared for our walk, which, through the park and by the good road to the village, would be a matter of twenty minutes. Coming downstairs to meet my colleague in the hall, I remembered a pair of gloves that had required three stitches and that had received them, with a publicity perhaps not edifying while I sat with the children at their tea, served on Sundays by exception, in that cold, clean temple of mahogany and brass, the grown-up dining room. The gloves had been dropped there, and I turned in to recover them. The day was grey enough, but the afternoon light still lingered, and it enabled me, on crossing the threshold, not only to recognise on the chair near the wide window, then closed, the articles I wanted, but to become aware of a person on the other side of the window and looking straight in. One step into the room had sufficed. My vision was instantaneous. It was all there. The person looking straight in was the person who had already appeared to me. He appeared thus again with, I won't say, greater distinctness, for that was impossible, but with a nearness that represented a forward stride in our intercourse and made me, as I met him, catch my breath and turn cold. He was the same. He was the same and seen this time, as he had been seen before, from the waist up the window, though the dining room was on the ground floor, not going down to the terrace on which he stood. His face was close to the glass, yet the effect of this better view was strangely only to show me how intense the former had been. He remained but a few seconds, long enough to convince me he also saw and recognized, but it was as if I had been looking at him for years and had known him always. Something, however, happened this time that had not happened before. His stare into my face, through the glass and across the room, was as deep and hard as then. But it quitted me for a moment during which I could still watch it, see it fix successively several other things. On the spot there came to me the added shock of a certitude that it was not for me he had come there. He had come for someone else. The flash of this knowledge for it was knowledge in the midst of dread, produced in me the most extraordinary effect. Started as I stood there, a sudden vibration of duty and courage. I say courage because I was beyond all doubt already far gone. I bounded straight out of the door again, reached that of the house, got in an instant upon the drive, and passing along the terrace as fast as I could rush, turned the corner and came full in sight. But it was in sight of nothing now. My visitor 
had vanished. I stopped, I almost dropped with the real relief of this, but I took in the whole scene. I gave him time to reappear. I call it time, but how long was it? I can't speak to the purpose today of the duration of these things. That kind of measure must have left me. They couldn't have lasted as they actually appeared to me to last. The terrace and the whole place, the lawn and the garden beyond it, all I could see of the park were empty, with a great emptiness. There were shrubberies and big trees, but I remember the clear assurance I felt that none of them concealed him. He was there, or was not there, not there if I didn't see him. I got hold of this, then instinctively, instead of returning as I had come, went to the window. It was confusedly present to me that I ought to place myself where he had stood. I did so. I applied my face to the pane and looked, as he had looked, into the room. As if at this moment, to show me exactly what his range had been, Mrs. Gross, as I had done for himself just before, came in from the hall. With this, I had the full image of a repetition of what had already occurred. She saw me as I had seen my own visitant. She pulled up short, as I had done. I gave her something of the shock that I received. She turned white, and this made me ask myself if I had blanched as much. She stared in short and retreated on just my lines, and I knew she had then passed out and come round to me, and that I should presently meet her. I remained where I was, and while I waited, I thought of more things than one, but there's only one I take space dimension. I wondered why she should be scared. Chapter 5 Oh, she let me know as soon as round the corner of the house she loomed again into view. What in the name of goodness is the matter? She was now flushed and out of breath. I said nothing till she came quite near. With me? I must have made a wonderful face. Do I show it? You're white as a sheet, you look awful. I considered I could meet on this without scruple any innocence. My need to respect the bloom of Mrs. Gross's had dropped without a rustle from my shoulders, and if I wavered for the instant, it was not with what I kept back. I put out my hand to her and she took it. I held her heart a little, liking to feel her close to me. There was a kind of support in the shy heave of her surprise. You came for me for church, of course, but I can't go. Has anything happened? Yes, you must know now. Did I look very queer? To this window? Dreadful. Well, I said, I've been frightened. Mrs. Gross's eyes expressed plainly that she had no wish to be, yet also that she knew too well her place not to be ready to share with me any marked inconvenience. Oh, it was quite settled that she must share. Just what you saw from the dining room a minute ago was the effect of that. What I saw before was much worse. Her hand tightened. What was it? An extraordinary man, looking in. What extraordinary man? I haven't the least idea. Mrs. Gross gazed round us in vain. Then where is he gone? I know still less. Have you seen him before? Yes, once, on the old tower. She could only look at me harder. Do you mean he's a stranger? Oh, very much. Yet you didn't tell me. No, for reasons, but now that you've guessed. Mrs. Gross's round eyes encountered this charge. I haven't guessed, she said very simply. How can I if you don't imagine? I don't in the very least. You've seen him nowhere but on the tower, and on this spot just now. Mrs. Gross looked round again. What was he doing on the tower? Only standing there and looking down at me. She thought a minute. Was he a gentleman? I found I had no need to think. No. She gazed in deeper wonder. No. Then nobody about the place, nobody from the village. Nobody, nobody. I didn't tell you, but I made sure. She breathed a vague relief. This was oddly so much to the good. It only went indeed a little way. But if he isn't a gentleman, what is he? He's a horror. A horror? He's, God help me if I know what he is. Mrs. Gross looked round once more. She fixed her eyes on the duskier distance, then pulling herself together, turned to me with abrupt inconsequence. It's time we should be at church. Oh, I'm not fit for church. Won't it do you good? It won't do them, I nodded at the house. The children, I can't leave them now. You're afraid, I spoke boldly. I'm afraid of him. 
Mrs. Gross's large face showed me at this, for the first time, a faraway faint glimmer of a consciousness more acute. I somehow made out in it the delayed dawn of an idea I myself had not given her, and that was as yet quite obscure to me. It comes back to me that I thought instantly of this as something I could get from her, and I felt it to be connected with the desire she presently showed to know more. When was it? On the tower. About the middle of the month, uh, at this same hour. Almost the dark, said Mrs. Gross. Oh, no, not nearly. I saw him as I see you. Then how did he get in? And how did he get out? I laughed. I had no opportunity to ask him. This evening, you see, I pursued, he has not been able to get in. He only peeps. I hope it'll be confined to that. She had now let go of my hand. She turned away a little. I waited an instant, then I brought out, Go to church. Goodbye. I must watch. Slowly she faced me again. Do you fear for them? We met in another long look. Don't you? Instead of answering, she came nearer to the window and for a minute applied her face to the glass. You see how he could see, I meanwhile went on. She didn't move. How long was he here? Till I came out, I came to meet him. Mrs. Gross at last turned round, and there was still more in her face. I couldn't have come out. Neither could I, I laughed again, but I did come. I have my duty. So have I mine, she replied, after which she added, What's he like? I've been dying to tell you, but he's like nobody. N nobody, she echoed. He has no heart. Then seeing in her face that she already in this, with a deeper dismay, found a touch of picture, I quickly added stroke to stroke. He has a red hair, very close, close curling, and a pale face, long in shape, with straight, good features, and a little, rather queer whiskers that are as red as his hair. His eyebrows are somehow darker. They look particularly arched, and as if they might move a good deal. His eyes are sharp, strange, awfully, but I only know clearly that they're rather small and very fixed. His mouth's wide and his lips are thin, and except for his little whiskers, he's quite clean-shaven. He gives me a sort of sense of looking like an actor. An actor? It was impossible to resemble one less, at least, than Mrs. Gross at that moment. I've never seen one, but I suppose them. He's tall, active, erect, I continued, but never, no, never a gentleman. My companion's face had blanched as I went on. Her round eyes started, and her mild mouth gaped. A gentleman, she gasped, confounded, stupefied. A gentleman, he. You know him, then? She visibly tried to hold herself. But he's handsome. I saw the way to help her. Remarkably. And dressed? In somebody's clothes. They're smart, but they're not his own. She broke into a breathless affirmative groan. They're the masters. I caught it up. Do you know him? She faltered but a second. Quint, she cried. Quint? Peter Quint, his own man, his valet, when he was here. When the master was. Gaping still but meeting me, she pieced it all together. He never wore his hair, but he did wear, well, there were waistcoats missed. They were both here last year, then the master went and Quint was alone. I faltered but halting a little. Alone? Alone with us, then as from a deeper depth. In charge, she added. And what became of him? She hung fire so long that I was still more mystified. He went too, she brought out at last. Went where? Her expression at this became extraordinary. God knows where. He died. Died? I almost shrieked. She seemed fairly to square herself, plant herself more firmly to utter the wonder of it. Yes, Mr. Quint is dead. Chapter 6 It took, of course, more than that particular passage to place us together in presence of what we now had to live with as we could. My dreadful liability to impressions of the order so vividly exemplified, my companion's knowledge henceforth a knowledge half consternation and half compassion of that liability. There had been this evening, after the revelation left me for an hour so prostrate, there had been for either of us no attendance on any service, but a little service of tears and vows, of prayers and promises, 
a climax to the series of mutual challenges and pledges that had straightway ensued on our retreating together to the schoolroom and shutting ourselves up there to have everything out. The result of our having everything out was simply to reduce our situation to the last rigor of its elements. She herself had seen nothing, not the shadow of a shadow, and nobody in the house but the governess was in the governess's plight. Yet she accepted, without directly impugning my sanity, the truth as I gave it to her, and ended by showing me on this ground an awe-stricken tenderness. An expression of the sense of my more than questionable privilege, of which the very breath has remained with me as that of the sweetest of human charities. What was settled between us accordingly that night was that we thought we might bear things together, and I wasn't even sure that in spite of her exemption it was she who had the best of the burden. I knew at this hour, I think, as well as I knew later, what I was capable of meeting to shelter my pupils, but it took me some time to be wholly sure of what my honest ally was prepared for to keep terms with so compromising a contract. It was queer company enough, quite as queer as the company I received, but as I trace over what we went through, I see how much common ground we much have found in the one idea that by good fortune could steady us. It was the idea, the second movement, that led me straight out, as I may say, of the inner chamber of my dread. I could take the air in the court, at least, and there Mrs. Gross could join me. Perfectly can I recall now the particular way strength came to me before we separated for the night. We had gone over and over every feature of what I had seen. He was looking for someone else, you say. Someone who was not you. He was looking for little miles. A portentous clearness now possessed me. That's whom he was looking for. But how do you know? I know, I know, I know. My exaltation grew, and you know, my dear. She didn't deny this, but I required I felt not even so much telling as that. She resumed in a moment at any rate. What if he should see him? Little Miles, that's what he wants. She looked immensely scared again. The child, heaven forbid, the man. He wants to appear to them. That he might was an awful conception, and yet somehow I could keep it at bay, which moreover, as we lingered there, was what I succeeded in practically proving. I had an absolute certainty that I should see again what I had already seen. But something within me said that by offering myself bravely as the sole subject of such experience, by accepting, by inviting, by surmounting it all, I should serve as an expiatory victim and guard the tranquility of my companions. The children in especial I should fence about and absolutely save. I recall one of the last things I said that night to Mrs. Gross. It does strike me that my pupils have never mentioned. She looked at me hard as I musingly pulled up. His having been here and the time they were with him. The time they were with him and his name, his presence, his history, in any way. Oh, the little lady doesn't remember. She never heard on you. The circumstances of his death, I thought with some intensity. Perhaps not, but Miles would remember. Miles would know. Ah, oh, don't try him, broke from Mrs. Gross. I returned the look she had given me. Don't be afraid, I continued to think. It is rather odd that he's never spoken of him. Never by the least illusion. And you tell me they were great friends. Oh, it wasn't him, Mrs. Gross, with emphasis declared. It was Quint's own fancy. To play with him, I mean, to spoil him. She paused a moment, then she added, Quint was much too free. This gave me, straight from my vision of his face, such a face, a sudden sickness of disgust. Too free with my boy. Too free with everyone. I forbore for the moment to analyze this description further than by the reflection that a part of it applied to several of the members of the household, of the half-dozen maids and men who were still of our small colony. But there was everything for our apprehension in the lucky fact that no discomfortable legend, no perturbation of scullions had ever within anyone's memory attached to the kind old place. It had neither bad name nor ill fame. Mrs. Gross most apparently only desired to cling to me and to quake in silence. Even put her, the very last thing of all, to the test. 
It was when, at midnight, she had her hand on the schoolroom door to take leave. I have it from you then, for it's of great importance that he was definitely and admittedly bad. Oh, well, not admittedly. I knew it, but the master didn't. And you never told him. Well, he didn't like tail-bearing. He hated complaints. He was terribly short with anything of that kind. And if people were all right to him, he wouldn't be bothered with more. This squared well enough my impressions of him. He was not a trouble-loving gentleman, nor so very particular, perhaps, about some of the company he kept. All the same, I pressed my interlocutoress. I promise you, I would have told. She felt my discrimination. I dare say I was wrong, but really, I was afraid. Afraid of what? Of things that man could do. Quint was so clever. He was so deep. I took this in still more than probably I showed. You weren't afraid of anything else, not of his effect. His effect, she repeated with a face of anguish and waiting while I faltered. On innocent little precious lives. They were in your charge. No, they were not in mine, she roundly and distressfully returned. The master believed in him and placed him here because he was supposed to not be well with the country air so good for him. So he had everything to say. Yes, she let me have it, even about them. Them, that creature. I had to smother a kind of howl, and how could you bear it? No, I couldn't, and I can't now. And the poor woman burst into tears. A rigid control from the next day was, as I have said, to follow them. Yet how often and how passionately for a week we came back together to the subject, much as we had discussed it that Sunday night. I was in the immediate later hours in a special, for it may be imagined whether I slept, still haunted with the shadow of something she had not told me. I myself had kept back nothing, but there was a word Mrs. Gross had kept back. I was sure, moreover, by morning, that this was not from a failure of frankness, but because on every side there were fears. It seemed to me, in retrospect, that by the time the morrow's sun was high, I had restlessly read into the fact before us almost all the meaning they were to receive from subsequent and more cruel occurrences. What they gave me, above all, was just the sinister figure of the living man, the dead one, would keep a while and of the months he had continuously passed at Bly, which added up made a formidable stretch. The limit of this evil time had arrived only when, on the dawn of a winter's morning, Peter Quint was found by a laborer going to early work, stone dead, on the road from the village. The catastrophe explained, superficially at least, by a visible wound to his head. Such a wound as might have been produced, and as on the final evidence had been, by a fatal slip in the dark, and after leaving the public house on a steepish, icy slope, a wrong path altogether, at the bottom of which he lay. The icy slope, the turn mistaken at night and in liquor, accounted for much. Practically in the end, and after the inquest and boundless chatter, for everything. But there had been matters in his life, strange passages and perils, secret disorders, vices more than suspected, that would have accounted for a great deal more. I scarce know how to put my story into words which will be a credible picture of my state of mind, but I was in these days literally able to find a joy in the extraordinary flight of heroism the occasion demanded of me. I now saw that I had been asked for a service admirable and difficult, and there would be a greatness in letting it be seen, oh, in the right quarter, that I could succeed where many another girl might have failed. It was an immense help to me, I confess I rather applaud myself as I look back, that I saw my service so strongly and so simply. I was there to protect and defend the little creatures in the world, the most bereaved and the most lovable. The appeal of whose helplessness had suddenly become only too explicit, the deep, constant ache of one's own committed heart. We were cut off, really, together. We were united in our danger. They had nothing but me, and I, well, I had them. It was, in short, a magnificent chance. This chance presented itself to me in an image richly material. I was a screen. I was to stand before them. The more I saw, the less they would. 
I began to watch them in a stifled suspense, a disguised excitement that might well, had it continued too long, have turned to something like madness. What saved me, as I now see, was that it turned to something else altogether. It didn't last the suspense. It was superseded by horrible proofs. Proofs, I say, yes. From the moment I really took hold. This moment dated from an afternoon hour that I happened to spend in the grounds with the younger of my pupils alone. We had left Miles indoors, on the red cushion of a deep window seat. He had wished to finish a book, and I had been glad to encourage the purpose so laudable in a young man whose only defect was an occasional excess of the restless. His sister, on the contrary, had been alert to come out, and I strolled with her half an hour, seeking the shade, for the sun was still high and the day exceptionally warm. I was aware afresh with her as we went of how like her brother she contrived. It was the charming thing in both children to let me alone without appearing to drop me and to accompany me without appearing to surround. They were never importunate and yet never listless. My attention to them all really went to seeing them amuse themselves immensely without me. This was a spectacle they seemed actively to prepare and that engaged me as an active admirer. I walked in a world of their invention. They had no occasion whatever to draw upon mine, so that my time was taken only with being, for them, some remarkable personal thing that the game of the moment required, and that was merely, thanks to my superior, my exalted stamp, a happy and highly distinguished sinecure. I forget what I was on that present occasion, I only remember that I was something very important and very quiet, and that Flora was playing very hard. We were on the edge of the lake, and as we had lately begun geography, the lake was the Sea of Azov. Suddenly, in these circumstances, I became aware that on the other side of the Sea of Azov, we had an interested spectator. The way this knowledge gathered in me was the strangest thing in the world, the strangest, that is, except the very much stranger in which it quickly merged itself. I had sat down with a piece of work, for I was something or other that could sit on the old stone bench which overlooked the pond, and in this position I began to take in with certitude and yet without direct vision the presence at a distance of a third person. The old trees, the thick shrubbery made a great and pleasant shade, but it was all suffused with the brightness of the hot still hour. There was no ambiguity in anything, none whatever at least in the conviction I, from one moment to another, found myself forming as to what I should see straight before me and across the lake as a consequence of raising my eyes. They were attached at this juncture to the stitching which I was engaged, and I could feel once more the spasm of my effort not to move them till I should so have steadied myself as to be able to make up my mind what to do. There was an alien object in view, a figure whose right of presence I instantly, passionately questioned. I recollect counting over perfectly the possibilities, reminding myself that nothing was more natural, for instance, than the appearance of one of the men about the place, or even of a messenger, a postman, or a tradesman's boy from the village. That reminder had as little effect on my practical certitude as I was conscious, still, even without looking, of its having upon the character and attitude of our visitor. Nothing was more natural than that these things should be the other things they absolutely were not. Of the positive identity of the apparition, I would assure myself as soon as a small clock of my courage should have ticked out the right second. Meanwhile, with an effort that was already sharp enough, I transferred my eyes straight to little Flora, who at the moment was about ten yards away. My heart had stood still for an instant with the wonder and the terror of the question whether she too would see. And I held my breath while I waited for what a cry from her, what some sudden innocent sign either of interest or of alarm would tell me. I waited, but nothing came. Then, in the first place, and there is something more dire in this I feel than in anything I have to relate, I was determined by a sense that within a minute, all sounds from her had previously dropped. And in the second, by the circumstance, also within the minute, she had in her play turned her back to the water. This was her attitude when I at last looked at her, looked with the confirmed conviction that we were still together under direct personal notice. 
Chi had picked up a small flat piece of wood, which happened to have in it a little hole that had evidently suggested to her the idea of sticking in another fragment that might figure as a mast and make the thing a boat. This second morsel, as I watched her, she was very markedly and intently attempting to tighten in its place. My apprehension of what she was doing sustained me, so that after some seconds, I felt I was ready for more. Then, I again shifted my eyes. I faced what I had to face. That was the end of the first part of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, read by Tony Walker. There's plenty more to come. We're probably about a quarter of the way through, so I will post the next part very soon. The Turn of the Screw, written by Henry James and narrated by Tony Walker, part two. Mrs. Gross as soon after this as I could, and I can give no intelligible account of how I fought out the interval. Yet I still hear myself cry as I fairly threw myself into her arms. They know. It's too monstrous. They know. They know. And what on earth? I felt her incredulity as she held me. Why, all that we know, and heaven knows what else besides. Then, as she released me, I made it out to her. Made it out, perhaps, only now with full coherency, even to myself. Two hours ago in the garden, I could scarce articulate. Flora saw. Mrs. Gross took it as she might have taken a blow in the stomach. She's told you, she panted. Not a word, that's the horror. She kept it to herself. The child of eight, that child. Unutterable still for me was the stupefaction of it. Mrs. Gross, of course, could only gape the wider. Then how do you know? I was there. I saw with my eyes. Saw that she was perfectly aware. Do you mean aware of him? No, of her. I was conscious as I spoke that I looked prodigious things, for I got the slow reflection of them in my companion's face. Another person this time, but a figure of quite as unmissable horror and evil. A woman in black, pale and dreadful, with such an air also and such a face. On the other side of the lake, I was there with the child, quiet for the hour, and in the midst of it she came. Came how? From where? from where they come from. She just appeared and stood there, but not so near, and without coming nearer. Oh, for the effect and the feeling, she might have been as close as you. My friend, with an odd impulse, fell back a step. Was she someone you've never seen? Yes, but someone the child has, someone you have. Then to show how I had thought it all out, my predecessor, the one who died, Miss Jessel. Miss Jessel, you don't believe me? I pressed. She turned right and left in her distress. How can you be sure? This drew from me, in the state of my nerves, a flash of impatience. Then ask Flora, she's sure. But I had no sooner spoken than I caught myself up. No, for God's sake, don't. She'll say she isn't. She'll lie. Mrs. Gross was not too bewildered instinctively to protest. Ah, how can you? Because I'm clear Flora doesn't want me to know. It's only then to spare you. No, no, there are depths, depths. The more I go over it, the more I see in it, and the more I see in it, the more I fear. I don't know what I don't see, what I don't fear. Mrs. Gross tried to keep up with me. Y you mean you're afraid of seeing her again? Oh, no, that's nothing now. Then I explained. It's of not seeing her. But my companion only looked one. I, I don't understand you. Well, it's that the child may keep it up and that the child assuredly will without my knowing it. At the image of this possibility, Mrs. Gross for a moment collapsed, yet presently to pull herself together again, as if from the positive force of the sense of what should we yield an inch there would really be to give way to. Dear, dear, we must keep our heads. And after all, if she doesn't mind it, she even tried a grim joke. <laughs> Perhaps she likes it. 
likes such things, the scrap of an infant. It isn't it just a proof of her blessed innocence, my friend bravely inquired. She brought me for the instant almost round. Oh, we must clutch at that, we must cling to it. If it isn't a proof of what you say, it's a proof of God knows what. But the woman's a horror of horrors. Mrs. Gross at this fixed her eyes a minute on the ground, then at last raising them. Tell me how you know, she said. Then you admit it's what she was, I cried. Tell me how you know, my friend simply repeated. No, by seeing her, by the way she looked. At you, do you mean, so wickedly? Dear me, no, I could have borne that. She gave me never a glance. She only fixed the child. Mrs. Gross tried to see it. Fixed her? Oh, with such awful eyes. She stared at mine as if they might really have resembled them. Do you mean of dislike? God help us know her of something much worse. Worse than dislike. This left her indeed at a loss. With a determination indescribable. With a kind of fury of intention. I made her turn pale. Intention? To get hold of her. Mrs. Gross, her eyes just lingering on mine, gave a shudder and walked to the window. And while she stood there looking out, I completed my statement. That's what Flora knows. After a little, she turned round. The person was in black, you say. In mourning, rather poor, almost shabby, but yes, with extraordinary beauty. I now recognized what I had at last, stroke by stroke, brought the victim of my confidence. For she quite visibly weighed this. Oh, handsome, very, very, I insisted. Wonderfully handsome, but infamous. She slowly came back to me. Miss Jessel was infamous. She once more took my hand in both her own, holding it as tight as if to fortify me against the increase of alarm I might draw from this disclosure. They were both infamous, she finally said. So, for a little while, we faced it once more together, and I found absolutely a degree of help in seeing it now so straight. I appreciate, I said, the great decency of your not having hitherto spoken, but the time has certainly come to give me the whole thing. She appeared to assent to this, but still only in silence, seeing which I went on. I must have it now. Of what did she die? Come, there was something between them. There was everything. In spite of the difference, oh, of their rank, their condition, she brought it woefully out. She was a lady. I turned it over. I again saw, yes, she was a lady. And he so dreadfully below, said Mrs. Gross. I felt that I doubtless needn't press too hard in such company on the place of a servant in a scale. But there was nothing to prevent an acceptance of my companion's own measure of my predecessor's abasement. There was a way to deal with that, and I dealt the more readily for my full vision on the evidence of our employer's late, clever, good-looking, own man, impudent, assured, spoiled, depraved. The fellow was a hound. Mrs. Gross considered, as if it were perhaps a little a case for the sense of shades. I have never seen one like him. He did what he wished, with her, with them all. It was as if now, in my friend's own eyes, Miss Jessel had again appeared. It seemed, at any rate, for an instant, to see their evocation of her as distinctly as I had seen her by the pond. And I brought out with decision, it must have been also what she wished. Mrs. Gross' face signified that it had been indeed. But she said at the same time, poor woman, she paid for it. Then you do know what she died of, I asked. No, I know nothing. I wanted not to know. I was glad enough I didn't, and I thanked heaven she was well out of this. Yet you had then your idea of her real reason for leaving. Oh yes, as to that, she couldn't have stayed. Fancy it here for a governess. And afterward I imagined, and I still imagine, and what I imagine is dreadful. Not so dreadful as what I do, I replied, on which I must have shown her, as I was indeed but too conscious, a front of miserable defeat. It brought out again all her compassion for me, and at the renewed touch of her kindness, my power to resist broke down. I burst, as I had the other time, and made her burst into tears. She took me to her motherly breast, and my lamentation overflowed. I don't do it, I sobbed in despair. I don't save or shield them. It's far worse than I dream. They're lost.
chapter 8. What I had said to Mrs. Gross was true enough. They were in the matter I had put before her depths and possibilities that I lacked resolution to sound, so that when we met once more in the wonder of it, we were of a common mind about the duty of resistance to extravagant fancies. We were to keep our heads if we should keep nothing else, difficult indeed as that might be in the face of what, in our prodigious experience, was least to be questioned. Late that night, while the house slept, we had another talk in my room, when she went all the way with me as to its being beyond doubt that I had seen exactly what I had seen. To hold her perfectly in the pinch of that, I found I had only to ask her how, if I had made it up, I came to be able to give of each of the persons appearing to me the picture disclosing to the last detail their special marks, a portrait on the exhibition of which she had instantly recognized and named them. She wished, of course, small blame to her, to sink the whole subject, and I was quick to assure her that my own interest in it had now violently taken the form of a search for the way to escape from it. I encountered her on the ground of a probability that with the recurrence, for recurrence we took for granted, I should get used to my danger, distinctly professing that my personal exposure had suddenly become the least of my discomforts. It was my new suspicion that was intolerable, and yet even to this complication the later hours of the day had brought a little ease. On leaving her after my first outbreak, I had, of course, returned to my pupils, associating the right remedy for my dismay with that sense of their charm, which I had already found to be a thing I could positively cultivate, which had never failed me yet. I had simply, in other words, plunged afresh into Flora's special society, and there become aware, it was almost a luxury, that she could put her little conscious hand straight upon the spot that ached. She had looked at me in sweet speculation, and then had accused me to my face of having cried. I had supposed I had brushed away the ugly sins, but I could literally, for the time at all events, rejoice under this fathomless charity that they had not entirely disappeared. To gaze into the depths of blue of the child's eyes and pronounce their loveliness a trick of premature cunning was to be guilty of a cynicism in preference to which I naturally preferred to abjure my judgment and so far as might be my agitation. I couldn't abjure for merely wanting to, but I could repeat to Mrs. Gross, as I did there over and over in the small hours, that with their voices in the air, their pressure on one's heart, and their fragrant faces against one's cheek, everything fell to the ground but their incapacity and their beauty. It was a pity that somehow, to settle this once for all, I had equally to re-enumerate the signs of subtlety that in the afternoon, by the lake, had made a miracle of my show of self-possession. It was a pity to be obliged to reinvestigate the certitude of the moment itself and repeat how it had come to me as a revelation that the inconceivable communion I then surprised was a matter for either party of habit. It was a pity that I should have had to quaver out again the reasons for my not having in my delusion so much as questioned that the little girl saw our visitant even as I actually saw Mrs. Gross herself, and that she wanted, by just so much as she did thus see, to make me suppose she didn't, and at the same time, without showing anything, arrive at a guess as to whether I myself did. It was a pity that I needed once more to describe the portentous little activity by which she sought to divert my attention, the perceptible increase of movement, the greater intensity of play, the singing, the gabbling of nonsense, and the invitation to romp. Yet, if I had not indulged, to prove there was nothing in it in this review, I should have missed the two or three dim elements of comfort that still remain to me. I should not, for instance, have been able to asseverate to my friend that I was certain, which was so much for the good, that I at least had not betrayed myself. I should have not have been prompted by stress of need, by desperation of mind, I scarce know what to call it, to invoke such further aid to my intelligence as might spring from pushing my colleague fairly to the wall. She had told me, bit by bit, under pressure, a great deal, but a small, shifty spot on the wrong side of it all still sometimes brushed my brow like the wing of a bat. And I remember how on this occasion, of the sleeping house and the concentration of a like of our danger and our watch seemed to help. I felt the importance of giving the last jerk to the curtain. I don't believe anything so horrible, I recollect saying, 
No, let us put it definitely, my dear, that I don't. But if I did, you know, there's a thing I should require now, just without sparing you the least bit more. Oh, not a scrap. Come, to get out of you. What was it you had in mind when our distress before Miles came back over the letter from his school you said under my insistence that you didn't pretend for him that he had not ever literally ever been bad? He has not literally ever in these weeks that I myself have lived with him and so closely watched him, he has been an imperturbable little prodigy of delightful, lovable goodness. Therefore, you might perfectly have made the claim for him if you had not, as it happened, seen an exception to take. What was your exception? And to what passage in your personal observation of him did you refer? It was a dreadfully austere inquiry, but levity was not our note. And at any rate, before the grey dawn admonished us to separate, I had got my answer. What my friend had in mind proved to be immensely to the purpose. It was neither more nor less than the circumstance that for a period of several months Quint and the boy had been perpetually together. It was in fact the very appropriate truth that she had ventured to criticize the propriety, to hint at the incongruity of so close an alliance, and even go so far on the subject as a frank overture to Miss Jessel. Miss Jessel had, with a most strange manner, requested her to mind her business, and the good woman had, on this, directly approached little Miles. What she had said to him, since I pressed, was that she liked to see young gentlemen not forget their station. I pressed again, of course, at this. He reminded him that Quint was only a base menial, as you might say. And it was his answer, for one thing, that was bad, and for another thing I waited. He repeated your words to Quint. No, not that. It's just what he wouldn't. She could still impress upon me. I was sure at any rate, she added, that he didn't. But he denied certain occasions. What occasions? When they had been out about together, quite as if Quint were his tutor and a very grand one, and Miss Jessel only for the little lady, when he had gone off with the fellow, I mean, and spent hours with him, he then prevaricated about it. He said that he hadn't. Her assent was clear enough to cause me to add in a moment, I see. He lied. Oh, Mrs. Gross mumbled. This was a suggestion that it didn't matter, which indeed she backed up by a further remark. You see, after all, Miss Jessel didn't mind. She didn't forbid him. I considered, did he put that to you as a justification? At this, she dropped again. No, he never spoke of it. Never mentioned her in connection with Quint. She saw, visibly flushing, where I was coming out. Well, he didn't show anything. He denied, she repeated. He denied. Lord, how I pressed her now. So that you could see he knew what was between the two wretches. I don't know, I don't know, the poor woman groaned. You do know, you dear thing, I replied. Only you haven't my dreadful boldness of mind, and you keep back out of timidity and modesty and delicacy, even the impression that in the past when you had, without my aid, to flounder about in silence, most of all made you miserable. But I shall get it out of you yet. There was something in the boy that suggested to you, I continued, that he covered and concealed their relation. Oh, he couldn't prevent. You're learning the truth, I dare say. But heavens, I fell with vehemence of thinking. What it shows that they must, to that extent, have succeeded in making of him. Ah, uh, nothing that's not nice now, Mrs. Gross lugubriously pleaded. I don't wonder you look queer, I persisted, when I mentioned to you the letter from his school. I doubt if I looked as queer as you, she retorted with homely force. And if he was so bad then as that comes to, how is he such an angel now? Yes, indeed, and if he was a fiend at school, how, how, how? Well, I said in my torment, you must put it to me again, but I shall not be able to tell you for some days. Only put it to me again. I cried in a way that made my friend stare. There are directions in which I must not for the present let myself go. Meanwhile, I returned to her first example, the one to which she had just previously referred, of the boy's happy capacity for an occasional slip. If Quint, on your remonstrance at the time you speak of, was a base menial, one of the things Miles said to you, I find myself guessing, was that you were another. Again, her admission was so adequate that I continued. And you forgave him that, wouldn't you? Oh, yes. And we exchanged there in the stillness a sound of the oddest amusement. Then I went on. At all events, 
while he was with the man. Miss Flora was with the woman. It suited them all. It suited me too, I felt only too well. By which I mean that it suited exactly the particularly deadly view I was in the very act of forbidding myself to entertain. But I so far succeeded in checking the expression of this view that I will throw just here no further light on it than may be offered by the mention of my final observation to Mrs. Gross. His having lied and being impudent are, I confess, less engaging specimens than I had hoped to have from you at the outbreak in him of the little natural man. Still, I'm used. They must do, for they make me feel more than ever that I must watch. It made me blush the next minute to see in my friend's face how much more unreservedly she had forgiven him than her anecdote struck me as presenting to my own tenderness an occasion for doing. This came out when at the schoolroom door she quitted me. Surely you don't accuse him of carrying on an intercourse that he conceals from me. I remember that until further evidence I now accuse nobody. Then, before shutting her out to go by another passage to her own place, I must just wait, I wound up. Chapter 9 I waited and waited, and the days as they elapsed took something from my consternation. A very few of them, in fact, passing in constant sight of my pupils without a fresh incident, sufficed to give to grievous fancies and even to odious memories a kind of brush of the sponge. I have spoken of the surrender to their extraordinary childish grace as a thing I could actively cultivate, and it may be imagined, if I neglected now to address myself to this source, or whatever it would yield. Stranger than I can express, certainly, was the effort to struggle against my new lights. It would doubtless have been, however, a great attention still, had it not been so frequently successful. I used to wonder how my little charges could help guessing that I thought strange things about them, and the circumstances that these things only made them more interesting was not by itself a direct aid to keeping them in the dark. I trembled lest they should see that they were so immensely more interesting Putting things at the worst, at all events, as in meditation, I so often did, any clouding of their innocence could only be, blameless and foredoomed as they were, a reason the more for taking risks. There were moments when, by an irresistible impulse, I found myself catching them up and pressing them to my heart. As soon as I had done so, I used to say to myself, what will I think of that? Doesn't it betray too much? It would have been easy to get into a sad, wild tangle about how much I might betray, but the real account, I feel, of the hours of peace that I could still enjoy was that the immediate charm of my companions was a beguilement still effective, even under the shadow of the possibility that it was studied. For, if it occurred to me that I might occasionally excite suspicion by the little outbreaks of my sharper passion for them, so too I remember wondering if I mightn't see a queerness in the traceable increase of their own demonstrations. They were at this period extravagantly and preternaturally fond of me, which, after all I could reflect, was no more than a graceful response in children perpetually bowed over and hugged. The homage of which they were so lavish succeeded, in truth for my nerves quite as well as if I never appeared to myself, as I may say, literally to catch them at a purpose in it. They had never, I think, wanted to do so many things for their poor protectress. I mean, though they got their lessons better and better, which was naturally what would please her most, in the way of diverting, entertaining, surprising her, reading her passages, telling her stories, acting her charades, pouncing out at her in disguises as animals and historical characters, and above all, by astonishing her by the pieces they had secretly got by heart and could interminably recite. I should never get to the bottom, were I to let myself go even now, of the prodigious private commentary, all under still more private correction, with which, in these days, I overscored their full hours. They had shown me, from the first, a facility for everything, a general faculty which, taking a fresh start, achieved remarkable flights. They got their little tasks as if they loved them, 
and indulge from the mere exuberance of the gift in the most unimposed little miracles of memory. They not only popped out at me as tigers and as Romans, but as Shakespeareans, astronomers and navigators. This was so singularly the case that they had presumably much to do with the fact as to which, at the present day, I am at a loss for a different explanation. I allude to my unnatural composure on the subject of another school for miles. What I remember is that I was content not, for the time, to open the question, and that contentment must have sprung from the sense of his perpetually striking show of cleverness. He was too clever for a bad governess, for a parson's daughter to spoil. And the strangest, if not the brightest thread in the pensive embroidery I just spoke of was the impression I might have got, if I had dared to work it out, that he was under some influence operating in his small intellectual life as a tremendous incitement. If it was easy to reflect, however, that such a boy could postpone school, it was at least as marked that for such a boy to have been kicked out by a schoolmaster was a mystification without end. Let me add that in their company now, and I was careful almost never to be out of it, I could follow no scent very far. We lived in a cloud of music and love and success and private theatricals. The musical sense in each of the children was of the quickest, but the elder, in especial, had a marvellous knack of catching and repeating. The schoolroom piano broke into all gruesome fancies, and when that failed, there were confabulations in corners, with a sequel of one of them going out in the higher spirits in order to come in as something new. I had had brothers myself, and it was no revelation to me that little girls could be slavish idolaters of little boys. What surpassed everything was that there was a little boy in the world who could have for the inferior age, sex and intelligence so fine a consideration. They were extraordinarily at one, and to say that they never either quarrelled or complained is to make the note of praise coarse for their quality of sweetness. Sometimes indeed, when I dropped into coarseness, I perhaps came across traces of little understandings between them by which one of them should keep me occupied while the other slipped away. There is a naive side, I suppose, in all diplomacy, but if my pupils practised upon me, it was surely with the minimum of grossness. It was all in the other quarter that after a lull, the grossness broke out. I find that I really hang back, but I must take my plunge. In going on with the record of what was hideous at Bly, I not only challenged the most liberal faith for which I little care, but this is another matter. I renew what I myself suffered. I again push my way through it to the end. There came suddenly an hour after which, as I look back, the affair seems to me to have been all pure suffering, but I have at least reached the heart of it, and the straightest road out is doubtless to advance. One evening, with nothing to lead up or to prepare it, I felt the cold touch of the impression that had breathed on me the night of my arrival, and which much lighter then, as I have mentioned, I should probably have made little of in memory had my subsequent sojourn been less agitated. I had not gone to bed. I sat reading by a couple of candles. There was a room full of old books at Bly, last century fiction, some of it, which, to the extent of a distinctly deprecated renown, but never, to so much as that of a stray specimen, had reached the sequestered home and appealed to the unavowed curiosity of my youth. I remember that the book I had in my hand was Fielding's Amelia, and also that I was wholly awake. I recall further both the general conviction that it was horribly late and a particular objection to looking at my watch. I figure, finally, that the white curtain draping in the fashion of those days, the head of Flora's little bed, shrouded, as I had assured myself long before, the perfection of childish rest. I recollect, in short, that though I was deeply interested in my author, I found myself, at the turn of a page, and with his spell all scattered, looking straight up from him, and hard at the door of my room. There was a moment during which I listened, reminded of the faint sense I had had the first night of there being something undefinably astir in the house, and noted the soft breath of the open casement 
just moved, the half-drawn blind. Then, with all the marks of a deliberation that must have seemed magnificent had there been anyone to admire it, I laid down my book, rose to my feet, and taking a candle, went straight out of the room and from the passage, on which my light made little impression, noiselessly closed and locked the door. I can say now neither what determined nor what guided me, but I went straight along the lobby, holding my candle high, till I came within sight of the tall window that presided over the great turn of the staircase. At this point, I precipitately found myself aware of three things. They were practically simultaneous, yet they had flashes of succession. My candle under a bold flourish went out, and I perceived by the uncovered window that the yielding dusk of earliest morning rendered it unnecessary. Without it, the next instant I saw that there was someone on the stair. I speak of sequences, but I required no lapse of seconds to stiffen myself for a third encounter with Quint. The apparition had reached the landing halfway up and was therefore on the spot nearest the window, where at sight of me it stopped short and fixed me exactly as it had fixed me from the tower and from the garden. He knew me as well as I knew him, and so in the cold, faint twilight, with a glimmer in the high glass and another on the polish of the oak stair below, we faced each other in our common intensity. He was absolutely, on this occasion, a living, detestable, dangerous presence. But that was not the wonder of wonders. I reserved this distinction for quite another circumstance, the circumstance that dread that unmistakably quieted me, and that there was nothing in me there that didn't meet and measure him. I had plenty of anguish after that extraordinary moment, but I had, thank God, no terror, and he knew I had not. I found myself at the end of an instant magnificently aware of this. I felt, in a fierce rigor of confidence, that if I stood my ground a minute, I should cease, for the time at least, to have him to reckon with. And during the minute, accordingly, the thing was as human and hideous as a real interview, hideous just because it was human, as human as to have met alone in the small hours in a sleeping house some enemy, some adventurer, some criminal. It was the dead silence of our long gaze at such close quarters that gave the whole horror, huge as it was, its only note of the unnatural. If I had met a murderer in such a place and at such an hour, we still at least would have spoken. Something would have passed in life between us. If nothing had passed, one of us would have moved. The moment was so prolonged that it would have taken but a little more to make me doubt if even I were in life. I can't express what followed it, save by saying that silence itself, which was indeed in a manner an attestation of my strength, became the element into which I saw the figure disappear in which I definitely saw it turn, as I might have seen the low wretch to which it had once belonged turn and receipt of an order, and pass, with my eyes on the villainous back that no hunch could have more disfigured, straight down the staircase and into the darkness in which the next bend was lost. Chapter 10 I remained a while at the top of the stair, but with the effect presently of understanding that when my visitor had gone, he had gone. Then I returned to my room. The foremost thing I saw there by the light of the candle I had left burning was that Flora's little bed was empty, and on this I caught my breath with all the terror that five minutes before I had been able to resist. I dashed at the place in which I had left her lying and over which, for the small silk counterpane and the sheets were disarranged, the white curtains had been deceivingly pulled forward. Then, my step to my unutterable relief produced an answering sound. I perceived an agitation of the window blind, and the child, ducking down, emerged rosily from the other side of it. She stood there in so much of her candor and so little of her nightgown with her pink bare feet and the golden glow of her curls. She looked intensely grave, 
and I had never had such a sense of losing an advantage acquired, the thrill of which had just been so prodigious, as on my consciousness that she addressed me with a reproach. You naughty! Where have you been? Instead of challenging her own irregularity, I found myself arraigned and explaining. She herself explained for the matter with the loveliest eager simplicity. She had known suddenly as she lay there that I was out of the room and had jumped up to see what had become of me. I had dropped with the joy of her reappearance back into my chair, feeling then and then only a little faint. And she had pattered straight over to me, thrown herself upon my knee, given herself to be held with the flame of the candle full in the wonderful little face that was still flushed with sleep. I remember closing my eyes an instant, yieldingly, consciously, as before the excess of something beautiful that shone out of the blue of her own. You were looking for me out of the window, I said. You thought I might be walking in the grounds. Well, you know, I, I thought someone was. She never blanched as she smiled out that at me. Oh, how I looked at her now. And did you see anyone? Ah, no, she returned almost with the full privilege of childish inconsequence, resentfully, though, with a long sweetness and a little drawl of the negative. At that moment, in the state of my nerves, I absolutely believed she lied. And if I once more closed my eyes, it was before the dazzle of the three or four possible ways in which I might take this up. One of these, for a moment, tempted me with such singular intensity that to withstand it I must have gripped my little girl with a spasm that wonderfully she submitted to without a cry or a sign of fright. Why not break out at her on the spot and have it all over? Give it to her straight in her lovely little light face. You see, you see, you know that you do, and that you already quite suspect I believe it, therefore why not frankly confess it to me, so that we may at least live with it together and learn perhaps in the strangeness of our fate where we are and what it means. This solicitation dropped alas as it came to me. If I could immediately have succumbed to it, I might have spared myself. Well, you'll see what. Instead of succumbing, I sprang again to my feet, looked at her bed, and took a helpless middle way. Why did you pull the curtain over the place to make me think you were still there? Laura luminously considered, after which, with her divine little smile, because I don't like to frighten you. But if I had, by your idea, gone out, she absolutely declined to be puzzled. She turned her eyes to the flame of the candle as if the question were as irrelevant, or at any rate as impersonal, as Mrs. Marsett on nine times nine, Oh, but you know, she quite adequately answered, that you might come back, you dear, and that you have. And after a little while, when she had got into bed, I had for a long time, by almost sitting on her to hold her hand, to prove that I recognized the pertinence of my return. You may imagine the general complexion from that moment of my nights. I repeatedly sat up until I didn't know when. I selected moments when my roommate unmistakably slept and stealing out, took noiseless turns in the passage and even pushed as far to where I had last met Quint. But I never met him there again. And I may as well say at once that I on no other occasion saw him in the house. I just missed on the staircase, on the other hand, a different adventure. Looking down it from the top, I at once recognized the presence of a woman seated on one of the lower steps with her back presented to me, her body half bowed, and her head in an attitude of woe in her hands. I had been there but an instant, however, when she vanished without looking round at me. I knew, nonetheless, exactly what dreadful face she had to show, and I wondered whether, if instead of being above I had been below, I should have had for going up the same nerve I had lately shown Quint. Well, there continued to be plenty of chance for nerve. On the eleventh night, after my latest encounter with that gentleman, they were all numbered now. I had an alarm that perilously skirted it, and that indeed, from the particular quality of its unexpectedness, proved quite my sharpest shock. It was precisely the first night during this series that, weary with watching, I had felt that I might again without laxity lay myself down at my old hour. I slept immediately, and as I afterwards knew, 
till about one o'clock. But when I woke, it was to sit straight up, as completely roused as if a hand had shook me. I had left a light burning, but it was now out, and I felt an instant certainty that Flora had extinguished it. This brought me to my feet and straight in the darkness to her bed, which I found she had left. A glance at the window enlightened me further, and the striking of a match completed the picture. The child had again got up, this time blowing out the taper, and had again, for some purpose of observation or response, squeezed in behind the blind, and was peering out into the night. That she now saw, as she had not, I had satisfied myself the previous time, was proved to me by the fact that she was disturbed neither by my re-illumination nor by the haste I made to get into slippers and into a wrap. Hidden, protected, absorbed, she evidently rested on the sill. The casement opened forward and gave herself up. There was a great still moon to help her, and this fact had counted in my quick decision. She was face to face with the apparition we had met at the lake and could now communicate with it as she had not then been able to do. What I on my side had to care for was without disturbing her to reach from the corridor some other window in the same quarter. I got to the door without her hearing me. I got out of it, closed it, and listened from the other side for some sound from her. While I stood in the passage, I had my eyes on her brother's door, which was but ten steps off, and which indescribably produced in me a renewal of the strange impulse that I lately spoke of as my temptation. What if I should go straight in and march to his window? What if, by risking to his boyish bewilderment a revelation of my motive, I should throw across the rest of the mystery the long halter of my boldness? This thought held me sufficiently to make me cross to his threshold and pause again. I preternaturally listened. I figured to myself what might portentously be. I wondered if his bed were also empty and he too was secretly at watch. It was a deep, soundless minute, at the end of which my impulse failed. He was quiet. He might be innocent. The risk was hideous. I turned away. There was a figure in the grounds, a figure prowling for a sight, the visitor with whom Flora was engaged, but it was not the visitor most concerned with my boy. I hesitated afresh, but on other grounds and only for a few seconds. Then I had made my choice. There were empty rooms at Bly, and it was only a question of choosing the right one. The right one suddenly presented itself to me as the lower one, though high above the gardens, in the solid corner of the house that I have spoken of as the old tower. This was a large square chamber, arranged with some state as a bedroom, the extravagant size of which made it so inconvenient that it had not for years, though kept by Mrs. Gross in exemplary order, been occupied. I had often admired it, and I knew my way about in it. I had only, after just faltering at the first chill gloom of its disuse, to pass across it and unbolt as quietly as I could one of the shutters. Achieving this transit, I uncovered the glass without a sound, and applying my face to the pane was able, the darkness without being much less than within, to see that I commanded the right direction. Then I saw something more. The moon made the night extraordinarily penetrable and showed me on the lawn a person diminished my distance who stood there motionless and as if fascinated, looking up to where I had appeared, looking, that is, not so much straight at me as at something that was apparently above me. There was clearly another person above me. There was a person on the tower, but the presence on the lawn was not in the least what I had conceived and had confidently hurried to meet. The presence on the lawn, I felt sick as I met it out. It was poor little Miles himself. Chapter 11 It was not till late the next day that I spoke to Mrs. Gross. 
the rigor with which I kept my pupils in sight making it often difficult to meet her privately, and the more as we each felt the importance of not provoking on the part of the servants quite as much as on that of the children any suspicion of a secret flurry or that of a discussion of mysteries. I drew a great security in this particular from her mere smooth aspect. There was nothing in her fresh face to pass on to others my horrible confidences. She believed me, I was sure, absolutely. If she hadn't, I don't know what would have become of me, for I couldn't have borne the business alone. But she was a magnificent monument to the blessing of a want of imagination. And if she could see in our little charges nothing but their beauty and amiability, their happiness and cleverness, she had no direct communication with the sources of my trouble. If they had been at all visibly blighted or battered, she would doubtless have grown on tracing it back haggard enough to match them. As matters stood, however, I could feel her when she surveyed them with her large white arms folded and the habit of serenity in all her look. Thank the Lord's mercy that if they were ruined, the pieces would still serve. Flights of fancy gave place in her mind to a steady fireside glow, and I had already begun to perceive how, with the development of the conviction that, as time went on without a public accident, our young things could, after all, look out for themselves. She addressed her greatest solicitude to the sad case presented by their instructress. That, for myself, was a sound simplification. I could engage that to the world my face should tell no lies, but it would have been, in the conditions, an immense added strain to find myself anxious about hers. At the hour I now speak of, she had joined me under pressure on the terrace, where, with the lapse of the season, the afternoon sun was now agreeable, and we sat there together while before us, at a distance, but within call if we wished, the children strolled to and fro in one of their most manageable moods. They moved slowly in unison below us over the lawn, the boy as they went reading aloud from a storybook and passing his arm around his sister to keep her quite in touch. Mrs. Gross watched them with positive placidity. Then I caught the suppressed intellectual creak with which she conscientiously turned to take from me a view of the back of the tapestry. I had made her a receptacle of lurid things, but there was an odd recognition of my superiority, my accomplishments and my function in her patience under my pain. She offered her mind to my disclosures as, had I wished to mix a witch's broth and proposed it with assurance, she would have held out a large, clean saucepan. This had become thoroughly her attitude by the time that, in my recital of the events of the night, I reached the point of what Miles had said to me, when after seeing him at such a monstrous hour, almost on the very spot where he happened now to be, I had gone down to bring him in, choosing then at the window with a concentrated need of not alarming the house, rather that method than a signal more resonant. I had left her meanwhile in little doubt of my small hope, representing with success even to her actual sympathy, my sense of the real splendour, of the little inspiration with which, after I had got him into the house, the boy met my final articulate challenge. As soon as I appeared in the moonlight on the terrace, he had come to me as straight as possible on which I had taken his hand without a word and led him through the dark spaces up the staircase where Quint had so hungrily hovered for him, along the lobby where I had listened and trembled, and so to his forsaken room. Not a sound on the way had passed between us, and I had wondered, oh, how I had wondered, if he were groping about in his little mind for something plausible and not too grotesque. It would tax his invention, certainly, and I felt, this time, of his real embarrassment, a curious thrill of triumph. It was a sharp trap for the inscrutable. He couldn't play any longer at innocence. So how the deuce would he get out of it? There, beating me indeed with the passionate throb of this question, an equal dumb appeal as to how the deuce I should. I was confronted at last, as never yet, with all the risk attached even now to sounding my own horrid note. I remember, in fact, that as we pushed into his little chamber, where the bed had not been slept in at all, and the window, uncovered to the moonlight, made the place so clear that there was no need of striking a match. I remembered how I suddenly dropped, sank upon the edge of the bed from the force of the idea that he must know how he really, as they say, had me. 
He could do what he liked, with all his cleverness to help him, so long as I should continue to defer to the old tradition of the criminality of those caretakers of the young who minister to superstitions and fears. He had me indeed, and in the cleft stick, for who would ever absolve me? Who would consent that I should go unhung if, by the faintest tremor of an overture, I were the first to introduce into our perfect intercourse an element so dire? No, no. It was useless to attempt to convey it to Mrs. Gross, just as it is scarcely less so to attempt to suggest here how, in our short, stiff brush in the dark, he fairly shook me with admiration. I was, of course, thoroughly kind and merciful. Never, never yet had I placed on his little shoulders hands of such tenderness as those with which, while I rested against the bed, I held him there well under the fire. I had no alternative but, in form at least, to put it to him. You must tell me now, and all the truth, what did you go out for? What were you doing there? I can still see his wonderful smile, the whites of his beautiful eyes, and the uncovering of his little teeth shine to me in the dusk. If I tell you why, will you understand? My heart had this leapt into my mouth. Would he tell me why? I found no sound on my lips to press it, and I was aware of replying only with a vague, repeated, grimacing nod. He was gentleness itself, and while I wagged my head at him, he stood there more than ever a little fairy prince. It was his brightness indeed that gave me a respite. Would it be so great if you were really going to tell me? Well, he said, at last, just exactly in order that you should do this. Do what? Think me, for a change, bad. I shall never forget the sweetness and gaiety with which he brought out the word, nor how on top of it he bent forward and kissed me. It was practically the end of everything. I met his kiss and I had to make, while I folded him for a minute in my arms, the most stupendous effort not to cry. He had given exactly the account of himself, the permitted least of my going behind it, and it was only with the effect of confirming my acceptance of it that as I presently glanced about the room I could say, then you didn't undress at all. He fairly glittered in the gloom. Not at all. I sat up and read. And when did you go down? At midnight, when I'm bad, I am bad. I see, I see, it's charming, but how could you be sure I wouldn't know it? Oh, I arranged that with Flora. His answers rang out with a readiness. She was to get up and look out, which is what she did do. It was I who fell into the trap. So she disturbed you, and to see what she was looking at, you also looked. You saw while you, I concurred, caught your death in the night air. He literally bloomed so from this exploit that he could afford radiantly to ascend. How otherwise should I have been bad enough, he asked. Then, after another embrace, the incident and our interview closed on my recognition of all the reserves of goodness that for his joke he had been able to draw upon. Chapter 12 The particular impression I had received proved in the morning light, I repeat, not quite successfully presentable to Mrs. Gross, though I reinforced it with the mention of still another remark that he had made before we separated. It all lies in half a dozen words, I said to her, words that really settle the matter. Think, you know, what I might do. He threw that off to show me how good he is, he knows, down to the ground, what he might do. That's what he gave him a taste of at school. Lord, you do change, cried my friend. I don't change, I simply make it out. The four depend upon it, perpetually meet. If on either of these last nights you had been with either child, you would have clearly understood. The more I've watched and waited, the more I've felt that if there were nothing else to make it sure, it would be made so by the systematic silence of each. Never, by a slip of the tongue, have they so much as alluded to either of their old friends, any more than Miles has alluded to his expulsion. Oh yes, we may sit here and look at them, and they may show off to us there to their fill, but even while they pretend to be lost in their fairy tale, they're steeped in their vision, the dead restored. 
He's not reading to her, I declared. They're talking of them. They're talking horrors. I go on. I know as if I were crazy, and it's a wonder I'm not. What I've seen would have made you so, but it has only made me more lucid, made me get hold of still other things. My lucidity must have seemed awful, but the charming creatures who were victims of it, passing and repassing in their interlocked sweetness, gave my colleague something to hold on by. And I felt how tight she held, as without stirring in the breath of my passion, she covered them still with her eyes. Of what other things have you got hold? Why, of the very things that have delighted, fascinated, and yet at bottom, as I now so strangely see, mystified and troubled me? They're more than earthly beauty. They're absolutely unnatural goodness. It's a game, I went on. It's a policy and a fraud. On the part of little darlings, as yet mere lovely babies. Yes, mad as that seems. The very act of bringing it out really helped me to trace it follow it all up and piece it all together. They haven't been good, they've only been absent. It has been easy to live with them because they're simply leading a life of their own. They're not mine, they're not ours. They're his and they're hers. Quince and that woman's. Quince and that woman's. They want to get rid of them. Oh, how would this poor Mrs. Gross appear to study them? But for what? For the love of all the evil that in those dreadful days the pair put them into, and to ply them with that evil still, to keep up the work of demons is what brings the others back. Laws, said my friend under her breath. The exclamation was homely, but it revealed a real acceptance of my further proof of what, in the bad time, for there had been a worse even than this, must have occurred. There could have been no such justification for me as the plain ascent of her experience to whatever depth of depravity I found credible in our brace of scoundrels. It was in obvious submission of memory that she brought out after a moment. They were rascals, but what can they do now, she pursued. Do? I echoed so loud that Miles and Flora, as they passed at their distance, paused an instant in their walk and looked at us. Don't they do enough? I demanded in a lower tone, while the children, having smiled and nodded and kissed hands to us, resumed their exhibition. We were held by it a minute. Then I answered, they can destroy them. At this, my companion did turn, but the inquiry she launched was a silent one, the effect of which was to make me more explicit. They don't know as yet quite how, but they're trying hard. They're seen only across, as it were, and beyond in strange places, and on high places, the tops of towers, the roofs of houses, the outside of windows, the further edge of pools, but there's a deep design on either side to shorten the distance and overcome the obstacle. And the success of the tempters is only a question of time. They've only to keep to their suggestions of danger for the children to come and perish in the attempt. Mrs. Gross slowly got up and I scrupulously added, unless, of course, we can prevent. Standing there before me, while I kept my seat, she visibly turned things over. Their uncle must do the preventing, and he must take them away. And who's to make him? She had been scanning the distance, but she now dropped on me a foolish face. You, miss, by writing to him that his house is poisoned and his little nephew and niece mad. But if they are, miss, and if I am myself, you mean. That's charming news to be sent him by a governess whose prime undertaking was to give him no worry. Mrs. Gross considered following the children again. Yes, sir, you do hate worry. That was the great reason. Why those fiends took him in so long, no doubt. Though his indifference must have been awful. As I'm not a fiend at any rate, I shouldn't take him in. My companion, after an instant and for all answer sat down again and grasped my arm. Make him at any rate come to you. Instead, to me, I had a sudden fear of what she might do. Him? He ought to be here. He ought to help. I quickly rose, and I think I must have shown her a queerer face than ever yet. You see me asking him for a visit? No. With her eyes on my face, she evidently couldn't. Instead of it even, 
as a woman reads another, she could see what I myself saw, his derision, his amusement, his contempt for the breakdown of my resignation at being left alone, and for the fine machinery I had set in motion to attract his attention to my slighted charms. She didn't know, no one knew, how proud I had been to serve him and to stick to our terms. Yet, she nonetheless took the measure, I think, of the warning I now gave her. If you should so lose your head as to appeal to him for me, she was really frightened. Yes, miss, I would leave, on the spot, both him and you. Chapter 13. It was all very well to join them, but speaking to them proved quite as much as ever an effort beyond my strength, offered in close quarters at difficulties as insurmountable as before. This situation continued a month, and with new aggravations and particular notes, the note above all sharper and sharper, with a small ironic consciousness on the part of my pupils. It was not I am as sure today as I was sure then my mere infernal imagination. It was absolutely traceable that they were aware of my predicament, and that this strange relation made, in a manner, for a long time, the air in which we moved. I don't mean that they had their tongues in their cheeks, or did anything vulgar, for that was not one of their dangers. I do mean, on the other hand, the element of the unnamed and untouched became, between us, greater than any other, and that so much avoidance could not have been so successfully effected without a great deal of tacit arrangement. It was as if, at moments, we were perpetually coming into sight of subjects before which we must stop short, turning suddenly out of alleys where we perceived to be blind, closing with a little bang that made us look at each other, for like all bangs it was something louder than we had intended. The doors we had indiscreetly opened all roads lead to Rome, and there were times when it might have struck us that almost every branch of study or subject of conversation skirted forbidden ground. Forbidden ground was the question of the return of the dead in general, and of whatever in especial might survive in memory of the friends little children had lost. There were days when I could have sworn that one of them had, with a small invisible nudge, said to the other, she thinks she'll do it this time, but she won't. To do it would have been to indulge, for instance, and for once in a way, in some direct reference to the lady who prepared them for my discipline. They had a delightful, endless appetite for passages in my own history, to which I had again and again treated them. They were in possession of everything that had ever happened to me that had, with every circumstance, the story of my smallest adventures and of those of my brothers and sisters and of the cat and the dog at home, as well as many particulars of the eccentric nature of my father, of the furniture and arrangement of our house, and of the conversation of the old women of our village. There were things enough, taking one with another, to chatter about, if one went very fast and knew by instinct when to go round. They pulled with an art of their own the strings of my invention and my memory. Nothing else, perhaps, when I thought of such occasions afterward, gave me so the suspicion of being watched from under cover. It was, in any case, over my life, my past, and my friends alone that we could take anything like our ease. A state of affairs that led them sometimes without the least pertinence to break out into sociable reminders. I was invited, with no visible connection, to repeat a fresh Goody Gosling celebrated mo, or to confirm the details already supplied as to the cleverness of the vicarage pony. It was partly at such junctures as these, and partly at quite different ones, that with the turn of my matters had now taken, my predicament, as I have called it, grew most sensible. The fact that the days passed for me without another encounter ought, it would have appeared, have done something towards soothing my nerves. Since the light brush that second night on the upper landing, with the presence of a woman at the foot of the stair, I had seen nothing, whether in or out of the house, that one had better not have seen. There was many a corner round which I expected to come upon Quint, and many a situation that in a merely sinister way 
would have favoured the appearance of Miss Jessel. The summer had turned, the summer had gone. The autumn had dropped upon Bly and had blown out half our lights. The place with its grey sky and withered garlands, its bared spaces and scattered dead leaves, was like a theatre after the performance, all strewn with crumpled playbills. There were exactly states of the air, conditions of sound and of stillness, unspeakable impressions of the kind of ministering moment that brought back to me, long enough to catch it, the feeling of the medium in which that June evening out of doors I had had my first sight of Quint, and in which too, at those other instants, I had, after seeing him through the window, looked for him in vain in the circle of the shrubbery. I recognised the signs, the portents, I recognised the moment, the spot, but they remained unaccompanied and empty, and I continued unmolested, if unmolested one could call a young woman whose sensibility had, in the most extraordinary fashion, not declined, but deepened. I had said in my talk with Mrs. Gross and that horrid scene of floors by the lake, and had perplexed her so by saying, that it would from that moment distress me much more to lose my power than to keep it. I had then expressed what was vividly in my mind, the truth that, whether the children really saw or not, since, that is, it was not yet definitely proved, I greatly preferred as a safeguard the fullness of my own exposure. I was ready to know the very worst that was to be known. What I had then had an ugly glimpse of was that my eyes might be sealed just while theirs were most opened. Well, my eyes were sealed, it appeared, at present, a consummation for which it seemed blasphemous not to thank God. There was, alas, a difficulty about that. I would have thanked him with all my soul had I not had in the proportionate measure this conviction of the secret of my pupils. How can I retrace today the strange steps of my obsession? There were times of our being together when I would have been ready to swear that literally in my presence, but without my direct sense of it closed, they had visitors who were known and were welcome. Then it was that had I not been deterred by the very chance that such an injury might prove greater than the injury to be averted, my exultation would have broken out. They're here, they're here, you little wretches, I would have cried, and you can't deny it now. The little wretches denied it with all the added volume of their sociability and their tenderness in just the crystal depths of which, like the flash of a fish in a stream, the mockery of their advantage peeped up. The shock, in truth, had sunk into me deeper than I knew on the night when, looking out to see either Quint or Miss Jessel under the stars, I had beheld the boy over whose rest I watched and who had immediately brought in with him had straight away there turned it on me, the lovely upward look with which, from the battlements above me, the hideous apparition of Quint had played. If it was a question of scare, my discovery on this occasion had scared me more than any other, and it was in the condition of nerves produced by it that I made my actual inductions. They harassed me so that at some times, at odd moments, I shut myself up audibly to rehearse it was at once a fantastic relief and a renewed despair, the manner in which I might come to the point. I approached it from one side and the other while in my room I flung myself about. But I always broke down in the monstrous utterance of names. As they died away on my lips, I said to myself that I should indeed help them to represent something infamous if by pronouncing them I should violate as rare a little case of instinctive delicacy as any schoolroom probably had ever known. When I said to myself, they have the manners to be silent, and you, trusted as you are, the baseness to speak, I felt myself crimson, and I covered my face with my hands. After these secret scenes, I chattered more than ever, going on volubly enough until one of our prodigious palpable hushes occurred. I can call them nothing else. A strange, dizzy lift or swim, I try for terms, into a stillness, a pause of all life, that had nothing to do with the more or less noise that at the moment we might be engaged in making. 
and that I could hear through any deepened exhilaration or quickened recitation or louder strum of the piano. Then it was that the others, the outsiders, were there. Though they were not angels, they passed, as the French said, causing me, while they stayed, to tremble with the fear of their addressing to their younger victims some yet more infernal message or more vivid image than they had thought good enough for myself. What it was the most impossible to get rid of was the cruel idea that whatever I had seen, Miles and Flora saw more, things terrible and unguessable, and that sprang from dreadful passages of intercourse in the past. Such things naturally left on the surface for the time a chill which we vociferously denied that we felt, and we had, all three, with repetition, got into such splendid training that we went each time almost automatically to mark the close of the incident through the very same movements. It was striking of the children at all events to kiss me inveterately with a kind of wild irrelevance and never to fail, one or the other, of the precious question that had helped us through many a peril. When do you think he will come? Don't you think we ought to write? There was nothing like that inquiry. We found by experience for carrying off an awkwardness. He, of course, was their uncle in Harley Street, and we lived in much profusion of theory that he might at any moment arrive to mingle in our circle. It was impossible to have given less encouragement than he had done to such a doctrine, but if we had not had the doctrine to fall back upon, we should have deprived each other of some of our finest exhibitions. He never wrote to them. That may have been selfish, but it was part of the flattery of his trust of me for the way in which a man pays his highest tribute to a woman is apt to be but by the more festal celebration of one of the sacred laws of his comfort. And I held that I carried out the spirit of the pledge given not to appeal to him when I let my charges understand that their own letters were but charming literary exercises. They were too beautiful to be posted. I kept them myself. I have them all to this hour. There was a rule indeed which only added to the satiric effect of my being plied with the supposition that he might at any moment be among us. It was exactly as if my charges knew how almost more awkward than anything else that might be for me. There appears to me, moreover, as I look back, no note in all of this more extraordinary than the mere fact that in spite of my tension and of their triumph, I never lost patience with them. Adorable they must in truth have been, and now I reflect that I didn't in those days hate them. Would exasperation, however, if relief had longer been postponed, finally have betrayed me? It little matters, for relief arrived. I call it relief, though it was only the relief that a snap brings to a strain, or the burst of a thunderstorm to a day of suffocation. It was at least change, and it came with a rush. Chapter 14 Walking to church a certain Sunday morning, I had little Miles at my side, and his sister in advance of us, and at Mrs. Gross's well in sight. It was a crisp, clear day, the first of its order for some time. The night had brought a touch of frost, and the autumn air, bright and sharp, made the church bells almost gay. It was an odd accident of thought that I should have happened at such a moment to be particularly and very gratefully struck with the obedience of my little charges. Why did they never resent my inexorable, my perpetual society? Something or other had brought nearer home to me that I had all but pinned the boy to my shawl, and that, in the way our companions were marshalled before me, I might have appeared to provide against some danger of rebellion. I was like a jailer with an eye to possible surprises and escapes. But all this belonged, I mean their magnificent little surrender, just to the special array of the facts that were the most abysmal. Turned out for Sunday by his uncle's tailor, who had had a free hand and a notion of pretty waistcoats and of his grand little air. Miles's whole title to independence, the rights of his sex and situation, were so stamped upon him that if he had suddenly struck for freedom, I should have had nothing to say. 
I was, by the strangest of chances, wondering how I should meet him when the revolution unmistakably occurred. I call it a revolution because I now see how, with the word he spoke, the curtain rose on the last act of my dreadful drama and the catastrophe was precipitated. Look here, my dear, you know, he charmingly said. When in the world, please, am I going back to school? Transcribed here, the speech sounds harmless enough, particularly as uttered in his sweet, high, casual pipe, with which at all interlocutors, but above all at his eternal governess, he threw off intonations as he were tossing roses. There was something in them that always made one catch, and I caught, at any rate, now so effectually that I stopped as short as if one of the trees of the park had fallen across the road. There was something new on the spot between us, and he was perfectly aware that I recognised it, though to enable me to do so, he had had no need to look a whit less candid and charming than usual. I could feel in him how he already, from my at first finding nothing to reply, perceived the advantage he had gained. I was so slow to find anything that he had plenty of time after a minute to continue with his suggestive but inconclusive smile. You know, my dear, that for a fellow to be with a lady always, his my dear was constantly on his lips for me. Nothing could have expressed more the exact shade of the sentiment with which I desired to inspire my pupils than its fond familiarity. It was so respectfully easy. But oh, how I felt that present I must pick my own phrases. I remember that to gain time I tried to laugh and I seemed to see in the beautiful face with which he watched me how ugly and queer I looked. And always with the same lady, I returned. He neither blanched nor winked. The whole thing was virtually out between us. Ah, of course, she's a jolly perfect lady, but after all, I'm a fellow, don't you see? That's, well, getting on. I lingered there with him an instant, ever so kindly. Yes, you're getting on. Oh, but I felt helpless. I have kept to this day the heartbreaking little idea of how he seemed to know that and to play with it. And you can't say I've not been awfully good, can you? I laid my hand on his shoulder, for though I felt how much better it would have been to walk on, I was not quite able to. No, I can't say that, Miles. Except just that one night, you know. That one night? I couldn't look as straight as he. Why, when I went down went out of the house. Oh, yes. But I forget what you did it for. You forget? He spoke with the sweet extravagance of childish reproach. Why, it was to show you I could. Oh, yes, you could. And I can again. I felt that I might, perhaps, after all, succeed in keeping my wits about me. Certainly. But you won't. No, not that again. It was nothing. It was nothing, I said. But we must go on. He resumed a walk with me, passing his hand into my arm. Then, when am I going back? I wore in turning it over my most responsible air. Were you very happy at school? He just considered. Oh, I'm happy enough anywhere. Well then, I quavered, if you're just as happy here. Ah, but that isn't everything. Of course, you know a lot. But you hint that you know almost as much, I risked as he paused. Not half what I want to, Miles honestly professed. But it isn't so much that. What is it, then? Well, I want to see more life. I see, I see. We had arrived within sight of the church, and of various persons, including several of the household of Bly, on their way to it, and clustered about the door to see us go in. I quickened our step. I wanted to get there before the question between us opened up much further. I reflected hungrily that for more than an hour we would have to be silent and I thought with envy of the comparative dusk of the pew and of the almost spiritual help of the hassock on which I might bend my knees. I seemed literally to be running a race with some confusion to which he was about to reduce me, but I felt that he had got in first, when before we had even entered the churchyard he threw out, I want my own sort. It literally made me bound forward. There are not many of your own sort, Miles, I laughed, Unless perhaps, dear little Flora, you really compare me to a baby girl. This found me singularly weak. Don't you then love our sweet Flora? If I didn't, and you too, if I didn't, he repeated as if retreating for a jump. 
yet leaving his thoughts so unfinished that after we had come into the gate, another stop, which he imposed on me by the pressure of his arm, had become inevitable. Mrs. Gross and Flora had passed into the church. The other worshippers had followed, and we were for the minute alone among the old, thick graves. We had paused on the path from the gate by a low, oblong, table-like tomb. Yes, if you didn't, he looked while I waited at the graves. Well, you know what. But he didn't move, and he presently produced something that made me drop straight down on the stone slab, as if suddenly to rest. Does my uncle think what you think? I markedly rested. How do you know what I think? Oh, well, of course I don't. It strikes me, you never tell me. But I mean, does he know? N know what, Miles? Why, the way I'm going on. I perceived quickly enough that I could make to this inquiry no answer that wouldn't involve something of a sacrifice of my employer. Yet it appeared to me that we were all at blind, sufficiently sacrificed to make that venial. I don't think your uncle much cares. Miles on this stood looking at me. Then don't you think he can be made to? In what way? Why, by his coming down. But who'll get him to come down? I will, the boy said, with extraordinary brightness and emphasis. He gave me another look, charged with that expression, and then marched off alone into the church. Chapter 15 The business was practically settled from the moment I never followed him. It was a pitiful surrender to agitation, but my being aware of this had somehow no power to restore me. I only sat there on my tomb and read into what my little friend had said to me the fullness of its meaning. By the time I had grasped the whole of which I had also embraced, for absence, the pretext that I was ashamed to offer my pupils and the rest of the congregation such an example of delay, what I said to myself above all was that Miles had got something out of me and that the proof of it, for him, would be just this awkward collapse. He had got out of me that there was something I was much afraid of and that he should probably be able to make use of my fear to gain, for his own purpose, more freedom. My fear was of having to deal with the intolerable question of the grounds of his dismissal from school, for that was really but the question of the horrors gathered behind. That his uncle should arrive to treat with me of these things was the solution that, strictly speaking, I ought now to have desired to bring on, but I could so little face the ugliness and the pain of it that I simply procrastinated and lived from hand to mouth. The boy, to my deep discomposure, was immensely in the right, was in the position to say to me, either you clear up with my guardian the mystery of this interruption of my studies, or you cease to expect me to lead with you a life that's so unnatural for a boy. What was so natural for the particular boy I was concerned with was this sudden revelation of a consciousness and a plan. That was what really overcame me, what prevented my going in. I walked around the church, hesitating, hovering. I reflected that I had already with him hurt myself beyond repair. Therefore, I could patch up nothing, and it was too extreme an effort to squeeze beside him into the pew. He would be so much more sure than ever to pass his arm into mine and make me sit there for an hour in close, silent contact with his commentary on our talk. For the first minute since his arrival, I wanted to get away from him. As I paused beneath the high east window and listened to the sounds of worship, I was taken with an impulse that might master me. I felt completely should I give it the least encouragement. I might easily put an end to my predicament by getting away altogether. Here was my chance. There was no one to stop me. I could give the whole thing up, turn my back and retreat. It was only a question of hurrying again for a few preparations to the house which the attendance at church of so many of the servants would practically have left unoccupied. No one, in short, could blame me if I should just drive desperately off. What was it to get away, if I got away only till dinner? That would be in a couple of hours, at the end of which I had the acute prevision my little pupils would play at innocent wonder about my non-appearance in their train. What did you do, you naughty bad thing? Why in the world to worry us so, and take our thoughts off too, don't you know? 
did you desert us at the very door? I couldn't meet such questions, nor, as they asked them, their false little lovely eyes. Yet it was also exactly what I should have to meet, that as the prospect grew sharp to me, I at last let myself go. I got so far as the immediate moment was concerned away. I came straight out of the churchyard, and thinking hard, retraced my steps through the park. It seemed to me that by the time I reached the house I had made up my mind I would fly. The Sunday stillness, both of the approaches and of the interior, in which I met no one, fairly excited me with a sense of opportunity. Were I to get off quickly, this way, I should get off without a scene, without a word. My quickness would have to be remarkable, however, and the question of a conveyance was the great one to settle. Tormented in the hall, with difficulties and obstacles, I remember sinking down at the foot of the staircase, suddenly collapsing there on the lowest step, and then, with a revulsion, recalling that it was exactly where more than a month before, in the darkness of night, and just so bowed with evil things, I had seen the spectre of the most horrible of women. At this, I was able to straighten myself. I went the rest of the way up, and made in my bewilderment for the schoolroom, where there were objects belonging to me that I should have to take. But I opened the door to find again, in a flash, my eyes unsealed. In the presence of what I saw, I reeled straight back upon my resistance. Seated at my own table, in clear noonday light, I saw a person whom, without my previous experience, I should have taken at the first blush for some housemaid who might have stayed at home to look after the place, and who, availing herself of rare relief from observation and of the schoolroom table and my pens, ink and paper, had applied herself to the considerable effort of a letter to her sweetheart. There was an effort in the way that, while her arms rested on the table, her hands with evident weariness supported her head. But at the moment I took this in, I had already become aware that, in spite of my entrance, her attitude strangely persisted. Then it was, with the very act of its announcing itself, that her identity flared up in a change of posture. She rose, not as if she had heard me, but with an indescribable grand melancholy of indifference and detachment, and within a dozen feet of me stood there as my vile predecessor. Dishonoured and tragic, she was all before me, but even as I fixed and for memory secured it, the awful image passed away. Dark as midnight in her black dress, her haggard beauty and her unnutterable woe, she had looked at me long enough to appear to say that her right to sit at my table was as good as mine to sit at hers. While these instants lasted, indeed I had the extraordinary chill of feeling that it was I who was the intruder. It was his wild protest against it that actually addressing her, you terrible, miserable woman. I heard myself break into a sound that by the open door rang through the long passage of the empty house. She looked at me as if she heard me, but I had recovered myself and cleared the air. There was nothing in the room the next minute but the sunshine and a sense that I must stay. Chapter 16 I had so perfectly expected that the return of my pupils would be marked by a demonstration that I was freshly upset at having to take into account that they were dumb about my absence. Instead of gaily denouncing and caressing me, they made no allusion to my having failed them, and I was left, for the time, on perceiving that she too said nothing, to study Mrs. Gross's odd face. I did this to such purpose that I made sure they had in some way bribed her to silence, a silence that, however, I would engage to break down on the first private opportunity. This opportunity came before tea. I secured five minutes with her in the housekeeper's room, where, in the twilight, amid a smell of lately baked bread, but with the place all swept and garnished, I found her sitting in pain placidity before the fire. So I see her still, so I see her best, facing the flame from her straight chair in the dusky shining room, a large, clean image of the put-away 
of drawers closed and locked and rest without a remedy. Oh yes, they asked me to say nothing and to please them, so long as they were there. Of course I promised. But what happened to you? I only went with you for the walk, I said. I had then to come back and meet a friend. She showed her surprise. A friend? You? Oh yes, I have a couple, I laughed. But did the children give you a reason? For not alluding to your leaving us, yes. They said you would like it better. Do you like it better? My face had made her rueful. No, I like it worse. But after an instant, I added, did they say why I should like it better? No, Master Miles only said we must do nothing but what she likes. I wish indeed he would. And what did Flora say? Miss Flora, too sweet. She said, of course, of course, and I said the same. I thought a moment. You were too sweet too, I can hear you all. But nonetheless, between Miles and me, it's now all out. All out, my companion stared. But what, miss? Everything. It doesn't matter. I've made up my mind. I came home, my dear, I went on, for a talk with Miss Jessel. I had by this time formed the habit of having Mrs. Gross literally well in hand in advance of my sounding that note, so that even now, as she bravely blinked under the signal of my word, I could keep her comparatively firm. A talk? Do you mean she spoke? It came to that. I found her on my return in the schoolroom. And what did she say? I can hear the good woman still and the candor of her stupefaction that she suffers the torments. It was this of a truth that made her, as she filled out my picture, gape. Do you mean, she faltered, of the lost, of the lost, of the damned, and that's why to share them, I faltered myself with the horror of it. But my companion with less imagination kept me up to share them. She wants Flora. Mrs. Groves might, as I gave it to her, fairly have fallen away from me, had I not been prepared. I still held her there, to show I was. As I told you, Harvey, it doesn't matter, because you've made up your mind. But to what? To everything. And what do you call everything? Why, sending for their uncle. Oh, miss, in pity do, my friend broke out. Ah, but I will, I will. I see it's the only way. What's out, as I told you with Miles, is that if he thinks I'm afraid to, and has ideas of what he gains by that, he shall see he's mistaken. Yes, yes, his uncle shall have it here from me on the spot, and before the boy himself, if necessary. That if I'm to be reproached with having done nothing again about more school... Yes, miss, my companion pressed me. Well, there's that awful reason. There were now clearly so many of these for my poor colleague that she was excusable for being vague, but uh, which? Why, the letter from his old place. He'll show it to the master. I ought to have done so on the instant. Oh no, said Mrs. Gross with precision. I'll put it before him, I went on inexorably, that I can't undertake to work the question on behalf of a child who has been expelled. For we've never in the least known what, Mrs. Gross declared. For wickedness. For what else? When he's so clever and beautiful and perfect, is he stupid? Is he untidy? Is he infirm? Is he ill-natured? He's exquisite. So it can be only that. And that would open up the whole thing. After all, I said, it's their uncle's fault. If he left here such people, he didn't really in the least know them. The fault's mine. She had turned quite pale. Well, you shan't suffer, I answered. The children shan't, she emphatically returned. I was silent a while. We looked at each other. Then what am I to tell him? You needn't tell him anything. I'll tell him. I measured this. Do you mean you'll write? Remembering she couldn't, I caught myself up. How do you communicate? I tell the bailiff he writes. And should you like him to write our story? My question had a sarcastic force that I had not fully intended, and it made her, after a moment, inconsequently break down. The tears were again in her eyes. Ah, miss, you write. Well, tonight, I at last answered. And on this, we separated. That was The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, narrated by Tony Walker. Our part two, part three will follow.
the turn of the screw, written by Henry James and narrated by Tony Walker. This is part three. Chapter 17. I went so far in the evening as to make a beginning. The weather had changed back, a great wind was abroad, and beneath the lamp in my room, with Flora at peace beside me, I sat for a long time before a blank sheet of paper and listened to the lash of the rain and the batter of the gusts. Finally I went out, taking a candle. I crossed the passage and listened a minute at Miles's door. What, under my endless obsession, I had been impelled to listen for was some betrayal of his not being at rest and I presently caught one, but not in the form I had expected. His voice tinkled out. I say, you there, come in. It was a gaiety in the gloom. I went in with my light and found him in bed, very wide awake, but very much at his ease. Well, what are you up to? He asked with a grace of sociability in which it occurred to me that Mrs. Gross, had she been present, might have looked in vain for proof that anything was out. I stood over him with my candle. How did you know I was there? Why, well, of course I heard you. Did you fancy you made no noise? You're like a troop of cavalry, he beautifully laughed. Then you weren't asleep. Not much, I lie away and think. I put my candle designedly a short way off and then, as he held out his friendly old hand to me, it sat down on the edge of his bed. What is it, I asked, that you think of? What in the world, my dear, but you? Ah, the pride I take in your appreciation doesn't insist on that. I had so far rather you slept. Well, I think also you know of this queer business of ours. I marked the coolness of his firm little hand. Of what queer business, Miles? Why, the way you bring me up, and all the rest. I fairly held my breath a minute, and even from my glimmering taper, it was light enough to show how he smiled up at me from his pillow. What do you mean by all the rest? Oh, you know, you know. I could say nothing for a minute, though I felt, as I held his hand, that our eyes continued to meet, that my silence had all the air of admitting his charge, and that nothing in the whole world of reality was perhaps at that moment so fabulous as our actual relation. Certainly you shall go back to school, I said, if it be that that troubles you, but not to the old place. We must find another, a better. How could I know it did trouble you, this question, when you never told me so, never spoke of it at all? His clear, listening face framed in its smooth whiteness made him for the minute as appealing as some wistful patient in a children's hospital, and I would have given, as the resemblance came to me, all I possessed on earth, really to be the nurse or the sister of charity who might have helped to cure him. Well, even as it was, I perhaps might help. Do you know, you've never said a word to me about your school. I mean, the old one. Never mentioned it in any way. He seemed to wonder. He smiled with the same loveliness, but he clearly gained time. He waited. He called for guidance. Haven't I? It wasn't for me to help him. It was with a thing I had met. Something in his tone and the expression of his face as I got this from him set my heart aching with such a pang as it had never yet known. So unutterably touching was it to see his little brain puzzled and his little resources taxed to play under the spell laid on him, a part of innocence and consistency. No, never from the hour you came back. You've never mentioned to me one of your masters, one of your comrades, nor the least little thing that ever happened to you at school. Never, little Miles, no, never. Have you given me an inkling of anything that may have happened there? Therefore, you can fancy how much I'm in the dark. Until you came out that way this morning, you had, since the first hour I saw you, scarce even made a reference to anything in your previous life. You seemed so perfectly to accept the present. It was extraordinary how my absolute conviction of his secret precocity, or whatever I might call the poison of an influence that I dared but half to phrase, made him in spite of the faint breath of his inward trouble appear as accessible as an older person, imposed him almost as an intellectual equal. I thought you wanted to go on as you are. 
It struck me that at this he just faintly coloured. He gave at any rate like a convalescent, slightly fatigued, a languid shake of his head. I don't, I don't, I want to get away. You're tired of Bly. Oh no, I like Bly. Well then, oh, you know what a boy wants. I felt that I didn't know so well as Miles, and I took a temporary refuge. Do you want to go to your uncle? Again at this, with his sweet ironic face, he made a movement on the pillow. Ah, you can't get off with that. I was silent a little, and it was I now, I think, who changed colour. My dear, I don't want to get off. You can't, even if you do, you can't, you can't, he lay beautifully staring. My uncle must come down, and you must completely settle things. If we do, I returned with some spirit, you may be sure it will be to take you quite away. Well, don't you understand that that's exactly what I'm working for? You'll have to tell him about the way you've let it all drop. You'll have to tell him a tremendous lot. The exultation with which he uttered this helped me somehow, for the instant to meet him rather more. And how much will you, Miles, have to tell him? There are things he'll ask you. He turned it over. Very likely. But what things? The things you've never told me. To make up his mind what to do with you. He can't send you back. Oh, I don't want to go back, he broke in. I want a new field. He said it with admirable serenity, with positive, unimpeachable gaiety, and doubtless it was that very note that most evoked for me the poignancy, the unnatural childish tragedy of his probable reappearance at the end of three months with all this bravado and still more dishonour. It overwhelmed me now that I should never be able to bear that, and it made me let myself go. I threw myself upon him and in the tenderness of my pity embraced him. Dear little Miles, dear little Miles. My face was close to his and he let me kiss him, simply taking it with indulgent good humour. Well, old lady, is there nothing, nothing at all that you want to tell me? He turned off a little, facing round toward the wall and holding up his hand to look at as one had seen sick children look. I told you, I told you this morning. Oh, I was sorry for him that you just want me not to worry you. He looked round at me now, as if in recognition of my understanding him. Then, ever so gently, to let me alone, he replied. There was even a singular little dignity in it, something that made me release him. Yet, when I had slowly risen, linger beside him. God knows I never wished to harass him, but I felt that merely at this to turn my back on him was to abandon, or to put it more truly, to lose him. I've just begun a letter to your uncle, I said. Well then, finish it. I waited a minute. What happened before? He gazed up at me again. Before what? Before you came back and before you went away. For some time, he was silent, but he continued to meet my eyes. What happened? It made me the sound of the words in which it seemed to me that I caught for the very first time a small, faint quaver of consenting consciousness it made me drop on my knees beside the bed and seize once more the chance of possessing him. Dear little Miles, dear little Miles, if you knew how I want to help you, it's only that it's nothing but that, and I'd rather die than give you a pain or do you a wrong. I'd rather die than hurt a hair of you. Dear little Miles. Oh, I brought it out now, even if I should go too far. I just want you to help me to save you. But I knew in a moment after this that I had gone too far. The answer to my appeal was instantaneous, but it came in the form of an extraordinary blast and chill, a gust of frozen air, and a shake of the room as great as if in the wild wind the casement had crashed in. The boy gave a loud high shriek, which lost in the rest of the shock of sound, might have seemed indistinctly though I was so close to him, a note either of jubilation or of terror. I jumped to my feet again and was conscious of darkness. So, for a moment we remained, while I stared about me, and saw that the dawn curtains were unstirred and the window tight. Why, the candle's out, I then cried. It was I who blew it out, dear, said Miles. Chapter 18 
The next day, after lessons, Mrs. Gross found a moment to say to me quietly, Have you written, miss? Yes, I've written, but I didn't add for the hour that my letter, sealed and directed, was still in my pocket. It will be time enough to send it before the messenger should go to the village. Meanwhile, there had been, on the part of my pupils, no more brilliant, more exemplary morning. It was exactly as if they had both had at heart to gloss over any recent little friction. They performed the dizziest feats of arithmetic, soaring quite out of my feeble range, and perpetrated in higher spirits than ever geographical and historical jokes. It was conspicuous, of course, in Miles in particular, that he appeared to wish to show how easily he could let me down. This child, to my memory, really lives in a setting of beauty and misery that no words can translate. There was a distinction all his own in every impulse he revealed. Never was a small natural creature to the uninitiated eye all frankness and freedom, a more ingenious, a more extraordinary little gentleman. I had perpetually to guard against the wonder of contemplation into which my initiated view betrayed me, to check the irrelevant gaze and discouraged sigh in which I constantly both attacked and renounced the enigma of what such a little gentleman could have done that deserved a penalty. Say that by the dark prodigy I knew, the imagination of all evil had been opened up to him. All the justice within me ached for the proof that could ever have flowered into an act. He had never at any rate been such a little gentleman as when, after our early dinner on this dreadful day, he came round to me and asked if I shouldn't like him for half an hour to play to me. David playing to Saul could never have shown a finer sense of the occasion. It was literally a charming exhibition of tact and magnanimity, and quite tantamount to his saying outright, the true knights we love to read about never push an advantage too far. I know what you mean now. You mean that to be let alone yourself and not followed up. You'll cease to worry and spy upon me. Won't keep me so close to you. Will let me go and come. Well, I come see, but I don't go. There'll be plenty of time for that. I do really delight in your society, and I only want to show you that I contend for a principle. It may be imagined whether I resisted this appeal or failed to accompany him again, hand in hand to the schoolroom. He sat down at the old piano and played as he had never played, and if there are those who think he had better been kicking a football, I can only say that I wholly agree with them. For, at the end of a time that under his influence I had quite ceased to measure, I started up with a strange sense of having literally slept at my post. It was after luncheon and by the schoolroom fire, and yet I hadn't really in the least slept. I had only done something much worse. I had forgotten. Where all this time was Flora? When I put the question to Miles, he played on a minute before answering, and then could only say, Why, my dear, how do I know? breaking moreover into a happy laugh, which immediately after, as if it were a vocal accompaniment, he prolonged into incoherent, extravagant song. I went straight to my room, but his sister was not there. Then, before going downstairs, I looked into several others. As she was nowhere about, she would surely be with Mrs. Gross, whom, in the comfort of that theory, I accordingly proceeded in quest of. I found her where I had found her the evening before, but she met my quick challenge with a blank, scared ignorance. She had only supposed that after the repast I had carried off both the children, as to which she was quite in the right, for it was the very first time I had allowed the little girl out of my sight without some special provision. Of course now, indeed, she might be with the maids, so that the immediate thing was to look for her without an air of alarm. This we promptly arranged between us, but when, Ten minutes later, and in pursuance of our arrangement, we met in the hall. It was only to report on either side that after guarded inquiries, we had altogether failed to trace her. For a minute there, apart from observation, we exchanged mute alarms, and I could feel with what high interest my friend returned me all those I had from the first given her. She'll be above, she presently said, in one of the rooms we haven't searched. No, she's at a distance. I had made up my mind. She's gone out. Mrs. Gross stared. Without a hat? And naturally also looked volumes. Isn't that woman always without one? She's with her. She's with her, I declared. 
We must find them. My hand was on my friend's arm, but she failed for the moment, confronted with such an account of the matter to respond to my pressure. She communed on the contrary on the spot with her uneasiness. And, and where's Master Miles? Oh, he's with Quint. They're in the schoolroom. Lord Miss, my view I was myself aware, and therefore I suppose my tone had never yet reached so calm an assurance. The tricks played, I went on. They've successfully worked their plan. He found the most divine little way to keep me quiet while she went off. Divine? Mrs. Groves bewilderedly echoed. Infernal, then, I almost cheerfully rejoined. He has provided for himself as well, but come. She had helplessly gloomed at the upper regions. You leave him? So long with Quint, yes. I don't mind that now. She always ended at these moments by getting possession of my hand. In this manner, she could at present still stay me. But after gasping an instant at my sudden resignation, because of your letter, she eagerly brought out. I quickly, by way of answer, felt for my letter, drew it forth, held it up, and then freeing myself went and laid it on the great hall table. Luke will take it, I said as I came back. I reached the house door and opened it. I was already on the steps. My companion still demurred. The storm of the night and the early morning had dropped but the afternoon was damp and grey. I came down to the drive while she stood in the doorway. You go with nothing on. What do I care when the child has nothing? I can't wait to dress, I cried. And if you must do so, I leave you. Try meanwhile yourself upstairs. With them? Oh, on this, the poor woman promptly joined me. Chapter 19 we went straight to the lake, as it was called at Bly, and I dare say rightly called, though I reflect that it may in fact have been a sheet of water less remarkable than it appeared to my untravelled eyes. My acquaintance with sheets of water was small, and the pool of Bly at all events on the few occasions of my consenting under the protection of my pupils to a fronted surface in the old flat-bottomed boat moored there for our use had impressed me both with its extent and its agitation. The usual place of embarkation was half a mile from the house, but I had the intimate conviction that wherever Flora might be, she was not near home. She had not given me the slip for any small adventure, and since the day of the very great one that I had shared with her by the pond, I had been aware in our walks of the quarter to which she most inclined. This was why I had now given to Mrs. Gross's steps so marked a direction. A direction that made her, when she perceived it, oppose a resistance that showed me she was freshly mystified. You go into the water, miss? You think she's in? She may be, though the depth is, I believe, nowhere very great. But what I judge most likely is that she's on the spot from which the other day we saw together what I told you. When she pretended not to see, with that astounding self-possession, I've always been sure she wanted to go back alone, and now her brother has managed it for her. Mrs. Gross still stood where she had stopped. You suppose they really talk to them? I could meet this with confidence. They say things that, if we heard them, would simply appall us. And if she is there, yes, then Miss Jessel is, beyond a doubt. You shall see. Oh. Thank you, my friend cried, planted so firm that in taking it in, I went straight on without her. By the time I reached the pool, however, she was close behind me, and I knew that whatever to her apprehension might befall me, the exposure of my society struck her as the least danger. She exhaled a moan of relief as we at last came in sight of the greater part of the water without the sight of the child. There was no trace of Flora on that nearer side of the bank, where my observation of her had been most startling, and none on the opposite edge where, save for a margin of some twenty yards, a thick copse came down to the water. The pond, oblong in shape, had a width so scant compared to its length that with its ends out of view it might have been taken for a scant river. We looked at the empty expanse, and then I felt the suggestion of my friend's eyes. I knew what she meant and I replied with a negative handshake, 
No, no, wait, she's taken the boat. My companion stared at the vacant mooring place and then again across the lake. Then where is it? Our not seeing it is the strongest of proofs. She has used it to go over and then has managed to hide it. All alone? That child? She's not alone. And at such time, she's not a child. She's an old, old woman. I scanned all the visible shore while Mrs. Gross took again into the queer element I offered her, one of her plunges of submission. Then I pointed out that the boat might perfectly be in a small refuge formed by one of the recesses of the pool, an indentation masked for the hither side by a projection of the bank and by a clump of trees growing close to the water. But if the boat's there, where on earth is she? My colleague anxiously asked. That's exactly what we must learn. And I started to walk further. By going all the way round? Certainly, far as it is. It will take us for ten minutes, but it's far enough to have made the child prefer not to walk. She went straight over. Laws, cried my friend again. The chain of my logic was ever too much for her. It dragged her at my heels even now. And when we had got halfway round, a devious, tiresome process on ground much broken, and by a path choked with overgrowth, I paused to give her breath. I sustained her with a grateful arm, assuring her that she might hugely help me, and this started us afresh, so that in the course of but a few minutes more, we reached a point from which we found the boat to be where I had supposed it. It had been intentionally left as much as possible out of sight, and was tied to one of the stakes of a fence that came just there, down to the brink and that had been an assistance to disembarking. I recognized, as I looked at the pair of short, thick oars quite safely drawn up, the prodigious character of the feet for a little girl. But I had lived by this time too long among wonders, and had panted to too many livelier measures. There was a gate in the fence through which we passed, and had brought us after a trifling interval more into the open. Then, there she is! We both exclaimed at once. Flora, a short way off, stood before us on the grass and smiled as if her performance was now complete. The next thing she did, however, was to stoop straight down and pluck, quite as if it were all she was there for, a big, ugly spray of withered fern. I instantly became sure she had just come out of the copse. She waited for us, not herself taking a step, and I was conscious of the rare solemnity with which we presently approached her. She smiled and smiled, and we met, but it was all done in a silence by this time flagrantly ominous. Mrs. Gross was the first to break the spell. She threw herself on her knees and drawing the child to her breast, clasped in a long embrace the little tender yielding body. While this dumb convulsion lasted, I could only watch it which I did the more intently when I saw Flora's face peep at me over our companion's shoulder. It was serious now. A flicker had left it. But it strengthened the pang with which I at that moment envied Mrs. Gross the simplicity of her relation. Still, all this while, nothing more passed between us save that Flora had let her foolish fern again drop to the ground. What she and I had virtually said to each other was that pretexts were useless now. When Mrs. Gross finally got up, she kept the child's hand so that the two were still before me, and the singular reticence of our communion was even more marked in the frank look she launched me. I'll be hanged, it said, if I'll speak. It was Flora who, gazing all over me in candid wonder, was the first. She was struck with our bareheaded aspect. Why, where are your things? Where are yours, my dear? I promptly returned. She had already got back her gaiety and appeared to take this as an answer quite sufficient. And where's Miles? She went on. There was something in the small valour of it that quite finished me. These three words from her were, in a flash like the glitter of a drawn blade, the jostle of the cup that my hand for weeks and weeks had held high and full to the brim, that now, even before speaking, I felt overflow in the deluge. I'll tell you if you tell me, I heard myself say, then heard the tremor in which it broke. Well, what? 
Mrs. Gross's suspense blazoned at me, but it was too late now, and I brought the thing out handsomely. Where my pet is Miss Jessel. Chapter 20 Just as in the churchyard with Miles, the whole thing was upon us. Much as I had made of the fact that this name had never once between us been sounded, the quick, smitten glare with which the child's face now received it fairly likened my breach of the silence to the smash of a plane of glass. It added to the interposing cry, as if to stay the blow, that Mrs. Gross at the same instant uttered over my violence the shriek of a creature scared, or rather wounded, which, in turn, within a few seconds, was completed by a gasp of my own. I seized my colleague's arm. She's there. She's there. Miss Jessel stood before us on the opposite bank, exactly as she had stood the other time. And I remember, strangely, as the first feeling now produced in me, my thrill of joy at having brought on a proof. She was there, and I was justified. She was there, and I was neither cruel nor mad. She was there for poor, scared Mrs. Gross, but she was there most for Flora. And no moment of my monstrous time was perhaps so extraordinary as that in which I consciously threw out at her, with the sense that pale and ravenous demon as she was, she would catch and understand it. An inarticulate message of gratitude. She rose erect on the spot my friend and I had lately quitted, and there was not in all the long reach of her desire, an inch of her evil that fell short. This first vividness of vision and emotion were things of a few seconds, during which Mrs. Gross's dazed blink across to where I pointed struck me as a sovereign sign that she too at last saw, just as it carried my own eyes precipitately to the child. The revelation then of the manner in which Flora was affected startled me. In truth, far more than it would have done to find her also merely agitated. Her direct dismay was of course not what I had expected. Prepared and on her guard as our pursuit had actually made her, she would repress every betrayal. And I was therefore shaken on the spot by my first glimpse of the particular one for which I had not allowed. To see her, without a convulsion of her small pink face, not even feign to glance in the direction of the prodigy I announced but only, instead of that, turn at me an expression of hard, still gravity, an expression absolutely new and unprecedented, and that appeared to read and accuse and judge me. This was a stroke that somehow converted the little girl herself into the very presence that would make me quail. I quailed, even though my certitude that she thoroughly saw was never greater than at that instant. And in the immediate need to defend myself, I called it passionately to witness. She's there, you unhappy little thing. There, there, there. And you see her as well as you see me. I had said shortly before to Mrs. Gross that she was not at these times a child, but an old, old woman. And that description of her could not have been more strikingly confirmed than in the way in which, for all answer to this, she simply showed me without a concession an admission of her eyes, a countenance of deeper and deeper, of indeed suddenly quite fixed reprobation. I was by this time, if I can put the whole thing at all together, more appalled at what I may properly call her manner than at anything else, though it was simultaneously with this that I became aware of having Mrs. Gross also, and very formidably to reckon with. My elder companion, the next moment at any rate, blotted out everything but her own flushed face and her loud, shocked protest, a burst of high disapproval. What a dreadful turn to be sure, miss. Where on earth do you see anything? I could only grasp her more quickly yet, for even while she spoke, the hideous plain presence stood undimmed and undaunted. It had already lasted a minute, and it lasted while I continued seizing my colleague, quite thrusting her at it and presenting her to it to insist with my pointing hand. You don't see her exactly as we see. You mean to say you don't now? Now? She's as big as a blazing fire. Only look, dearest woman, look! She looked, even as I did, and gave me, with her deep groan of negation, repulsion, compassion, the mixture with her pity of her relief at her exemption, 
a sense touching to me even then that she would have backed me up if she could. I might well have needed that, for with this hard blow of the proof that her eyes were hopelessly sealed, I felt my own situation horribly crumble. I felt, I saw my livid predecessor pass from her position on my defeat, and I was conscious more than all of what I should have from this instant to deal with in the astounding little attitude of Flora. Into this attitude, Mrs. Gross immediately and violently entered breaking, even while there pierced through my sense of ruin, a prodigious private triumph, and a breathless reassurance. She isn't there, little lady, and nobody's there, and you never see nothing, my sweet. How can poor Miss Jessel, when poor Miss Jessel's dead and buried? We know, don't we, love? And she appealed, blundering into the child. It's all a mere mistake and a worry and a joke. We'll all go home as fast as we can. Our companion on this had responded with a strange, quick primness of propriety, and they were again with Mrs. Gross on her feet, united, as it were, in pained opposition to me. Flora continued to fix me with her small mask of reprobation, and even at that minute I prayed God to forgive me for seeming to see that. As she stood there holding tight to our friend's dress, her incomparable childish beauty had suddenly failed, had quite vanished. I've said it already, she was literally, she was hideously hard. She had turned common and almost ugly. I don't know what you mean. I see nobody. I see nothing. I never have. I think you're cruel. I don't like you. Then, after this deliverance, which might have been that of a vulgarly pert little girl on the street, she hugged Mrs. Gross more closely and buried in her skirts the dreadful little face. In this position, she produced an almost furious wail. Take me away. Take me away. Oh, take me away from her. From me, I panted. From you. From you, she cried. Even Mrs. Gross looked across at me dismayed, while I had nothing to do but communicate again with the figure that, on the opposite bank, without a movement, as rigidly still as if catching beyond the interval our voices, was as vividly there for my disaster as it was not there for my service. The wretched child had spoken exactly as if she had got from some outside source each of her stabbing little words and I could therefore, in the full despair of all I had to accept, but sadly shake my head at her. If I had ever doubted, all my doubt would at present have gone. I've been living with the miserable truth, and now it is only too much closed around me. Of course, I've lost you. I've interfered, and you've seen under her dictation, with which I faced over the pool again our infernal witness the easy and perfect way to meet it. I've done my best, but I've lost you. Goodbye. For Mrs. Gross, I had an imperative, an almost frantic, go, go, before which in infinite distress, but mutely possessed of the little girl and clearly convinced in spite of her blindness that something awful had occurred and some collapse engulfed us. She retreated by the way we had come as fast as she could move. Of what first happened when I was left alone, I had no subsequent memory. I only knew that at the end of it, I suppose, a quarter of an hour, an odorous dampness and roughness, chilling and piercing my trouble, had made me understand that I must have thrown myself on my face, on the ground, and given way to a wildness of grief. I must have lain there long and cried and sobbed, for when I raised my head, the day was almost done. I got up and looked a moment through the twilight of the grey pool and its blank haunted edge, and then I took back to the house, my dreary and difficult course. When I reached the gate in the fence, the boat, to my surprise, was gone, so that I had a fresh reflection to make on Flora's extraordinary command of the situation. She passed that night by the most tacit, and I should add, were not the words so grotesque a false note, the happiest of arrangements with Mrs. Gross. I saw neither of them on my return, but on the other hand, as by an ambiguous compensation, I saw a great deal of miles. I saw, I can use no other phrase, so much of him that it was as if it were more than it had ever been. No evening I had passed at Bly had the portentous quality of this one. 
in spite of which, and in spite also of the deeper depths of consternation that had opened beneath my feet, there was literally, in the ebbing actual, an extraordinarily sweet sadness. On reaching the house, I had never so much as looked for the boy. I had simply gone straight to my room to change what I was wearing and to take in at a glance much material testimony to Flora's rupture. Her little belongings had all been removed. When later, by the schoolroom fire, I was served with tea by the usual maid, I indulged on the article of my other pupil in no inquiry whatever. He had his freedom now. He might have it to the end. Well, he did have it, and it consisted, in part at least, of his coming in at about eight o'clock and sitting down with me in silence. On the removal of the tea things I had blown out the candles and drawn my chair closer, I was conscious of a mortal coldness and felt as if I should never again be warm. So when he appeared, I was sitting in the glow with my thoughts. He paused a moment by the door, as if to look at me. Then, as if to share them, came to the other side of the hearth and sank into a chair. We sat there in absolute stillness. Yet he wanted, I felt, to be with me. Chapter 21 before a new day in my room had fully broken, my eyes opened to Mrs. Gross, who had come to my bedside with worse news. Flora was so markedly feverish that an illness was perhaps at hand. She had passed a night of extreme unrest, a night agitated above all by fears that had for their subject not in the least her former, but wholly her present governess. It was not against the possible re-entrance of Miss Jessel on the scene that she protested, it was conspicuously and passionately against mine. I was promptly on my feet, of course, and with an immense deal to ask, the more that my friend had discernibly now girded her loins to meet me once more. This I felt as soon as I had put to her the question of her sense of the child's sincerity as against my own. She persists in denying to you that she saw or has ever seen anything. My visitor's trouble truly was great. Ah, miss, it isn't a matter on which I can push her. Yet it isn't either, I must say, as if I much needed to. It has made her, every inch of her, quite old. Oh, I see perfectly from here. She resents for all the world like some high little personage, the imputation on her truthfulness and, as it were, her respectability. Miss Jessel, indeed. She. Ah, oh, she's respectable, the chit. This impression she gave me there yesterday was, I assure you, the very strangest of all. It was quite beyond any of the others. I didn't put my foot in it. She'll never speak to me again. Hideous and obscure as it all was, it held Mrs. Gross briefly silent. Then she granted my point with a frankness which I made sure had more behind it. I, I think indeed, miss, she never will. She do have a grand manner about it. And that manner, I summed it up, is practically what's the matter with her now. On that manner, I could see in my visitor's face and not a little else besides. She asks me every three minutes if I think you're coming in. I see, I see. I too, on my side, had so much more than worked it out. Has she said to you since yesterday, except to repudiate her familiarity with anything so dreadful, a single other word about Miss Jessel? Not one, miss. And of course, you know, my friend added, I took it from her by the lake that... Just then and there at least, and there was nobody. Rather, and naturally, you take it from her still. I don't contradict her. What else can I do? Nothing in the world. You're the cleverest little person to deal with. They've made them, their two friends, I mean, still cleverer even than nature did. For it was wondrous material to play on. Flora now has her grievance, and she'll work it to the end. Yes, miss, but to what end? Why, that of dealing with me to her uncle, she'll make me out to him the lowest creature. I winced at the fair show of the scene in Mrs. Gross's face. She looked for a minute as if she sharply saw them together. And him who thinks so well of you. He has an odd way. He comes over me now, I laugh, of proving it. But that doesn't matter. What Flora wants, of course, is to get rid of me. My companion bravely concurred. 
never again to so much as look at you. So that what you've come to me for now, I asked, is to speed me on my way. Before she had time to reply, however, I had her in check. I have a better idea, the result of my reflections. My going would seem the right thing, and on Sunday I was terribly near it. Yet that won't do. It's you who must go. You must take Flora. My visitor at this did speculate. But where in the world? Away from here, away from them. Away even, most of all now, from me. Straight to her uncle. Only to tell on you, no, not only, to leave me in addition with my remedy. She was still vague. And what is your remedy? Your loyalty to begin with, and then Miles's. She looked at me hard. Do you think he won't, if he has the chance, turn on me? Yes, I venture still to think it. At all events, I want to try. Get off with his sister as soon as possible and leave me with him alone. I was amazed myself at the spirit I still had in reserve, and therefore perhaps a trifle the more disconcerted at the way in which, in spite of this fine example of it, she hesitated. There's one thing, of course, I went on, they mustn't, before she goes, see each other for three seconds. Then it came over me that in spite of Flora's presumable sequestration from the instant of her return from the pool, it might already be too late. Do you mean, I anxiously asked, that they have met? At this she quite flushed. Oh, miss, I'm not such a fool as that. If I've been obliged to leave her three or four times, it has been each time with one of the maids, and at present, though she's alone, she's locked in safe. And yet, yet, there are too many things. And yet what? Well, are you so sure of the little gentleman? I'm not sure of anything but you. But I have since last evening a new hope. I think he wants to give me an opening. I do believe that poor little exquisite wretch, he wants to speak. Last evening in the firelight and the silence he sat with me for two hours, as if it were just coming. Mrs. Gross looked hard through the window at the grey gathering day. And uh, did it come? No. Though I waited and waited, I confess it didn't. And it was without a breach of the silence or so much as a faint allusion to his sister's condition and absence that we last kissed for good night. All the same, I continued, I can't, if her uncle sees her consent to his seeing her brother without my having given the boy, and most of all because things have got so bad, a little more time. My friend appeared on this ground more reluctant than I could quite understand. What do you mean by more time? Well, a day or two, really, to bring it out. He'll then be on my side, of which you see the importance. If nothing comes, I shall only fail, and you will, at the worst, have helped me by doing, on your arrival in town, whatever you may have found possible. So I put it before her, but she continued for a little so inscrutably embarrassed that I came again to her aid, unless indeed I wound up. You really want not to go. I could see it in her face at last clear itself. She put her hand to me as a pledge. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go this morning. I want it to be very just. If you should wish still to wait, I would engage she shouldn't see me. No, no, it's the place itself. She must leave it. She held me a moment with heavy eyes and brought out the rest. Your idea's the right one. I myself miss. Well, I can't stay. The look she gave me with it made me jump at possibilities. You mean it since yesterday you have seen? She shook her head with dignity. I've heard. Heard? From that child. Horrors. There, she sighed with tragic relief. On my honor, miss, she says things. But at this evocation, she broke down. She dropped with a sudden sob upon my sofa and, as I had seen her do before, gave way to all the grief of it. It was quite in another manner that I, for my part, let myself go. Oh, thank God. She sprang up again at this, drying her eyes with a groan. Thank God. It so justifies me. It does that, miss. I couldn't have desired more emphasis, but I just hesitated. She's so horrible. I saw my colleague scarce knew how to put it. Really shocking. And about me? About you, miss, since you must have it. It's beyond everything for a young lady. And I can't think wherever she must have picked it up. The appalling language she applied to me. I 
can, then. I broke in with a laugh that was doubtless significant enough. It only in truth left my friend still more grave. Well, perhaps I ought to also, since I've heard some of it before, yet I can't bear it. The poor woman went on a while with the same movement. She glanced over on my dressing table at the face of my watch. But I must go back. I kept her, however. Ah, uh, if you can't bear it, how can I stop with her, you mean? Why, just for that, to get her away, far from this, she pursued, far from them. She may be different. She may be free. I seized her almost with joy. Then, in spite of yesterday, you believe in such doings. A simple description of them required in the light of her expression to be carried no further. And she gave me the whole thing as she had never done. I believe. Yes, it was a joy, and we were still shoulder to shoulder. If I might continue sure of that, I should care but little what else happened. My support in the presence of disaster would be the same as it had been in my early need of confidence. And if my friend would answer for my honesty, I would answer for all the rest. On the point of taking leave of her, nonetheless, I was to some extent embarrassed. There's one thing, of course, it occurs to me, to remember. My letter giving the alarm will have reached town before you. I now perceived still more how she had been beating about the bush and how weary at last it had made her. Your letter won't have got there. Your letter never went. What then became of it? Goodness knows. Master Miles. Do you mean he took it? I gasped. She hung fire, but she overcame her reluctance. I mean that I saw yesterday when I came back with Miss Flora that it wasn't where you had put it. Later in the evening, I had the chance to question Luke, and he declared that he had neither noticed nor touched it. We could only exchange on this one of our deeper mutual soundings, and it was Mrs. Gross who first brought up the plum with the almost elated, You see? Yes. I see that if Miles took it instead, he probably would have read it and destroyed it. And don't you see anything else? I faced her a moment with a sad smile. It strikes me that by this time your eyes are open even wider than mine. They proved to be so indeed, but she could still blush almost to show it. I make out now what he must have done at school. And she gave, in her simple sharpness, an almost droll, disillusioned nod. He stole. I turned it over. I tried to be more judicial. Well, perhaps. She looked as if she found me unexpectedly calm. He stole letters. She couldn't know my reasons for a calmness, after all, pretty shallow. So I showed them off as I might. I hoped then it was to more purpose than in this case. The note, at any rate, that I put on the table yesterday, I pursued, will have given him so scant an advantage. For it only contained the bare demand for an interview, that he is already much ashamed of having gone so far for so little, and that what he had on his mind last evening was precisely the need of confession. I seemed to myself for the instant to have mastered it, to see it all. Leave us, leave us. I was already at the door hurrying her off. I'll get it out of him. He'll meet me. He'll confess. If he confesses, he's saved. And if he's saved, then you are. The dear woman kissed me on this, and I took her farewell. I'll save you without him, she cried as she went. Chapter 22 Yet it was when she had got off, and I missed her on the spot, the great pinch really came. If I had counted on what it would give me to find myself alone with Miles, I speedily perceived, at least, that it would give me a measure. No hour of my stay, in fact, was so assailed with apprehensions as that of my coming down to learn that the carriage containing Mrs. Gross and my younger pupil had already rolled out of the gates. Now I was, I said to myself, face to face with the elements, and for much of the rest of the day, while I fought my weakness, I would consider that I had been supremely rash. It was a tighter place still than I had yet turned round in, all the more that for the first time I could see in the aspect of others a confused reflection of the crisis. What had happened naturally caused them all to stare. There was too little of the explained throughout whatever we might in the suddenness of my colleague's act. The maids and the men looked blank, the effect of which on my nerves was an aggravation until I saw the necessity of making it a positive aid. It was precisely, in short, 
by just clutching the helm that I avoided total wreck. And I dare say that to bear up at all, I became that morning very grand and very dry. I welcomed the consciousness that I was charged with much to do, and I caused it to be known as well that left thus to myself I was quite remarkably firm. I wandered with that manner for the next hour or two all over the place and looked, I have no doubt, as if I were ready for any onset. So, for the benefit of whom it might concern, I paraded with a sick heart. The person it appeared least to concern proved to be till dinner little Miles himself. My perambulations had given me, meanwhile, no glimpse of him, but they had tended to make more public the change taking place in our relation as a consequence of his having at the piano the day before kept me, in Flora's interest, so beguiled and befooled. The stamp of publicity had, of course, been fully given by her confinement and departure, and the change itself was now ushered in by our non-observance of the regular custom of the schoolroom. He had already disappeared when, on my way down, I pushed open his door, and I learned below that he had breakfasted in the presence of a couple of the maids with Mrs. Gross and his sister. He had then gone out, as he said, for a stroll, than which nothing, I reflected, could better have expressed his frank view of the abrupt transformation of my office. What he would not permit this office to consist of was yet to be settled. There was a queer relief at all events, I mean for myself in especial, in the renouncement of one pretension. If so much had sprung to the surface, I scarce put it too strongly in saying that what had perhaps sprung highest was the absurdity of our prolonging the fiction that I had anything more to teach him. It sufficiently stuck out that by tacit little tricks in which even more than myself he carried out the care for my dignity, I had had to appeal to him to let me off straining to meet him on the ground of his true capacity. He had, at any rate, his freedom now. I was never to touch it again, as I had amply shown moreover when on his joining me in the schoolroom the previous night, I had uttered on the subject of the interval just concluded neither challenge nor hint. I had too much from this moment my other ideas. Yet, when he at last arrived, the difficulty of applying them, the accumulations of my problem, were brought straight home to me by the beautiful little presence on which what had occurred had as yet for the eye dropped neither stain nor shadow. To mark for the house the high state I cultivated, I decreed that my meals with the boy should be served, as we called it, downstairs, so that I had been awaiting him in the ponderous pomp of the room outside of the window, of which I had had from Mrs. Gross that first scared Sunday, my flash of something it would scarce have done to call light. Here at present, I felt it fresh, for I had felt it again and again how my equilibrium depended on the success of my rigid will, the will to shut my eyes as tight as possible to the truth that what I had to deal with was revoltingly against nature. I could only get on at all by taking nature into my confidence, and to my account, by treating my monstrous ordeal as a push in a direction unusual, of course, and unpleasant, but demanding, after all, for a fair front, only another turn of the screw of ordinary human virtue. No attempt, nonetheless, could well require more tact than just this attempt to supply oneself all the nature. How could I put even a little of that article into a suppression of reference to what had occurred? How, on the other hand, could I make reference without a new plunge into the hideous obscure? Well, a sort of answer after a time had come to me and it was so far confirmed as that I was met incontestably by the quickened vision of what was rare in my little companion. It was indeed as if he had found even now, as he had so often found of lessons, still some other delicate way to ease me off. Wasn't there light in the fact which, as we shared our solitude, broke out with a specious glitter it had never yet quite worn? The fact that opportunity aiding, precious opportunity which had now come, it would be preposterous with a child so endowed to forego the help one might wrest from absolute intelligence. What had his intelligence been given him for but to save him? 
mightn't want to reach his mind risk the stretch of an angular arm over his character. It was as if when we were face to face in the dining room, he had literally shown me the way. The roast mutton was on the table, and I had dispensed with attendance. Miles, before he sat down, stood a moment with his hands in his pockets and looked at the joint, on which he seemed on the point of passing some humorous judgment. But what he presently produced was, I say, my dear, is she really very awfully ill? Little Flora, not so bad, but she'll presently be better. London will set her up. Bly had ceased to agree with her. Come here and take your mutton. He alertly obeyed me, carried the plate carefully to his seat, and when he was established, went on. Did Bly disagree with her so terribly suddenly? Not so suddenly as you might think. Juan had seen it coming on. Then why didn't you get her off before? Before what? Before she became too ill to travel? I found myself prompt. She's not too ill to travel. She only might have become so if she had stayed. This was just the moment to seize. The journey will dissipate the influence. Oh, I was grand. And carry it off. I see. I see. Miles, for that matter, was grand too. He settled to his repast with the charming little table manner that from the day of his arrival had relieved me of all grossness of admonition. Whatever he had been driven off from school for, it was not for ugly feeding. He was irreproachable as always today, but he was unmistakably more conscious. He was discernibly trying to take for granted more things than he found without assistance quite easy. And he dropped into peaceful silence while he felt his situation. Our meal was of the briefest, mine vain pretense, and I had the things immediately removed. While this was done, Miles stood again with his hands in his little pockets and his back to me, stood and looked out of the wide window through which that other day I had seen what pulled me up. We continued silent while the maid was with us, as silent it whimsically occurred to me as some young couple who on their wedding journey at the inn feel shy in the presence of the waiter. He turned round only when the waiter had left us. Well, so we're alone. Chapter 23. Oh, more or less. I fancy my smile was pale. Not absolutely, we shouldn't like that, I went on. No, I suppose we shouldn't. Of course, we have the others. We have the others. We have indeed the others, I concur. Yet, even though we have them, he returned, still with his hands in his pockets and planted there in front of me. They don't count much, do they? I made the best of it, but I felt what? Well. It depends what you call much. Yes, with all accommodation. Everything depends. On this, however, he faced to the window again and presently reached it with his vague, restless, cogitating step. He remained there a while, with his forehead against the glass, in contemplation of the stupid shrubs I knew and the dull things of November. I had always my hypocrisy of work, behind which now I gained the sofa. Steadying myself with it there, as I had repeatedly done at those moments of torment that I have described as the moments of my knowing the children to be given to something from which I was barred, I sufficiently obeyed my habit of being prepared for the worst, but an extraordinary impression dropped on me as I extracted a meaning from the boy's embarrassed back. None other than the impression that I was not barred now. This inference grew in a few minutes to sharp intensity and seemed bound up with the direct perception that it was positively he who was. The frames and squares of the great window were a kind of image for him kind of failure. I felt that I saw him at any rate shut in or shut out. He was admirable, but not comfortable. I took it in with a throb of hope. Wasn't he looking through the haunted pane for something he couldn't see? And wasn't it the first time in the whole business that he had known such a lapse? The first, the very first. I found it a splendid portent. It made him anxious, though he watched himself he had been anxious all day, and even while in his usual sweet little manner he sat at table, 
had needed all his small, strange genius to give it a gloss. When he at last turned round to meet me, it was almost as if this genius had succumbed. Well, I think I'm glad Bly agrees with me. You would certainly seem to have seen these 24 hours a good deal more of it than for some time before. I hope, I went on bravely, that you've been enjoying yourself. Oh yes, I've been ever so far, all round about, miles and miles. I've never been so free. He had really a manner of his own, and I could only try to keep up with him. Well, do you like it? He stood there smiling. Then at last he put into two words. For you, more discrimination than I had ever heard two words contain. Before I had time to deal with that, however, he continued, as if with the sense that this was an impertinence to be softened. Nothing could be more charming than the way you take it. Of course, if we're alone together, now it's you that are alone most, but I hope, he threw in, you don't particularly mind. Having to do with you, I asked, my dear child, how can I help minding? Though I've renounced all claim to your company, or so beyond me, I at least greatly enjoy it. What else should I stay on for? He looked at me more directly, and the expression of his face, graver now, struck me as the most beautiful I had ever found in it. You stay on just for that? Certainly, I stay on as your friend, and from the tremendous interest I take in you, for something can be done for you that may be more worth your while. That needn't surprise you. My voice trembled, so that I felt it impossible to suppress the shake. Don't you remember how I told you when I came and sat on your bed the night of the storm that there was nothing in the world I wouldn't do for you? Yes, yes. He, on his side, more and more visibly nervous, had a tone to master, but he was so much more successful than I. But laughing out through his gravity, he could pretend we were pleasantly jesting. Only that, I think, was to get me to do something for you. It was partly to get you to do something, I conceded, but you know... You didn't do it. Oh, yes, he said with the brightest superficial eagerness. You uh, wanted me to tell you something. That's it, out, straight out. What have you on your mind, you know? Ah, then is that what you've stayed over for? He spoke with a gaiety through which I could still catch the finest little quiver of resentful passion, but I can't begin to express the effect upon me of an implication to surrender even so faint. It was as if, what I had yearned for had come at last only to astonish me. Well, yes, I may as well make a clean breast of it. It was precisely for that. He waited so long that I supposed it for the purpose of repudiating the assumption on which my action had been founded. But what he finally said was, Do you mean now? Here. There couldn't be a better place or time. He looked round him uneasily and I had the rare, queer impression of the very first symptom I had seen in him of the approach of immediate fear. It was as if he was suddenly afraid of me, which struck me indeed as perhaps the best thing to make. Yet, in the very pang of the effort, I felt it vain to try sternness. I heard myself the next instant so gentle as to be almost grotesque. You want so to go out again? Awfully, he smiled at me heroically, and the touching little bravery of it was enhanced by his actually flushing with pain. He had picked up his hat, which he had brought in, and stood twirling it in a way that gave me, even as I was just nearly reaching port, a perverse horror of what I was doing. To do it in any way was an act of violence, but what did it consist of but the obtrusion of the idea of grossness and guilt on a small, helpless creature who had been for me a revelation of the possibilities of beautiful intercourse wasn't it base to create for a being so exquisite a mere alien awkwardness? I suppose I now read into our situation a clearness we couldn't have had at the time, for I seemed to see our poor eyes already lighted with some spark of a prevision of the anguish that was to come. So we circled about with terrors and scruples, like fighters not daring to close. But it was for each other that we feared. That kept us a little longer suspended and bruised. I'll tell you everything, Miles said. I mean, I'll tell you anything you like. You'll stay on with me, and we shall both be all right, and I'll tell you. I will. 
But not now. Why not now? My insistence turned him from me and kept him once more at his window in a silence, during which between us you might have heard a pin drop. Then he was before me again with the air of a person for whom, outside, someone who had frankly to be reckoned with was waiting. I have to see Luke. I had not yet reduced him to so quite vulgar a lie, and I felt proportionately ashamed. But horrible as it was, his lies made up my truth. I achieved thoughtfully a few loops of my knitting. Well then, go to Luke, and I'll wait for what you promise. Only, in return for that, satisfy before you leave me one very much smaller request. He looked as if he felt he had succeeded enough to be able still a little to bargain. Very much smaller? Yes, a mere fraction of the whole. Tell me. Oh, the work preoccupied me and I was offhand. If yesterday afternoon from the table in the hall... You took, you know, my letter. Chapter 24 My sense of how he received this suffered for a minute from something that I can describe only as a fierce split of my attention. A stroke that at first, as I sprang straight up, reduced me to the mere blind movement of getting hold of him, drawing him close, and while I just fell for support against the nearest piece of furniture, instinctively keeping him with his back to the window. The appearance was full upon us that I had already had to deal with here. Peter Quint had come into view like a sentinel before a prison. The next thing I saw was that from outside he had reached the window, and then I knew that close to the glass and glaring in through it, he offered once more to the room his white face of damnation. It represents but grossly what took place within me at the sight to say that on the second my decision was made, yet I believe that no woman so overwhelmed ever in so short a time recovered her grasp of the act. It came to me in the very horror of the immediate presence that the act would be seeing and facing what I saw and faced to keep the boy himself unaware. The inspiration, I can call it by no other name, was that I felt how voluntarily how transcendental it might. It was like fighting with a demon for a human soul. And when I had fairly so appraised it, I saw how the human soul held out in the tremor of my hands at arm's length had a perfect view of sweat on a lovely childish forehead. The face that was so close to mine was as white as the face against the glass, and out of it presently came a sound, not low nor weak, but as if from much further away, that I drank like a waft of fragrance. Yes, I took it. At this, with a moan of joy, I enfolded and drew him close. And while I held him to my breast, where I could feel in the sudden fever of his little body the tremendous pulse of his little heart, I kept my eyes on the thing at the window and saw it move and shift its posture. I had likened it to a sentinel, but its slow wheel for a moment was rather the prowl of a baffled beast. My present quickened courage, however, was such that not too much to let it through, I had to shade, as it were, my flame. Meanwhile, the glare of the face was again at the window, the scoundrel fixed as if to watch and to wait. It was the very confidence that I might now defy him, as well as the positive certitude by this time child's unconsciousness that made me go on. What did you take it for? See what you said about me. You opened the letter. I opened it. My eyes were now, as I held him off a little again, on Miles's own face, on which the collapse of mockery showed me how completely was the ravage of uneasiness. What was prodigious was that at last by my success his sense was sealed and his communication stopped. He knew that he was in the presence, but knew not of what, and knew still less that I also was and that I did know. And what did this strain of trouble matter when my eyes went back to the window only to see that the air was clear again, and by my personal triumph, the influence quenched. There was nothing there. I felt that the cause was mine and that I would surely get all. And you found nothing, I let my elation out. He gave the most mournful, thoughtful little head shake. Nothing, 
Nothing, nothing, I almost shouted in my joy. Nothing, nothing, he sadly repeated. I kissed his forehead, it was drenched. So what have you done with it? I burned it. Burned it? It was now or never. Is that what you did at school? Oh, what this brought up. At school? Did you take letters? Or other things? Other things? He appeared now to be thinking of something far off, and that reached him only through the pressure of his anxiety. Yet it did reach him. Did I steal? I felt myself redden to the roots of my hair, as well as wonder if it were more strange to put to a gentleman such a question, or to see him take it with allowances that gave the very distance of his fall in the world. Was it for that you mightn't go back? The only thing he felt was rather a dreary little surprise. Did you know I mightn't go back? I know everything. He gave me at this the longest and strangest look. Everything. Everything, therefore did you... But I couldn't say it again. Miles could, very simply. No, I didn't steal. My face must have shown him I believed him utterly, yet my hands, that it was for pure tenderness, shook him, as if to ask him why, if it was all for nothing, he had condemned me to months of torment. What then did you do? He looked in vague pain all round the top of the room and drew his breath two or three times over as if with difficulty. He might have been standing at the bottom of the sea and raising his eyes to some faint green twilight. Well, I said things. Only that? They thought it was enough. To turn you out for? Never truly had a person turned out shown so little to explain it as this little person. He appeared to weigh my question, but in a manner quite detached and almost helpless. Well, I suppose I oughtn't. But to whom did you say them? He evidently tried to remember, but it dropped. He had lost it. I don't know. He almost smiled at me in the desolation of his surrender, which was indeed practically by this time so complete that I ought to have left it there. But I was infatuated. I was blind with victory. Though even then the very effect that was to have brought him so much nearer was already that of added separation. Was it to everyone? I asked. No, it was only to... But he gave a sick little head shake. I don't remember their names. Were they then so many? No, only a few. Those I liked. Those he liked. I seemed to float not into clearness, but into a darker obscure. And within a minute there had come to me out of my very pity the appalling alarm of his being perhaps innocent. It was for the instant confounding and bottomless, for if he were innocent, what then on earth was I? Paralyzed while it lasted by the mere brush of the question, I let him go a little, so that with a deep-drawn sigh he turned away from me again, which, as he faced toward the clear window, I suffered, feeling that I had nothing now there to keep him from. And did they repeat what you said? I went on after a moment. He was soon at some distance from me, still breathing hard and again with the air, though now without anger for it of being confined against his will. Once more, as he had done before, he looked up at the dim day, as if of what had hitherto sustained him nothing was left but an unspeakable anxiety. Oh yes, he nevertheless replied. They must have repeated them, to those they liked, he added. There was somehow less of it than I had expected, but I turned it over. And uh, these things came round to the masters. Oh, yes, he answered very simply. But I didn't know they'd tell. The masters, they didn't. They've never told. That's why I ask you. He turned to me again, his little beautiful fevered face. Yes, it was too bad. Too bad. What I suppose I sometimes said. To write home. I can't name the exquisite pathos of the contradiction given to such a speech by such a speaker. I only know that the next instant I heard myself thrown off with homely force. Stuff and nonsense. But the next after that I must have sounded stern enough. What were these things? My sternness was all for his judge, his executioner, yet it made him avert himself again. And that movement made me, with a single bound and an irrepressible cry, spring straight upon him. But there, again, against the glass, 
as if to blight his confession and stay his answer, was the hideous author of our woe, the white face of damnation. I felt a sick swim at the drop of my victory and all the return of my battle, so the wildness of my veritable leap only served as a great betrayal. I saw him from the midst of my act meted with a divination, and on the perception that even now he only guessed and that the window was still to his own eyes free, I let the impulse flame up to convert the climax of his dismay into the very proof of his liberation. No more, no more, no more, I shrieked as I tried to press him against me to my visitant. Is she here? Mars panted as he caught with his sealed eyes the direction of my words. Then, as his strange, she staggered me, and with a gasp I echoed it. Miss Jessel, Miss Jessel. He, with a sudden fury, gave me back. I seized, stupefied his supposition, some sequel to what we had done to Flora, but this made me only want to show him that it was better still than that. It's not Miss Jessel, but it's at the window straight before us. It's there, coward horror, there for the last time. But this, after a second in which his head made the movement of a baffled dog's on a scent, and then gave a frantic shake for air and light, he was at me in a white rage, bewildered, glaring vainly over the place and missing wholly, though right now, to my sense, filled the room like a taste of poison, a wide, overwhelming presence. It's he! I was so determined to have all my proof that I flashed into ice to challenge him. Who do you mean by he? Peter Quint, you devil! His face gave again round the room, its convulsed supplication. Where? They are in my ears still, his supreme surrender of the name, and his tribute to my devotion. What does he matter now, my own? What will he ever matter? I have you. I launched at the beast, but he has lost you forever. Then, with a demonstration of my work, there, there, I said to Miles. But he had already jerked straight round, stared, glared again, and seen but the quiet day. With the stroke of the loss I was so proud of, he uttered the cry of a creature hurled over an abyss, and the grasp with which I recovered him might have been that of catching him in his fall. I caught him, yes, I held him. It may be imagined with what a passion, but at the end of a minute, I began to feel what it truly was that I held. We were alone with a quiet day, and his little heart, dispossessed, had stopped. That was The Turn of the Screw, written by Henry James, and narrated by Tony Walker. The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. It is very seldom that mere ordinary people like John and myself secure ancestral halls for the summer, a colonial mansion, a hereditary estate, I would say a haunted house, and reach the heights of romantic felicity, but that would be asking too much of fate. Still, I will proudly declare that there is something queer about it, else why should it be let so cheaply? and why it stood so long untenanted. John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in marriage. John is practical in the extreme. He has no patience with faith, an intense horror of superstition, and he scoffs openly at any talk of things not to be felt and seen and put down in figures. John is a physician, and perhaps I would not say it to a living soul, of course, but this is dead paper and a great relief to my mind. Perhaps... That is one reason I do not get well faster. You see, he does not believe that I am sick. And what can one do? 
If a physician of high standing and one's own husband assures friends and relatives that there is really nothing the matter with one, a temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency, what is one to do? My brother is also a physician and also of high standing, and he says the same thing. So I take phosphates or phosphites, whatever it is, and tonics and journeys and air and exercise, and am absolutely forbidden to work until I'm well again. Personally, I disagree with their ideas. Personally, I believe the congenial work with excitement and change would do me good. But what is one to do? I did write for a while in spite of them, but it does exhaust me a good deal, having to be so sly about it or else meet with heavy opposition. I sometimes fancy that in my condition, if I had less opposition and more society and stimulus, but John says the very worst thing I can do is think about my condition, and I confess it always makes me feel bad. So I will let it alone and talk about the house. The most beautiful place. It is quite alone, standing well back from the road, quite three miles from the village. It makes me think of English places that you read about, but there are hedges and walls and gates that lock and lots of separate little houses for the gardeners and people. There is a delicious garden. I never saw such a garden, large and shady, full of box bordered paths and lined with long grape-covered arbors with seats under them. There were greenhouses too, but they are all broken now. There was some legal trouble, I believe. Something about the heirs and co-heirs. Anyhow, the place has been empty for years. That spoils my ghostliness, I am afraid, but I don't care. There is something strange about the house. I can feel it. I even said so to John one moonlit evening, but he said what I felt was a draft and shut the window. I get unreasonably angry with John sometimes. I am sure I never used to be so sensitive. I think it's due to this nervous condition, but John says if I feel so, I shall neglect proper self-control. So I take pains to control myself, before him at least, and that makes me very tired. I don't like our room a bit. I wanted one downstairs that opened onto the piazza and had roses all over the window and such pretty old-fashioned chintz hangings, but John would not hear of it. He said there was only one window and not room for two beds, and no near room for him if he took another. He is very careful and loving and hardly lets me stir without special direction. I have a scheduled prescription for each hour in the day. He takes all care from me and I feel so basely ungrateful not to value it more. He said we came here solely on my account, that I was to have a perfect rest and all the air I could get. Your exercise depends on your strength, my dear, said he, and your food somewhat on your appetite. But air you can absorb all the time. So we took the nursery at the top of the house. It is a big, airy room, the whole floor nearly, with windows that look always and air and sunshine galore. It was nursery first and then playroom and gymnasium. I should judge, for the windows are barred for little children and there are rings and things in the walls. The paint and paper look as if a boy's school had used it. It stripped off the paper in great patches all around the head of my bed, about as far as I can reach and in a great place on the other side of the room, low down. I never saw worse paper in my life. It is one of those sprawling, flamboyant patterns committing every artistic sin. It is dull enough to confuse the eye in following, pronounced enough to constantly irritate and provoke study, and when you follow the lame, uncertain curves for a little distance, they suddenly commit suicide, plunge off at outrageous angles, destroy themselves in unheard of contradictions. The color is repellent almost revolting, a smoldering, unclean yellow, strangely faded by the slow-turning sunlight. It is a dull yet lurid orange in some places, a sickly sulfur tint in others. No wonder the children hated it. I should hate it myself if I had to live in this room long. There comes John, I must put this away. He hates to have me write a word. We've been here two weeks and I haven't felt like writing before since that first day. I am sitting by the window now, up in this atrocious nursery, and there's nothing to hinder my writing as much as I please, save lack of strength. John is away all day, and even some nights when his cases are serious. I'm glad my case is not serious. But these nervous troubles are dreadfully depressing. John does not know how much I really suffer. He knows there is no reason to suffer, and that satisfies him. Of course, it is only nervousness. It does weigh on me, so not to do my duty in any way. I meant to be such a help to John, such a real rest and comfort, and here I am, a comparative burden already. 
Nobody would believe what an effort it is to do what little I am able to dress and entertain and order things. It is fortunate Mary is so good with the baby, such a dear baby, and yet I cannot be with him. It makes me so nervous. I suppose John never was nervous in his life. He laughs at me so about this wallpaper. At first he meant to repaper the room, but afterwards he said I was letting it get the better of me, and nothing was worse for a nervous patient than to give way to such fancies. He said that after the wallpaper was changed, it would be the heavy bedstead, and then the barred windows, and then that gate at the head of the stairs, and so on. You know the place is doing you good, he said, and really, dear, I don't care to renovate the house just for a three months rental. Then do let us go downstairs, I said. There are such pretty rooms there. He took me in his arms and called me a blessed little goose and said he would go down to the cellar if I wished and have it whitewashed into the bargain. But he is right enough about the beds and windows and things. It is an airy and comfortable room as anyone need wish and, of course, I would not be so silly as to make him uncomfortable just for a whim. I'm really getting quite fond of this big room, all but that horrid paper. Out of one window I can see the garden, those mysterious deep-shaded arbors and riotous old-fashioned flowers and bushes and gnarly trees. Out of another I get a lovely view of the bay and a little private wharf belonging to the estate. There is a beautiful shaded lane that runs down there from the house. I always fancy I see people walking in these numerous paths and arbors, but John has cautioned me not to give way to fancy in the least. He says that with my imaginative power and habit of story-making, a nervous weakness like mine, he's sure to lead to all manner of excited fancies, and that I ought to use my will and good sense to check the tendency. So I try. I think sometimes that if I were only well enough to write a little, it would relieve the press of ideas and rest me, but I find I get pretty tired when I try. It is so discouraging not to have any advice and companionship about my work. When I get really well, John says we will ask Cousin Henry and Julia down for a long visit. But he says he would soon as put fireworks in my pillowcase as let me have those stimulating people about now. I wish I could get well faster, but I must not think about that. This paper looks to me as if it knew what a vicious influence it had. There is a recurrent spot where the pattern lolls like a broken neck, and two bulbous eyes stare at you upside down. I get positively angry with the impertinence of it and the everlastingness. Up and down and sideways they crawl, and those absurd unblinking eyes are everywhere. There is one place where two breaths didn't match, and the eyes go all up and down the line, one a little higher than the other. I never saw so much expression in an inanimate thing before, and we all know how much expression they have. I used to lie awake as a child and get more entertainment and terror out of blank walls and plain furniture than most children could find in a toy store. I remember what a kindly wink the knobs of our big old bureau used to have. And there was one chair that always seemed like a strong friend. I used to feel that if any of the other things looked too fierce, I could always hop into the chair and be safe. The furniture in this room is no worse than inharmonious, however, for we had to bring it all from downstairs. I suppose when this was used as a playroom, they had to take the nursery things out, and no wonder. I never saw such ravages as the children have made here. The wallpaper, as I said before, is torn off in spots, and it sticks closer than a brother. They must have had perseverance as well as hatred. Then the floor is scratched and gouged and splintered. The plaster itself is dug out here and there, and this great heavy bed, which is all we found in the room, Looks as if it had been through the wars, but I don't mind it a bit. Only the paper. There comes John's sister. Such a dear girl as she is, and so careful of me. I must not let her find me writing. She is a perfect and enthusiastic housekeeper, and hopes for no better profession. I verily believe she thinks it is the writing that makes me sick. But I can write when she's out, and I see her a long way off from these windows. There is one that commands a road, a lovely shaded winding road, and one that just looks over the country. A lovely country, too, full of great elms and velvet meadows. This wallpaper has a kind of sub-pattern in a different shade, a particularly irritating one, where you can only see it in certain lights and not clearly then. 
But in the places where it isn't faded and where the sun is just so, I can see a strange, provoking, formless sort of figure that seems to skulk about behind that silly and conspicuous front design. There's Sister on the stairs. Well, the 4th of July is over. People are all gone and I'm tired out. John thought it might do me good to see a little company, so we just had Mother and Nellie and the children down for a week. Of course, I didn't do a thing. Jenny sees to everything now. But it tired me all the same. John says if I don't pick up faster, he shall send me to Weir Mitchell in the fall. But I don't want to go there at all. I had a friend who was in his hands once, and she says it is just like John and my brother, only more so. Besides, it is such an undertaking to go so far. I don't feel as if it was worthwhile to turn my hand over for anything, and I'm getting dreadfully fretless and querulous. I cry at nothing and cry most of the time. Of course, I don't when John is here or anybody else, but when I'm alone, and I am alone a great deal just now. John is kept in town very often by serious cases, and Jenny is good and lets me alone when I want her to. So I walk a little in the garden or down that lovely lane, sit on the porch under the roses and lie down up here a good deal. I'm getting really fond of the room in spite of the wallpaper, perhaps because of the wallpaper. It dwells in my mind so. I lie here on this great and movable bed that is nailed down, I believe, and follow that pattern about by the hour. It is as good as gymnastics, I assure you. I start, we'll say, at the bottom, down in the corner, over there where it is not being touched. And I determine for the thousandth time that I will follow that pointless pattern to some sort of conclusion. I know a little of the principle of design, and I know that this thing was not arranged on any laws of radiation, or alternation, or repetition, or symmetry, or anything else that I've ever heard of. It is repeated, of course, by the breaths, but not otherwise. Looked at in one way, each breath stands alone. The bloated curves and flourishes, a kind of debased Romanesque, with delirium tremens, go waddling up and down in isolated columns of fatuity. But, on the other hand, they connect diagonally, and the sprawling outlines run off in great slanting waves of optic horror, like a lot of wallowing seaweeds at full chase. The whole thing goes horizontally, too. At least it seems to. And I exhaust myself in trying to distinguish the order of its going in that direction. They have used the horizontal breath for a breeze, and that adds wonderfully to the confusion. There is one end of the room where it's almost intact, and there, where the cross lights fade and the low sun shines directly upon it, I can almost fancy radiation after all. The interminable grotesques seem to form around a common center and rush off in headlong plunges of equal distraction. It makes me tired to follow it. I'll take a nap, I guess. I don't know why I should write this. I don't want to. I don't feel able. And I know that John would think it absurd, but I must say what I feel and think in some way. It is such a relief. But the effort is getting to be greater than the relief. Half the time now, I'm awfully lazy and lie down ever so much. John says I mustn't lose my strength and has me take cod liver oil and lots of tonics and things to say nothing of ale and wine and rare meat. Dear John, he loves me very dearly and hates to have me sick. I tried to have a real earnest, reasonable talk with him the other day and tell him how I wish he would let me go and make a visit to cousin Henry and Julia. But he said I wasn't able to go, nor able to stand it after I got there, and I did not make out a very good case for myself, for I was crying before I had finished. It's getting to be a great effort for me to think straight. Just this nervous weakness, I suppose. And dear John gathered me up in his arms and just carried me upstairs and laid me on the bed. And sat by me and read to me till it tired my head. He said I was his darling and his comfort and all he had. And that I must take care of myself for his sake and keep well. He says no one but myself can help me out of it. And that I must use my will and self-control and not let any silly fancies run away with me. There's one comfort, the baby is well and happy and doesn't have to occupy this nursery with the horrid wallpaper. If we had not used it, that blessed child would have. What a fortunate escape. Why, I wouldn't have a child of mine, an impressionable little thing, live in such a room for worlds. I never thought about it before, but it is lucky that John kept me here after all. 
I can stand it so much easier than a baby, you see. Of course, I never mention it to them anymore. I'm too wise. But I keep watch of it all the same. There are things in that paper that nobody knows but me or ever will. Behind that outside pattern, the dim shapes get clearer every day. It is always the same shape, only very numerous. And it is like a woman stooping down and creeping about behind that pattern. I don't like it a bit. I wonder, I begin to think, I wish John would take me away from here. It is so hard to talk to John about my case because he's so wise and because he loves me so. But I tried it last night. It was moonlight. The moon shines and all around just as the sun does. I hate to see it sometimes. It creeps so slowly and always comes in by one window or another. John was asleep and I hated to waken him, so I kept still and watched the moonlight on the undulating wallpaper till I felt creepy. The faint figure behind seemed to shake the pattern, just as if she wanted to get out. I got up softly and went to feel and see if the paper did move. And when I came back, John was awake. What is it, little girl, he said. Don't go walking about like that. You'll get cold. I thought it was a good time to talk, so I told him that I really was not gaining here and that I wished he would take me away. Why, darling, he said. Our lease will be up in three weeks, and I can't see how to leave before. The repairs are not done at home, and I cannot possibly leave town just now. Of course, if you were in any danger, I could and would, but you really are better, dear, whether you can see it or not. I am a doctor, dear, and I know. You're gaining flesh and color. Your appetite is better. I feel really much easier about you. I don't weigh a bit more, said I, nor as much. My appetite may be better in the evening when you're here, but it's worse in the morning when you're away. Bless her little heart, said he with a big hug. She shall be as sick as she pleases. But now let's improve the shining hours by going to sleep and talk about it in the morning. And you won't go away, I asked gloomily. Why, how can I, dear? It's only three weeks more, and then we'll take a nice little trip of a few days while Jenny is getting the house ready. Really, dear, you are better. Better in body, perhaps, I began and stopped short, for he sat up straight and looked at me with such a stern, reproachful look that I could not say another word. My darling, said he, I beg of you for my sake and for our child's sake as well as for your own that you will never for one instant let that idea enter your mind. There is nothing so dangerous, so fascinating to a temperament like yours. It is a false and foolish fancy. Can you not trust me as a physician when I tell you so? So, of course, I said no more on that score, and we went to sleep before long. He thought I was asleep first, but I wasn't. And I lay there for hours trying to decide whether that front pattern and the back pattern really did move together or separately. On a pattern like this by daylight, there's a lack of sequence, a defiance of law that is a constant irritant to the normal mind. The color is hideous enough and unreliable enough and infuriating enough that the pattern is torturing. You think you've mastered it, but just as you get well into way in following, it turns a back somersault and there you are. It slaps you in the face, knocks you down and tramples upon you. It's like a bad dream. The outside pattern is a florid arabesque, reminding one of a fungus. If you can imagine a toadstool in joints, an interminable string of toadstools budding and sprouting in endless convolutions. Why? That is something like it. That is, sometimes. There is one marked peculiarity about this paper, a thing which nobody seems to notice but myself, and that is, it changes as the light changes. When the sun shoots in through the east window, I always watch that first long straight ray. It changes so quickly that I can never quite believe it. That is why I watch it always. By moonlight, the moon shines in all night when there is a moon. I wouldn't know it was the same paper. At night, in any kind of light, in twilight, candlelight, lamplight, and worst of all, by moonlight, it becomes bars. The outside pattern, I mean, and the woman behind it is as plain as can be. I didn't realize for a long time what the thing was that showed behind that dim sub-pattern, but now I'm quite sure it is a woman. By daylight, she is subdued, quiet. I fancy it is the pattern that keeps her so still. That is so puzzling, it keeps me quiet by the hour. I lie down ever so much now. John says it's good for me and to sleep while I can. 
Indeed, he started the habit by making me lie down for an hour after each meal. It is a very bad habit, I'm convinced. But you see, I don't sleep. And that cultivates deceit. Or I don't tell them I'm awake. Oh, no. The fact is, I'm getting a little afraid of John. He seems very queer sometimes. And even Jenny has an inexplicable look. It strikes me occasionally, just as a scientific hypothesis, that perhaps it is the paper. I have watched John when he didn't know I was looking, and come into the room suddenly on the most innocent excuses, and I've caught him several times looking at the paper, and Jenny too. I caught Jenny with her hand on it once. She didn't know I was in the room, and when I asked her in a quiet and very quiet voice, with the most restrained manner possible, what she was doing with the paper, she turned around, as if she'd been caught stealing, and looked quite angry, asked me why I should frighten her so. Then she said that the paper stained everything it touched, and that she'd found yellow smooches on all my clothes and John's, and she wished we'd be more careful. Did that not sound innocent? But I know she was studying that pattern, and I'm determined that nobody shall find it out but myself. Life is very much more exciting now than it used to be. You see, I have something more to expect, to look forward to, to watch. I really do eat better and am more quiet than I was. John is so pleased to see me improve. He laughed a little the other day and said I seemed to be flourishing in spite of my wallpaper. I turned it off with a laugh. I had no intention of telling him it was because of the wallpaper. He would make fun of me. He might even want to take me away. I don't want to leave now until I found it out. There is a week more, and I think that'll be enough. I'm feeling ever so much better. I don't sleep much at night, for it's so interesting to watch developments. But I sleep a good deal in the daytime. In the daytime, it's tiresome and perplexing. There are always new shoots on the fungus and new shades of yellow all over it. I cannot keep count of them, although I've tried conscientiously. It is the strangest yellow, that wallpaper. It makes me think of all the yellow things I ever saw. Not beautiful ones like buttercups, but old, foul, bad yellow things. And there's something else about that paper. The smell. I noticed it the moment we came into the room, but with so much air and sun it was not bad. Now we've had a week of fog and rain, and whether the windows are open or not, the smell is here. It creeps all over the house. I find it hovering in the dining room, skulking in the parlor, hiding in the hall, lying in wait for me on the stairs. It gets into my hair. Even when I go to ride, if I turn my head suddenly and surprise it, there is that smell. Such a peculiar odor, too. I've spent hours in trying to analyze it to find what it smelled like. It's not bad at first and very gentle, but quite the subtlest, most enduring odor I ever met. In this damp weather, it's awful. I wake up in the night and find it hanging over me. It used to disturb me at first. I thought seriously of burning the house to reach the smell. But now I'm used to it. The only thing I can think of that it is like is the color of the paper, the yellow smell. There is a very funny mark on this wall low down near the mop board, a streak that runs around the room. It goes behind every piece of furniture except the bed, a long, straight, even smooch, as if it had been rubbed over and over. I wonder how it was done and who did it and what they did it for. Round and round and round. Round and round and round. It makes me dizzy. I really have discovered something at last. Through watching so much at night when it changes so, I have finally found out. The front pattern does move, and no wonder the woman behind shakes it. Sometimes I think there are a great many women behind her, and sometimes only one, and she crawls around fast, and her crawling shakes it all over. Then, in the very bright spot, she keeps still, and in the very shady spots, she just takes hold of the bars and shakes them hard. And she is all the time trying to climb through. But nobody could climb through that pattern. It strangles so. I think that is why it has so many heads. They get through, and then the pattern strangles them off and turns them upside down and makes their eyes white. If those heads were covered or taken off, it wouldn't be half so bad. I think that woman gets out in the daytime, and I'll tell you why. Privately, I've seen her. I can see her out of every one of my windows. It is the same woman I know, for she's always creeping. And most women do not creep by daylight. 
I see her on that long road under the trees, creeping along, and then, when a carriage comes, she hides under the blackberry vines. I don't blame her a bit. It must be very humiliating to be caught creeping by daylight. I always lock the door when I creep by daylight. I can't do it at night now, for I know John would suspect something at once. And John is so queer now, that I don't want to irritate him. I wish he would take another room. Besides, I don't want anybody to get that woman out at night, but myself. I often wonder if I could see her out of all the windows at once. But turn as fast as I can, I can only see her out of one at a time. And though I always see her, she may be able to creep faster than I can turn. I have watched her sometimes away off in the open country, creeping as fast as a cloud shadow in a high wind. If only that top pattern could be gotten off from the under one. I mean to try it, little by little. I found out another funny thing, but I shan't tell it this time. It doesn't do to trust people too much. There are only two more days to get this paper off, and I believe John is beginning to notice. I don't like the look in his eyes. And I heard him ask Jenny a lot of professional questions about me. She had a very good report to give, she said. I slept a good deal in the daytime. John knows I don't sleep very well at night, for all I'm so quiet. He asked me all sorts of questions, too, and pretended to be very loving and kind. As if I couldn't see through him. Still, I don't wonder he acts so, sleeping under this paper for three months. It only interests me, but I feel sure John and Jenny are secretly affected by it. Hurrah, this is the last day. But it is enough. John to stay in town overnight and won't be out until this evening. Jenny wanted to sleep with me, this sly thing. But I told her I should undoubtedly rest better for a night all alone. That was clever for really, I wasn't alone one bit. As soon as it was moonlight and that poor thing began to crawl and shake the pattern, I got up and ran to help her. I pulled and she shook, I shook and she pulled, and before morning we had peeled off yards of that paper, a strip about as high as my head and half around the room. And then when the sun came and that awful pattern began to laugh at me, I declared I would finish it today. We go away tomorrow, and they are moving all my furniture down again to leave things as they were before. Jenny looked at the wall in amazement, but I told her merrily that I did it out of pure spite at the vicious thing. She laughed and said she wouldn't mind doing it herself, but I must not get tired. Now she betrayed herself that time. But I am here, and no person touches this but me, not alive. She tried to get me out of the room. It was too patent. But I said it was so quiet and empty and clean now that I believed I would lie down again and sleep all I could and not to wake me even for dinner. I would call when I woke. So now she's gone, and the servants are gone, and the things are gone, and there's nothing left but that great bedstead nailed down with the canvas mattress we found on it. We shall sleep downstairs tonight and take the boat home tomorrow. I quite enjoy the room now it's bare again. How those children did tear about here. The bedstead is fairly gnawed, but I must get to work. I've locked the door and thrown the key down into the front path. I don't want to go out, and I don't want to have anybody come in till John comes. I want to astonish him. I've got a rope up here that even Jenny didn't find. If that woman does get out and tries to get away, I can tie her, but I forgot I could not reach far without anything to stand on. This bed will not move. I tried to lift and push it until I was lame, and then I got so angry, I bit off a little piece at one corner, but it hurt my teeth. Then I peeled off all the paper I could reach standing on the floor. It sticks horribly, and the pattern just enjoys it. All those strangled heads and bulbous eyes and waddling fungus growths just shriek with derision. I'm getting angry enough to do something desperate. To jump out of the window would be an admirable exercise, but the bars are too strong even to try. Besides, I wouldn't do it. Of course not. I know well enough that a step like that is improper and might be misconstrued. I don't like to look out of the windows even. There are so many of those creeping women and they creep so fast. I wonder if they all come out of that wallpaper as I did. But I am securely fastened now by my well-hidden rope. You don't get me out in the road there. I suppose I shall have to get back behind the pattern when it comes night, and that is hard. It is so pleasant to be out in this great room and creep around as I please. 
I don't want to go outside. I won't, even if Jenny asked me to. For outside, you have to creep on the ground, and everything is green instead of yellow. But here, I can creep smoothly on the floor, and my shoulder just fits in that long smooch around the wall, so I cannot lose my way. Why, there's John at the door. It's no use, young man, you can't open it. How he does call and pound. Now he's crying for an axe. It will be a shame to break down that beautiful door. John, dear, said I in the gentlest voice. The key is down by the front steps under a plant and a leaf. That silenced him for a few moments. Then he said, very quietly indeed, Open the door, my darling. I can't, said I. The key is down by the front door, under a plantain leaf. And then I said it again several times, very gently and slowly, and said it so often that he had to go and see. And he got it, of course, and came in. He stopped short by the door. What is the matter, he cried. For God's sake, what are you doing? I kept on creeping just the same, but I looked at him over my shoulder. I've got out at last, said I, in spite of you and Jane and I pulled off most of the paper so you can't put me back. Now, why should that man have fainted? But he did, and right across my path by the wall, so I had to creep over him every time. Oak of Oakhurst by Vernon Lee. The Count Peter Batulin, Tagantcha, Government of Kiev, Russia. My dear Batulin, do you remember me telling you one afternoon that you sat upon the hearthstool at Florence, the story of Mrs. Oak of Oakhurst? You thought it a fantastic tale, you lover of fantastic things, and urged me to write it out at once, although I protested that, in such matters, to write is to exercise, to dispel the charm, and that printer's ink chases away the ghosts that may pleasantly haunt us, as efficaciously as gallons of holy water. But if, as I suspect, you will now put down any charm that story may have possessed to the way in which we have been working ourselves up, that firelit evening, with all manner of fantastic stuff, if, as I fear, the story of Mrs. Oak of Oakhurst will strike you as stale and unprofitable, the sight of this little book will serve at least to remind you, in the middle of your Russian summer, that there is such a season as winter, such a place as Florence, and such a person as your friend, Vernon Lee. Kensington, July, 1886. One. That sketch up there with the boy's cap. Yes, that's the same woman. I wonder whether you can guess who she was. A singular being, is she not? The most marvellous creature, quite, that I have ever met. A wonderful elegance, exotic, far-fetched, poignant, an artificial, perverse sort of grace and research in every outline and movement and arrangement of head and neck and hands and fingers. Here are a lot of pencil sketches I made while I was preparing to paint her portrait. Yes, there's nothing but her in the whole sketchbook. Mere scratches, but they may give some idea of a marvellous, fantastic kind of grace. Here she is, leaning over the staircase, and, and here, sitting in the swing. Here she is, walking quickly out of the room. That's her head. You see, she isn't really handsome. Her forehead's too big, and her nose too short. 
This uh, gives no idea of her. It was altogether a question of movement. Look at the strange cheeks, hollow and rather flat. Well, when she smiled, she had the most marvellous dimples here. There was something exquisite and uncanny about it. Yes, I began the picture, but it was never finished. I did the husband first. I wonder who has his likeness now. Help me to move these pictures away from the wall. Thanks. This is her portrait. Ah, you wreck. I don't suppose you can make much of it. It's merely blocked in and seems quite mad. You see, my idea was to make her leaning against the wall. There was one hung with yellow that seemed almost brown, so as to bring out the silhouette. It was very singular. I should have chosen that particular wall. It does look rather insane in this condition, but I like it. It, it has something of her. I would frame it and hang it up, only people would ask questions. Yes, you've guessed right. It is Mrs. Oak of Oakhurst. I forgot you had relations in that part of the country. Besides, I suppose the newspapers were full of it at the time. You didn't know that it all took place under my eyes. I can scarcely believe now that it did. It all seems so distant, vivid but unreal, like a thing of my own invention. It really was much stranger than anyone guessed. People could no more understand it than they could understand her. I doubt whether anyone ever understood Alice Oak, beside myself. You mustn't think me unfeeling. She was a marvellous, weird, exquisite creature. But one couldn't feel sorry for her. And I felt much sorrier for the wretched creature of a husband. It seemed such an appropriate end for her. I fancy she would have liked it, could she have known. Ah, I shall never have another chance of painting such a portrait as I wanted. She seemed sent to me from heaven, or the other place. You've never heard the story in detail? Well, I don't usually mention it because people are so brutally stupid or sentimental. But I'll tell you it now. Let me see. It's too dark to paint any wall today, so I can tell you it now. Wait, <laughs> I must turn her face to the wall. Ah, she was a marvellous creature. Two. You remember three years ago my telling you I had let myself in for painting a couple of uh, Kentish squireine. I really couldn't understand what had possessed me to say yes to that man. A friend of mine had brought him one day to my studio. Mr. Oak of Oakhurst. That was the name on his card. He was a very tall, a very well-made, a very good-looking young man with a beautiful fair complexion, beautiful fair moustache and beautifully fitting clothes. Absolutely like a hundred other young men you can see any day in the park. And absolutely uninteresting from the crown of his head to the tip of his boots. Mr. Oak, who had been lieutenant in the blues before his marriage, was evidently extremely uncomfortable on finding himself in a studio. He felt misgivings about a man who could wear a velvet coat in town. But at the same time, he was nervously anxious not to treat me in the very least like a tradesman. He walked around my place, looked at everything with the most scrupulous attention, stammered out a few complimentary phrases, and then, looking at his friend for assistance, tried to come to the point, but failed. The point, which the friend kindly explained, was that Mr. Oak was desirous to know whether my engagements would allow of my painting him and his wife and what my terms would be. The poor man blushed perfectly crimson during this explanation, as if he had come with the most improper proposal, and I noticed, and the only interesting thing about him, a very odd, nervous frown between his eyebrows, a perfect double gash, a thing which usually means something abnormal. A mad doctor of my acquaintance calls it the maniac frown. When I had answered, he suddenly burst out into a rather confused explanation. His wife, Mrs. Oak, had uh, seen some of my pictures, painting, portraits, at the, what do you call it, academy? She had, in short, they had made a very great impression upon her. Mrs. Oak had a great taste for art. She was, in short, extremely desirous of having her portrait and his painted by me, etc. My wife, he suddenly added, is a remarkable woman. I don't know whether you will think her handsome. She isn't exactly, you know. 
but that she's awfully strange. And Mr. Oak of Oakhurst gave a little sigh and frowned that curious frown, as if so long a speech and so decided an expression of opinion had cost him a great deal. It was a rather unfortunate moment in my career. A very influential sitter of mine, you remember the fat lady with the crimson curtain behind her, had come to the conclusion or had been persuaded that I had painted her old and vulgar, which in fact she was. A whole clique had turned against me. The newspapers had taken up the matter, and for the moment I was considered a painter to whose brushes no woman would trust her reputation. Things were going badly. So I snapped, but too gladly, at Mr. Oak's offer and settled to go down to Oakhurst at the end of a fortnight. But the door had scarcely closed upon my future sitter when I began to regret my rashness and my disgust at the thought of wasting a whole summer upon the portrait of a totally uninteresting Kentish squire and his doubtless equally uninteresting wife grew greater and greater as the time for execution approached. I remember so well the frightful temper in which I got into the train for Kent, and the even more frightful temper in which I got out of it at the little station nearest to Oakhurst. It was pouring floods. I felt a comfortable fury at the thought my canvases would get nicely wetted before Mr. Oak's coachman had packed them on the top of the wagonette. It was just what served me right for coming to this confounded place to paint these confounded people. We drove off in the steady downpour. The roads were a mass of yellow mud. The endless flat grazing grounds under the oak trees, after having been burnt to cinders in a long drought, were turned into a hideous brown sop. The country seemed intolerably monotonous. My spirits sank lower and lower. I began to meditate upon the modern Gothic country house with the usual amount of Morris furniture, Liberty rugs and Mudy novels to which I was doubtless being taken. My fancy painted very vividly the five or six little oaks. That man certainly must have at least five children. The aunts and sisters-in-law and cousins, the eternal routine of afternoon tea and lawn tennis. Above all, it pictured Mrs. Oak, the bouncing, well-informed model housekeeper, electioneering, charity-organizing young lady whom any such individual as Mr. Oak would regard in the light of a remarkable woman and my spirit sank within me, and I cursed my avarice in accepting the commission, my spiritlessness in not throwing it over while yet there was time. We had meanwhile driven into a large park, or rather a long succession of grazing gowns, dotted about with large oaks, under which the sheep were huddled together for shelter from the rain. In the distance, blurred by the sheets of rain, was a line of low hills, with a jagged fringe of bluish firs and a solitary windmill. It must be a good mile and a half since we had passed the house, and there was none to be seen in the distance. Nothing but the undulation of sere grass, sopped brown beneath the huge blackish oak trees, and whence arose from all sides a vague, disconsolate bleating. At last the road made a sudden bend, and disclosed what was evidently the home of my sitter. It was not what I had expected. In a dip in the ground, a large red brick house with the rounded gables and high chimney stacks of the time of James I, a forlorn, vast place set in the midst of the pasture land with no trace of garden before it and only a few large trees indicating the possibility of one to the back. No lawn either, but on the other side of the sandy dip which suggested a filled up moat, a huge oak, short, hollow, with wreathing blasted black branches upon which only a handful of leaves shook in the rain. It was not at all what I had pictured to myself the home of Mr. Oak of Oakhurst. My host received me in the hall, a large place, panelled and carved, hung round with portraits up to its curious ceiling, vaulted and ribbed like the inside of a ship's hull. He looked even more blonde and pink and white, more absolutely mediocre in his tweed suit, and also, I thought, even more good-natured and duller. He took me into his study, a room hung round with whips and fishing tackle in place of books, while my things were being carried upstairs. It was very damp, and a fire was smouldering. 
He gave the embers a nervous kick with his foot and said, as he offered me a cigar, you, you must excuse my not introducing you at once to Mrs. Oak, my, my wife, in short. I believe my wife is asleep. Is uh, Mrs. Oak unwell? I asked, a sudden hope flashing across me that I might be off the whole matter. Uh, oh, no, uh, Alice is, is quite well, at least uh, quite as well as she usually is. Uh, my wife, he added after a minute, and in a very decided tone, does not enjoy very good health. Uh, a nervous constitution. Oh, no, not at all ill. Nothing at all serious, you know. Uh, only nervous, the doctors say. You mustn't be worried or excited, the doctors say. It requires lots of repose, that sort of thing. There was a dead pause. This man depressed me. I knew not why. He had a listless, puzzled look, very much out of keeping with his evident admirable health and strength. Um, I suppose you're a great sportsman, I asked from sheer despair, nodding in the direction of the whips and guns and fishing rods. Oh, oh no, not now. I was once. I have given up all that, he answered, standing with his back to the fire and staring at the polar bear beneath his feet. Uh, I have no time for all that now, he added, as if an explanation would you. A married man, you know. Would you like to come up to your rooms? He suddenly interrupted himself. I have had one arranged for you to paint in. Uh, my wife said you'd prefer a north light. If that one doesn't suit, you can have your choice of any other. I followed him out of the study, through the vast entrance hall. In less than a minute, I was no longer thinking of Mr. and Mrs. Oak and the boredom of doing their likeness. I was simply overcome by the beauty of this house, which I had pictured modern and philistine. It was, without exception, the most perfect example of an old English manor house that I had ever seen, the most magnificent intrinsically and the most admirably preserved. Out of the huge hall, with its immense fireplace of delicately carved and inlaid grey and black stone and its rows of family portraits reaching from the wainscoting to the oaken ceiling, vaulted and ribbed like a ship's hull, opened the wide, flat-stepped staircase. The parapet surmounted at intervals by heraldic monsters. The wall covered with oak carvings of coats of arms, leafage, and little mythological scenes painted a faded red and blue, and picked out with tarnished gold, which harmonized with the tarnished blue and gold of the stamped leather that reached to the oak cornice, again delicately tinted and gilded. The beautifully damascened suits of court armour looked, without being at all rusty, as if no modern hand had ever touched them. The very rugs underfoot were of sixteenth-century Persian make. The only things of today were the big bunches of flowers and ferns arranged in majolica dishes upon the landings. Everything was perfectly silent. Only from below came the chimes, silvery like an Italian palace fountain of an old-fashioned clock. It seemed to me that I was being led through the palace of the Sleeping Beauty. What a magnificent house, I exclaimed, as I followed my host through a long corridor, also hung with leather, wainscoted with carvings, and furnished with big wedding coffers and chairs that looked as if they came out of some Van Dyke portrait. In my mind was a strong impression that all this was natural, spontaneous, that it had about it nothing of the picturesqueness which swell studios have taught to rich and aesthetic houses. Mr. Oak misunderstood me. Uh, it's a nice old place, he said, but, but it's too large for us. You see, my wife's health does not allow of our having many guests and there are no children. I thought I noticed a vague complaint in his voice and he evidently was afraid that they might have seen something of the kind for he added immediately, uh, I, I don't care for children, one jack straw, you know, myself. Can't understand how anyone can, for my part. If ever a man went out of his way to tell a lie, I said to myself, Mr. Oak of Oakhurst was doing so at the present moment. When he had left me in one of the two enormous rooms that were allotted to me, I threw myself into an armchair and tried to focus the extraordinary imaginative impression which this house had given me. 
I am very susceptible to such impressions. And besides, a sort of spasm of imaginative interest sometimes given to me by certain rare and eccentric personalities, I know nothing more subduing than the charm, quieter and less analytic, of any sort of complete and out of the common run sort of house. To sit in a room like the one I was sitting in, with the figures of the tapestry glimmering grey and lilac and purple in the twilight, the great bed, columned and curtained, looming in the middle, and the embers reddening beneath the overhanging mantelpiece of inlaid Italian stonework. A vague scent of rose leaves and spices put into the china bowls by the hands of ladies, long since dead, while the clock downstairs sent up every now and then its faint silvery tune of forgotten days filled the room. To do this is a special kind of voluptuousness, peculiar and complex and indescribable, like the half-drunkenness of opium or hashish, and which to be conveyed to others in any sense as I feel it would require a genius, subtle and heady, like that of Baudelaire. After I had dressed for dinner, I resumed my place in the armchair and resumed also my reverie, letting all these impressions of the past, which seemed faded like the figures in the arras, but still warm like the embers in the fireplace, still sweet and subtle like the perfume of the dead rose leaves and broken spices in the china bowls, permeate me and go to my head. Of Oak and Oak's wife, I did not think. I seemed quite alone, isolated from the world, separated from it in this exotic enjoyment. Gradually the embers grew paler, the figures in the tapestry more shadowy, the columned and curtained bed loomed out vaguer. The room seemed to fill with greyness, and my eyes wandered to the mullioned bow window, beyond whose panes between whose heavy stonework stretched a greyish-brown expanse of saw and sodden park grass, dotted with big oaks, while far off, behind a jagged fringe of dark scotch firs, the wet sky was suffused with the blood red of the sunset. Between the falling of the raindrops from the ivy outside, there came, fainter or sharper, the recurring bleating of the lambs separated from their mothers, a forlorn, quavering, eerie little cry. I started up at a sudden rap at my door. Haven't you heard the gong for dinner? asked Mr. Oak's voice. I had completely forgotten his existence. Three. I feel that I cannot possibly reconstruct my earliest impression of Mrs. Oak. My recollection of them would be entirely coloured by my subsequent knowledge of her, whence I conclude that I could not at first have experienced the strange interest and admiration which that extraordinary woman very soon excited in me. Interest and admiration, be it well understood, of a very unusual kind, as she was herself, a very unusual kind of woman, and I, if you choose, am a rather unusual kind of man, but I can explain that better anon. This much is certain, that I must have been immeasurably surprised at finding my hostess and future sitter so completely unlike everything I had anticipated. Or no, now I come to think of it, I scarcely felt surprised at all, or if I did, that shock of surprise could have lasted but an infinitesimal part of a minute. The fact is, that having once seen Alice Oak in the reality, it was quite impossible to remember that one could have fancied her at all different. There was something so complete, so completely unlike everyone else in her personality, that she seemed always to have been present in one's consciousness, although present, perhaps, as an enigma. Let me try and give you some notion of her. And not that first impression, whatever it may have been, but the absolute reality of her as I gradually learned to see it. To begin with, I must repeat and reiterate over and over again that she was, beyond all comparison, the most graceful and exquisite woman I have ever seen. But with a grace 
and an exquisiteness that had nothing to do with any preconceived notion or previous experience of what goes by those names. Grace and exquisiteness recognized at once as perfect, but which were seen in her for the first, and probably, I do believe, for the last time. It is conceivable, is it not, that once in a thousand years there may arise a combination of lines, a system of movements, an outline, a gesture, which is new, unprecedented, and yet hits off exactly our desires for beauty and rareness. She was very tall, and I suppose people would have called her thin. I don't know, for I never thought about her as a body, bones, flesh, that sort of thing, but merely as a wonderful series of lines and a wonderful strangers of personality. Tall and slender, certainly, but with not one item of what makes up our notion of a well-built woman. She was as straight, I mean, she had as little of what people call figure, as a bamboo. Her shoulders were a trifle high, and she had a decided stoop. Her arms and her shoulders she never once wore uncovered. But this bamboo figure of hers had a suppleness and a stateliness, a play of outline with every step she took, that I can't compare to anything else. There was in it something of the peacock, and something also of the stag. But above all, it was her own. I wish I could describe her. I wish, alas, I wish, I wish, I wish, I have wished a hundred thousand times I could paint her, as I see her now, if I shut my eyes, even if it were only a silhouette. There, I see her so plainly, walking slowly up and down a room, the slight highness of her shoulders just completing the exquisite arrangement of lines made by the straight, just completing the exquisite arrangement of lines made by the straight, supple back, the long, exquisite neck, the head, with the hair cropped and short, pale curls, always drooping a little, except when she would suddenly throw it back and smile, not at me, nor at anyone, nor at anything that had been said, but as if she alone had suddenly seen or heard something, with the strange dimple in her thin, pale cheeks, and the strange whiteness in her full, wide-opened eyes. At the moment when she had something of the stag in her movement, but where is the use of talking about her? I don't believe, you know, that even the greatest painter can show what is the real beauty of a very beautiful woman in the ordinary sense. Titian's and Tintoretto's women must have been miles handsomer than they have made them. Something, and that's the very essence, always escapes. Perhaps because real beauty is as much a thing in time, a thing like music, a succession, a series, as in space. Mind you, I'm speaking of a woman beautiful in the conventional sense. Imagine then how much more so in the case of a woman like Alice Oak. And if the pencil and brush imitating each line and tint can't succeed, how is it possible to give even the vaguest emotion with mere wretched words? Words possessing only a wretched abstract meaning, an impotent conventional association. To make a long story short, Mrs. Oak of Oakhurst was, in my opinion, to the highest degree exquisite and strange. An exotic creature whose charm you can no more describe than you could bring home the perfume of some newly discovered tropical flower by comparing it with the scent of a cabbage rose or a lily. That first dinner was gloomy enough. Mr. Oak, Oak of Oakhurst, as the people down there called him, was horribly shy, consumed with the fear of making a fool of himself before me and his wife, I then thought. But that sort of shyness did not wear off, and I soon discovered that, although it was doubtless increased by the presence of a total stranger, it was inspired in Oak not by me, but by his wife. He would look every now and then as if he were going to make a remark, and then evidently restrain himself and remain silent. It was very curious to see this big, handsome, manly young fellow, who ought to have had any amount of success with women, suddenly stammer and grow crimson in the presence of his own wife. Nor was it the consciousness of stupidity, for when you got him alone, Oak, although always slow and timid, had a certain amount of ideas and very defined political and social views, 
and a certain childlike earnestness and desire to attain certainty and truth which was rather touching. On the other hand, Oak's singular shyness was not, so far as I could see, the result of any kind of bullying on his wife's part. You can always detect, if you have any observation, the husband or the wife who is accustomed to be snubbed, to be corrected by his or her better half. There is a self-consciousness in both parties, a habit of watching and fault-finding, of being watched and found fault with. This was clearly not the case at Oakhurst. Mrs. Oak evidently did not trouble herself about her husband in the very least. He might say or do any amount of silly things without rebuke or even notice, and he might have done so had he chosen ever since his wedding day. You felt at once Mrs. Oak simply passed over his existence. I cannot say she paid much attention to anyone's, even to mine. At first uh, I thought it an affectation on her part, for there was something far-fetched in her whole appearance, something suggesting study, which might lead on to tax her with affectation at first. But she was dressed in a strange way, not according to any established aesthetic eccentricity, but individually, strangely, as if in the clothes of an ancestress of the 17th century. Well, at first I thought it a kind of pose on her part, this mixture of extreme graciousness and utter indifference which she manifested towards me. She always seemed to be thinking of something else. And although she talked quite sufficiently and with every sign of superior intelligence, she left the impression of having been as taciturn as her husband. In the beginning, in the few first days of my stay at Oakhurst, I imagined that Mrs. Oak was a highly superior sort of flirt, and that her absent manner, her look, while speaking to you into an invisible distance, a curious, irrelevant smile, were so many means of attracting and baffling adoration. I mistook it for the somewhat similar manners of certain foreign women, it's beyond English ones, which mean, to those who can understand, pay court to me. But I soon found I was mistaken. Mrs. Oak had not the faintest desire that I should pay court to her. Indeed, she did not honour me with sufficient thought for that, and I, on my part, began to be too much interested in her from another point of view to dream of such a thing. I became aware, not merely that I had before me the most marvellously rare and exquisite and baffling subject for a portrait, but also one of the most peculiar and enigmatic of characters. Now that I look back upon it, I'm tempted to think that the psychological peculiarity of that woman might be summed up in an exorbitant and absorbing interest in herself, a narcissus attitude, curiously complicated with a fantastic imagination, a sort of morbid daydreaming, all turned inwards and with no outer characteristics save a certain restlessness, a perverse desire to surprise and shock, to surprise and shock more particularly her husband, and thus be revenged for the intense boredom of which his want of appreciation inflicted upon her. I got to understand this much, little by little, yet I did not seem to have really penetrated to something mysterious about Mrs. Oak. There was a waywardness, a strangeness, which I felt, but couldn't explain. Something as difficult to define as the peculiarity of her outward appearance, and perhaps very closely connected therewith. I became interested in Mrs. Oak, as if I had been in love with her, and I was not in the least in love. I neither dreaded parting from her, nor felt any pleasure in her presence. I had not the smallest wish to please or to gain her notice, but I had her on the brain. I pursued her, her physical image, her psychological explanation, with a kind of passion which filled my days and prevented my ever feeling dull. The Oaks lived a remarkably solitary life. There were but few neighbours, of whom they saw but little, and they rarely had a guest in the house. Oak himself seemed every now and then seized with a sense of responsibility towards me. He would remark vaguely during our walks and after dinner chats that I must find life at Oakhurst horribly dull. His wife's health had accustomed him to solitude, and then, 
Also, his wife thought the neighbors a bore. He never questioned his wife's judgment in these matters. He merely stated the case as if resignation were quite simple and inevitable. Yet it seemed to me, sometimes, that this monotonous life of solitude by the side of a woman who took no more heed of him than of a table or chair was producing a vague depression and irritation in this young man so evidently cut out for a cheerful, commonplace life. I often wondered how he could endure it at all, not having, as I had, the interest of a strange psychological riddle to solve and of a great portrait to paint. He was, I found, extremely good, the type of the perfectly conscientious young Englishman, the sort of man who ought to have been the Christian soldier kind of thing, devout, pure-minded, brave, incapable of any baseness, a little intellectually dense, and puzzled by all manner of moral scruples. The condition of his tenants and of his political party, who was a regular Kentish Tory, lay heavy on his mind. He spent hours every day in his study doing the work of a land agent and a political whip, reading piles of reports and newspapers and agricultural treatises, and emerging for lunch with piles of letters in his hand, and that odd, puzzled look in his good, healthy face, that deep gash between his eyebrows, which my friend, the mad doctor, calls the maniac frown. It was with this expression of face that I should have liked to paint him, but I felt that he would not have liked it, that it was more fair to him to represent him in his more wholesome pink and white and blonde conventionality. I was, perhaps, rather unconscientious about the likeness of Mr. Oak. I felt satisfied to paint it, no matter how. I mean, as regards character. My whole mind was swallowed up in thinking how I should paint Mrs. Oak, how it could best transport onto canvas that singular and enigmatic personality. I began with her husband, and told her frankly that I must have much longer to study her. Mr. Oak couldn't understand why it should be necessary to make a hundred and one pencil sketches of his wife before even determining in what attitude to paint her. But I think he was rather pleased to have an opportunity of keeping me at Oakhurst. My presence evidently broke the monotony of his life. Mrs. Oak seemed perfectly indifferent to my staying, as she was perfectly indifferent to my presence. Without being rude, I never saw a woman pay so little attention to a guest. She would talk with me sometimes by the hour, or rather let me talk to her, but she never seemed to be listening. She would lie back in a big 17th century armchair while I played the piano, with that strange smile every now and then in her thin cheeks, that strange whiteness in her eyes, but it seemed a matter of indifference whether my music stopped or went on. In my portrait of her husband she did not take, or pretend to take, the very faintest interest. But that was nothing to me. I did not want Mrs. Oak to think me interesting. I merely wished to go on studying her. The first time that Mrs. Oak seemed to become at all aware of my presence as distinguished from that of the chairs and tables, the dogs that lay in the porch, or the clergyman or lawyer or strained neighbour who was occasionally asked to dinner, was one day. I might have been there a week when I chanced to remark to her upon the very singular resemblance that existed between herself and the portrait of a lady that hung in the hall with the ceiling, like the ship's hull. The picture in question was a full length, neither very good nor very bad, probably done by some stray Italian of the early 17th century. It hung in a rather dark corner, facing the portrait, evidently painted to be its companion, of a dark man with a somewhat unpleasant expression of resolution and efficiency in a black Van Dyke dress. The two were evidently man and wife, and in the corner of the woman's portrait were the words, Alice Oak, daughter of Virgil Pomfret Esquire and wife to Nicholas Oak of Oakhurst, and the date, 1626. Nicholas Oak being the name painted in the corner of the small portrait. The lady was really wonderfully like the present Mrs. Oak, at least so far as an indifferently painted portrait of the early days of Charles I can be like a living woman of the 19th century. And there were the same strange lines of face and figure, the same dimples in the thin cheeks, the same wide-opened eyes, 
the same vague eccentricity of expression, not destroyed even by the feeble painting and conventional manner of the time. One could fancy that this woman had the same walk, the same beautiful line of nape of the neck and stooping head as her descendant. For I found that Mr. and Mrs. Oak, who were first cousins, were both descended from that Nicholas Oak and that Alice, daughter of Virgil Pomfret. But the resemblance was heightened by the fact that, as I soon saw, the present Mrs. Oak distinctly made herself up to look like her ancestress, dressing in garments that had the 17th century look, nay, that were sometimes absolutely copied from this portrait. You think I'm like her, answered Mrs. Oak dreamily to my remark, and her eyes wandered off to that unseen something, and a faint smile dimpled her thin cheeks. You are like her, and you know it. I may even say you wish to be like her, Mrs. Oak, I answered, laughing. Perhaps I do. And she looked in the direction of her husband. I noticed that he had an expression of distinct annoyance besides that frown of his. Isn't it true that Mrs. Oak tries to look like that portrait? I asked with a perverse curiosity. Oh, fudge, he exclaimed, rising from his chair and walking nervously to the window. It's all nonsense, mere nonsense. I wish you wouldn't, Alice. Wouldn't what? asked Mrs. Oak with a sort of contemptuous indifference. If I am like that Alice Oak, why I am. And I am very pleased that anyone should think so. She and her husband are just about the only two members of our family, our mostly flat, stale and unprofitable family, that ever were in the least degree interesting. Oak grew crimson and frowned as if in pain. I don't see why you should abuse our family, Alice, he said. Thank God our people have always been honourable and upright men and women. Excepting always Nicholas Oak and Alice's wife, daughter of Virgil Pomfret, Esquire, she answered, laughing, as he strode out into the park. How childish he is, she exclaimed when we were alone. He really minds, really feels disgraced by what our ancestor did two centuries and a half ago. I do believe William would have those two portraits taken down and burned, if he weren't afraid of me and ashamed of the neighbours. And as it is, these two people really are the only two members of our family that ever were in the least interesting. I'll tell you the story some day. As it was, the story was told to me by Oak himself. The next day, as we were taking our morning walk, he suddenly broke a long silence, laying about him all the time at the sere grasses with the hooked stick that he carried, like the conscientious Kentishman he was, for the purpose of cutting down his and other folks' thistles. I fear you must have thought me very ill-mannered towards my wife yesterday, he said shyly. And indeed I know I was. Oak was one of those chivalrous beings to whom every woman, every wife, and his own most of all, appeared in the light of something holy. But, but I have a prejudice, which my wife does not enter into, about raking up ugly things in one's own family. I suppose Alice thinks that it's so long ago that it really has no connection at all with us, she thinks of it merely as a picturesque story. I dare say many people feel like that. In short, I'm sure they do. Otherwise, there wouldn't be such lots of discreditable family traditions afloat. But I feel as if it were all one, whether it was long ago or not, when it's a question of one's own people. I would rather have it forgotten. I can't understand how people can talk about murders in their families and, and ghosts and so forth. Have you any ghosts at Oakhurst, by the way? I asked. The place seemed as if it required some to complete it. I hope not, answered Oak gravely. His gravity made me smile. Why would you dislike it if there were, I asked. If there are such things as ghosts, he replied, I don't think they should be taken lightly. God would not permit them to be except as a warning or a punishment. We walked on some time in silence. I wondering at the strange type of this commonplace young man, and half wishing I could put something into my portrait that should be the equivalent of this curious, unimaginative earnestness. Then Oak told me the story of those two pictures, told it me about as badly and hesitatingly as it was possible for a mortal man. He and his wife were, as I have said, cousins, and therefore descended from the same old Kentish stock, the Oaks of Oakhurst, traced back to Norman, almost to Saxon times, 
far longer than any of the titled or better known families of the neighborhood. I saw that William Oak, in his heart, thoroughly looked down upon all his neighbors. We have never done anything particular, or been anything particular, never held any office, he said. But we've always been there, and apparently always done our duty. An ancestor of ours was killed in the Scotch Wars, another at Agincourt, mere honest captains. Well, early in the 17th century, the family had dwindled to a single member, Nicholas Oak, the same who had rebuilt Oakhurst in its present shape. This Nicholas appears to have been somewhat different from the usual run of the family. He had, in his youth, sought adventures in America, and seems, generally speaking, to have been less of a non-entity than his ancestors. He married, when no longer very young, Alice, daughter of Virgil Pomfret, a beautiful young heiress from a neighboring county. It was the first time an oak married a Pomfret, my host informed me, and the last time. The Pomfrets were quite different sort of people, restless, self-seeking. One of them had been a favorite of Henry VIII. It was clear that William Oak had no feeling of having any Pomfret blood in his veins. He spoke of these people with an evident family dislike, the dislike of an oak, one of the old, honorable, modest stock, which had quietly done its duty, were a family of fortune seekers and court minions. Well, they had come to live near Oakhurst, in a little house recently inherited from an uncle, a certain Christopher Lovelock, a young gallant and poet who was in momentary disgrace at court for some love affair. This Lovelock had struck up a great friendship with his neighbors of Oakhurst, too great a friendship apparently with the wife, either for her husband's taste or her own. Anyhow, one evening as he was riding home alone, Lovelock had been attacked and murdered, ostensibly by highwaymen, but as was afterwards rumored, by Nicholas Oak, accompanied by his wife, dressed as a groom. No legal evidence had been got, but the tradition had remained. They used to tell it to us when we were children, said my host in a hoarse voice, and to frighten my cousin, I mean my wife, and me with stories about Lovelock. It's merely a tradition which I hope may die out, as I sincerely pray to heaven that it may be false. Alice, Mrs. Oak, you see, he went on after some time, doesn't feel about it as I do. Perhaps I'm morbid, but I do dislike having the old story raked up. And we said no more on the subject. So that was Oak of Oakhurst, parts one to three. There are in fact ten parts. It was recommended to me to read, and I'm glad it was, by a listener. And I'm really enjoying it. So it's the first time I've read the story. And I'm not reading any further. I've only got to part three now, so I don't know what's going to happen. And I've done that deliberately, and I haven't read any um, reviews or analyses of the story, so I don't actually know what happens. But I'm really enjoying it. Anyway, I've got my notes about uh, Vernon Lee in the story, and I need to get those in a second. I just want to say, if any of you are sitting there getting quietly enraged that I'm doing a commentary, as some people seem to be, just do yourself a favor and stop listening. Just press stop. Don't force yourself to listen to the whole thing and get yourself all upset and then have to write um, an angry comment or a review. Just stop, and then we're all happy. And those of you who want to continue to listen to the waffle, let's get cracking. So this is the second Vernon Lee story we've done. The first one was a, a Wicked Voice, which was set in Venice. If you'd listened to that, you'd heard something about Vernon Lee. So I'm going to, the biography is inevitably going to be the same or very similar, depending how I say it. So Vernon Lee, despite sounding so masculine, Vernon Lee was actually a lady called Violet Paget. You think Paget or Paget? She was born in France in 1856 and died in Italy in, in 1935. Despite living most of her life on the continent of Europe, Pinetta Colby, her biographer, says that Lee was English by nationality, French by an accident of birth, and Italian by choice. So, as well as the ghost stories for which he is most famous, Vernon Lee was an essayist who wrote about travel and art, and especially aesthetics. I, she did um, an extended essay about the, the forest in um, Greek and Roman religion, which was pretty good. Um, so her parents were globe trotters as well, or at least Europe trotters. 
and uh, they settled when when she was 17 the moment she was born in france they settled in florence and she herself stayed pretty much around florence until her death in 1935 she produced her first collection of essays when she was 24 and these dealt with italian writers and dramatists and she later wrote on william shakespeare in renaissance italy she was not very kind to some of her english compatriots some of their artists she didn't think much of the pre-raphaelites and she made fun of them in her 1884 novel mrs brown she was a convinced pacifist and she like many women think of uh, george eliot as many women she thought that if she wrote as a man and i think the brontes originally if she wrote as a man she would be um, accepted and people would take her seriously and if she wasn't she wouldn't so she was a feminist she dressed mostly as a man and although she didn't actually come out as a lesbian which was very difficult in those days she um, did have relationships with women she also had some mental health problems as we would call them these days suffering from health anxiety and she was quite cruel about other writers so she was not very nice about henry james and edith wharton now interestingly I, her prose is almost jamesian sometimes she writes if you listen to her not as bad as he does or falcon or anybody like that but what she does is she writes a sentence she peppers it with clauses so she'll write a sentence and she'll have a clause that's tangential to that she'll go off and then she'll have another one in the middle of that and then by the time you get to it you know everything's been qualified so much so what i found when i was reading it it's different when you're reading it for the eye but when you're reading it out loud by the time we got to the last phrase, it felt quite disjointed. There are a couple of occasions like that. But her prose is very beautiful. She's a very lyrical writer, I say that in the... So Henry James, um, you may know his brother William James. You probably don't know them personally, to be fair, nor me. But I was introduced to William James before, through psychology, before Henry James, really. I, know, I was more familiar with uh, William James, who was an absolute genius, really. Henry wrote to William, who was going to visit Florence, where Vernon Lee lived, and said she is the most able mind in Florence, as dangerous and uncanny as she is intelligent. So watch yourself, bro. That was all that's about. So here we are, Oak of Oakhurst. Not set in Italy, set in England. And I wonder how much she knew of England, really. But her observation of what we imagine society to be like is pretty, seems pretty accurate. So it starts, and it is again a, a kind of frame story. It starts out with our narrator, the painter, whose name I haven't yet learned, talking to some unknown interlocutor, and who clearly has, has family in that part of Kent and knows the Oakhurst, so the first part he introduces in a very conversational way, which was actually really fun to, to read. Um, to act almost, not that I'm an actor. We learn that his encounter with the Oaks has left an indelible mark on this man. You know, we learn early on that there's something about Mrs. Oak which is quite extraordinarily powerful. And, he, and later on we find that he didn't love her, he had no romantic interest in her, but she compelled him in some other way. She's almost like, um, you know, let's not get all Jungian, but like the divine feminine, you know? If, you, if those of you are members have listened to my story about Dungarvan Castle on the members' videos of the YouTube channel, or in fact, on the, I've got it on podcast, on Patreon and Substack as well, will know I'm quite interested in that thing. Anyway, I digress, and that was, you could see that as a sales plug, I suppose, which I didn't totally mean it as that. So she does this really well. So she withholds a lot of information. We just drib, 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 drab fed it drip drop fed it so we learn a bit and we kind of oh oh and this this creates suspense something has happened so he can't he clearly can't he can't paint her now some he's lost the opportunity he doesn't know where the portrait of the husband has gone so something disastrous has happened the home has been broken up um, and it's as if some terrible fate has befallen them he didn't even manage to finish the portrait why not we don't know and then he says oh i suppose the newspapers were full of it at the time ah a scandal and then he drops a thing it really was stranger than anyone could have guessed and because this appears in a collection of stories called the uh, hauntings we're like we as readers are primed to think oh 
strange equals supernatural. And of course, so far in the reading we've done, you've just listened to, there isn't anything supernatural, apart from the mention of ghosts, which isn't supernatural in itself. Is it perhaps a foreshadowing? We know Alice Oak is dead and her end was strange but fitting. She didn't know, but she would have perhaps approved of the strangeness of it. And then he says, the painter says, she was sent to him from heaven, again this divine figure, or the other place. So who is this woman? You know, at this point I'm like, I want to know who she is. And he says, I don't normally tell this story, but but here I, here I go, I'm going to tell the story now. Mm. In the lead up, Vernon Lee is very skillful in that. She portrays, she kind of denigrates our painter and narrator through his own voice. She presents him a bit of a, an artistic snob. He wears a velvet, velvet jacket and he's very unkind initially to Mr. Oak, uh, thinking him as a bore, as a squireine, you know, some, some old fashioned fuddy duddy Tory, despite the fact he's a young guy. And he sets, him, sets the narrator up as this kind of um, really cultural snob. Some, you can just imagine this bloke living, having a studio wearing a velvet drap jacket, thinking he's the, the bee's knees, the coolest of the cool. Well, they didn't call it that in those days. Whereas Oak of Oakhurst is a really decent bloke. He's a really unassuming, solid, honourable, dutiful man who puts up with his wife's shenanigans and the fact that his wife looks down on him and, and is nothing but loyal, nothing but good, nothing but kind. And Lee is skillful enough to, to tell us that while telling us the opposite. She tells us that he is boring, etc. But we still become sympathetic, certainly I did, to Mr. Oak, William Oak of Oakhurst. I was on his side, so I think that was really clever, I don't know. I think it was clever, you know. The painter thinks himself the super duper cool guy and Oak as a boring old toad. But in fact, the picture we get is that the painter was a bit of a snob. Uh, not, not a political snob, but a cultural snob. And William Oak is actually a diamond geezer. Well, they probably wouldn't use those terms. A decent chap. I was listening to something, uh, watching a movie actually, or a film as we call them. There's somebody talking about how scriptwriters were laying pipe. So what Vernon Lee is doing in all these bits is laying pipe you know, build this, building this up to the story and managing to keep our attention, certainly mine, on the way, in part at least through the beautiful, the two really beautiful pieces for me, descriptively, the evocative pieces. First, the ride from the station in the carriage through the park of Oakhurst. It's the, the oaks and the sheep sheltering from the rain under the oaks. It's, it's really beautiful me and then the next bit is the description of the house this lyrical beautiful description particularly of him sitting in his bedroom in this old house with tapestries on the wall as the purple twilight crows and there's a silvery clock coming up and it, that is just transporting really so the things that vernon does well are those those fantastic descriptive bits but also i think the characterization is top notch as well i don't know what's going to happen. But towards the end of part three, we start to get a bit of narrative. So we already know, we've already been tantalized. There's something weird about this woman, right? We don't know what, oh yeah, we get the 17th century um, ancestor. And we learn that's clearly why she wants a portrait painted. The fact that she's obsessed with this woman and wants a portrait painted, a woman's in a portrait is linked to me, I think. I haven't read the story, but that's what I think. That's what I'm expecting. You know, Alice Oak, as I say in the notes, is pretty much a narcissist. I've just seen that in my notes, which is why I say it. And then towards the end, out of the blue, your man, our man, says, any ghosts? And William Oak, who's a decent cove. Oh no, he says, but you know, I don't think you should take them. He's a very serious young man. I don't, because God would not allow them other than a warning or a punishment. And then we change the subject to talk about the, the murder. So it seems to me we have been primed by that mention of ghosts. So it, it just comes out of the blue. Oh, ghosts. And we know, but we know that this is a ghost story because it's in a book called Haunting. So we're like, ah, ah, this foreshadows something. But as to what it foreshadows, dear listener, 
I'll have to wait, because I don't know. Um, I'm hoping to get the time to, to do it all. It'll be a long one, this. It might be three-parter, even. But I'm enjoying it so far. Yeah, quite a lot. Anyway, other news. Um, here we've got memberships started on the YouTube channel. I'll tell you a funny thing. I've been doing these not quite two years. So I've recorded them all sorts of times and I do these commentaries and I waffle on and I mention some contemporary things. And, you know, there's one I've just posted up on YouTube, which was about a year old. And I mentioned I was reading a book at the time. And people put, um, oh, this book you're reading. Well, I'm not reading it anymore. I was then. It's really weird, you know. I'm talking to you now and for you, I'm in your present. But this might be in my past. That's a weird thought, isn't it? So in one, one of them I had a cold and people were saying, I hope, hope you get better. And I'm like, well, that cold was a year ago and I haven't had a cold since because I've been, uh, been gelling my hands a lot and not made, meeting anybody. It, just for the record, it's a beautiful few days we're having here at the beginning of June and I had a lovely day out with my daughters yesterday in the Lake District and we went to Castle Rig Stone Circle, because Imogen's doing a project about stone circles for her art course. And I have my lovely young Catherine there who works too hard. She's a teacher, so it was nice to stand where we went for lunch in an Italian restaurant. There is no real connection apart from this story. It was written by somebody in Florence. And it was very, very splendid. And we move in house. It's in the throes of that. That's going to take a few weeks. Work's okay. Yeah, everything's fine, really. I hope you're all right. So, yeah, um, memberships, if you want if you want to join and get a member, you get kind of video stories on YouTube. That's the big news of the week. Join up on YouTube. Anyway, uh, even if you don't join, it's a pleasure to be able to read stories for you. Bye-bye okay. till more Oak Locus next time. Four. From that moment, I began to assume a certain interest in the eyes of Mrs. O. Or rather, I began to perceive that I had a means of securing her attention. Perhaps it was wrong of me to do so, and I have often reproached myself for very seriously later on. But after all, how was I to guess that I was making mischief merely by chiming in for the sake of the portrait I had undertaken, and of a very harmless psychological mania? with what was merely the fad, a little romantic affectation or eccentricity of a scatterbrained and eccentric young woman. How in the world should I have dreamed that I was handling explosive substances? A man is surely not responsible if the people with whom he is forced to deal and whom he deals with, as with all the rest of the world, are quite different from all other human creatures. So, if indeed I did at all conduce to mischief, I really can't blame myself. I had met in Mrs. Oak an almost unique subject for a portrait painter of my particular sort, and a most singular, bizarre personality. I could not possibly do my subject justice so long as I was kept at a distance, prevented from studying the real character of the woman. I required to put her into play. 
and I ask you whether any more innocent way of doing so could be found than talking to a woman and letting her talk about an absurd fancy she had for a couple of ancestors of hers of the time of Charles I and a poet whom they'd murdered, particularly as I studiously respected the prejudices of my host and refrained from mentioning the matter and tried to restrain Mrs. Oak from doing so in the presence of William Oak himself. I had certainly guessed correctly. To resemble the Alice Oak of the year 1626 was the caprice, the mania, the pose, the whatever you may call it, of the Alice Oak of 1880. And to perceive this resemblance was the sure way of gaining her good graces. It was the most extraordinary craze of all the extraordinary crazes of childless and idle women that I had ever met. But it was more than that. It was admirably characteristic. It finished off the strange figure of Mrs. Oak as I saw it in my imagination. This bizarre creature of enigmatic, far-fetched exquisiteness, that she should have no interest in the present, but only an eccentric passion for the past. It seemed to give the meaning to the absent look in her eyes, to her irrelevant and far-off smile. It was like the words to a weird piece of gypsy music, this that she, who was so different, so distant from all women of her own time, should try and identify herself with a woman of the past, that she should have a kind of a flirtation, but more of this anon. I told Mrs. Oak that I had learned from her husband the outline of the tragedy, or mystery, whichever it was, of Alice Oak, daughter of Virgil Pomfret, and the poet Christopher Lovelock, that look of vague contempt of a desire to shock which I had noticed before came into her beautiful, pale, diaphanous face. I suppose my husband was very shocked at the whole matter, she said, told it to you with as little detail as possible and assured you very solemnly that he hoped the whole story might be a mere dreadful calumny. Poor Willie. I remember already when we were children and I used to come with my mother to spend Christmas at Oakhurst my cousin was down here for his holidays, how I used to horrify him by insisting upon dressing up in shawls and waterproofs and playing the story of the wicked Mrs. Oak. And he always piously refused to do the part of Nicholas when I wanted to have the scene on Coates Common. I didn't know then that I was like the original Alice Oak. I found it out only after our marriage. You really think that I am? She certainly was particularly at the moment, as she stood in a white Van Dyke dress with the green of the parkland rising up behind her, and the low sun catching her short locks and surrounding her head, her exquisitely bowed head, with a pale yellow halo. But I confess, I thought of the original Alice Oak, siren and murderous though she might be, very uninteresting compared with this wayward and exquisite creature whom I had rashly promised myself to send down to posterity in all her unlikely wayward exquisiteness. One morning, while Mr. Oak was dispatching his Saturday heap of conservative manifestos and rural decisions, he was the justice of the peace in a most literal sense, penetrating into cottages and huts, defending the weak and admonishing the ill-conducted. One morning, while I was making one of my many pencil sketches, alas, they are all that remain to me now, of my future sitter, Mrs. Oak gave me her version of the story of Alice Oak and Christopher Lovelock. Do you suppose there was anything between them? I asked. That she was ever in love with him? How do you explain the part which tradition ascribes to her in the supposed murder? One has heard of women and their lovers who have killed the husband, but a woman who combines with her husband to kill her lover, or at least a man who is in love with her, that is surely very singular. I was absorbed in my drawing, and really thinking very little of what I was saying. I don't know, she answered pensively, with that distant look in her eyes. Alice Oak was very proud, I'm sure. She may have loved the poet very much, and yet been indignant with him, hated having to love him. She may have felt that she had a right to rid herself of him, and to call upon her husband to help her do so. Good heavens, what a fearful idea, I exclaimed, half laughing. Don't you think, after all, that Mr. Oak might be right in saying that it's easier and more comfortable to take the whole story as a pure invention? 
I cannot take it as an invention, answered Mrs. O contemptuously, because I happen to know that it is true. Indeed, I answered, working away at my sketch and enjoying putting this strange creature, as I said to myself, through her paces. How is that? How does one know that anything is true in this world, she replied evasively. Because one does. Because one feels it to be true, I suppose. And with that far-off look in her light eyes, she relapsed into silence. Have you ever read any of Lovelock's poetry? She asked me suddenly the next day. Uh, Lovelock, I answered, for I had forgotten the name. Lovelock who? But I stopped, remembering the prejudices of my host who was seated next to me at the table. Lovelock, who was killed by Mr. Oakes and my ancestors. And she looked full at her husband, as if in perverse enjoyment of the evidence and annoyance which it caused him. Alice, he entreated in a low voice, his whole face crimson. For mercy's sake, don't talk about such things before the servants. Mrs. Oak burst into a high, light, rather hysterical laugh, the laugh of a naughty child. The servants, gracious heavens! Do you suppose they haven't heard the story? Why, it's as well known as Oakhurst itself in the neighbourhood. Don't they believe that Lovelock has been seen about the house? Haven't they all heard his footsteps in the big corridor? Haven't they, my dear Willie, noticed a thousand times that you will never stay a minute alone in the yellow drawing room? That you run out of it like a child if I happen to leave you there for a minute? True. How was it I hadn't noticed that? Or rather, that I only now remembered having noticed it. The yellow drawing room was one of the most charming rooms in the house. A large, bright room, hung with yellow damask and panelled with carvings, that opened straight out onto the lawn, far superior to the room in which we habitually sat, which was comparatively gloomy. This time Mr. Oak struck me as really too childish. I felt an intense desire to badger him, the yellow drawing room, I exclaimed. Does this interesting literary character haunt the yellow drawing room? Do tell me about it. What happened there? Mr. Oak made a painful effort to laugh. Nothing ever happened there so far as I know, he said, and rose from the table. Really? I asked incredulously. Nothing did happen there, answered Mrs. Oak slowly, playing mechanically with a fork and picking out the pattern of the tablecloth. That is just the extraordinary circumstance that, so far as anyone knows, nothing ever did happen there. And yet that room has an evil reputation. No member of our family, they say, can bear to sit there alone for more than a minute. You see, William evidently cannot. Have you ever seen or heard anything strange there? I asked my host. Shook his head. Nothing, he answered curtly, and lit his cigar. I presume you have not, I asked, half laughing with Mrs. Oak, since you don't mind sitting in that room for hours alone. How do you explain this uncanny reputation, since nothing ever happened there? Perhaps something is destined to happen there in the future, she answered in her absent voice. And then she suddenly added, Suppose you paint my portrait in that room. Mr. Oak suddenly turned round. He was very white and looked as if he were going to say something, but desisted. Why do you worry Mr. Oak like that, I asked, when he had gone into his smoking room with his usual bundle of papers. It's very cruel of you, Mrs. Oak. You ought to have more consideration for people who believe in such things, although you may not be able to put yourself in their frame of mind. Who tells you that I don't believe in such things, as you call them, she answered abruptly. Come, she said after a minute. I want to show you why I believe in Christopher Lovelock. Come with me into the yellow room. Five. What Mrs. Oak showed me in the yellow room was a large bundle of papers, some printed and some manuscript, but all of them brown with age, which she took out of an old Italian ebony inlaid cabinet. It took her some time to get them, as a complicated arrangement of double locks and false drawers had to be put in play. And while she was doing so, I looked around the room, in which I had only been three or four times before. It was certainly the most beautiful room in this beautiful house, and, as it seemed to me now, the most strange. It was long and low, 
was something that made you think of the cabin of a ship, with the great mullioned window that let in, as it were, a perspective of the brownish-green parkland, dotted with oaks, and sloping upwards to the distant line of bluish firs against the horizon. The walls were hung with flower damask, whose yellow faded to brown, united with the reddish colour of the carved wainscoting and the carved oaken beams. For the rest, it reminded me more of an Italian room than an English one. The furniture was Tuscan, of the early 17th century, inlaid and carved. There were a couple of faded allegorical pictures by some Bolognese master on the walls, and in the corner, among a stack of dwarf orange trees, a little Italian harpsichord of exquisite curve and slenderness, with flowers and landscapes painted upon its cover. In a recess was a shelf of old books, mainly English and Italian poets of the Elizabethan time, and close by it, placed upon a carved wedding chest, a large and beautiful melon-shaped lute. The panes of the mullioned window were open, and yet the air seemed heavy with an indescribable heady perfume, not that of any growing flower, but like that of old stuff that should have lain for years among spices. It is a beautiful room, I exclaimed. I should awfully like to paint you in it. But I had scarcely spoken the words when I felt I had done wrong. This woman's husband could not bear the room, and it seemed to me vaguely as if he were right in detesting it. Mrs. Oak took no notice of my exclamation, but beckoned me to the table where she was standing, sorting the papers. Look, she said, these are all poems by Christopher Lovelock, and touching the yellow papers with delicate and reverent fingers, she commenced reading some of them out loud in a slow, half-audible voice. There were songs in the style of those of Herrick, Waller, and Drayton, complaining for the most part of the cruelty of a lady called Dryup, in whose name was evidently concealed a reference to that of the mistress of Oakhurst. The songs were graceful, and not without a certain faded passion. But I was thinking not of them, but of the woman who was reading them to me. Mrs. Oak was standing with the brownish-yellow wall as a background to her white brocade dress, which, in its stiff 17th-century make, seemed but to bring out more clearly the slightness, the exquisite suppleness of her tall figure. She held the papers in one hand and leaned the other, as if for support, on the inlaid cabinet by her side. Her voice, which was delicate, shadowy like a person, had a curious throbbing cadence, as if she were reading the words of a melody and restraining herself with difficulty from singing it. And as she read, a long slender throat throbbed slightly, and a faint redness came into her thin face. She evidently knew the verses by heart, and her eyes were mostly fixed with that distant smile in them, with which harmonized a constant, tremulous little smile in her lips. That is how I would wish to paint her, I exclaimed within myself, and scarcely noticed what struck me on thinking over the scene, that this strange being read these verses as one might fancy a woman would read love verses addressed to herself. Those are all written for Alice Oak, Alice, the daughter of Virgil Pomfret, she said slowly, folding up the papers. I found them at the bottom of this cabinet. Can you doubt the reality of Christopher Lovelock now? The question was an illogical one, but a doubt of the existence of Christopher Lovelock was one thing, but a doubt of the mode of his death was another. But somehow, I did feel convinced. Look, she said, when she had replaced the poems, I will show you something else. Among the flowers that stood on the upper story of her writing table, for I found that Mrs. Oak had a writing table in the yellow room, stood as on an altar a small black carved frame with a silk curtain drawn over it, the sort of thing behind which you would have expected to find a head of Christ or of the Virgin Mary. She drew the curtain and displayed a large-sized miniature representing a young man with auburn curls and a peaked auburn beard dressed in black, but with lace about his neck, and large pear-shaped pearls in his ears. A wistful, melancholy face. Mrs. Oak took the miniature religiously off its stand and showed me, 
written in faded characters upon the back, the name Christopher Lovelock, and the date 1626. I found this in the secret drawer of that cabinet, together with the heap of poems, she said, taking the miniature out of my hand. I was silent for a minute. Does, uh, does Mr. Oak know that you've got it here? I asked, and then wondered what in the world had impelled me to put such a question. Mrs. Oak smiled that smile of contemptuous indifference. I have never hidden it from anyone. If my husband disliked my having it, he might have taken it away, I suppose. It belongs to him, since it was found in his house. I didn't answer, but walked mechanically towards the door. There was something heady and depressive in this beautiful room, something, I thought, almost repulsive in this exquisite woman. She seemed to me suddenly perverse and dangerous. I scarcely know why, but I neglected Mrs. Oak that afternoon. I went to Mr. Oak's study and sat opposite to him, smoking, while he was engrossed in his accounts, his reports, and electioneering papers. On the table, above the heap of paper-bound volumes and pigeonholed documents, was a sole ornament of his den, a little photograph of his wife, done some years before. I don't know why, but as I sat and watched him, with his florid, honest, manly beauty, working away conscientiously with that little perplexed frown of his, I felt intensely sorry for this man. But this feeling did not last. There was no help for it. Oak was not as interesting as Mrs. Oak, and it required too great an effort to pump up sympathy for this normal, excellent, exemplary young squire in the presence of so wonderful a creature as his wife. So I let myself go to the habit of allowing Mrs. Oak daily to talk over her strange craze, or rather, of drawing her out about it. I confess that I derived a morbid and exquisite pleasure in doing so, it was so characteristic in her, so appropriate to the house. It completed her personality so perfectly and made it so much easier to conceive a way of painting her. I made up my mind, little by little, while working at William Oak's portrait. He proved a less easy subject than I had anticipated and despite his conscientious efforts, was a nervous, uncomfortable sitter, silent and brooding. I made up my mind that I would paint Mrs. Oak standing by the cabinet in the yellow room in the white Van Dyke dress copied from the portrait of her ancestress. Mr. Oak might resent it. Mrs. Oak even might resent it. They may refuse to take the picture to pay for it, to allow me to exhibit. They might force me to run my umbrella through the picture. No matter. That picture should be painted, if merely for the sake of having painted it for I felt it was the only thing I could do, and that it would be far away my best work. I told neither of my resolution, but prepared sketch after sketch of Mrs. Oak while continuing to paint her husband. Mrs. Oak was a silent person, more silent even than her husband, for she did not feel bound, as he did, to attempt to entertain a guest or to show any interest in him. She seemed to spend her life, a curious, inactive, half-invalidish life, broken by sudden fits of childish cheerfulness, in an eternal daydream, strolling about the house and grounds, arranging the quantities of flowers that always filled all the rooms, beginning to read, and then throwing aside novels and books of poetry, of which she always had a large number, and, I believe, lying for hours, doing nothing, on a couch in that yellow drawing room, which, with her sole exception, no member of the Oak family had ever been known to stay in alone. Little by little, I began to suspect, and to verify, another eccentricity of this eccentric being, and to understand why there were stringent orders never to disturb her in that yellow room. It had been the habit at Oakhurst, as at one or two other English manor houses, to keep a certain amount of the clothes of each generation, more particularly wedding dresses. A certain carved oaken press, of which Mr. Oak once displayed the contents to me, was a perfect museum of costumes, male and female, from the early years of the 17th to the end of the 18th century. A thing to take away the breath of a bric-a-brac collector, 
an antiquary or a genre painter. Mr. Oak was none of these, and therefore took but little interest in the collection, save insofar as it interested his family feeling. Still, he seemed well acquainted with the contents of that press. He was turning over the clothes for my benefit when suddenly I noticed that he frowned. I know not what impelled me to say. By the way, have you any dresses of that Mrs. Oak whom your wife resembles so much? Have you uh, got that particular white dress she was painted in, perhaps? Oak of Oakhurst flushed very red. Oh, uh, we have it, he answered hesitatingly, but uh, it isn't here at present. I can't find it. I suppose, he blurted out with an effort, that Alice has got it. Uh, Mrs. Oak sometimes has the fancy of having some of these uh, old things down. I suppose she takes ideas from them. A sudden light dawned in my mind. The white dress in which I had seen Mrs. Oak in the yellow room the day that she showed me Lovelock verses was not, as I had thought, a modern copy. It was the original dress of Alice Oak, the daughter of Virgil Pomfret, the dress in which, perhaps, Christopher Lovelock had seen her in that very room. The idea gave me a delightful, a picturesque shudder. I said nothing, and I pictured to myself Mrs. Oak sitting in that yellow room, that room which no Oak of Oakhurst save herself ventured to remain in alone, in the dress of her ancestress, confronting, as it were, that vague, haunting something that seemed to fill the place, that vague presence, it seemed to me, of the murdered cavalier poet. Mrs. Oak, as I have said, was extremely silent, as a result of being extremely indifferent, she really did not care in the least about anything, except her own ideas and daydreams, except when every now and then she was seized with a sudden desire to shock the prejudices or superstitions of her husband. Very soon, she got into the way of never talking to me at all, save about Alice and Nicholas Oak and Christopher Lovelock. And then, when the fit seized her, she would go on by the hour, never asking herself whether I was or was not equally interested in the strange craze that fascinated her. It so happened that I was. I loved to listen to her going on discussing by the hour the merits of Lovelock's poems and analysing her feelings and those of her two ancestors. It was quite wonderful to watch the exquisite, exotic creature in one of these moods, with the distant look in her grey eyes and the absent-looking smile in her thin cheeks talking as if she had intimately known these people of the 17th century, discussing every minute mood of theirs, detailing every scene between them and their victim, talking of Alice and Nicholas and Lovelock as she might of her most intimate friends, of Alice particularly, and of Lovelock. She seemed to know every word that Alice had spoken, every idea that had crossed her mind. It sometimes struck me as if she were telling me, speaking of herself in the third person, of her own feelings, as if I were listening to a woman's confidences, the recital of her doubts, scruples and agonies about a living lover. For Mrs. O, who seemed the most self-absorbed of creatures in all other matters, and utterly incapable of understanding or sympathizing with the feelings of other persons, entered completely and passionately into the feelings of this woman, this Alice, who at some moments seemed to be not another woman, but herself. But how could she do it? How could she kill the man she cared for? I once asked her. Because she loved him more than the whole world, she exclaimed, and rising suddenly from her chair, walked towards the window, covering her face with her hands. I could see from the movement of her neck that she was sobbing. She didn't turn round, but motioned to me to go away. D don't let us talk any more about it, she said. I'm ill today, and silly. I closed the door gently behind me. What mystery was there in this woman's life? This listlessness, this strange self-engrossment, and stranger mania about people long dead, this indifference and desire to annoy towards her husband, did it all mean that Alice Oak had loved, or still loved someone, who was not the master of Oakhurst? And his melancholy, his preoccupation, 
That something about him that told of a broken youth, did it mean that he knew it? Six. The following days, Mrs. Oak was in a condition of quite unusual good spirits. Some visitors, distant relatives, were expected. And although she had expressed the utmost annoyance at the idea of their coming, she was now seized with a fit of housekeeping activity and was perpetually about arranging things and giving orders, although all arrangements, as usual, had been made and all orders given by her husband. William Oak was quite radiant. If only Alice were always well like this, he exclaimed. If only she would take or, or could take an interest in life, how different things would be. But, he added, as if fearful lest he should be supposed to accuse her in any way, uh, how can she, usually, with her wretched health? Still, it does make me awfully happy to see her like this. I nodded, but I cannot say that I really acquiesced in his views. It seemed to me, particularly with the recollection of yesterday's extraordinary scene, that Mrs. Oak's high spirits were anything but normal. There was something in her unusual activity and still more unusual cheerfulness that was merely nervous and feverish, and I had the whole day the impression of dealing with a woman who was ill and who would very speedily collapse. Mrs. Oak spent her day wandering from one room to another and from the garden to the greenhouse, seeing whether all was in order, when, as a matter of fact, all was always in order with Oakhurst. She did not give me any sitting, and not a word was spoken about Alice Oak or Christopher Lovelock. Indeed, to a casual observer, it might have seemed as if all that craze about Lovelock had completely departed or never existed. About five o'clock, as I was strolling along the red brick, round gabled outhouses, each with its armorial oak and the old-fashioned spalliard kitchen and fruit garden, I saw Mrs. Oak standing, her hands full of York and Lancaster roses upon the steps facing the stables. A groom was curry-combing a horse, and outside the coach house was Mr. Oak's little high-wheeled cart. Let us have a drive, suddenly exclaimed Mrs. Oak on seeing me. Look, what a beautiful evening, and look at that dear little cart. It's so long since I've driven, and I feel as if I must drive again. Come with me, and you harness Jim at once and come round to the door. I was quite amazed, and still more so when the cart drove up before the door and Mrs. Oak called me to accompany her. She sent away the groom, and in a minute we were rolling along at a tremendous pace along the yellow sand road with the sere pasture lands, the big oaks on either side. I could scarcely believe my senses. This woman, with her mannish little coat and hat, driving a powerful young horse with the utmost skill and chattering like a schoolgirl of sixteen, could not be the delicate, morbid, exotic hothouse creature, unable to walk or to do anything, who spent her days lying about on couches in the heavy atmosphere redolent with strange scents and associations of the yellow drawing room. The movement of the light carriage, the cool draught and the very grind of the wheels upon the gravel seemed to go to her head like wine. It's so long since I've done this sort of thing, she kept on repeating. So long, so long. Oh, don't you think it's delightful going at this pace with the idea that any moment the horse may come down and we two be killed? And she laughed her childish laugh and turned her face, no longer pale, but flushed with the movement and the excitement towards me. The cart rolled on, quicker and quicker, one gate after another swinging two behind us as we flew up and down the little hills, across the pasture lands, through the little red brick gabled villages where people came out to see us pass, past the rows of willows along the streams and the darker green compact hop fields, with the blue and hazy treetops of the horizon getting bluer and more hazy as the yellow light began to graze the ground. At last, we got to an open space, a high-lying piece of common land, such as is rare in that ruthlessly utilised country of grazing grounds and hop gardens. Among the low hills of the Weald, it seemed quite preternaturally high up, giving a sense that its extent of flat heather and gorse bounded by distant firs, was really on top of the world. The sun was setting just opposite, and its lights lay flat on the ground, 
staining it with the red and black of the heather, or rather turning it into the surface of a purple sea, canopied over by a bank of dark purple clouds. The jet light sparkle of the dry ling and gorse tipping the purple like sunlit wavelets. A cold wind swept in our faces. What's the name of this place? I asked. It was the only bit of impressive scenery that I had met in the neighborhood of Oakhurst. It's called Coates Common, answered Mrs. Oak, who had slackened the pace of the horse and let the reins hang loose about his neck. It was here that Christopher Lovelock was killed. There was a moment's pause, and then she proceeded, tickling the flies from the horse's ears with the end of her whip, looking straight into the sunset, which now rolled a deep purple stream across the heath to our feet. Lovelock was riding home one summer evening from Appledore when, as he had got halfway across Coates Common, somewhere about here, for I have always heard them mention the pond in the old gravel pits as about the place, he saw two men riding towards him, in whom he presently recognised Nicholas Oak of Oakhurst, accompanied by a groom. Oak of Oakhurst hailed him, and Lovelock rode up to meet him. "'I'm glad to have met you, Mr. Lovelock,' said Nicholas, because... I have some important news for you. And so saying, he brought his horse close to the one that Lovelock was riding, and suddenly turning round, fired off a pistol at his head. Lovelock had no time to move, and the bullet, instead of striking him, went straight into the head of his horse which fell beneath him. Lovelock, however, had fallen in such a way as to be able to extricate himself easily from his horse, and drawing his sword, he rushed upon Oak and seized his horse by the bridle. Oak quickly jumped off and drew his sword, and in a minute Lovelock, who was much the better swordsman of the two, was having the better of him. Lovelock had completely disarmed him, and got his sword at Oak's throat, crying out to him that if he would ask forgiveness he should be spared for the sake of their old friendship, when the groom suddenly rode up from behind and shot Lovelock through the back. Lovelock fell and Oak immediately tried to finish him with his sword, while the groom drew up and held the bridle of Oak's horse. At that moment, the sunlight fell upon the groom's face, and Lovelock recognised Mrs. Oak. He cried out, Alice! Alice! It is you who have murdered me! and died. Then, Nicholas Oak sprang into his saddle and rode off with his wife leaving Lovelock dead by the side of his fallen horse. Nicholas Oak had taken the precaution of removing Lovelock's purse and throwing it into the pond, so the murder was put down to certain highwaymen who were about in that part of the country. Alice Oak died many years afterwards, quite an old woman, in the reign of Charles II, but Nicholas did not live very long, and shortly before his death got into a very strange condition, always brooding and sometimes threatening to kill his wife. They say that in one of these fits, just shortly before his death, he told the whole story of the murder, and made a prophecy, that when the head of his house and master of Oakhurst should marry another Alice Oak, descended from himself and his wife, there should be an end of the Oaks of Oakhurst. You see, it seems to be coming true. We have no children and I don't suppose we shall ever have any. I, at least, have never wished for them. Mrs. Oak paused and turned her face towards me with the absent smile in her thin cheeks. Her eyes no longer had that distant look. They were strangely eager and fixed. I did not know what to answer. This woman positively frightened me. We remained for a moment in that same place, with the sunlight dying away in crimson ripples on the heather gilding the yellow banks, the black waters of the pond surrounded by thin rushes and the yellow gravel pits, while the wind blew in our faces and bent the ragged, warped, bluish tops of the firs. Then Mrs. Oak touched the horse, and off we went at a furious pace. We did not exchange a single word, I think, on the way home. Mrs. Oak sat with her eyes fixed on the reins, breaking the silence now and again, only by a word to the horse urging him to an even more furious pace. The people we met along the roads must have thought that the horse was running away, unless they noticed Mrs. Oak's calm manner and the look of excited enjoyment in her face. 
To me, it seemed that I was in the hands of a mad woman, and I quietly prepared myself for being upset or dashed against a cart. It had turned cold, and the draught was icy in our faces when we got within sight of the red gables and high chimney stacks of Oakhurst. Mr. Oak was standing before the door. On our approach, I saw a look of relieved suspense, of keen pleasure come into his face. He lifted his wife out of the cart in his strong arms with a kind of chivalrous tenderness. I'm so glad to have you back, darling, he exclaimed. So glad. I was delighted to hear that you'd gone out with the cart. But as you haven't driven for so long, I was beginning to be frightfully anxious, dearest. Where have you been all this time? Mrs. Oak had quickly extricated herself from her husband, who had remained holding her, as one might hold a delicate child who has been causing anxiety. The gentleness and affection of the poor fellow had evidently not touched her. She seemed almost to recoil from it. I have taken him to Coates Common, she said, with that perverse look which I had noticed before as she pulled off her driving gloves. It's such a splendid old place. Mr. Oak flushed as if he had bitten upon a sore tooth and the double gash painted itself scarlet between his eyebrows. Outside, the mists were beginning to rise, veiling the parkland dotted with big black oaks, and from which, in the watery moonlight, rose on all sides the eerie little cry of the lambs separated from their mothers. It was damp and cold, and I shivered. So that was my part two of Oak of Oakhurst by Vernon Lee, comprising of parts four, five, and six. Now, it's going to be a three, three episode one, this one, because they're all about equal length. They're roughly about 40 minutes each. So the next one will take us to the end, okay? And in these middle episodes, there's often not a lot to say, really. I will make my observations, as people seem not to mind that so much. So the story develops, and our painter narrator notes the strange fascination Alice Oak has for her namesake from 1626. And as he keeps mentioning that, remember, I haven't read on to the end. I did take a sneak peek into, there was somebody written an essay on it. You can find anything on the internet, can't you? So I had a look at that, and I sort of do know what happens, but not in detail, just a summary of the plot. So... 1626, she keeps mentioning it, Vernon does, and I wonder if that is actually important. Is, is the actual date important? I don't know. We find out that the dress that she's wearing, Alice, 1880 Alice, isn't a copy of 1626 Alice's dress, it's the same one. And she reads the poems as if uh, our poet Lovelock had written them to her. And it's gradually dawning on us and the narrator that in some sense, this is the same woman. However, they are quite different as well. We don't, so far, I don't have a, a very clear picture of 1626 Alice. I see her dressed as a, a groom and being a highway woman. So I, um, oh, what was that? There was a movie called A Wicked Woman uh, set in kind of the, this sort of similar period, well, around, you know, 17th century, just before the English Civil War. Yeah, so you know all know what Cavaliers means. We, we, I think people in the UK know what Cavaliers are, but people who aren't, the Cavaliers were the, the, was the nickname for the soldiers and the people who fought on the side of the king during the English Civil War, and they were fought by the Roundheads, which is the nickname for the Parliamentarian side. So there was the Royalists, the Cavaliers, and the Parliamentarians who were the Roundheads. Okay, you, you may know that. And, and I think um, modern Alice, well, actually not modern, 1880 Alice is, is, is possessed by the spirit of this wild woman, you know, as she rides the cart like a lunatic. So we've got fey, ethereal Alice from 1880, who's a bit weird and narcissistic. And I wonder what I would diagnose her with hmm, if she came in <laughs> to the surgery. I wonder what I would. Hmm. Anyway, but the 1626 Alice is a wild woman, you know. She's, she's naughty. She's a wicked woman. So they're not the same. That's my point of the waffle. Although modern Alice thinks she's the same as 1626 Alice, she does appear to be quite different. 1626 Alice didn't lie around in, on a couch all day and do nout. She was off um, being wild, 
and having affairs with poets. The other thing to say is about poets, these, this poet, Lovelock, he can turn a mean verse, but he's handy with his sword as well. What's happened to poets? I don't see poets as being, you know, tough guys going into bars and sorting things out. Spark. That just reminds me of, do you ever read a book called The Reckoning, which was about Christopher Marlowe's death in a pub in um, South London? And he was, a, he was a bit of a wild boy as well. So clearly, in this period, in the Elizabethan sort of uh, a Stuart period, poets were rock... They were like rappers, really, weren't they? Which is what rappers are. Rappers are poets. And instead of having rapiers, they have um, glocks and oozies. So there you go. I don't know much about rappers. I know a bit more about poets, to be honest. Anyway... There we are, that's about it really, so enough waffle. If you're using this to go to sleep, please sleep well and dream of sheep. That's from Kate Bush, isn't it? Dream of sheep. And if you're wide awake, that's good. And if you're in New Zealand, I understand it's very cold there at the moment. It's not too bad here. I've got my summer shirt on. It's got um, hibiscus flowers on. I don't know if they are hibiscus. I don't know much about those kind of flowers. I know a little bit about wildflowers. Anyway, this is pure waffle now. I'm just delaying the inevitable of me ending it. So, yes, middle part of Oak of Oakhurst. I'm hoping to get the last part done over the next few days, but I am a bit busy, so I hope there isn't too much of a gap anyway. All of you, stay safe, be well, sleep tight, hope the bugs don't bite. That's it. Seven. The next day Oakhurst was full of people, and Mrs. Oak, to my amazement, was doing the honours of it, as if a house full of commonplace, noisy young creatures bent on flirting and tennis were her usual idea of felicity. The afternoon of the third day, they had come for an electioneering ball and stayed three nights. The weather changed. It turned suddenly very cold and began to pour. Everyone was sent indoors, and there was a general gloom suddenly over the company. Mrs. Oak seemed to have got sick of her guests, and was listlessly lying back on a couch, paying not the slightest attention to the chattering and piano strumming in the room, and one of our guests suddenly proposed that they should play charades. He was a distant cousin of the Oaks, a sort of fashionable artistic bohemian, swelled out to intolerable conceit by the amateur actor vogue of the season. It will be lovely in this marvellous old place, he cried, just to dress up and parade about and feel as if we belong to the past. I have heard that you have a marvellous collection of old costumes, more or less ever since the days of Noah somewhere, Cousin Bill. The whole party exclaimed in joy at this proposal. William Oak looked puzzled for a moment and glanced at his wife, who continued to lie listless on her sofa. Um, uh, there's a press uh, full of clothes uh, belonging to the family, he answered dubiously, apparently overwhelmed by the desire to please his guests. But, but I, I don't know whether it's respectful to dress up in the clothes of dead people. Oh, fiddlestick, cried the cousin. What do the dead people know about it? Besides, he added with mock seriousness, 
I assure you, we shall behave in the most reverent way and feel quite solemn about it all. If only you will give us the key, old man. Again, Mr. Oak looked towards his wife and again met only her vague, absent glance. Uh, uh, very well, he said, and led his guests upstairs. An hour later, the house was filled with the strangest crew and the strangest noises. I had entered, to a certain extent, into William Oak's feeling of unwillingness to let his ancestors' clothes and personality be taken in vain. But when the masquerade was complete, I must say that the effect was quite magnificent. A dozen youngish men and women, those who were staying in the house and some neighbours who had come for lawn tennis and dinner, were rigged out under the direction of the theatrical cousin in the contents of that oaken press. And I have never seen a more beautiful sight than the panelled corridors, the carved and the scutcheoned staircase, the dim drawing rooms with their faded tapestries, the great hall with its vaulted and ribbed ceiling dotted about with groups or single figures that seem to have come straight from the past. Even William Oak, who beside myself and a few elderly people was the only man not masqueraded, seemed delighted and fired by the sight. A certain schoolboy character suddenly came out in him, and finding that there was no costume left for him, he rushed upstairs and presently returned in the uniform he had worn before his marriage. I thought I had really never seen so magnificent a specimen of the handsome Englishman. He looked, despite all the modern associations of his costume, more genuinely old world than all the rest, a knight for the Black Prince or Sydney, with his admirably regular features and beautiful fair hair and complexion. After a minute, even the elderly people had got costumes of some sort, dominoes arranged at the moment, and hoods and all manner of disguises made out of pieces of old embroidery and oriental stuffs and furs. And very soon, this rabble of maskers had become, so to speak, completely drunk with its own amusement, with the childishness and, if I may say so, the barbarism, the vulgarity underlying the majority even of well-bred English men and women. Mr. Oak himself doing the mountebank like a schoolboy at Christmas. Where, where's Mrs. Oak? Where's Alice? Someone asked suddenly. Mrs. Oak had vanished. I could fully understand that to this eccentric being, with her fantastic, imaginative, morbid passion for the past, such a carnival as this must be positively revolting. And, absolutely indifferent as she was to giving offence, I could only imagine how she would have retired, disgusted and outraged, to dream her strange daydreams in the yellow room. But a moment later, as we were all noisily preparing to go into dinner, the door opened, and a strange figure entered. Stranger than any of these others who were profaning the clothes of the dead, a boy, slight and tall in a brown riding coat, leathern belt and big buff boots, a little grey cloak over one shoulder, a large grey hat slouched over the eyes, a dagger and a pistol at the waist. It was Mrs. Oak, her eyes preternaturally bright and her whole face lit up with a bold, perverse smile. Everyone exclaimed and stood aside. Then there was a moment's silence broken by faint applause even to a crew of noisy boys and girls playing the fool in the garments of men and women long dead and buried, there is something questionable in the sudden appearance of a young married woman, the mistress of the house, in a riding coat and jackboots. And Mrs. Oak's expression did not make the jest seem any the less questionable. What is that costume? asked the theatrical cousin, who, after a second, had come to the conclusion that Mrs. Oak was merely a woman of marvellous talent, whom he must try and secure for his amateur troupe next season. It is the dress in which an ancestor of ours, my namesake, Alice Oak, used to go out riding with her husband in the days of Charles I, she answered, and took her seat at the head of the table. Involuntarily, my eyes sought those of Oak of Oakhurst. He, who blushed as easily as a girl of sixteen, was now as white as ashes, and I noticed that he pressed his hand almost convulsively to his mouth. Don't you recognize my dress, William? asked Mrs. Oak, fixing her eyes upon him with a cruel smile. He didn't answer, 
and there was a moment's silence which the theatrical cousin had the happy thought of breaking by jumping upon his seat and emptying off his glass with the exclamation, to the health of the two Alice Oaks, of the past and the present. Mrs. Oak nodded, and with an expression I had never seen in her face before, answered in a loud and aggressive tone, to the health of the poet, Mr. Christopher Lovelock, if his ghost be honouring this house with its presence. I felt suddenly as if I were in a madhouse. Across the table, in the midst of this room full of noisy wretches tricked out in red, blue, purple and party-coloured as men and women of the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, as improvised Turks and Eskimos and dominoes and clowns, with faces painted and corked and flowered over, I seem to see that sanguine sunset washing like a sea of blood over the heather to where, by the black pond and the wind-warped firs, there lay the body of Christopher Lovelock with his dead horse near him, the yellow gravel and lilac ling soaked crimson all round, and above emerged as out of the redness the pale blonde head covered with the grey hat the absent eyes and strange smile of Mrs. Oak. It seemed to me horribly, vulgar, abominable, as if I had got inside a madhouse. Eight. From that moment I noticed a change in William Oak. Or rather, a change that had probably been coming on for some time got to the stage of being noticeable. I don't know whether he had any words with his wife about her masquerade of that unlucky evening. On the whole, I decidedly think not. Oak was with everyone a diffident and reserved man, and most of all so with his wife. Besides, I can fancy that he would experience a positive impossibility of putting into words any strong feeling of disapprobation towards her, that his disgust would necessarily be silent. But be this as it may, I perceived very soon that the relations between my host and hostess had become exceedingly strained. Mrs. Oak, indeed, had never paid much attention to her husband and seemed merely a trifle more indifferent to his presence than she had been before. But Oak himself, although he affected to address her at meals from a desire to conceal his feeling and a fear of making the position disagreeable to me, very clearly could scarcely bear to speak to or even see his wife. The poor fellow's honest soul was quite brimful of pain, which he was determined not to allow to overflow and which seemed to filter into his whole nature and poison it. This woman had shocked and pained him more than was possible to say. And yet, it was evident that he could neither cease loving her nor commence comprehending her real nature. I sometimes felt, as we took our long walks through the monotonous country, across the oak-dotted grazing grounds, and by the brink of the dull green, serried hop rows, talking at rare intervals about the value of the crops, the drainage of the estate, the village schools, the Primrose League, and the iniquities of Mr. Gladstone, while Oak of Oakhurst carefully cut down every tall thistle that caught his eye. I sometimes felt, I say, an intense and impotent desire to enlighten this man about his wife's character. I seemed to understand it so well, and to understand it well seemed to imply such a comfortable acquiescence, and it seemed so unfair that just he should be condemned to puzzle forever over this enigma and wear out his soul, trying to comprehend what now seemed so plain to me. But how would it ever be possible to get this serious, conscientious, slow-brained representative of English simplicity and honesty and thoroughness to understand the mixture of self-engrossed vanity, of shallowness, of poetic vision, of love, of morbid excitement that walked this earth under the name of Alice Oak? So, Oak of Oakhurst, was condemned never to understand. But he was condemned also to suffer from his inability to do so. The poor fellow was constantly straining after an explanation of his wife's peculiarities, and although the effort was probably unconscious, it caused him a great deal of pain, 
The gash, the maniac frown, as my friend calls it between his eyebrows, seemed to have grown a permanent feature of his face. Mrs. Oak, on her side, was making the very worst of the situation. Perhaps she resented her husband's tacit reproval of that masquerade night's freak, and determined to make him swallow more of the same stuff, for she clearly thought that one of William's peculiarities, and one for which she despised him, was that he could never be goaded into an outspoken expression of disapprobation, that from her he would swallow any amount of bitterness without complaining. At any rate, she now adopted a perfect policy of teasing and shocking her husband about the murder of Lovelock. She was perpetually alluding to it in her conversation, discussing in his presence what had or had not been the feelings of the various actors in the tragedy of 1626, and insisting upon her resemblance and almost identity with the original Alice Oak. Something had suggested to her eccentric mind that it would be delightful to perform in the garden at Oakhurst under the huge ilexes and elms, a little mask which she had discovered among Christopher Lovelock's works, and she began to scour the country and enter into vast correspondence for the purpose of effectuating this scheme. Letters arrived every other day from the theatrical cousin, whose only objection was that Oakhurst was too remote a locality for an entertainment in which he foresaw great glory to himself. And every now and then, there would arrive some young gentleman or lady whom Alice Oak had sent for to see whether they would do. I saw very plainly that the performance would never take place and that Mrs Oak herself had no intention that it ever should. She was one of those creatures to whom realisation of a project is nothing and who enjoy the plan making almost the more for knowing that it all will stop short at the plan. Meanwhile, this perpetual talk about the pastoral, about Lovelock, this continual attitudinizing as the wife of Nicholas Oak, had the further attraction to Mrs. Oak of putting her husband into a condition of frightful, though suppressed, irritation, which she enjoyed with the enjoyment of a perverse child. You must not think that I looked on indifferent, although I admit that this was a perfect treat to an amateur student of character like myself, I really did feel most sorry for poor Oak, and frequently quite indignant with his wife. I was several times at the point of begging her to have more consideration for him, even of suggesting that this kind of behaviour, particularly before a comparative stranger like me, was very poor taste. But there was something elusive about Mrs Oak which made it next to impossible to speak seriously with her, and besides, I was by no means sure that any interference on my part would not merely animate her perversity. One evening, a curious incident took place. We had just sat down to dinner, the Oaks, the theatrical cousin who was down for a couple of days, and three or four neighbours. It was dusk, and the yellow light of the candles mingled charmingly with the greyness of the evening. Mrs Oak was not well, and had been remarkably quiet all day, more diaphanous, strange and far away than ever and her husband seemed to have felt a sudden return of tenderness, almost of compassion for this delicate, fragile creature. We had been talking of quite indifferent matters, when I saw Mr. Oak suddenly turn very white and look fixedly for a moment at the window opposite to his seat. But who's that fellow looking at the window and making signs to Alice? Damn his impudence, he cried, and jumping up, ran to the window, opened it and passed out into the twilight. We all looked at each other in surprise. Some of the party remarked upon the carelessness of servants in letting nasty-looking fellows hang about the kitchen. Others told stories of tramps and burglars. Mrs. Oak did not speak, but I noticed the curious, distant-looking smile in her thin cheeks. After a minute, William Oak came in, his napkin in his hand. He shut the window behind him and silently resumed his place. Well, who was it? we all asked. Uh, nobody. I must have made a mistake, he answered, and turned crimson while he busily peeled a pear. It was probably Lovelock, remarked Mrs. Oak, just as she might have said it was probably the gardener, who with that faint smile of pleasure still in her face. Except the theatrical cousin who burst into a loud laugh, none of the company had ever heard Lovelock's name 
and doubtless imagining him to be some natural appanage of the Oak family, groom or farmer, said nothing. So the subject dropped. From that evening onwards, things began to assume a different aspect. That incident was the beginning of a perfect system. A system of what? I scarcely know what to call it. A system of grim jokes on the part of Mrs. Oak, of superstitious fancies on the part of her husband, a system of mysterious persecutions on the part of some less earthly tenant of Oakhurst. Well, yes, after all, why not? We have all heard of ghosts, had uncles, cousins, grandmothers, nurses who've seen them. We're all a bit afraid of them at the bottom of our soul. So why shouldn't they be? I am too skeptical to believe in the impossibility of anything for my part. Besides, when a man has lived throughout a summer in the same house with a woman like Mrs. Oak of Oakhurst, he gets to believe in the possibility of a great many improbable things. I assure you, as a mere result, of believing in her. And when you come to think of it, why not? That a weird creature, visibly not of this earth, a reincarnation of a woman who murdered her lover two centuries and a half ago, that such a creature should have the power of attracting about her, being altogether superior to earthly lovers, the man who loved her in that previous existence, whose love for her was his death, what is there astonishing in that? Mrs. Oak herself, I feel quite persuaded, believed, or half believed it. Indeed, she very seriously admitted the possibility thereof one day that I made the suggestion half in jest. At all events, it rather pleased me to think so. It fitted in so well with the woman's whole personality. It explained those hours and hours spent all alone in the yellow room, where the very air with its scent of heady flowers and old perfumed stuffs seemed redolent of ghosts. It explained that strange smile, which was not for any of us, and yet was not merely for herself. That strange far-off look in the wide, pale eyes. I liked the idea, and I liked to tease, or rather, to delight her with it. How should I know that the wretched husband would take such matters seriously? He became day by day more silent and perplexed looking, and as a result, worked harder, and probably with less effect, at his land improving schemes and political canvassing. It seemed to me that he was perpetually listening, watching, waiting for something to happen. A word spoken suddenly, the sharp opening of a door would make him turn, start, turn crimson, and almost tremble. The mention of Lovelock brought a helpless look, half a convulsion, like that of a man overcome by great heat into his face. And his wife, so far from taking any interest in his altered looks, went on irritating him more and more. Every time that the poor fellow gave one of those starts of his, or turned crimson at the sudden sound of a footstep, Mrs. Oak would ask him, with her contemptuous indifference, whether he had seen Lovelock. I soon began to perceive that my host was getting perfectly ill. He would sit at meals, never saying a word, with his eyes fixed scrutinizingly on his wife, as if vainly trying to solve some dreadful mystery. While his wife, ethereal, exquisite, went on talking in a listless way about the mask, about Lovelock, always about Lovelock. During our walks and rides, which we continued pretty regularly, he would start whenever in the roads or lanes surrounding Oakhurst or in its grounds we perceived a figure in the distance. I have seen him tremble at what, on nearer approach, I could scarcely restrain my laughter on discovering to be some well-known farmer or neighbour or servant. Once, as we were returning home at dusk, he suddenly caught my arm and, and pointed across the oak-dotted pastures in the direction of the garden then started off almost to run with his dog behind him, as if in pursuit of some intruder. Uh, who was it? I asked. And Mr. Oak merely shook his head mournfully. Sometimes in the early autumn twilights, when the white mists rose from the parkland and the rooks formed long black lines on the palings, I almost fancied I saw him start at the very trees and bushes the outlines of the distant oast houses with their conical roofs and projecting veins like jibing fingers 
in the half-light. Your husband is ill, I once ventured to remark to Mrs. Oak, as she sat for the hundred and thirtieth of my preparatory sketches. I somehow could never get beyond preparatory sketches with her. She raised her beautiful, wide, pale eyes, making as she did so that exquisite curve of her shoulders and neck and delicate pale head that I so vainly longed to reproduce. I don't see it, she answered quietly. If he is, why doesn't he go up to town and see the doctor? It's merely one of his glum fits. You shouldn't tease him about Lovelock, I added very seriously. You'll get to believe in him. Why not? If he sees him, why, he sees him. He wouldn't be the only person that has done so. And she smiled faintly and half perversely as her eyes sought that usual distant, indefinable something. But Oak got worse. He was growing perfectly unstrung, like a hysterical woman. One evening that we were sitting alone in the smoking room, he began, unexpectedly, a rambling discourse about his wife, how he had first known her when they were children, and they had gone to the same dancing school near Portland Place, how her mother, his aunt-in-law, had brought her for Christmas to Oakhurst while he was on his holidays, and how finally, thirteen years ago, when he was twenty-three and she was eighteen, they had been married. How terribly he'd suffered when they had been disappointed of their baby, and she had nearly died of the illness. I, I, I don't mind about the child, you know, he said in an excited voice. Although there will be an end of us now, and Oakhurst will go to the courtesies. I, I minded only about Alice. It was next inconceivable that this poor excited creature, speaking almost with tears in his voice and in his eyes, was the quiet, well got up, irreproachable young ex-guardsman who'd walked into my studio a couple of months before. Oak was silent for a moment, looking fixedly at the rug at his feet, when he suddenly burst out in a scarce audible voice, If, if you knew how I cared for Alice, how I still care for her, I could kiss the ground she walks on. I would give anything, my life, any day, if only she would look for two minutes, as if she liked me a little, as if she didn't utterly despise me. And the poor fellow burst into a hysterical laugh, which was almost a sob. Then he suddenly began to laugh outright, exclaiming with a sort of vulgarity of intonation, which was extremely foreign to him. Damn it, old fellow, this is a queer world we live in, and rang for more brandy and soda, which he was beginning, I noticed, to take pretty freely now, although he had been almost a blue ribbon man, as much so as is possible for a hospitable country gentleman when I first arrived. 9. It became clear to me now that, incredible as it might seem, the thing that ailed William Oak was jealousy. He was simply madly in love with his wife and madly jealous of her. Jealous? But of whom? He himself would probably have been quite unable to say. In the first place, to clear off any possible suspicion, certainly not of me. Besides the fact that Mrs. Oak took only just a very little more interest in me than in the butler or the upper housemaid, I think that Oak himself was the sort of man whose imagination would recoil from realizing any definite object of jealousy, even though jealousy might be killing him inch by inch. It remained a vague, permeating, continuous feeling, the feeling that he loved her and she did not care a jack straw about him, and that everything with which she came into contact was receiving some of that notice which was refused to him, every person, or thing, or tree, or stone. It was the recognition of that strange far-off look in Mrs. Oak's eyes, of that strange absent smile on Mrs. Oak's lips, eyes and lips, that had no look and no smile for him. Gradually his nervousness, his watchfulness, suspiciousness, tendency to start, took a definite shape. Mr. Oak was forever alluding to steps or voices he'd heard, to figures he had seen sneaking round the house. The sudden bark of one of the dogs would make him jump up. He cleaned and loaded very carefully all the guns and revolvers in his study, and even some of the old fowling pieces and holster pistols in the hall. The servants and tenants thought that Oak of Oakhurst had been seized with the terror of tramps and burglars. 
Mrs. Oak smiled contemptuously at all these doings. My dear William, she said one day, the persons who worry you have just as good a right to walk up and down the passages and staircase and to hang about the house as you or I. They were there in all probability long before either of us was born and are greatly amused by your preposterous notions of privacy. Mr. Oak laughed angrily. I suppose you'll tell me it's Lovelock, your eternal Lovelock, whose steps I hear on the gravel every night. I suppose he has as good a right to be here as you or I. And he strode out of the room. Lovelock, Lovelock, why will she always go on like that about Lovelock? Mr. Oak asked me that evening, suddenly staring me in the face. I merely laughed. It's only because she has that play of his on the brain, I answered, and because she thinks you superstitious and likes to tease you. I don't understand, sighed Oak. How could he? And if I had tried to make him do so, he would merely have thought I was insulting his wife and have perhaps kicked me out of the room. So I made no attempt to explain psychological problems to him. And he asked me no more questions until once. But I must first mention a curious incident that happened. The incident was simply this. Returning one afternoon from our usual walk, Mr. Oak suddenly asked the servant whether anyone had come. The answer was in the negative, but Oak didn't seem satisfied. We had hardly sat down to dinner when he turned to his wife and asked, in a strange voice which I scarcely recognized as his own, who had called that afternoon. No one, answered Mrs. Oak at least to the best of my knowledge. William Oak looked at her fixedly. No one, he repeated in a scrutinizing tone. No one, Alice? Mrs. Oak shook her head. No one, she replied. There was a pause. Who was it then that was walking with you near the pond about five o'clock? Asked Oak slowly. His wife lifted her eyes straight to his and answered contemptuously, no one was walking with me near the pond at five o'clock or any other hour. Mr. Oak turned purple and made a curious hoarse noise like a man choking. I thought I saw you walking with a man this afternoon, Alice, he brought out with an effort, adding for the sake of appearances before me. I thought it might have been the curate. Um, come with that report for me. Mrs. Oak smiled. I can only repeat that no living creature has been near me this afternoon, she said slowly. If you saw anyone with me, it must have been Lovelock, for there certainly was no one else. And she gave a little sigh like a person trying to reproduce in her mind some delightful, but too evanescent impression. I looked at my host. From crimson, his face had turned perfectly livid, and he breathed as if someone was squeezing his windpipe no more was said about the matter. I vaguely felt that a great danger was threatening. To Oak or to Mrs. Oak, I couldn't tell which. But I was aware of an imperious inner call to avert some dreadful evil, to exert myself, to explain, to interpose. I determined to speak to Oak the following day, for I trusted him to give me a quiet hearing, and I did not trust Mrs. Oak. That woman would slip through my fingers like a snake if I attempted to grasp her elusive character. I asked Oak whether he would take a walk with me the next afternoon, and he accepted to do so with a curious eagerness. We started about three o'clock. It was a stormy, chilly afternoon, with great balls of white clouds rolling rapidly in the cold blue sky, and occasional lurid gleams of sunlight broad and yellow, which made the black ridge of the storm gathered on the horizon look blue-black. I think. We walked quickly across the sere and sodden grass of the park and on to the high road that led over the low hills, I don't know why, in the direction of Coates Common. Both of us were silent, for both of us had something to say and did not know how to begin. For my part, I recognized the impossibility of starting the subject. An uncalled for interference from me would merely indispose Mr. Oak and make him doubly dense of comprehension. So, if Oak had something to say, which he evidently had, it was better to wait for him. Oak, however, broke the silence only by pointing out to me the condition of the hops as we passed one of his many hop gardens. It'll be a poor year, he said, stopping short, 
looking intently before him. No hops at all. No hops this autumn. I looked at him. It was clear that he had no notion what he was saying. The dark green vines were covered with fruit, and only yesterday he himself had informed me that he had not seen such a profusion of hops for many years. I didn't answer, and we walked on. A cart met us in a dip of the road, and the carter touched his hat and greeted Mr. Oak. But Oak took no heed. He didn't seem to be aware of the man's presence. The clouds were collecting all around black domes, among which coursed the round grey masses of fleecy stuff. I think we should be caught in a tremendous storm, I said. Hadn't we better be turning? He nodded and turned sharply round. The sunlight lay in yellow patches under the oaks and pasture lands and burnished the green hedges. The air was heavy and yet cold, and everything seemed preparing for a great storm. The rooks swirled in black clouds round the trees, and the conical red caps of the oast houses, which give that country the look of being studded with turreted castles. Then they descended, a black line upon the fields, with what seemed an unearthly loudness of caw, and all round there rose a shrill, quavering bleating of lambs and calling of sheep, while the wind began to catch the topmost branches of the trees. Suddenly, Mr. Oak broke the silence. Um, I don't know you very well, he began hurriedly, without turning his face towards me, but I think you're honest and have seen a good deal of the world, much more than I. I, I want you to tell me, but truly please, what do you think a man should do if... And he stopped for some minutes. Uh, imagine, he went on quickly, that a man cares a great deal, a very great deal for his wife, and that he finds out that she, well, that she's deceiving him. No, uh, don't misunderstand me. I mean that she's constantly surrounded by someone else and will not admit it. Someone whom she hides away. Do you understand? Perhaps she doesn't know all the risks she's running, you know, but... She won't draw back. She will not avow it to her husband. My dear Oak, I interrupted, attempting to take the matter lightly. These are questions that can't be solved in the abstract or by people to whom the thing has not happened. And it certainly hasn't happened to you or me. Oak took no notice of my interruption. You see, he went on, the man doesn't expect his wife to care much about him. It's not that he isn't merely jealous, you know. He feels that she's on the brink of dishonouring herself because I don't think that a woman can really dishonour her husband. Dishonour is in our own hands and depends only on our own acts. He ought to save her. Do you see? He, he must, must save her in one way or another. But she will not listen to him. What can he do? Must he seek out the other one and, and try to get him out of the way? You see, it's all the fault of the other, not hers, not hers. If only she would trust in her husband, she'd be safe. But that other one won't let her. Look here, Oak, I said boldly, but feeling rather frightened. I know quite well what you're talking about. And I see you don't understand the matter in the very least. I do. I have watched you and watched Mrs. Oak these six weeks. And I see what's the matter. Will you listen to me? and taking his arm I tried to explain to him my view of the situation, that his wife was merely eccentric and a little theatrical and imaginative, and that she took a pleasure in teasing him, that he, on the other hand, was letting himself get into a morbid state, that he was ill and ought to see a good doctor. I even offered to take him to town with me. I poured out volumes of psychological explanations. I dissected Mrs. Oak's character 20 times over, and tried to show him that there was absolutely nothing at the bottom of his suspicions beyond an imaginative pose and a garden play on the brain. I had used twenty instances mostly invented for the nonce of ladies of my acquaintance who had suffered from similar fads. I pointed out to him that his wife ought to have an outlet for her imaginative and theatrical over-energy. I advised him to take her to London and plunge her into some set where everyone should be more or less in similar condition. I laughed at the notion of there being any hidden individual about the house. I explained to Oak that he was suffering from delusions and called upon so conscientious and religious a man to take every step to rid himself of them, adding innumerable examples of people who had cured themselves of seeing visions and of brooding over morbid fancies. 
I struggled and wrestled like Jacob with the angel, and I really hoped I had made some impression. At first, indeed, I felt that not one of my words went into the man's brain, that though silent, he wasn't listening. It seemed almost hopeless to present my views in such a light that he could grasp them. I felt as if I were expounding and arguing at a rock. But when I got to the tack of his duty towards his wife and himself, and appealed to his moral and religious notions, I felt that I was making an impression. <sighs> I, I dare say you're right, he said, taking my hand as we came in sight of the red gables of Oakhurst, and speaking in a weak, tired, humble voice. I don't understand you quite, but I I'm sure that what you say is true. I dare say it's all that I'm seedy. I feel sometimes as if I were mad and just fit to be locked up, but don't think I don't struggle against it. I do, I do, continually. Only sometimes it seems too strong for me. I pray God night and morning to give me the strength to overcome my suspicions and to remove these dreadful thoughts from me. God knows I know what a wretched creature I am and how unfit I am to take care of that poor girl. And Oak again pressed my hand. As we entered the garden, he turned to me once more. I'm very, very grateful to you, he said. And indeed, I'll do my best to try and be stronger. If only, he added with a sigh, if only Alice would give me a moment's breathing time and not go on day after day mocking me with her love lock. 10. I had begun Mrs. Oak's portrait and she was giving me a sitting. She was unusually quiet that morning, but it seemed to me with the quietness of a woman who's expecting something, and she gave me the impression of being extremely happy. She had been reading, at my suggestion, the Vita Nuova, which she didn't know before, and the conversation came to roll upon that, and upon the question whether love so abstract and so enduring was a possibility. Such a discussion which might have savoured a flirtation in the case of almost any other young and beautiful woman became, in the case of Mrs. Oak, something quite different. It seemed distant, intangible, not of this earth, like her smile and the look in her eyes. Such love as that, she said, looking into the far distance of the oak-dotted parkland, is very rare, but it can exist. It becomes a person's whole existence, his whole soul, and it can survive the death, not merely of the beloved, but of the lover, it is unextinguishable and goes on in the spiritual world until it meet a reincarnation of the beloved. And when this happens, it jets out and draws to it all that may remain of that lover's soul and takes shape and surrounds the beloved once more. Mrs. Oak was speaking slowly, almost to herself, and I had never, I think, seen her look so strange and so beautiful. The stiff white dress bringing out but the more the exotic exquisiteness and the incorporealness of her person. I didn't know what to answer, so I said half in jest, I fear you've been reading too much Buddhist literature, Mrs. Oak. There is something dreadfully esoteric in all you say. She smiled contemptuously. I know people can't understand such matters, she replied, and was silent for some time. But through her quietness and silence, I felt as it were the throb of a strange excitement in this woman, almost as if I had been holding her pulse. Still, I was in hopes that things might be beginning to go better in consequence of my interference. Mrs. Oak had scarcely once alluded to Lovelock in the last two or three days, and Oak had been much more cheerful and natural since our conversation. He no longer seemed so worried, and once or twice I'd caught in him a look of great gentleness and loving kindness, almost of pity as towards some young and very frail thing, as he sat opposite his wife. But the end had come. After that sitting, Mrs. Oak had complained of fatigue and retired to her room, and Oak had driven off on some business to the nearest town. I felt all alone in the big house, and after having worked a little at a sketch I was making in the park, I amused myself by rambling about the house. It was a warm, enervating autumn afternoon, the kind of weather that brings the perfume out of everything, the damp ground and fallen leaves, the flowers in the jars, the old woodwork and stuffs, that seems to bring on to the surface of one's consciousness all manner of vague recollections and expectations. 
something half pleasurable, half painful that makes it impossible to do or to think. I was the prey of this particular, not at all unpleasurable restlessness. I wandered up and down the corridors, stopping to look at the pictures, which I knew already in every detail, to follow the pattern of the carvings and old stuffs, to stare at the autumn flowers arranged in magnificent masses of colour in the big china bowls and jars. I took up one book after another and threw it aside. Then. I sat down to the piano and began to play irrelevant fragments. I felt quite alone, although I had heard the grind of the wheels on the gravel, which meant that my host had returned. I was lazily turning over a book of verses. I remember it perfectly well. It was Morris's Love is Enough in a corner of the drawing room. When the door suddenly opened and William Oak showed himself, he didn't enter, but beckoned to me to come out with him. There was something in his face that made me start up and follow him at once. He was extremely quiet, even stiff, not a muscle of his face moving, but very pale. I have something to show you, he said, leading me through the vaulted hall, hung round with ancestral pictures, into the gravelled space that looked like a filled up moat, where stood the big blasted oak with its twisted, pointing branches. I followed him onto the lawn or rather the piece of parkland that ran up to the house. We walked quickly, he in front, without exchanging a word. Suddenly he stopped, just where there jutted out the bow window of the yellow drawing room, and I felt Oak's hand tight on my arm. I brought you here to see something, he whispered hoarsely, and he led me to the window. I looked in. The room, compared with the outdoor, was rather dark, but against the yellow wall I saw Mrs. Oak sitting alone on her couch in her white dress, her head slightly thrown back, a large red rose in her hand. Do you believe me now? whispered Oak's voice hot at my ear. Do you believe now? Was it all my fancy? But I'll have him this time. I locked the door outside, and by God he shan't escape. The words were not out of Oak's mouth when I found myself struggling with him silently outside that window, but he broke loose pulled open the window and leapt into the room, and I after him. As I crossed the threshold, something flashed in my eyes. There was a loud report, a sharp cry, and a thud of a body on the ground. Oak was standing in the middle of the room, with a faint smoke about him, and at his feet, sunk down from the sofa, with her blonde head resting on its seat, lay Mrs. Oak, a pool of red forming in her white dress. Her mouth was convulsed, as if in that automatic shriek, but her wide-open white eyes seemed to smile vaguely and distantly. I know nothing of time. It all seemed to be one second, but a second that lasted hours. Oak stared, then turned round and laughed. The damned rascal has given me the slip again, he cried, and quickly unlocking the door, rushed out of the house with dreadful cries. That is the end of the story. Oak tried to shoot himself that evening, but merely fractured his jaw and died a few days later, raving. There were all sorts of legal inquiries through which I went as through a dream, and whence it resulted that Mr. Oak had killed his wife in a fit of momentary madness. That was the end of Alice Oak. By the way, her maid brought me a locket which was found round her neck, all stained with blood. It contained some very dark auburn hair, not at all the colour of William Oakes. I'm quite sure it was Lovelock's. So that was part seven to ten of Oak of Oakhurst, written by Vernon Lee, whose real name was Violet Padgett and I've lumped it together as part three, so I split the story into three episodes of about 45 minutes each. So it's quite a long story. It's unusual in that it's one of very, at least very few stories set in England, and it, I don't know why, but it isn't actually as famous as, as the Italian ones. We did a wicked voice and things like that set in Venice, so most of her stories are set on the continent where she spent most of her life. The story was originally called The Phantom Lover, and you can see why, because of course Alice Oak has the ghostly Lovelock, the poet Lovelock as her phantom lover. Actually, um, Violet Paget 
Vernon Lee changed the name to Oak of Oakhurst. Now, Oak of Oakhurst is clearly William Oak. Although the narrator, and just to say something about the narrator, he hardly intrudes. He's like um, a film camera, isn't he? You know, he, he, he has some minor intervention. It doesn't really do much to try and help, help Oak from going nuts at the end but it doesn't really do much. And, and he's really just a frame through which we see this drama in full between William Oak and his wife, Alice, and of course her demon lover. So the other theme that we have is insanity. And it is perfectly plausible to understand this story as a, as a story about madness rather than about the supernatural. Vernon Lee's clever enough to leave both options open. And what happened with the ghost story in the late Victorian period was in the early 18th century, the beginnings of the Gothic stories, the supernatural was just taken as the supernatural. There was no, it was ghosts were ghosts, monsters were monsters, as in folk tales. But in the Victorian period, like this is 1880, the rationality came in, and so you know you had to at least give the option that there was no supernatural. That there is, there are other explanations. So madness is a, a clever explanation for how these things appear. So they appear to be supernatural, but they're not supernatural. They're due to madness. And that is in keeping with the rationalistic 19th century that was attempting to explain. On one hand, I mean, you've got spiritualism as well, but certainly clever people were seeing things in terms of the mind and the psyche rather than spirits. Clinically speaking, a poor old William Oak has de descended into a psychotic depression. He's so depressed, he's become psychotic, and this does happen. And he, and, he, and he has paranoid delusions that his wife is being seen by the ghost of um, this cavalier poet. And the wife encourages him now. She kind of alludes that she may have seen the ghost, but really there's no evidence that she did. So we, we can read it either way. Either she did see the ghost, or she's just teasing her husband. She's a very strange woman. And from the outset, our narrator, the painter, makes out that she is the really interesting one. She is lovely and exquisite, but she's monstrous. She's horrible to her husband. And he is a really decent, if dull, he's a really decent bloke. The real hero of this story, going back to it being called the Phantom Lover, the Phantom Lover is not the hero. The real hero of this story is the ordinary decent man, William Oak, who is driven to madness. Okay, he becomes a crazed murderer at the end. But we still kind of like him. Well, I did anyway. It wasn't his fault. I thought he'd been driven to it by the naughty Alice Oak. She's probably got a histrionic personality disorder. He's got a psychotic depression. Uh, or they're haunted by the cavalier poet, but and, and she is possessed by the ghost of her ancestor. So you can read it both ways. I think it's a kind of a subtle story, and it reminds me quite a lot, not in setting, but in theme. In, yeah, a bit of Oliver Onions is uh, the beckoning fair one. We've done a series of stories about ghosts in houses where, and it, not so strongly in this one, but certainly the ghost is that lives in the house in this one. But um, some of these stories we've done, I've just put up Shirley Jackson's A Visit onto YouTube, and that is the, the ghost is definitely the house, is the spirit there. And also Full Circle, which we did, um, by John Buchan, the, the ghost is the house definitely there, and they, by Rudyard Kipling. Now, of course, the ghost isn't the house, but it is. It's very much a part of it. And if you remember in Gothic literature, the Gothic, all Gothic stories have to have the Gothic edifice where everything happens. So that is usually a castle or a ruined abbey in the classic. Um, but that developed in an English context to the English manor house, and that's that's what we see here. So it is a classic Gothic story, but it is subtle, and so it's pretty good. So I don't know what more I want to say about that. Probably nothing. Yep, so that's it. Oak of Oakhurst, more next week. All right, cheers. Bye-bye.
The Beckoning Fair One Written by Oliver Onions And narrated by Tony Walker One the three or four to let boards had stood within the low paling as long as the inhabitants of the little triangular square could remember, and if they had ever been vertical, it was a very long time ago. They now overhung the palings, each at its own angle, and resembled nothing so much as a row of wooden choppers, ever in the act of falling upon some passer-by, yet never cutting off a tenant for the old house from the stream of his fellows. Not that there ever was any great stream through the square. The stream passed a furlong and more away, beyond the intricacy of tenements and alleys and byways that had sprung up since the old house had been built, hemming it in completely, and probably the house itself was only suffered to stand depending the falling in of a lease or two, when doubtless a clearance would be made of the whole neighbourhood. It was of bloomy old red brick, and built into its walls were the crowns and clasped hands and other insignia of insurance companies long since defunct. The children of the secluded square had swung upon the low gate at the end of the entrance alley until little more than the solid top bar of it remained, and the alley itself ran past boarded basement windows on which tramps had chalked their cryptic marks. The path was washed and worn unevenly by the spilling of water from the eaves of the encroaching next house, and cats and dogs had made the approach their own. The chances of a tenant did not seem such as to warrant the keeping of the toilette boards in a state of legibility and repair, and as a matter of fact, they were not so kept. For six months Oleron had passed the old place twice a day or oftener, on his way from his lodgings to the room ten minutes' walk away he had taken to work in, and for six months no hatchet-like notice board had fallen across his path. This might have been due to the fact that he usually took the other side of the square, but he chanced one morning to take the side that ran past the broken gate and the rain-worn entrance alley, and to pause before one of the inclined boards. The board bore, beside the agent's name, the announcement, written apparently about the time of Oleron's own early youth, that the key was to be had at number six. Now Oleron was already paying for his separate bedroom and workroom, more than an author who, without private means, habitually disregards his public, can afford. And he was paying in addition a small rent for the storage of the greater part of his grandmother's furniture. Moreover, it invariably happened that the book he wished to read in bed was at his working quarters half a mile and more away, while the note or letter he had sudden need of during the day was as likely as not to be in the pocket of another coat hanging behind his bedroom door and there were other inconveniences in having a divided domicile. Therefore, Oleron, brought suddenly up by the hatchet-like notice board, looked first down through some scanty privet bushes at the boarded basement windows, then up at the blank and grimy windows of the first floor, and so up to the second floor and the flat stone coping of the leads. He stood for a minute, thumbing his lean and shaven jaw, then, with another glance at the board, he walked slowly across the square to number six. He knocked and waited for two or three minutes, but although the door stood open, received no answer. He was knocking again when a long-nosed man in shirt sleeves appeared. I was asking a blessing on our food, he said in severe explanation. Oleron asked if he might have the key of the old house and the long-nosed man withdrew again. Oleron waited for another five minutes on the step, then the man, appearing again and masticating some of the food of which he had spoken, announced that the key was lost. But you won't want it, he said. The entrance door ain't closed, and a push will open any of the others. I'm an agent for it if you're thinking of taking it. Oleron recrossed the square, descended the two steps at the broken gate, passed along the alley, and turned in at the old wide doorway. To the right, immediately within the door, steps descended to the roomy cellars, and the staircase before him had a carved rail, it was broad and handsome and filthy. Oleron ascended it, avoiding contact with the rail and wall, and stopped at the first landing. A door facing him had been boarded up, 
but he pushed at that on his right hand, and an insecure bolt or staple yielded. He entered the empty first floor. He spent a quarter of an hour in the place, and then came out again. Without mounting higher, he descended and recrossed the square to the house of the man who had lost the key. Can you tell me how much the rent is? he asked. The man mentioned a figure, the comparative lowness of which seemed accounted for by the character of the neighbourhood and the abominable state of unrepair of the place. Would it be possible to rent a single floor? The long-nosed man didn't know. They might. Who were they? The man gave older on the name of a firm of lawyers in Lincoln's Inn. You might mention my name, Barrett, he added. Pressure of work prevented Oldron from going down to Lincoln's Inn that afternoon, but he went on the morrow and was instantly offered the whole house as a purchase for fifty pounds down, the remainder of the purchase money to remain on mortgage. It took him half an hour to disabuse the lawyer's mind of the idea that he wished anything more of the price than to rent a single floor of it. This made certain hums and haws of a difference, and the lawyer was by no means certain that it lay within his power to do as Oldron suggested. But it was finally extracted from him that, provided the notice boards were allowed to remain up, and that, provided it was agreed that in the event of the whole house letting, the arrangement should terminate automatically without further notice, something might be done. That the old place should suddenly let over his head seemed to older on the slightest of risks today, and he promised a decision within a week. On the morrow he visited the house again, went through it from top to bottom, and then went home to his lodgings to take a bath. He was immensely taken with that portion of the house he had already determined should be his own, scraped clean and repainted, and with that old furniture of old one's grandmother's, it ought to be entirely charming. He went to the storage warehouse to refresh his memory of his half-forgotten belongings, and to take measurements, and thence he went to a decorator's. He was very busy with his regular work, and could have wished the notice board had caught his attention either a few months earlier or else later in the year. But the quickest way would be to suspend work entirely until after his removal. A fortnight later, his first floor was painted throughout in a tender elderflower white. The paint was dry, and Oleron was in the middle of his installation. He was animated, delighted, and he rubbed his hands as he polished and made disposals of his grandmother's effects. The tall lattice pane china cupboard with its Derby and Mason and Spode, the large folding Sheraton table, the long low bookshelves, he yeah, had two of them copied, the chairs, the Sheffield candlesticks, the riveted rose bowls. These things he set against his newly painted elder white walls, walls of wood panelled in the happiest proportions and moulded and coffered to the low seated window recesses in a mood of gaiety and rest that the builders of rooms no longer know. The ceilings were lofty and faintly painted with an old pattern of stars. Even the tapering mouldings of his iron fireplace were as delicately designed as jewellery, and Oleron walked about rubbing his hands, frequently stopping for the mere pleasure of the glimpses from white room to white room. Charming, charming, he said to himself. I wonder what Elsie Bengough will think of this. He bought a bolt and a Yale lock for his door, and shut off his quarters from the rest of the house. If he now wanted to read in bed, his book could be had for stepping into the next room. All the time he thought how exceedingly lucky he was to get the place. He put up a hat rack in the little square hall, and hung up his hats and caps and coats, and passes through the small triangular square late at night, looking up over the little serried row of wooden toilet hatchets, could see the light within Oleron's red blinds, or else the sudden darkening of one blind and the illumination of another, as Oleron, candlestick in hand, passed from room to room, making final settlings of his furniture, or preparing to resume the work that his removal had interrupted. Two. As far as the chief business of his life, his writing was concerned, Paul Oleron treated the world a good deal better than he was treated by it, but he seldom took the trouble to strike a balance or to compute how far at 44 years of age he was behind his points on the handicap. 
To have done so wouldn't have altered matters, and it might have depressed Oleron. He had chosen his path and was committed to it beyond possibility of withdrawal. Perhaps he had chosen it in the days when he had been easily swayed by something a little disinterested, a little generous, a little noble, and had he ever thought of questioning himself, he would still have held to it, that a life without nobility and generosity and disinterestedness was no life for him. Only quite recently, and rarely, had he even vaguely suspected that there was more in it than this. But it was no good anticipating the day when he supposed he would reach that maximum point of his powers, beyond which he must inevitably decline, and be left face to face with the question whether it would not have profited him better to have ruled his life by less exigent ideals. In the meantime, his removal into the old house with the insurance marks built into its brick merely interrupted Romilly Bishop at the 15th chapter. As this tall man with a lean ascetic face moved about his new abode, arranging, changing, altering, hardly yet into his working stride again, he gave the impression of almost spinster-like precision and nicety. For twenty years past, in a score of lodgings, garrets, flats and rooms furnished and unfurnished, he had been accustomed to do many things for himself, and he had discovered that it saves time and temper to be methodical. He had arranged with the wife of the long-nosed Barrett, a stout Welshwoman with a falsetto voice, the Marionetshire accent of which long residence in London had not perceptibly modified, to come across the square each morning to prepare his breakfast, and also to turn the place out on Saturday mornings, and for the rest he even welcomed a little housework as a relaxation from the strain of writing. His kitchen, together with the adjoining strip of an apartment into which a modern bath had been fitted, overlooked the alley at the side of the house, and at one end of it was a large closet with a door and a square sliding hatch in the upper part of the door. This had been a powder closet, and through the hatch the elaborately dressed head had been thrust to receive the click and puff of the powder pistol. Oleron puzzled a little over this closet, then, as its use occurred to him, he smiled faintly, a little moved, he knew not by what. He would have put it to a very different purpose from its original one. It would probably have to serve as his larder. It was in this closet that he made a discovery. The back of it was shelved, and rummaging on an upper shelf that ran deeply into the wall, Oleron found a couple of mushroom-shaped old wig stands. He didn't know how they'd come to be there. Doubtless the painters had turned them up somewhere or other and had put them there. But his five rooms as a whole were short of cupboard and closet room, and it was only by the exercise of some ingenuity that he was able to find places for the bestowal of his household linen, his boxes, and his seldom used, but not to be destroyed accumulation of papers. It was in early spring that Oleron entered on his tenancy, and he was anxious to have Romilly ready for publication in the coming autumn. Nevertheless, he didn't intend to force its production. Should it demand longer in the doing, so much the worse. He realised its importance, its crucial importance, in his artistic development, and it must have its own length and time. In the workroom he had recently left, he had been making excellent progress. Romilly had begun, as the saying is, to speak and act of herself, and he didn't doubt she would continue to do so the moment the distraction of his removal was over. This distraction was almost over. He told himself it was time he pulled himself together again, and on a March morning he went out, returned again with two great bunches of yellow daffodils, placed one bunch on his mantelpiece between the Sheffield sticks and the other on the table before him, and took out the half-completed manuscript of Romilly Bishop, but before beginning work, he went to a small rosewood cabinet and took from a drawer his checkbook and passbook. He totted them up, and his monk-like face grew thoughtful. His installation had cost him more than he had intended it should, and his balance was rather less than fifty pounds, with no immediate prospect of more. Hmm, I'd forgotten rugs and chintz curtains and so forth mounted up so, said Oleron but it would have been a pity to spoil the place for the want of ten pounds or so. Well, Romilly simply must be out for the autumn, that's all. So here goes. 
He drew his papers towards him, but he worked badly, or rather, he did not work at all. The square outside had its own noises, frequent and new, and Oleron could only hope that he would speedily be accustomed to these. First came hawkers with their carts and cries. At midday, the children, returning from school, trooped into the square and swung on Oleron's gate, and when the children had departed again for afternoon school, an itinerant musician with a mandolin posted himself beneath Oleron's window and began to strum. This was a not unpleasant distraction, and Oleron, pushing up his window, threw the man a penny. Then he returned to his table again. But it was no good. He came to himself at long intervals to find that he had been looking about his room and wondering how it had formerly been furnished. Whether a settee in buttercup or petunia satin had stood under the farther window, whether from the centre moulding of the light, lofty ceiling had depended a glimmering crystal chandelier, or where the tambour frame or the piquet table had stood. Now it was no good. He had far better be frankly doing nothing than getting fruitlessly tired, and he decided that he would take a walk, but chancing to sit down for a moment, dozed in his chair instead. This won't do, he yawned when he awoke at half past four in the afternoon. I must do better than this tomorrow. And he felt so deliciously lazy that for some minutes he even contemplated the breach of an appointment he had for the evening. The next morning he sat down to work without even permitting himself to answer one of his three letters, two of them tradesmen's accounts, the third a note from Miss Bengough, forwarded from his old address. It was a jolly day of white and blue, with a gay noisy wind and a subtle turn in the colour of growing things and over and over again, once or twice a minute, his room became suddenly light and then subdued again as the shining white clouds rolled northeastwards over the square. The soft, fitful illumination was reflected in the polished surface of the table and even in the foot-worn old floor, and the morning noises had begun again. Oleron made a pattern of dots on the paper before him, and then he broke off to move the jar of daffodils exactly opposite the centre of the creamy panel. Then he wrote a sentence that ran continuously for a couple of lines, after which it broke into notes and jottings. For a time he succeeded in persuading himself that in making these memoranda he was really working. Then he rose and began to pace his room. As he did so, he was struck by an idea. It was perhaps a thought too pale. It was that the place might possibly be a little better for more positive colour. It was perhaps a thought too pale, mild and sweet as a kind old face, but a little devitalised, even one. Yes, decidedly it would bear a robuster note, more and richer flowers, and possibly some warm and gay stuff for cushions for the window seats. Of course I can't really afford it, he muttered as he went for a two foot and began to measure the width of the window recesses. In stooping to measure a recess, his attitude suddenly changed to one of interest and attention. Presently he rose again, rubbing his hands with gentle glee. Oh, 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 he said. These look to me very much like window boxes nailed up. We must look into this. Yes, those are boxes where I'm... Oh, oh, this is an adventure. On that wall of his sitting room there were two windows. The third was in another corner and beyond the open bedroom door on the same wall was another. The seats of all had been painted, repainted and painted again, and Oleron's investigating finger had barely detected the old nail heads beneath the paint. Under the ledge over which he stooped, an old keyhole had also been putted up. Oleron took out his penknife. He worked carefully for five minutes and then went into the kitchen for a hammer and chisel. Driving the chisel cautiously under the seat, he started the whole lid slightly. Again, using the penknife, he cut along the hinged edge and outward along the ends, and then he fetched a wedge and a wooden mallet. Now for our little mystery, he said. The sound of the mallet on the wedge seemed, in that sweet and pale apartment, somehow a little brutal, nay, even shocking. The panelling rang and rattled and vibrated to the blows like a sounding board. The whole house seemed to echo. From the roomy cellarage to the garrets above, a flock of echoes seemed to awake, and the sound got a little on Oleron's nerves. 
All at once he paused, fetched a duster, and muffled the mallet. When the edge was sufficiently raised, he put his fingers under it and lifted. The paint flaked and starred a little. The rusty old nails squeaked and grunted, and the lid came up, laying open the box beneath. Holderon looked into it, save for a couple of inches of scurf and mould and old cobwebs. It was empty. No treasure there, said Olderon, a little amused that he should have fancied there might have been. Romilly will still have to be out by autumn. Let's have a look at the others. He turned to the second window. The raising of the two remaining seats occupied him until well into the afternoon. That of the bedroom, like the first, was empty, but from the second seat of his sitting room he drew out something yielding and folded and furred over an inch thick with dust. He carried the object into the kitchen, and having swept it over a bucket, took a duster to it. It was some sort of a large bag of an ancient frieze-like material, and when unfolded, it occupied the greater part of the small kitchen. In shape, it was an irregular, a very irregular triangle, and it had a couple of white flaps and the remains of straps and buckles. The patch that had been uppermost in the folding was of a faded yellowish brown, but the rest of it was shades of crimson that varied according to the exposure of the parts of it. Now whatever can that have been? Oliver mused as he stood surveying it. I give up. Whatever it is, it's settled my work for today, I'm afraid. He folded the object up carelessly and thrust it into the corner of the kitchen. Then, taking pans and brushes and an old knife, he returned to the sitting room and began to scrape and wash and to line with paper his newly discovered receptacles. When he had finished, he put his spare boots and books and papers into them, and he closed the lids again, amused with his little adventure, but also a little anxious for the hour had come when he should settle fairly down to his work again. Three. It piqued Oleron a little that his friend Miss Bengough should dismiss with a glance the place he himself had found so singularly winning. Indeed, she scarcely lifted her eyes to it, but then she had always been more or less like that a little indifferent to the graces of life, careless of appearances, and perhaps a shade more herself when she ate biscuits from a paper bag than when she dined with greater observance of the conveniences. She was an unattached journalist of thirty-four, large, showy, fair as butter, pink as a dog rose, reminding one of a florist's picked specimen bloom and given to sudden and ample movements and moist and explosive utterances. She pulled a better living out of the pool, as she expressed it, than Oleron did, and by cunningly disguised puffs of drapers and haberdashers, she pulled also the greater part of her very varied wardrobe. She left small whirlwinds of air behind her when she moved, in which her veils and scarves fluttered and spun. Oleron heard the flurry of her skirts on his staircase and her single loud knock at his door when he had been a month in his new abode. Her garments brought in the outer air, and she flung a bundle of ladies' journals down on a chair. Don't knock off for me, she said, across a mouthful of large-headed hatpins as she removed her hat and veil. I didn't know whether you were straight yet, so I brought some sandwiches for lunch. You've got coffee, I suppose. No, don't get up. I'll find the kitchen. Oh, that's all right. I'll clear these things away. To tell the truth, I'm rather glad to be interrupted, said Oleron. He gathered his work together and put it away. She was already in the kitchen. He heard the running of water into the kettle. He joined her, and ten minutes later followed her back to the sitting room with the coffee and sandwiches on a tray. They sat down with the tray on a small table between them. Well, what do you think of the new place? Oleron asked as she poured out coffee. Hmm, anybody think you're going to get married, Paul? He laughed. Oh no, but it's an improvement on some of them, isn't it? Is it? I suppose it is, I don't know. I like the last place, in spite of the black ceiling and no water tap. How's Romilly? Oleron thumbed his chin. Mm, I'm rather ashamed to tell you. The fact is, I've not got on very well with it. But it'll be all right on the night, as you used to say. Stuck? Rather stuck. Got any of it you care to read to me? Oleron had long been in the habit of reading portions of his work to Miss Bengough occasionally. Her comments were always quick and practical, sometimes directly useful, 
sometimes indirectly suggestive. She, in return for his confidence, always kept all mentions of her own work sedulously from him. His, she said, was real work. Hers merely filled space, not always even grammatically. I'm afraid there isn't, Oleron replied, still meditatively dry shaving his chin. Then he added with a little burst of candour, The fact is, Elsie, I have not written, not actually written, very much more of it than any more of it, in fact. But of course, that doesn't mean I haven't progressed. I progressed in one sense rather alarmingly. I'm now thinking of reconstructing the whole thing. Miss Bengough gave a gasp. Reconstructing? Making Romilly herself a different type of woman? Somehow I began to feel that I'm not getting the most out of her. As she stands, I've certainly lost interest in her to some extent. But, but, Miss Bengough protested, you had her so real, so living, Paul. Alderon smiled faintly. He had been quite prepared for Miss Bengough's disapproval. He wasn't surprised that she liked Romilly as she at present existed. She would, whether she realised it or not, there was much of herself in this fictitious creation. Naturally, Romilly would seem real, living to her. But are you really serious, Paul? Miss Bengough asked presently with a round-eyed stare. Quite serious. You're really going to scrap those fifteen chapters? I didn't exactly say that. That fine, rich love scene. I should only do it reluctantly, and for the sake of something I thought better. And that beautiful, beautiful description of Romilly on the shore. It wouldn't necessarily be wasted, he said a little uneasily. But Miss Bengough made a large and windy gesture, and then let him have it. Really, you're too trying, she broke out. I do wish sometimes you'd remember you're human and live in the world. You know, I'd be the last to wish you to lower your standard one inch, but it wouldn't be lowering it to bring it within human comprehension. Oh, you're sometimes altogether too godlike. Why, it would be a wicked, criminal waste of your powers to destroy those fifteen chapters. Look at it reasonably now. You've been working for nearly twenty years. You've now got what you've been working for almost within your grasp. Your affairs are at a most critical stage. Oh, don't tell me. I know you're about at the end of your money. And here you are, deliberately proposing to withdraw a thing that will probably make your name, and to substitute it for something that ten to one nobody on earth will ever want to read, and small blame to them. Really, you try my patience. Oleron had shaken his head slowly as she had talked. It was an old story between them. The noisy, able, practical journalist was an admirable friend up to a certain point. Beyond that, well, each of us knows that point beyond which we stand alone. Elsie Bengough sometimes said that had she had one-tenth part of Oleron's genius, there were few things she couldn't have done, thus making that genius a quantitatively divisible thing, a sort of ingredient to be attracted to or subtracted from in the admixture of his work. That it was a qualitative thing, essential, indivisible, informing, past her comprehension. Their spirits parted company at that point. Oleron knew it. She didn't appear to know it. Yes, 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 he said a little wearily, by and by. Practically, you're quite right, entirely right, and I haven't a word to say. If I could only turn Romilly over to you, you'd make an enormous success of her, but that can't be, and I, for my part, am seriously doubting whether she's worth my while. You know what that means. What does it mean? she demanded bluntly. Well, he said, smiling wanly, what does it mean when you're convinced the thing isn't worth doing? You simply don't do it. Miss Bengough's eyes swept the ceiling for assistance against this impossible man. What utter rubbish, she broke out at last. Why, when I saw you last, you were simply oozing wrongly. You were turning her off at the rate of four chapters a week. If you hadn't moved, you'd have her three parts done by now. What on earth possessed you to move right in the middle of your most important work? Oleron tried to put her off with a recital of inconveniences, but she wouldn't have it. Perhaps in her heart she partly suspected the reason. He was simply mortally weary of the narrow circumstances of his life. He had had twenty years of it. Twenty years of garrets and roof chambers and dingy flats and shabby lodgings. And he was tired of dinginess and shabbiness. The reward was as far off as ever. Or, if it was not... He no longer cared as once he would have cared to put out his hand and take it. 
It's all very well to tell a man who's at the point of exhaustion that only another effort is required of him. If he cannot make it, he is as far off as ever. Anyway, old one summed up, I'm happier here than I have been for a long time. That's some sort of a justification. And doing no work, said Miss Bengough pointedly. At that, a trifling petulance that had been gathering in old one came to her head. And why shall I do nothing but work, he demanded. How much happier am I for it? I don't say I don't love my work when it's done, but I hate doing it. Sometimes it's an intolerable burden that I simply long to be rid of. Once in many weeks it has a moment, one moment, of glow and thrill for me. I remember the days when it was all glow and thrill, and now I'm forty-four and it's becoming drudgery. Nobody wants it. I'm ceasing to want it myself. And if any ordinary sensible man were to ask me whether I didn't think I was a fool to go on, I think I should agree that I was. Miss Bengough's comely pink face was serious. Chapter but seventeen. You that, Paul, many, many years ago. And you Dr. Still Seward's so diary continued. Well, and how should I? Have known? When we arrived at the Barclay Hotel, Van Helsing so. found a telegram My waiting for you. Told me so. and I'm coming up by train. Jonathan at Whitby. Important knows. news. Then one Mina day Harker. discovers that it's nearly fifty. Forty-four, Paul. Forty-four, then. And it finds that the glamour isn't in front but behind. Yes, I knew and chose, if that's known and choosing. But it's a costly choice we call them to make when we're young. Miss Bengough's eyes were on the floor, without moving them, she said. You're not regretting it, Paul. Am I not, said Philip? Upon my word, I've lately thought I am. What do I get in return for it all? You know what you get, she replied. He might have known from her tone what else he could have had for the holding up of a finger, herself. She knew, but couldn't tell him, that he could have done no better thing for himself. Had he, any time these ten years, asked her to marry him, she would have replied quietly, Very well. When? He had never thought of it. Yours is the real world, she continued quietly. Without you, we jackals couldn't exist. You and a few like you hold everything upon your shoulders. For a minute there was a silence. Then it occurred to Oleron that this was common vulgar grumbling. It wasn't his habit. Suddenly he rose and began to stack cups and plates on the tray. Sorry you catch me like this, Elsie, he said with a little laugh. No, I'll take them out. Then we'll go for a walk if you like. He carried out the tray and began to show Miss Bengough round his flat. She made few comments. In the kitchen, she asked what an old faded square of reddish frieze was that Mrs. Barrett used as a cushion for her wooden chair. That! I should be glad if you could tell me what it is, old Ron replied, as he unfolded the bag and related the story of its finding in the window seat. I think I know what it is, said Miss Bengough. It's been used to wrap up a harp before putting it in its case. By Jove, that's probably just what it is, said old Ron. I could make neither head nor tail of it. They finished the tour of the flat and returned to the sitting room. And uh, who lives in the rest of the house, Miss Bengough asked. I dare say a tramp sleeps in the cellar occasionally. Nobody else. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what I think about it, if you like. I should like. You'll never work here. Oh, said Oleron quickly, why not? You'll never finish Romilly here. Why, I don't know, but you won't. I know it. You'll have to leave before you get on with that book. He mused for a moment and then said... Isn't that a little prejudiced, Elsie? Perfectly ridiculous. As an argument, it hasn't a leg to stand on. There it is, replied, her mouth once more full of large-headed hat pins. Oleron was reaching down his hat and coat. He laughed. I can only hope they're entirely wrong, he said, for I shall be in a serious mess if Romilly isn't out in the autumn. As Oleron sat by his fire that evening, pondering Miss Bengough's prognostication that difficulties awaited him in his work, he came to the conclusion that it would have been far better had she kept her beliefs to herself. No man does a thing better for having his confidence stamped at the outset, and to speak of difficulties is in a sense to make them. Speech itself becomes a deterrent act, to which other discouragements accrete until the very event of which warning is given is as likely as not to come to pass. He heartily confounded her, an influence hostile to the completion of Romilly had been born. 
and in some illogical, dogmatic way women seemed to have, she had attached this antagonistic influence to his new abode. Was ever anything so absurd? You'll never finish Romilly here. Why not? Was this her idea of the luxury that saps the springs of action and brings a man down to indolence and dropping out of the race? The place was well enough. It was entirely charming for the matter, but it wasn't so demoralizing as all that. No, Elsie had missed a mark that time. He moved his chair to look around the room that smiled, positively smiled in the firelight. He too smiled, as if pity was to be entertained for a maligned apartment. Even that slight lack of robust colour he had remarked was not noticeable in the soft glow. The drawn chintz curtains, they had a flowered and trellised pattern with baskets and oaten pipes, fell in long, quiet folds to the window seats. The rows of bindings in old bookcases took the light richly. The last trace of sallowness had gone with the daylight, and if the truth must be told, it had been Elsie herself who had seemed a little out of the picture. That reflection struck him a little, and presently he returned to it. Yes, the room had, quite accidentally, done Miss Bengough a disservice that afternoon. It had, in some subtle but unmistakable way, placed her, marked the contrast of qualities. Assuming for the sake of argument the slightly ridiculous proposition that the room in which Oleron sat was characterised by a certain sparsity and lack of vigour, so much the worse for Miss Bengough. She certainly erred on the side of redundancy and general muchness. And if one must contrast abstract qualities, Oleron inclined to the austere in taste. Yes, here Oleron had made a distinct discovery. He wondered had he not made it before. He pictured Miss Bengough again as she had appeared that afternoon, large, showy, moistly pink, with that quality of the prized bloom exuding as it was from her. And instantly she suffered in his thought, he even recognised now that he had noticed something odd at the time, but unconsciously his attitude, even while she had been there, had been one of criticism. The mechanism of her was a little obvious. Her melting humidity was the result of analysable processes, and behind her there had seemed to lurk some dim shape emblematic of mortality. He had never, during the ten years of their intimacy, dreamed for a moment of asking her to marry him. Nonetheless, he now felt for the first time a thankfulness that he hadn't done so. Then suddenly and swiftly his face flamed that he should be thinking thus of his friend. What Elsie Bengough, with whom he had spent weeks and weeks of afternoons, she the good chum on whose health he was counted that all the rest of the world failed him, she whose loyalty to him would not he knew swerve as long as there was breath in her, Elsie, to be even in thought dissected thus, he was an ingrate and a cow. Had she been there in that moment, he would have abased himself before her. For ten minutes and more he sat, still gazing into the fire, with that humiliating red fading slowly from his cheeks. All was still within and without, save for a tiny musical tinkling that came from his kitchen, the dripping of water from an imperfectly turned off tap into the vessel beneath it. Mechanically, he began to beat with his finger to the faintly heard falling of the drops. The tiny, regular movement seemed to hasten that shameful withdrawal from his face. He grew cool once more, and when he resumed his meditation, he was all unconscious that he took it up again at the same point. It was not only her florid superfluity of build that he had approached in the attitude of criticism. He was conscious also of the wide differences between her mind and his own. He felt no thankfulness that up to a certain point their natures had ever run companionably side by side. He was now full of questions beyond that point. Their intellects diverged, there was no denying it. And looking back, he was inclined to doubt whether there had been any real coincidence. True, he had read his writings to her, and she had appeared to speak comprehendingly and to the point. But what can a man do, who having assumed that another sees as he does, is suddenly brought up sharp by something that falsifies and discredits all that has gone before. He doubted all now. It did for a moment occur to him that the man who demands of a friend more than can be given to him is in danger of losing that friend. But he put the thought aside. And he ceased to think, and again moved his finger to the distant dripping of the tap. And now, he resumed by and by, if these things were true of Elsie Bengough, 
they were also true of the creation of which she was the prototype, Romilly Bishop. And since he could say of Romilly what for very shame he could not say of Elsie, he gave his thoughts rein. He did so in that smiling, fire-lighted room with the accompaniment of the faintly heard tap. There was no longer any doubt about it. He hated the central character of his novel. Even as he had described her physically, she overpowered the senses. She was coarse-fibred, overcoloured, rank, it became true the moment he formulated his thoughts. Gulliver had described the Brobdingnagian maids of honour thus, and mentally and spiritually she corresponded, was unsensitive, limited, common. The model, he closed his eyes for a moment, the model struck out through fifteen vulgar and blatant chapters at such a pitch that without seeing the reason he'd been unable to begin the sixteenth, he marvelled that it had only just dawned upon him. And this was to have been his Beatrice, his vision, as Elsie she was to have gone into the furnace of his art, and she was to come out the woman all men desire. Her thoughts were to have been culled from his own finest, her form from his dearest dreams, and her setting wherever he could find one fit for her worth. He had brooded long before making the attempt, and one day he had felt a stir within him as a mother feels a quickening, and he had begun to write. And so he had added chapter to chapter, and those fifteen sodden chapters were what he had produced. Again he sat, softly moving his finger, and he bestirred himself. She must go, all fifteen chapters of her, that was settled. But what was to take her place, his mind was a blank, but one thing at a time. A man is not excused from taking the wrong course, because the right one isn't immediately revealed to him. Better would come if it was to come. In the meantime, he rose, fetched the fifteen chapters and read them over before he dropped them into the fire. But instead of putting them into the fire, he let them fall from his hand. He became conscious of the dripping of the tap again. It had a tinkling gamut of four or five notes, in which it rang irregular changes, and it was foolishly sweet and dulcimer-like. In his mind, Oleron could see the gathering of each drop, its little tremble on the lip of the tap, and the tiny percussion of its fall, plink, plunk, minimized almost to inaudibility. Following the lowest note, there seemed to be a brief phrase, irregularly repeated, and presently Oleron found himself waiting for the recurrence of this phrase. It was quite pretty, but it did not conduce to wakefulness, and Oleron dozed over his fire. When he awoke again, the fire had burned low, and the flames of the candle were licking the rims of the Sheffield sticks. Sluggishly he rose, yawned, went his nightly round of door locks and window fastenings, and passed into his bedroom. Soon he slept soundly. But a curious little sequel followed on the morrow. Mrs. Barrett usually tapped, not at his door, but at the wooden wall beyond which lay Oleron's bed, and then Oleron rose, put on his dressing gown, and admitted her. He was not conscious that as he did so that morning he hummed an air, but Mrs. Barrett, lingering with her hand on the doorknob and her face a little averted and smiling, Dear me, a soft falsetto rose, but that will be a very old tune, Mr. Oleron. I will not have heard it these forty years. What tune? Oleron asked. That tune, indeed, that you was humming, sir. Oleron had his thumb in the flap of a letter that remained there. I was humming. Sing it, Mrs. Barrett. Mrs. Barrett prut prutted. I have no voice for singing, Mr. Oleron. It was Anne Pugh who was the singer of our family, but the tune will be very old, and it is called The Beckoning Fair One. Try to sing it, said Oleron, his thumb still in the envelope, and Mrs. Barrett, with much dimpling and confusion, hummed the air. They do say it was sung to a harp, Mr. Oleron, and it will be very old, she concluded, and I was singing that. Indeed you was. I would not be likely to tell you lies. With a very well, let me have breakfast. Oleron opened his letter, but the trifling circumstance struck him as more odd than he would have admitted to himself. The phrase he had hummed had been that which he had associated with the falling from the tap on the evening before.
part five. Even more curious than the commonplace dripping of an ordinary water tap should have tallied so closely with an actually existing air was another result it had, namely that it awakened or seemed to awaken in Oleron an abnormal sensitiveness to other noises of the old house. It has been remarked that the silence obtains its fullest and most impressive quality when it is broken by some minute sound. And, truth to tell, the place was never still. Perhaps the mildness of the spring air operated on its torpid old timbers. Perhaps Oleron's fires caused it to stretch its own anatomy. And certainly, a whole world of insect life bored and burrowed in its forks and joists. At any rate, Oleron had only to sit quiet in his chair and to wait for a minute or two in order to become aware of such a change in the auditory scale as comes upon a man who, conceiving the midsummer woods to be motionless and still, all at once finds his ear sharpened to the reputation of a myriad insects. And he smiled to think of man's arbitrary distinction between that which has life and that which has not. Here, quite apart from such recognizable sounds as the scampering of mice, the falling of plaster behind its panelling, and the popping of purses or coffins from his fire, was a whole house talking to him, had he but known its language. Beams settled with a tired sigh into the old mortises, creatures ticked in the walls, joints cracked, boards complained. With no palpable stirring of the air, window sashes changed their positions with a soft knock in their frames. And whether the place had life in this sense or not, it had at all events a winsome personality. It needed but an hour of musing for Oleron to conceive the idea that, as his own body stood in friendly relation to his soul, so, by an extension and an attenuation, his habitation might fantastically be supposed to stand in some relation to himself. He even amused himself with the far-fetched fancy that he might so identify himself with the place that some future tenant, taking possession, might regard it as in a sense haunted. It would be rather a joke if he, a perfectly harmless author, with nothing on his mind worse than a novel he had discovered he must begin again, should turn out to be laying the foundation of a future ghost. In proportion, however, as he felt this growing attachment to the fabric of his abode, Elsie Bengough, from being merely unattracted, began to show a dislike of the place that was more and more marked and she did not scruple to speak of her aversion. It doesn't belong to today at all, and for you, especially, it's bad, she said with decision. You're only too ready to let go your hold on actual things and to slip into apathy. You ought to be in a place with concrete floors and a patent gas meter and a tradesman's lift, and it would do you all the good in the world if you had a job that made you scramble and rub elbows with your fellow men. Now... If I could get you a job for, say, two or three days a week, one that would allow you heaps of time for your proper work, would you take it? Somehow, Oleron resented a little being diagnosed like this. He thanked Miss Bengough, but without a smile. Thank you, but I don't think so. After all, each of us has his own life to live, he couldn't refrain from adding. His own life to live? How long is it since you were out, Paul? About two hours. I don't mean to buy stamps or to post a letter. How long is it since you had anything like a stretch? Oh, some little time, perhaps, I don't know. Since I was here last, I haven't been out much. And has Romilly progressed much better for your being cooped up? I think she has. I'm laying the foundations of her. I shall begin the actual writing presently. It seemed as if Miss Bengough had forgotten their tussle about first Romilly. She frowned turned half away and then quickly turned again. Ah, so you've still got that ridiculous idea in your head. If you mean, said Oleron slowly, that I've discarded the old Romilly and I'm at work on a new one, you're right. I have still got that idea in my head. Something uncordial in his tone struck her, but she was a fighter. His own absurd sensitiveness hardened her. She gave a pshaw of impatience. Where's the old one? she demanded abruptly. Why? asked Oleron. I want to see it. I want to show some of it to you. I want, if you're not wall-gathering entirely, to bring you back to your senses. This time it was he who turned his back. But when he turned around again, 
He spoke more gently. It's no good, Elsie. I am responsible for the way I go, and you must allow me to go it, even if it should seem wrong to you. Believe me, I am giving thought to it. The manuscript? I was on the point of burning it, but I didn't. It's in that window seat. You must see it. Miss Bengough crossed quickly to the window seat and lifted the lid. Suddenly, she gave a little exclamation and put the back of her hand to her mouth. She spoke over her shoulder. You ought to knock those nails in, Paul, she said. He strode to her side. What? What is it? What's the matter? He asked. I did knock them in, or rather, pull them out. You left enough to scratch with, she replied, showing her hand. From the upper wrist to the knuckle of the little finger, a welling red wound showed. Good gracious, Oron ejaculated. Here, come to the bathroom and bathe it quickly. He hurried her to the bathroom, turned on warm water and bathed and cleansed the bad gash. Then, still holding the hand, he turned cold water on it, uttering broken phrases of astonishment and concern. Good Lord, how did that happen? As far as I knew, I'd... Is this water too cold? Does that hurt? I can't imagine how on earth... There, that'll do. No, one moment longer. I can bear it, she murmured, her eyes closed. Presently, he led her back to the sitting room and bound the hand in one of his handkerchiefs, but his face did not lose its expression of perplexity. He had spent half a day in opening and making serviceable the three window boxes, and he could not conceive how he had come to leave an inch and a half of rusty nails standing in the wood. He himself had opened the lids of each of them a dozen times and hadn't noticed any now, but there it was. It shall come out now, at all events, he muttered, as he went for a pair of pinches, and he made no mistake about it that time. Elsie Bengough had sunk into a chair, and her face was rather white, but in her hand was the manuscript of Romilly. She had not finished with Romilly yet. Presently, she returned to the charge. Oh, Paul, it will be the greatest mistake you ever, ever made if you do not publish this, she said. He hung his head, genuinely distressed. He couldn't get that incident of the nail out of his head, and Romilly occupied a second place in his thoughts for the moment. But still she insisted, and when presently he spoke, it was almost as if he asked a pardon for something. What can I say, Elsie? I can only hope that when you see the new version, you'll see how right I am. And if in spite of all you don't like her, well, he made a hopeless gesture. Don't you see that I must be guided by my own lights? To his son. Come on, Elsie, he said gently. You've got along well so far. Don't let us split on this. The last words had hardly passed his lips before he regretted them. She had been nursing her injured hand with her eyes once more closed, but her lips and lids quivered simultaneously. Her voice shook as she spoke. I can't help saying it, Paul, but you are so greatly changed. Ah, Chelsea, he murmured soothingly. You've had a shock. Rest for a while. How could I change? I don't know, but you are. You've not been yourself ever since you came here. I wish you'd never seen the place. It stopped your work, it's making you into a person I hardly know, and it's made me horribly anxious about you. Oh, how my hand is beginning to throb. Poor child, he murmured. Will you let me take you to the doctor and have it properly dressed? No, I shall be all right presently. I'll keep it raised. She put her elbow on the back of her chair, and the bandaged hand rested lightly on his shoulder. At that touch, an entirely new anxiety stirred suddenly within him. Hundreds of times previously, on the jaunts and excursions, she had slipped her hand within his arm as she might have slipped it into the arm of a brother, and he had accepted the little affectionate gesture as a brother might have accepted it. But now, for the first time, there rushed into his mind a hundred startling questions. Her eyes were still closed, and her head had fallen pathetically back, and there was a lost and ineffable smile on her parted lips. Truth broke in upon him. Good God, and he had never divined it. And stranger than all was that now that he did see that she was lost in love with him, there came to him not sorrow and humility and abasement, but something else that he struggled in vain against, something entirely strange and new, that, had he analyzed it, he would have found to be petulance and irritation and resentment and ungentleness. The sudden selfish prompting mastered him before he was aware he all but gave it words. What was she doing there at all? Why wasn't she getting on with her own work? 
Why was she here interfering with his? Who had given her this guardianship over him that lately she had put forward so assertively? Changed. It was she, not himself, who had changed. But by the time she had opened her eyes again, he had overcome his resentment sufficiently to speak gently, albeit with reserve. I wish you'd let me take you to a doctor. She rose. No, thank you, Paul, she said. I'll go now. If I need a dressing, I'll get one. Take the other hand, please. Goodbye. He didn't attempt to detain her. He walked with her to the foot of the stairs. Halfway along the narrow alley, she turned. It will be a long way to come if you happen not to be in, she said. I'll send you a postcard the next time. At the gate, she turned again. Leave here, Paul, she said with a mournful look. Everything is wrong with this house. Then she was gone. Oleron returned to his room. He crossed straight to the window box. He opened the lid and stood long looking at it. Then he closed it again and turned away. That's rather frightening, he muttered. It's simply not possible that I shouldn't have removed that nail. Six. Oleron knew very well what Elsie had meant when she had said that her next visit would be preceded by a postcard. She, too, had realised that at last, at last he knew, knew, and didn't want her. It gave him a miserable, pitiful pang, therefore, when she came again within a week, knocking at the door unannounced. She spoke to him on the landing. She didn't intend to stay, she said, and he had to press her before she would so much as enter. Her excuse for calling was that she had heard of an inquiry for short stories that he might be wise to follow up. He thanked her. Then, her business being over, she seemed anxious to get away again. Oleron did not seek to detain her, even though he saw through the pretext of the stories, and he accompanied her down the stairs. But Elsie Bengough had no luck whatever in that house. A second accident befell her. Halfway down the staircase, there was the sharp sound of splintering wood, and she checked a loud cry. Oleron knew the woodwork to be old, but he himself had ascended and descended frequently enough without mishap. Elsie had put her foot through one of the stairs. He sprang to her side in alarm. Oh, I say, my poor girl! She laughed hysterically. It's my weight. I know I'm getting fat. Keep still. Let me clear these splinters away, he muttered between his teeth. She continued to laugh and sob that it was her weight. She was getting fat. He thrust downwards at the broken boards. The extrication was no easy matter, and her torn boot showed him how badly the foot and ankle within it must be abraded. Good God, good God, he muttered over and over again. I shall be too heavy for anything soon, she sobbed and laughed. But she refused to reascend and to examine her hurt. No, let me go quickly, let me go quickly, she repeated. But it's a frightful gash. No, not so bad. Let me get away quickly. I'm, I'm, I'm not wanted. At her words, that she was not wanted, his head dropped as if she had given him a buffet. Elsie, he choked brokenly in shock. But she too made a quick gesture as if she put something violently aside. Oh, Paul, not that. Not you. Of course I do mean that too, in a sense. Oh, oh, you know what I mean. But if the other can't be... Spare me this now. I wouldn't have come, but... but oh, I did try to keep away. It was intolerable, heartbreaking. But what could he do? What could he say? He didn't love her. Let me go. I'm not wanted. Let me take away what's left of me. Dear Elsie, you are very dear to me. But again she made the gesture as of putting something violently aside. No, not that. Not anything less. Don't offer me anything less. Leave me a little pride. Let me get my hat and coat. Let me take you to a doctor, he muttered. But she refused. She refused even the support of his arm. She gave another unsteady laugh. I'm sorry I broke your stairs, Paul. You will go and see about the short stories, won't you? He groaned. Then, if you won't see a doctor, will you go across the square and let Mrs. Barrett look at you? Look, there's Barrett passing now. The long-nosed Barrett was looking curiously down the alley. But as Oleron was about to call him, he made off without a word. Elsie seemed anxious for nothing so much as to be clear of the place and finally promised to go straight to a doctor, but insisted on going alone. Goodbye, she said. 
And Oleron watched her until she was past the hatchet-like to let boards, as if he feared that even they might fall upon her and maim her. That night, Oleron didn't dine. He had far too much on his mind. He walked from room to room of his flat, as if he could have walked away from Elsie Bengough's haunting cry that still rang in his ears. I'm not wanted. Don't offer me anything less. Let me take away what's left of me. Oh, if he could only have persuaded himself that he loved her. He walked until twilight fell. Then, without lighting candles, he stirred up the fire and flung himself into a chair. Poor, poor Elsie. But even while his heart ached for her, it was out of the question. If only he'd known, if only he'd used common observation. But those walks, those sisterly takings of the arm, what a fool he had been. Well... It was too late now. It was she, not he, who must now act. Act by keeping her away. He would help her all he could. He himself would not sit in her presence. If she came, he would hurry her out again as fast as he could. Poor, poor Elsie. His room grew dark, the fire burned dead, and he continued to sit, wincing from time to time as a fresh tortured phrase rang again in his ears. Then... Suddenly, he knew not why. He found himself anxious for her in a new sense, uneasy about her personal safety, a horrible fancy that even then she might be looking over an embankment down into dark water, that she might even now be glancing up at the hook on the door took him. Women had been known to do these things. Then there'd be an inquest, and he himself would be called upon to identify her, and would be asked how she had come by an ill-healed wound on the hand and a bad abrasion of the ankle. Barrett would say that he had seen her leaving his house. Then he recognized that his thoughts were morbid. By an effort of will, he put them aside and sat for a while listening to the faint creakings and tickings and rappings within his paneling. If only he could have married her, but he couldn't. Her face had risen before him again as he had seen it on the stairs, drawn with pain and ugly and swollen with tears. Ugly, yes, positively blubbered. If tears were women's weapons, as they were said to be, such tears were weapons turned against themselves. Suicide again. Then, all at once, he found himself attentively considering her two accidents. Extraordinary they had been, both of them. He could not have left that old nail standing in the wood. Why, he had fetched tools especially from the kitchen, and he was convinced that the step that had broken beneath her weight had been as sound as the others. It was inexplicable. If these things could happen, anything could happen. There was not a beam nor a jam in the place that might not fall without warning, not a plank that might not crash inwards, not a nail that might not become a dagger. The whole place was full of life, even now. As he sat there in the dark, he heard its crowds of noises, as if the house had been one great microphone. Only half conscious that he did so, he had been sitting for some time identifying these noises, attributing each crack or creak or not its material cause. But there was one noise, which again not fully conscious of the omission, he had not sought to account for. It had last come some minutes ago. It came again now. A sort of soft, sweeping rustle it seemed to hold an almost inaudibly minute crackling. For half a minute or so, it had Oberon's attention. Then his heavy thoughts were of Elsie Benkoff again. He was nearer to loving her in that moment than he had ever been. He thought how to some men their loved ones were but the dearer for those poor mortal blemishes that tell us we are but sojourners on earth, with a common fate not far distant that makes it hardly worthwhile to do anything but love for the time remaining. Strangling sobs, blearing tears, bodies buffeted by sickness, hearts and minds callous and hard with the rubs of the world. How little love there would be were these things a barrier to love. In that sense, he did love Elsie Bengough. What her happiness had never moved in him, a sorrow almost awoke. Suddenly, his meditation went. His ear had once more become conscious of that soft and repeated noise, the long sweep with the almost inaudible crackle in it. Again and again it came with a curious insistence and urgency. It quickened a little. As he became increasingly attentive, it seemed to Oleron that it grew louder. All at once, he started bolt upright in his chair, tense and listening. The silky rustle came again. 
He was trying to attach it to something. The next moment, he had leapt to his feet, unnerved and terrified. His chair hung poised for a moment and then went over, setting the fire irons clattering as it fell. There was only one noise in the world like that which had caused him to spring thus to his feet. The next time it came, Olderon felt behind him at the empty air with his hand and backed slowly until he found himself against the wall. God in heaven! The ejaculation broke from Olderon's lips. The sound had ceased. The next moment he had given a high cry. What is it? What's there? Who's there? A sound of scuttling caused his knees to bend under him for a moment, but that he knew was a mouse. That was not something that his stomach turned sick and his mind real to entertain. That other sound, the like of which was not in the world, had now entirely ceased, and again he called. He called and continued to call, and then another terror, a terror of the sound of his own voice seized him. He didn't dare to call again. His shaking hand went to his pocket for a match, but found none. He thought there might be matches on the mantelpiece. He worked his way to the mantelpiece round a little recess without for a moment leaving the wall. Then his hand encountered the mantelpiece and groped along it. A box of matches fell to the hearth. He could just see them in the firelight, but his hand could not pick them up until he had cornered them inside the fender. Then he rose and struck a light. The room was as usual. He struck a second match. The candle stood on the table, he lighted it, and the flame sank for a moment and then burned up clear. Again he looked round. There was nothing, but there had been something, and might still be something. Formerly, Oleron had smiled at the fantastic thought that by merging an interplay of identities between himself and his beautiful room, he might be preparing a ghost for the future. It had not occurred to him that there might have been a similar merging and coalescence in the past, yet... With this staggering impossibility, he was now face to face. Something did persist in the house. It had a tenant other than himself. And that tenant, whatsoever, or whosoever, had appalled Oleron's soul by producing the sound of a woman brushing her hair. Without quite knowing how he came to be there, Oleron found himself striding over the loose board he had temporarily placed on the step broken by Miss Bengough. He was hapless, and descending the stairs, not until later did there return to him a hazy memory that he had left the candle burning on the table, had opened the door no wider than was necessary to allow the passage of his body, and had sidled out, closing the door softly behind him. At the foot of the stairs another shock awaited him, Something dashed with a flurry up from the disused cellars and disappeared out of the door. It was only a cat, but Oleron gave a childish sob. He passed out of the gate and stood for a moment under the toilet boards, plucking foolishly at his lip and looking up at the glimmer of light behind one of his red blinds. Then, still looking over his shoulder, he moved, stumblingly, up the square. There was a small public house round the corner. Oleron had never entered it, but he entered it now and put down a shilling that missed the counter by inches. Brandy, he said, and then stooped to look for the shilling. He had the little sawdust bar to himself what company there was. Carters and labourers and the small tradesmen of the neighbourhood was gathered in the farther compartment, beyond the space where the white-haired landlady moved about her taps and bottles. Oleron sat down on a hardwood settee with a perforated seat, drank half his brandy, and then, thinking he might as well drink it as spill it, finished it. Then he fell to wondering which of the men whose voices he heard across the public house would undertake the removal of his effect on the morrow. In the meantime, he ordered more brandy, for he did not intend to go back to that room where he had left the candle burning. Oh no, he couldn't have faced even the entry in the staircase with the broken step, certainly not that pith-white, fascinating room. 
He would go back for the present to his old arrangement of workroom and separate sleeping quarters. He would go to his old landlady at once, presently, when he had finished his brandy, and see if she could put him up for the night. The glass was empty now. He rose, had it refilled, and sat down again. And if anybody asked his reason for removing again, oh, he had reason enough, reason enough. Nails that put themselves back into wood again and gashed people's hands. Steps that broke when you trod on them. And women who came into a man's place and brushed their hair in the dark were reasons enough. He was querulous and injured about it all. He had taken the place for himself, not for invisible women to brush their hair in. That lawyer fellow in Lincoln's Inn should be told so too before many hours were out. It was outrageous letting people in for agreements like that. A cut glass partition divided the compartment where Oberon sat from the space where the white-haired landlady moved, but it stopped seven or eight inches above the level of the counter. There was no partition at the further bar. Presently, Oberon, raising his eyes, saw that faces were watching him through the aperture. The faces disappeared when he looked at them. He moved to a corner where he could not be seen from the other bar, but this brought him into line with the white-haired landlady. She knew him by sight, had doubtless seen him passing and repassing, and presently she made a remark on the weather. Oleron did not know what he replied, but it sufficed to call forth a further remark that the winter had been a bad one for influenza, and that the spring weather seemed to be coming at last. Even this slight contact with the commonplace steadied Oleron a little, an idle, nascent wonder whether the landlady brushed her hair every night, and if so, whether it gave out those little electric cracklings that were shut down with a snap, and all the one was better. With his next glass of brandy, he was all for going back to his flat, not go back, indeed he would go back. They should very soon see whether he was to be turned out of his place like that. He began to wonder why he was doing the rather unusual thing he was doing at that moment, unusual for him sitting, hatless, drinking brandy in a public house. Suppose he were to tell the white-haired landlady all about it, to tell her that a caller had scratched her hand on a nail, that later had had the bad luck to put her foot through a rotten stair, and that he himself, in an old house full of squeaks and creaks and whispers, had heard a minute noise and had bolted from it in fright. What would she think of him? That he was mad, of course. Psh, the real truth of the matter was that he hadn't been doing enough work to occupy him. He had been dreaming his days away, filling his head with a lot of moonshine about a new Romilly, as if the old one wasn't good enough. And now he was surprised that the devil should enter an empty head. Yes, he would go back. He would take a walk in the air first. He hadn't walked enough recently. And then he would take himself in hand, settle the hash of that 16th chapter of Romilly. Fancy, he had actually been fool enough to think of destroying 15 chapters. And thenceforth, he would remember that he had obligations to his fellow men and work to do in the world. There was the matter in a nutshell. He finished his brandy and went out. He had walked for some time before any other bearing of the matter than that on himself occurred to him. At first, the fresh air had increased the heady effect of the brandy he had drunk, but afterwards his mind grew clearer than it had been since morning, and the clearer it grew, the less final did his boastful self-assurances become and the firmer his conviction that, when all explanations had been made, there remained something that could not be explained. His hysteria of an hour before had passed. He grew steadily calmer, but the disquieting conviction remained. Deep fear took possession of him. It was a fear for Elsie. But something in this place was inimical to her safety. Of themselves, her two accidents might not have persuaded him of this, but she herself had said it. I'm not wanted here. And she had declared that there was something wrong with the place. She had seen it before he had, well and good. One thing stood out clearly, namely, that if this was so, she must be kept away for quite another reason than that which had so confounded and humiliated Oleron. Luckily, she had expressed her intention of staying away. She must be held to that intention. He must see to it. And he must see to it all the more that he now saw his first impulse never to set foot in the place again was absurd. People didn't do that kind of thing. With Elsie made secure, he could not, with any respect to himself, suffer himself to be turned out by a shadow, nor even by a danger merely because it was a danger. He had to live somewhere, and he would live there. He must return. 
He mastered the faint chill of fear that came with the decision and turned in his walk abruptly. Should fear grow on him, should fear grow on him again, he would perhaps take one more glass of brandy. But by the time he reached the short street that led to the square, he was too late for more brandy. The little public house was still lighted, but closed, and one or two men were standing talking on the curb. Olderon noticed that the sudden silence fell on them as he passed, and he noticed further that the long-nosed Barrett, whom he passed a little lower down, did not return his good night. He turned in at the broken gate, hesitated, merely an instant in the alley, and then mounted his stairs again. Only an inch of candle remained in the Sheffield stick, and Oleron did not light another one. Deliberately, he forced himself to take it up to make the tour of his five rooms before retiring. It was as he returned from the kitchen across his little hall that he noticed that the letter lay on the floor. He carried it into his sitting room and glanced at the envelope before opening it. It was unstamped and had been put into the door by hand. His handwriting was clumsy and it ran from beginning to end without a comma or period. Oleron read the first line, turned to the signature and then finished the letter. It was from the man Barrett and it informed Oleron that he, Barrett, would be obliged if Mr. Oleron would make other arrangements for the preparing of his breakfast and the cleaning out of his place. The sting lay in the tail, that is to say, the postscript. This consisted of a text of scripture. It embodied an illusion that could only be to Elsie Bengoff. A seldom-seen frown had cut deeply into Oleron's brow. So that was it. Very well. They would see about that on the morrow. For the rest, it seemed merely another reason why Elsie should keep away. Then, his suppressed rage broke out. The foul-minded lot. The devil himself could not have given a leer at anything that had ever passed between Paul Oleron and Elsie Bengoff. Yet this nosing rascal must be prying and talking. Oleron crumpled the paper up held it in the candle flame and then ground the ashes under his heel. One useful purpose, however, the letter had served. It had created an Oleron of wrathful blaze that effectually banished pale shadows. Nevertheless, one other puzzling circumstance was to close the day. As he undressed, he chanced to glance at his bed. Coverlets or an impression as if somebody had lain on them. Oleron couldn't remember that he himself had lain down during the day. Offhand, he would have said that certainly he had not, but after all, he could not be positive. His indignation for Elsie acting possibly with the residue of the brandy in him excluded all other considerations, and, as he put down his candle, lay down and passed immediately to a deep and dreamless sleep, which, in the absence of Mrs. Barrett's morning call, lasted almost once round the clock. Eight. To the man who pays heed to that voice within him, which warns him that twilight and danger are settling over his soul, terror is apt to appear an absolute thing, against which his heart must be safeguarded in a twink unless there is to take place an alteration in the whole range and scale of his nature. Mercifully, he is never far to look for safeguards. Of the immediate and small and common and momentary things of life, of usages and observances and modes and conventions, he builds up fortifications against the powers of darkness. He is even content that not terror only, but joy also should be for working purposes be placed in the category of the absolute things, and the last treason he will commit would be that breaking down of terms and limits that strikes not at one man, but at the welfare of the souls of all. In his own person, Oleron began to commit this treason. He began to commit it by admitting the inexplicable and horrible to an increasing familiarity. He did it insensibly, unconsciously, by a neglect of the things that he now regarded it as an impertinence in Elsie Bengough to have prescribed. Two months before, the words, a haunted house, applied to his lovely, bemusing dwelling would have chilled his marrow. Now, his scale of sensation becoming depressed, he could ask, haunted by what? And remain unconscious that horror, when it can be proved to be relative, by so much loses its proper quality. 
He was setting aside the landmarks. Mists and confusion had begun to enwrap him. And he was conscious of nothing so much as of a voracious inquisitiveness. He wanted to know. He was resolved to know. Nothing but the knowledge would satisfy him, and craftily he cast about for means whereby he might attain it. He might have spared his craft. The matter was the easiest imaginable. As in time past he had known in his writing moments when his thoughts had seemed to rise of themselves and to embody themselves in words not to be altered afterwards. So now the questions he put himself seemed to be answered even in the moment of their asking. There was exhilaration in the swift, easy processes. He had known no such joy in his own power since the days when his writing had been a daily freshness and a delight to him. It was almost as if the course he must pursue was being dictated to him. And the first thing he must do, of course, was to define the problem. He defined it in terms of mathematics. Granted that he had not the place to himself, granted that the old house had inexpressibly caught and engaged his spirit, granted that by virtue of the common denominator of the place, this unknown co-tenant stood in some relation to himself, what next? Clearly, the nature of the other numerator must be ascertained. And how? Ordinarily, this would not have seemed simple, but to Oleron it was now pellucidly clear. The key, of course, lay in his half-written novel, or rather in both Romilly's, the old and the proposed new one. A little while before, Oleron would have thought himself mad to have embraced such an opinion. Now he accepted the dizzying hypothesis without a quiver. He began to examine the first and second Romilly's. From the moment of his doing so, the thing advanced by leaps and bounds. Swiftly, he reviewed the history of the Romilly of the fifteen chapters. He remembered clearly now that he had found her insufficient on the very first morning on which he had sat down to work in his new place. Other instances of this aversion leaped up to confirm his obscure investigation. There had come the night when he had hardly forborne to throw the whole thing into the fire, and the next morning, he had begun the planning of the new Romilly. It had been on that morning that Mrs. Barrett, overhearing him humming a brief phrase at the dripping of a tap the night before had suggested, had informed him that he was singing some air he had never in his life heard before, called The Beckoning Fair One. The Beckoning Fair One. With scarcely a pause in thought, he continued. The first Romilly had been definitely thrown over, the second had instantly fastened herself upon him, clamouring for birth in his brain. He even fancied now, looking back, that there had been something like passion, hate almost, in the supplanting, and that more than once a stray thought given to his discarded creation had. It was astonishing how credible Oleron found the almost unthinkable idea had offended the supplanter. Yet yeah, that a malignancy almost homicidal should be extended to his fiction's poor mortal prototype. In spite of his inuring to a scale in which the horrible was now a thing to be fingered and turned this way and that, a good God broke from Oleron. This intrusion of the first Romilly's prototype into his thought again was a factor that for the moment brought his inquiry into the nature of his problem to a termination. The mere thought of Elsie was fatal to anything abstract. For another thing, he could not yet think of that letter of Barrett's, nor of a little scene that had followed it without a mounting of colour and a quick contraction of the brow. For wisely or not, he had had that argument out at once. Striding across the square on the following morning, he had bearded Barrett on his own doorstep. Coming back again a few minutes later, he had been strongly of the opinion that he had only made matters worse. The man had been vagueness itself. He had not been to be either challenged or browbeaten into anything more definite than a muttered farrago in which the words, certain things, Mrs. Barrett, respectable ass, if the cap fits, proceedings that shall be nameless, had been constantly repeated. Nor that I make any charge, he had concluded. Charge, old Ron had cried. I have my ideas of things and I don't doubt you have yours. Ideas? Mine? Oleron had cried wrathfully. 
immediately dropping his voice as heads had appeared at windows of the square. Look you here, my man. You've an unwholesome mind which probably you can't help, but a tongue which you can help and shall, if there is a breath of this repeated. I'll not be talked to on my own doorstep like this by anybody, Barrett had blustered. You shall, and I'm doing it. Don't you forget there's a god above all who has said, you're a low scandal monger, and so forth, continuing badly what was already badly begun. Oleron had returned wrathfully to his own house, and thenceforward, looking out of his windows, had seen Barrett's face at odd times, lifting blinds or peering round curtains, as if he sought to put himself in possession of heaven knew what evidence, in case it should be required of him. The unfortunate occurrence made certain minor differences in Oleron's domestic arrangements. Barrett's tongue, he gathered, had already been busy. He was looked at askance by the dwellers of the square, and he judged it better, until he should be able to obtain other help, to make his purchases of provisions a little farther afield, rather than at the small shops of the immediate neighbourhood. For the rest, housekeeping was no new thing to him, and he would resume his old bachelor habits. Besides, he was deep in certain rather abstruse investigations in which it was better that he should not be disturbed. He was looking out of his window one midday, rather tired, not very well, and glad that it was not very likely he would have to stir out of doors when he saw Elsie Bengal crossing the square towards his house. The weather had broken. It was a raw and gusty day, and she had to force her way against the wind that set her ample skirts bellying about her opulent figure, and her veil spinning and streaming behind her. Oleron acted swiftly and instinctively. Seizing his hat, he sprang to the door and descended the stairs at a run. A sort of panic had seized him. She must be prevented from setting foot in the place. As he ran along the alley, he was conscious that his eyes went up to the eaves, as if something drew them. He did not know that a slate might not accidentally fall. He met her at the gate and spoke with curious volubleness. This is really too bad, Elsie, just as I'm urgently called away. I'm afraid it can't be helped, though, and that you have to think me an inhospitable beast. He poured it out, just as it came into his head. She asked if he was going to town. Yes, yes, to town, he replied. I've got to call on um, uh, Chambers. You know Chambers, don't you? No, I remember you don't. Big man, you once saw me with. I ought to have gone yesterday, and this he felt to be a brilliant effort. And he's going out of town this afternoon, uh, to Brighton. I had a letter from him this morning. He took her arm and led her up the square. She had to remind him his way to town lay in the other direction. <laughs> of course, how stupid of me, he said with a little loud laugh. I'm so used to going the other way with you, of course. It's the other way to the bus. Will you come along with me? I'm so awfully sorry it's happened like this. They took the street to the bus terminus. This time, Elsie bore no signs of having gone through interior struggles. If she detected anything unusual in his manner, she made no comment. And he, seeing her calm, began to talk less recklessly through silences. By the time they reached the bus terminus, nobody seeing the pallid-faced man without an overcoat and the large, ample-skirted girl at his side would have supposed that one of them was ready to sink on his knees for thankfulness that he had, as he believed, saved the other from a wildly unthinkable danger. They mounted to the top of the bus, Oleron protesting that he should not miss his overcoat, and that he found the day, if anything, rather oppressively hot. They sat down on a front seat. Now that this meeting was forced upon him, he had something else to say that would make demands upon his tact. It had been on his mind for some time, and was indeed peculiarly difficult to put. He revolved it for some minutes, and then, remembering the success of his story of a sudden call to town, cut the knot of his difficulty with another lie. I'm uh, thinking of going away for a little while, Elsie, he said. She merely said, oh, somewhere for a change. I need a change. I, I think I shall go tomorrow, or the day after. Yes, uh, tomorrow, I think. Yes, he replied. I don't know quite how long I shall be, he continued. I shall have to let you know when I'm back. Yes, let me know, she replied in an even tone. The tone was for her suspiciously even. He was a little uneasy. 
You uh, don't ask me where I'm going, he said with a little cumbrous effort to rally her. She was looking straight before her past the bus driver. I know, she said. He was startled. How? You know? You're not going anywhere, she replied. He found not a word to say. It was a minute or so before she continued in the same controlled voice she had employed from the start. You're not going anywhere. You weren't going out this morning. You only came out because I appeared. Don't behave as if we were strangers, Paul. A flush of pink had mounted to his cheeks. He noticed that the wind had given her the pink of early rhubarb. Still, he found nothing to say. Of course you ought to go away, she continued. I don't know whether you look at yourself often in the glass, but you're rather noticeable. Several people have turned to look at you this morning, so of course you ought to go away. But you won't. And I know why. He shivered, coughed a little, and then broke silence. Then, if you know, there's no use in continuing this discussion, he said curtly. Not for me, perhaps. But there is for you, she replied. Shall I tell you what I know? No, he said in a voice slightly raised. No, she asked, her round eyes earnestly on him. No. Again, he was getting out of patience with her. Again, he was conscious of the strain. Her devotion and fidelity and love plagued him. She was only humiliating both herself and him. It would have been bad enough had he ever, by word or deed, given her cause for thus fastening herself on him. But there, that was the worst of that kind of life for a woman. Women such as she, business women, in and out of offices all the time, always, whether they realized it or not, made comradeship a cover for something else. They accepted the unconventional status, came and went freely as men did, were honestly taken by men at their own valuation, and then it turned out to be the other thing after all, and they went and fell in love. No wonder there was gossip in shops and squares and public houses. In a sense, the gossipers were in the right of it, independent, yet not efficient, with some of womanhood's graces foregone, and yet with all the woman's hunger and need, half sophisticated, yet not wise. Olderon was tired of it all, and it was time he told her so. I suppose, he said tremblingly, looking down between his knees, I suppose the real trouble is in the life women who earn their own living are obliged to lead. He couldn't tell in what sense she took the blame generality. She merely replied, I suppose so. It can't be helped, he continued, but you do sacrifice a great deal. She agreed, a good deal. And then she added after a moment, what, for instance? You may or may not be gradually attaining a new status, but you're in a false position today. It was very likely, she said. She hadn't thought of it much in that light. And, he continued desperately, you're bound to suffer. Your most innocent acts are misunderstood. Motives you never dreamed of are attributed to you. And in the end it comes to... He hesitated a moment and then took the plunge with a sidelong look and the leer. She took his meaning with perfect ease. She merely shivered a little as she pronounced the name. Barrett. His silence told her the rest. Anything further that was to be said must come from her. It came as the bus stopped at the stage and fresh passengers mounted the stairs. You'd better get down here and go back, Paul, she said. I understand perfectly. Perfectly. It isn't Barrett. You'd be able to deal with Barrett. It's merely convenient for you to say it is Barrett. I know what it is. But you said I wasn't to tell you that. Very well. But before you go, let me tell you why I came up this morning. In a dull tone, he asked her why. Again, she looked straight before her as she replied. I came to force your hand. Things couldn't go on as they have been going, you know. And now, that's all over. All, all over, he repeated stupidly. All over. I want you now to consider yourself, as far as I'm concerned, perfectly free. I make only one reservation. He hardly had the spirit to ask her what it was. If I merely need you, she said, please don't give that a thought, that's nothing. I shan't come near for that. But, he dropped her voice, if you're in need of me, Paul, and I shall know if you are, and you will be, then I shall come no matter what cost. You understand that? He could only groan. 
So, that's understood, she concluded. And I think that's all. Now, go back. I should advise you to walk back for your shivering. Goodbye. She gave him a cold hand and he descended. He turned on the edge of the curb as the bus started again. For the first time in all the years he had known her, she parted from him with no smile and no wave of her long arm. He stood on the curb, plunged in misery, looking after her as long as she remained in sight. But almost instantly with her disappearance, he felt the heaviness lift from his spirit. She had given him his liberty, true. There was a sense in which he had never parted with it, but now was no time for splitting hairs. He was free to act, and all was clear ahead. Swiftly, the sense of lightness grew on him. It became a positive rejoicing in his liberty, and before he was halfway home, he had decided what must be done next. The vicar of the parish in which his dwelling was situated lived within ten minutes of the square. To his house, Oleron turned his steps. It was necessary that he should have all the information he could get about this old house with the insurance marks and the sloping to let boards, and the vicar was the person most likely to be able to furnish it, this last preliminary out of the way, and aha, Oleron chuckled. Things might be expected to happen. But he gained less information than he hoped for. The house, the vicar said, was old, but there needed no vicar to tell Oleron that. It was reputed, Oleron pricked up his ears, to be haunted. But there were few old houses about which some such rumour didn't circulate among the ignorant, and the deplorable lack of faith of the modern world, the vicar thought, did not tend to dissipate these superstitions. For the rest, his manner was the soothing manner of one who prefers not to make statements without knowing how they will be taken by his hearer. Oleron smiled as he perceived this. You may leave my nerves out of the question, he said. How long has the place been empty? A dozen years, I should say, the vicar replied. And the last tenant, did you know him or her? Oleron was conscious of a tingling of his nerves as he offered the vicar the alternative of sex. Him, said the vicar, a man, if I remember rightly. His name was Madley, an artist. He was a great recluse, seldom went out of the place, and, the vicar hesitated and then broke into a little gush of candour, and since you appear to have come for this information, and since it's better that the truth should be told than that garbled versions should get about, I don't mind saying that this man Madley died there under somewhat unusual circumstances. It was ascertained at the post-mortem that there was not a particle of food in his stomach, though he was found not to be without money, and his frame was simply worn out. Suicide was spoken of, but you'll agree with me that deliberate starvation is, to say the least, an uncommon form of suicide. An open verdict was returned. Ah, said Oleron, does there happen to be any comprehensive history of this parish? No, partial ones only. I myself am not guiltless of having made a number of notes on this purely ecclesiastical history, its registers and so forth, which I shall be happy to show you if you would care to see them. But it's a large parish. I have only one curate, and my leisure, as you will readily understand. The extent of the parish and the scantiness of the vicar's leisure occupied the remainder of the interview, and Oleron thanked the vicar, took his leave, and walked slowly home. He walked slowly for a reason, twice turning away from the house within a stone's throw of the gate and taking another turn of twenty minutes or so. He had a very ticklish piece of work now before him. It required greatest mental concentration. It was nothing less than to bring his mind, if he might, into such a state of unpreoccupation and receptivity that he should see the place as he had seen it on that morning when his removal accomplished, he had sat down to begin the sixteenth chapter of his first Romilly, for could he recapture that first impression, he now hoped for far more from it. Formerly he had carried no end of mental lumber. Before the influence of the place had been able to find him out at all, it had had the inertia of those dreary chapters to overcome. No results had shown. The process had been one of slow saturation, charging, filling up to a brim. 
But now he was light and burdened, rid at last both of that Romilly and of her prototype. Now for the new unknown, coy, jealous, bewitching, beckoning, fair. At half past two of the afternoon, he put his key into the Yale lock, entered and closed the door behind him. His fantastic attempt was instantly and astonishingly successful. He could have shouted with triumph as he entered the room. It was as if he had escaped into it. Once more, as in the days when his writing had had a daily freshness and wonder and promise for him, he was conscious of that new ease and mastery and exhilaration and release. The air of the place seemed to hold more oxygen, as if his own specific gravity had changed. His very tread seemed less ponderable. The flowers in the bowls, the fair proportions of the meadow-sweet coloured panels and mouldings, the polished floor and the lofty and faintly starred ceiling fairly laughed their welcome. Oleron actually laughed back and spoke aloud. Oh, you're pretty, pretty, he flattered it. Then he lay down on his couch. He spent that afternoon as a convalescent who expected a dear visitor might have spent it, in a delicious vacancy, smiling now and then as if in his sleep, and ever lifting drowsy and contented eyes to his alluring surroundings. He lay thus until darkness came, and with darkness, the nocturnal noises of the old house. But if he waited for any specific happening, he waited in vain. He waited similarly in vain on the morrow, maintaining, though with less ease, that sensitized plate-like condition of his mind. Nothing occurred to give it an impression. Whatever it was which he so patiently wooed, it seemed to be both shy and exacting. Then, on the third day, he thought he understood. A look of gentle drollery and cunning came into his eyes, and he chuckled. Oh, 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 well, if the wind sits in that quarter, we must see what else there is to be done. What is there now? No, I won't send for Elsie. We don't need a wheel to break the butterfly on. We won't go to those lengths, my butterfly. He was standing, musing, thumbing his lean jaw, looking aslant. Suddenly... He crossed to his hall, took down his hat and went out. My lady is coquettish, is she? Well, we'll see what a little neglect will do. He chuckled as he went down the stairs. He sought a railway station, got onto a train and spent the rest of the day in the country. Oh yes, old one thought. He was the man to deal with fair ones who beckoned and invited and then took refuge in shyness and hanging back. He didn't return until after eleven that night. Now, my fair beckoner, he murmured as he walked along the alley and felt in his pocket for his keys. Inside his flat, he was perfectly composed, perfectly deliberate, exceedingly careful not to give himself away, as if to intimate that he intended to retire immediately, he lighted only a single candle, and as he set out with it on his nightly round, he affected to yawn. He went first into his kitchen. There was a full moon and a lozenge of moonlight, almost peacock blue by contrast with his candle flame, lay on the floor. The window was uncurtained, and he could see the reflection of the candle, and faintly, out of his own face as he moved about. The door of the powder closet stood a little jar, and he closed it before sitting down to remove his boots on the chair with a cushion made of the folded harp bag. From the kitchen he passed to the bathroom, there, another slant of blue moonlight cut the windowsill and lay across the pipes on the wall. He visited his seldom-used study and stood for a moment gazing at the silvered roofs across the square. Then, walking straight through his sitting room, his stockinged feet making no noise, he entered his bedroom and put the candle on the chest of drawers. His face all this time wore no expression save that of tiredness. He had never been wilier nor more alert. His small bedroom fireplace was opposite the chest of drawers on which the mirror stood, and his bed and the window occupied the remaining sides of the room. Oleron drew down his blind, took off his coat, and then stooped to get his slippers from under the bed. He could have given no reason for the conviction, but the manifestation that for two days had been withheld was close at hand. He never for an instant doubted nor, though he could not form the faintest guess of the shape it might take, did he experience fear. Startling or surprising it might be, he was prepared for that. 
but that was all. His scale of sensation had become depressed. His hand moved this way and that under the bed in search of the slippers. But for all his caution and method and preparedness, his heart all at once gave a leap and a pause that was almost horrid. He had found the slippers, but he was still on his knees, say, for this circumstance, he would have fallen. The bed was a low one. The groping for the slippers accounted for the turn of his head to one side, and he was careful to keep the attitude until he had partly recovered his self-possession. When presently he rose, there was a drop of blood on his lower lip, where he had caught at it with his teeth, and his watch had jerked out of the pocket of his waistcoat and was dangling at the end of its short leather guard. Then, before the watch had ceased its little oscillation, he was himself again. In the middle of his mantelpiece there stood a picture, a portrait of his grandmother. He placed himself before this picture so that he could see in the glass of it the steady flame of the candle that burned behind him on the chest of drawers. He could also see in the picture glass the little glancings of light from the bevels and facets of the objects about the mirror and candle. But he could see more. These twinklings and reflections and re-reflections did not change their position, but there was one gleam that had motion. It was fainter than the rest, and it moved up and down through the air. It was a reflection of the candle on Oleron's black vulcanite comb, and each of its downward movements was accompanied by a silky and crackling rustle. Oleron, watching what went on in the glass of his grandmother's portrait, continued to play his part. He felt for his dangling watch and began slowly to wind it up. Then, for a moment, ceasing to watch, he began to empty his trouser pockets and place methodically in a little row on the mantelpiece the pennies and halfpennies he took from them. The sweeping, minutely electric noise filled the whole bedroom, and had Oleron altered his point of observation, he could have brought the dim gleam of the moving comb so into position that it would almost have outlined his grandmother's head. Any other head of which it might have been following the outline was invisible. Oleron finished the emptying of his pockets, then under cover of another simulated yawn, not so much summoning his resolution as overmastered by an exorbitant curiosity, he swung suddenly round. That which was being combed was still not to be seen, but the comb did not stop. It had altered its angle a little, and had moved a little to the left. It was passing in fairly regular sweeps from a point rather more than five feet from the ground, in a direction roughly vertical, to another point a few inches below the level of the chest of drawers. Oleron continued to act to admiration. He walked to his little washstand in the corner, poured out water, and began to wash his hands. He removed his waistcoat and continued his preparations for bed. The combing did not cease, and he stood for a moment in thought. Again, his eyes twinkled. The next was very cunning. Hmm, I think I'll read for a quarter of an hour, he said aloud. He passed out of the room. He was away a couple of minutes. When he returned again, the room was suddenly quiet. He glanced at the chest of drawers. The comb lay still between the collar he had removed and a pair of gloves. Without hesitation, Oleron put out his hand and picked it up. It was an ordinary eighteen-penny comb, taken from a card in a chemist's shop, of a substance of a definite specific gravity and no more capable of rebellion against the laws by which it existed than are the worlds that keep their orbits through the void. Oleron put it down again. Then he glanced at the bundle of papers he held in his hand. What he had gone to fetch had been the fifteen chapters of the original Romilly. Hmm, he muttered as he threw the manuscript into a chair. As I thought, she's just blindly, ragingly, murderously jealous. On the night after that, and on the following night, and for many nights and days, so many that he began to be uncertain about the count of them, Oleron courting, cajoling, neglecting, threatening, beseeching, eaten out with unappeased curiosity, and regardless that his life was becoming one consuming passion and desire, continued his search for the unknown co-numerator of his abode. Ten. 
time went on, it came to pass that few except postmen mounted Oleron's stairs. And since men who do not write letters receive few, even the postman's tread became so infrequent that it was not heard more than once or twice a week. There came a letter from Oleron's publishers asking when they might expect to receive the manuscript of his new book. He delayed for some days to answer it and finally forgot. A second letter came which he also failed to answer. He received no third. The weather grew bright and warm. The privet bushes among the chopper-like notice boards flowered, and in the streets where Oleron did his shopping, the baskets of flower women lined the curbs. Oleron purchased flowers daily. His room clamoured for flowers, fresh and continually renewed, and Oleron did not stint its demands. Nevertheless, the necessity for going out to buy them became to irk him more and more, and it was with a greater and ever greater sense of relief that he returned home again. He began to be conscious that again his scale of sensation had suffered a subtle change, a change that was not restoration to its former capacity, but an extension, an enlarging that once more included terror. It admitted it in an entirely new form, Lux Orco, Tenebrae Jovi. The name of this terror was agoraphobia. Oleron had begun to dread air and space and the horror that might pounce upon the unguarded back. Presently, he so contrived it that his food and flowers were delivered daily at his door. He rubbed his hands when he had hit upon this expedient. That was better. Now he could please himself whether he went out or not. Quickly, he was confirmed in his choice. It became his pleasure to remain immured. But he was not happy. Or if he was, his happiness took an extraordinary turn. He fretted discontentedly, could sometimes have wept for mere weakness and misery, and yet he was dimly conscious that he would not have exchanged his sadness for all the noisy mirth of the world outside. And speaking of noise, noise, much noise now, caused him the acutest discomfort. It was hardly more to be endured than that newborn fear that kept him on the increasingly rare occasions when he did go out, sidling close to walls and feeling friendly railings with his hand. He moved from room to room softly and in slippers, and sometimes stood for many seconds closing the door so gently that not a sound broke the stillness that was in itself a delight. Sunday now became an intolerable day for him, for since the coming of the fine weather, there had begun to assemble in the square under his windows each Sunday morning certain members of the sect which the long-nosed Barrett adhered. These came with a great drum and large brass-bellied instruments, men and women uplifted, anguished voices, struggling with their god, and Barrett himself with upraised face and closed eyes and working brows prayed that the sound of his voice might penetrate the ears of all unbelievers, as it certainly did older ones. One day, in the middle of one of these rhapsodies, Oleron sprang to his blind and pulled it down, and heard as he did so his own name made the subject of a fresh torrent of outpouring. And sometimes, but not as expecting a reply, Oleron stood still and called softly. Once or twice he called, Romilly, and then waited, but more often his whispering did not take the shape of a name. There was one spot in particular of his abode that he began to haunt with increasing persistency. This was just within the opening of his bedroom door. He had discovered one day that by opening every door in his place, always excepting the outer one, which he only opened unwillingly, and by placing himself on this particular spot, he could actually see to a greater or less extent into each of his five rooms without changing his position. He could see the whole of his sitting room, all of his bedroom except the part hidden by the open door, and glimpses of his kitchen, bathroom, and of his rarely used study. He was often in this place, breathless and with his finger on his lip. One day, as he stood there, he suddenly found himself wondering whether this madly, of whom the vicar had spoken, had ever discovered the strategic importance of the bedroom entry. Light, moreover, now caused him greater disquietude and did darkness. Direct sunlight, of which as the sun passed daily round the house, each of his rooms had now its share, was like a flame in his brain, and even diffused light was a dull and numbing ache. He began at successive hours of the day, one after another, to lower his crimson blinds. 
He made short and daring excursions in order to do this, but he was ever so careful to leave his retreat open in case he should have sudden need of it. Presently, this lowering of the blinds had become a daily methodical exercise, and his rooms, when he had been on his round, had the blood-red half-light of a photographer's darkroom. One day, as he drew down the blind of his little study and backed in good order out of the room again, he broke into a soft laugh. That bilks Mr. Barrett, he said, and the baffling of Barrett continued to afford him mirth for an hour. But on another day, soon after, he had a fright that left him trembling also for an hour. He had seized the cord to darken the window over the seat in which he had found the harp bag, and was standing with his back well protected in the embrasure when he thought he saw the tail of a black and white check skirt disappear around the corner of the house. He couldn't be sure. He had to run to the window of the other wall, which was blinded. The skirt must have already been passed, but he was almost sure that it was Elsie. He listened in an agony of suspense for her tread on the stairs. But no tread came, and after three or four minutes he drew a long breath of relief. By Jove, but that would have compromised me horribly, he muttered. And he continued to mutter from time to time, horribly compromising. No woman would stand that, not any kind of a woman. Oh, compromising the extreme. Yet he was not happy. He could not have assigned the cause of the fits of quiet weeping which took him sometimes. They came and went, like the fitful illumination of the clouds that travelled over the square. And perhaps, after all, if he was not happy, he was not unhappy. Before he could be unhappy, something must have been withdrawn. And nothing had yet been withdrawn from him, for nothing had been granted. He was waiting for that granting in that flower-laden, frightfully enticing apartment of his, with the pith-white walls tinged and subdued by the crimson blinds to a blood-like gloom. He paid no heed to it that his stock of money was running perilously low, nor that he had ceased to work. Ceased to work? He had not ceased to work. They knew very little about it. It was supposed that Oleron had ceased to work. He was, in truth, only now beginning to work. He was preparing such a work, such a work, such a mistress was a making in the gestation of his art. Let him but get this period of probation and poignant waiting over, and men should see. How should men know her, this fair one of Oleron's, until Oleron himself knew her? Lovely, radiant creations are not thrown off like how-do-you-do's. The men to whom it is committed to father them must weep wretched tears, as Oleron did must swell with vain presumptuous hopes, as Oleron did, must pursue, as Oleron pursued, the capricious, fair, mocking, slippery, eager spirit that ever eluding, ever sees to it that the chase does not slacken. Let Oleron but hunt this huntress a little longer, he would have her sparkling and panting in his arms yet. Oh no, they were very far from the truth to suppose that Oleron had ceased to work. And if all else was falling away from Oleron, Gladly he was letting it go. So do we all when our fair ones beckon. Quite at the beginning we wink and promise ourselves that we will put her ladyship through her paces, neglect her for a day, turn her own jealous wiles against her, flout and ignore her when she comes wheedling. Perhaps there lurks within us all the time a heartless sprite who is never fooled. But in the end, all falls away. She beckons, beckons, and all goes. And so Oleron kept his strategic post within the frame of his bedroom door and watched and waited and smiled with his finger on his lips. It was his duty of service, his worship, his troth plighting, all that he had ever known of love. And when he found himself, as he now and again did, hating the dead man madly and wishing that he had never lived, he felt that that too was an acceptable service. But as he thus prepared himself, as it were, for a marriage, and moped and chafed more and more that the bride made no sign. He made a discovery that he ought to have made weeks before. It was through a thought of the dead madly that he made it. Since that night when he had thought in his greenness that a little studied neglect would bring the lovely beckoner to her knees and had made use of her own jealousy to banish her, he had not set eyes on those fifteen discarded chapters of Romilly. He had thrown them back into the window seat, forgotten their very existence, but his own jealousy of Madley put him in mind of hers, of her jilted rival, the flesh and blood, 
and he remembered them fool that he had been. Had he then expected his desire to manifest herself where there still existed the evidence of his divided allegiance? What? And she with a passion so fierce and centred that it had not hesitated at the destruction twice attempted of her rival. Fool that he had been. But if that was all the pledge and sacrifice she required, she should have it, oh yes, and quickly. He took the manuscript from the window seat and brought it to the fire. He kept his fire always burning now. The warmth brought out the last vestige of odour of the flowers with which his room was banked. He didn't know what time it was, long since he had allowed his clock to run down. It had seemed a foolish measure of time in regard to the stupendous things that were happening to Oleron, but he knew it was late. He took the Romilly manuscript and knelt before the fire. But he hadn't finished removing the fastening that held the sheets together before he suddenly gave a start, turned his head over his shoulder and listened intently. The sound he had heard had not been loud. It had, indeed, been no more than a tap, twice or thrice repeated, but it had filled Oleron with alarm. His face grew dark as it came again. He heard a voice outside on his landing. Paul, Paul! It was Elsie's voice. Paul! I know you're in. I want to see you. He cursed her under his breath, but kept perfectly still. He did not intend to admit her. Paul, you're in trouble. I believe you're in danger. At least come to the door. Oleron smothered a low laugh. It somehow amused him that she, in such danger herself, should talk to him of his danger. Well, if she was, serve her right. She knew or said she knew all about it. Paul, Paul! Oh, Paul, he mimicked her under his breath. Oh, Paul, it's horrible. Horrible, was it, thought Oleron. Then let her get away. I only want to help you, Paul. I didn't promise not to come if you'd needed me. He was impervious to the pitiful sob that interrupted the low cry. The devil take the woman. Should he shout to her to go away and not come back? No, let her call and knock and sob. She had a gift for sobbing. She mustn't think her sobs would move him. They irritated him so that he set his teeth and shook his fist at her. But that was all. Let her sob. Paul! Paul! With his teeth hard set, he dropped the first page of Romilly into the fire. Then he began to drop the rest in, sheet by sheet. For many minutes the calling behind his door continued, then, suddenly, it ceased. He heard the sound of feet slowly descending the stairs, he listened for the noise of a fall or a cry or the crash of a piece of the handrail of the upper landing, but none of these things came. She was spared. Apparently her rival suffered her to crawl abject and beaten away. Oleron heard the passing of her steps under his window, and she was gone. He dropped the last page into the fire and then, with a low laugh, rose. He looked fondly round his room. Lucky to get away like that, he remarked. She wouldn't have got away if I'd given her as much as a word or a look. What devils these women are. But no, I wouldn't say that. One of them showed forbearance. Who showed forbearance and what was forborne? Ah, Oleron knew contempt, no doubt. Had been at the bottom of it, but that didn't matter. The pestering creature had been allowed to go unharmed. Yes, she was lucky. Oleron hoped she knew it. And now, 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 for his reward... Old one crossed the room. All his doors were open. His eyes shone as he placed himself within that of his bedroom. Fool that he had been not to think of destroying the manuscript sooner. How, in a house full of shadows, should he know his own shadow? How, in a house full of noises, distinguish the summons he felt to be at hand? Ah, trust him, he would know. The place was full of a jugglery of dim lights. The blind at his elbow that allowed the light of a street lamp to struggle vaguely through, the glimpse of greeny blue moonlight seen through the distant kitchen door, the sulky glow of the fire under the black ashes of the burnt manuscript, the glimmering of the tulips and the moon daisies, the narcissi in the bowls and jugs and jars. These did not so trick and bewilder his eyes that he wouldn't know his own. It was he, not she, who had been delaying the shadowy bridal. He hung his head for a moment in mute acknowledgement. Then he bent his eyes on the deceiving, puzzling gloom again. He would have called her name had he known it. But now he would not ask her to share even a name with the other. 
His own face within the frame of the door glimmered white as a narcissi in the darkness. A shadow light as fleece seemed to take shape in the kitchen. A time had been when Ulron would have said that a cloud had passed over the unseen moon. The low illumination on the blind at his elbow grew dimmer. The time had been when Ulron would have concluded that the lamplighter going on his rounds had turned low the flame of the lamp. The fire settled, letting down the black and charred papers. A flower fell from a bowl and lay distinct upon the floor. All was still. And then a stray draught moved through the old house, passing before Oleron's face. Suddenly, inclining his head, he withdrew a little from the door jamb. The wandering draught caused the door to move a little on its hinges. Oleron trembled violently, stood for a moment longer, and then, putting his hand out to the knob, softly drew the door to, sat down on the nearest chair, and waited as a man might await the calling of his name that should summon him to some weighty high and privy audience. Part 11 One knows not whether there can be human compassion for anemia of the soul. When the pitch of life is dropped, and the spirit is so put over and reversed that that only is horrible which before was sweet and worldly and of the day the human relation disappears the sane soul turns appalled away lest not merely itself but sanity should suffer we are not gods we cannot drive out devils we must see selfishly to it the devils do not enter into ourselves and this we must do even though love so transfuse us that we may well deem our nature to be half divine. We shall but speak of honour and duty in vain. The letter dropped within the dark door will lie unregarded, or, if regarded for a brief instant between two unspeakable lapses, left and forgotten again. The telegram will be undelivered, nor will the whistling messenger, wisely a guided than he knows to whistle, be conscious as he walks away of the drawn blind that is pushed aside an inch by a finger, and then fearfully replaced again. No, let the miserable wrestle with his own shadows. Let him, if indeed he be so mad, clip and strain and enfold and couch the succubus. But let him do so in a house into which not an air of heaven penetrates, nor a bright finger of the sun pierces the filthy twilight. The lost must remain lost. Humanity has other business to attend to. For the handwriting of the two letters that Oleron stealing noiselessly one June day into his kitchen to rid his sitting room of an armful of fetid, and decaying flowers had seen on the floor within his door had had no more meaning for him than if it had belonged to some dim and faraway dream, and that the beating of the telegraph boy upon the door within a few feet of the bed where he lay, he had gnashed his teeth and stopped his ears. He had pictured the lad standing there just beyond his partition among packets of provisions and bundles of dead and dying flowers for his outer landing was littered with these. Oleron had feared to open his door to take them in. After a week, the errand lads had reported that there must be some mistake about the order, and had left no more. Inside, in the red twilight, the old flowers turned brown and fell, and decayed where they lay. Gradually, his power was draining away, the abomination fastened on Oleron's power. The steady sapping sometimes left him for many hours of prostration gazing vacantly up at his red-tinged ceiling, idly suffering such fancies as came of themselves to have their way with him. Even the strongest of his memories had no more than a precarious hold upon his attention. Sometimes a flitting half-memory of a novel to be written 
A novel, it was important that he should write, tantalized him for a space before vanishing again, and sometimes whole novels, perfect, splendid, established to endure rose magically before him, and sometimes the memories were absurdly remote and trivial, of garrets he had inhabited and lodgings that had sheltered him and so forth. Oleron had known a good deal about such things in his time, but all that now was past. He had at last found a place which he did not intend to leave until they fetched him out, a place that some might have thought a little on the greenstick side, that others might have considered to be a little too redolent of long dead and morbid things for a living man to be heaved up in, but ah, so irresistible, with such an authority of its own, with such an associate of its own, and a place of such delights when once a man had ceased to struggle against its inexorable will. A novel. Somebody ought to write a novel about a place like that. There must be lots to write about in a place like that, if one could but get to the bottom of it. It had probably already been painted by a man called Madley who had lived there. But Oleron had not known this Madley, had a strong feeling that he wouldn't have liked him would rather he had lived somewhere else, really couldn't stand the fellow, hated him. Madly, in fact. Aha, uh -huh, that was a joke. He seriously doubted whether the man had led the life he ought. Oleron was in two minds sometimes, or whether he wouldn't tell that long-nosed guardian of the public morals across the way about him, but probably he knew, and had made his praying hullabaloos for him also. That was his line. Why, Oleron himself had had a dust-up with him about something or other. Some girl or other. Elsie Bengoff, her name was, he remembered. Oleron had moments of deep uneasiness about this Elsie Bengoff. Or rather, he was not so much uneasy about her as restless about the things she did. Chief of these was the way in which she persisted in thrusting herself into his thoughts. And whenever he was quick enough, he sent her packing the moment she made her appearance there. The truth was that she wasn't merely a bore. She'd always been that. It had now come to the pitch where her very presence in his fancy was inimical to the full enjoyment of certain experiences. She had no tact. Really, ought to have known that people are not at home to the thoughts of everybody all the time. Ought in mere politeness to have allowed him certain seasons quite to himself and was monstrously ignorant of things that she didn't know, as she appeared not to know. That there were certain special hours when a man's veins ran with fire and daring and power, in which, well, in which he had the reasonable right to treat folk as he had treated that prying Barrett, to shut them out completely. But no, up she popped the thought of her and ruined all bright, towering fabrics by the side of which even those perfect, magical novels of which he dreamed were dun and grey vanished utterly at her intrusion. It was as if a fog should suddenly quench some fair, beaming star, as if at the threshold of some golden portal prepared for Oleron, a pit should suddenly gape, as if a bat-like shadow should turn the growing dawn to murk and darkness again. Therefore, Oleron strove to stifle even the nascent thought of her. Nevertheless, there came an occasion on which this woman, Bengoff, absolutely refused to be suppressed. Oleron couldn't have told exactly when this happened. He only knew by the glimmer of the street lamp on his blind that it was some time during the night, and that for some time she had not presented herself. He had no warning, none of her coming. He just came, was there. Strive as he would, he couldn't shake off the thought of her, nor the image of her face. She haunted him. But for her to come at that moment of all moments. Really, it was past belief. How she could endure it, Oleron could not conceive. Actually, to look on, as it were, at the triumph of arrival. Good God, it was monstrous. Tact, reticence. He had never credited her with an overwhelming amount of either, but he had never attributed mere. No, there was no word for it. Monstrous, monstrous! Did she intend thenceforward, good God, to look on? 
Oleron felt the blood rush up to the roots of his hair with anger against her. Damnation, take her, he choked. But the next moment his heat and resentment had changed to a cold sweat of cowering fear. Panic-stricken, he strove to comprehend what he had done. But though he knew not what, he knew he had done something. Something fatal, irreparable, blasting. Anger he had felt, but not this blaze of infernal light. That appalling flash wasn't his. Not his, that open rift of bright and searing hell. Not his, not his. His had been the hand of a child, preparing a puny blow. But what was this other horrific hand that was drawn back to strike in the same place? Had he set that in motion? Had he provided the spark that had touched off the whole accumulated power of that formidable and relentless place? He didn't know. He only knew that that poor igniting particle in himself was blown out. That, oh, impossible, clinging kiss, how else to express it, that changed on his very lips to a gnashing and a removal. And that for the very pity of the awful odds, he must cry out to her against whom he had lately raged to guard herself, guard herself. Look out, he shrieked aloud. The revulsion was instant, as if a cold, slow billow had broken over him. He came too to find that he was lying in his bed, that the mist and horror that had for so long enwrapped him had departed, that he was Paul Oleron, and that he was sick, naked, helpless, and unutterably abandoned and alone. His faculties, though weak, answered at last to his calls upon them, and he knew that it must have been a hideous nightmare that had left him sweating and shaking thus. Yes, he was himself, Paul Oleron, a tired novelist, already past the summit of his best work and slipping downhill again, empty-handed from it all. He had struck short in his life's aim. He had tried too much, had overestimated his strength and was a failure, a failure. It all came to him in a single word, in rapt and complete. He needed no sequential thought. He was a failure. He had missed. And he had missed not one happiness, but two. He had missed the ease of this world which men love. And he had missed also that other shrining prize for which men forgo ease. The snatching and holding and triumphant bearing up aloft of which is the only justification of the mad adventurer who hazards the enterprise. There was no second attempt. Fate has no morrow. Oleron's morrow must be to sit down to profitless, ill-done, unrequired work again. And so, on the morrow after that, and the morrow after that, and as many morrows as there might be, he lay there, weakly, yet sanely considering it. And since the whole attempt had failed, it was hardly worthwhile to consider whether a little might not be saved from the general wreck. No good would ever come of that half-finished novel. It intended that it should appear in the autumn. It was under contract that it should appear, no matter. It was better to pay forfeit to his publishers than to waste what days were left. He was spent. Age was not far off, and paths of wisdom and sadness were the properest for the remainder of the journey. If only he had chosen the wife, the child, the faithful friend at the fireside, and let them follow in ignis fatus that list. In the meantime, it began to puzzle him exceedingly what he should be so weak, that his room should smell so overpoweringly of decaying vegetable matter, and that his hand, chancing to stray to his face in the darkness, should encounter a beard. He thought he heard a sound, from the kitchen or bathroom. He rose a little on his pillow and listened. Ah, he was not alone then. It certainly would have been extraordinary if they had left him ill and alone. Alone? Oh no, he would be looked after. He wouldn't be left ill to shift for himself. If everybody else had forsaken him, he could trust Elsie Bengoff, the dearest chum he had for that. Bless her faithful heart. But suddenly, a short, stifled, spluttering cry rang sharply out. Paul! It came from the kitchen. 
And in the same moment it flashed upon Oleron, he knew not how, for two, three, five, he didn't know how many minutes before, another sound, unremarked at the time, but suddenly transfixing his attention now, had striven to reach his intelligence. This sound had been the slight touch of metal on metal, just such a sound as Oleron made when he put his key into the lock. Hello? Who's that? He called sharply from his bed. He had no answer. He called again. Hello? Who's there? Who is it? This time he was sure he heard noises soft and heavy in the kitchen. This is a queer thing altogether, he muttered. By Jove, I'm as weak as a kitten too. Hello there. Somebody called, didn't they? Elsie? Is that you? Then he began to knock with his hand on the wall at the side of his bed. Elsie, Elsie, you called, didn't you? Please come here, whoever it is. There was a sound as of a closing door and then, in silence, Oleron began to get rather alarmed. It, it may be a nurse, he muttered. Elsie, they've got me a nurse, of course. She'd sit with me as long as she could spare the time, brave lass, and she'd get a nurse for the rest. But it was awfully like her voice. Elsie, or whoever it is, I can't make this out at all. I must go and see what's the matter. He put one leg out of the bed, feeling its feebleness. He reached with his hand for the additional support of the wall. But before putting out the other leg, he stopped and considered, picking at his newfound beard. He was suddenly wondering whether he dared go into the kitchen. It was such a frightfully long way. No man knew what horror might not leap and huddle on his shoulders if he went so far. When a man has an overmastering impulse to get back into bed, he ought to take heed of the warning and obey it. Besides, why should he go? What was it there to go for? If it was that Vengoff creature again, let her look after herself. Oleron wasn't going to have things cramp themselves on his defenceless back for the sake of such a spoil sport as she. If she was in, let her let herself out again and the sooner the better for her. Oleron simply couldn't be bothered. He had his work to do. On the morrow, he must set about the writing of a novel with a heroine so winsome, capricious, adorable, jealous, wicked, beautiful, inflaming, and altogether evil. The men should stand amazed. She was coming over him now. He knew that by the alteration of the very air of the room when she was near him. And that soft thrill of bliss that had begun to stir in him never came back and that she was beckoning, beckoning. He let go of the wall and fell back into the bed again. Oh, as oh, unthinkable. The other half of that kiss that a gnash had interrupted was placed. How else convey it? On his lips, robbing him of very breath. In the bright June sunlight, a crowd filled the square and looked up at the windows of the old house with the antique insurance marks in its walls of red brick and the agents' notice boards hanging like wooden choppers over the paling. Two constables stood at the broken gate of the narrow entrance alley, keeping folk back. The women kept to the outskirts of the throng, moving now and then as if to see the red drawn blinds of the old house from a new angle and talking in whispers. The children were in the houses behind closed doors. A long-nosed man had a little group about him, and he was telling some story over and over again, and another man, little and fat and wide-eyed, sought to capture the long-nosed man's audience with some relation in which a key figured. And it was revealed to me that there'd been something in that very afternoon, the long-nosed man was saying. I was standing there, where Constable Saunders is, or, or rather, I was passing about my business, and they came out. There was no deceiving me, oh no, deceiving me. I saw a face. What was it like, Mr. Barrett? The man asked. It was like hers whom our Lord said to, Woman, doth any man accuse thee? White as paper, no mistake, don't tell me. And so I walk straight over to Mrs. Barrett. And Jane, I says, this must stop. And stop at once. We are commanded to avoid evil, I says, and it must come to an end now. Let him get help somewhere else. And then she says to me, John, she says, is four and sixpence a week. 
Them was her words. Jane, I says, if it was £46,000, it should stop. And from that day to this, she hasn't set foot inside that gate. It was a short silence then. Did uh, Mrs Barrett ever see anything like? Somebody vaguely inquired. Barrett turned austerely on the speaker. What Mrs Barrett saw, what Mrs Barrett didn't see, shall not pass these lips, even as is written, keep thy tongue from speaking evil, he said. Another man spoke. He was pretty near canned up at the wagon and horses that night, weren't he, Jim? Yeah, he had no half copped it. Not standing treat much neither. He was in the bar all on his own. So he was, we talked about it. The fat, scared-eyed man made another attempt. She got the key off me. She had the number of it. She come into my shop of a Tuesday evening. Nobody heeded him. Shut your head, the heavy labourer commented gruffly. She hasn't been found yet. Here's the inspectors. We shall know more in a bit. Two inspectors had come up and were talking to the constables who guarded the gate. The little fat man ran eagerly forward, saying that she had bought the key off him. I remember the number because it's been three ones and three threes. One, 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 three, 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 he exclaimed excitedly. An inspector put him aside. Nobody's been in, he asked one of the constables. No, sir. Then you, Brackley, come with us. You, Smith, keep the gate. There's a squad on its way. The two inspectors and the constable passed down the alley and entered the house. They mounted the wide, carved staircase. This don't look like as if it'd been much out lately, one of the inspectors muttered as he kicked aside a litter of dead leaves and a paper that lay outside over one's door. I don't think we need to knock. Break a pane, Brackley. The door had two glazed panels. There was a sound of shattered glass, and Brackley put his hand through the hole his elbow had made and drew back the latch. Oh, choked one of the inspectors as they entered. Let some light and air in quick. It stinks like a hearse. The assembly out in the square saw the red blinds go up and the windows of the old house flung open. That's better, said one of the inspectors, putting his head out of a window and drawing a deep breath. That seems to be the bedroom in there. Will you go in, Sims, while I go over the rest? They had drawn up the bedroom blind also and the waxy, white, emaciated man on the bed had made a blinker of his hand against the torturing flood of brightness. Nor could he believe that his hearing wasn't playing tricks with him, but there were two policemen in his room, bending over him and asking where she was. He shook his head. This woman, Bengoff, goes by the name of Miss Elsie Bengoff. You hear? Where is she? No good, Brackley. Get him up. Be careful with him. I'll just shove my head out the window, I think. The other inspector had been through all around study and had found nothing, and was now in the kitchen, kicking aside an ankle-deep mass of vegetable refuse that cumbered the floor. The kitchen window had no blind, and was overshadowed by the blank end of the house across the alley. The kitchen appeared to be empty, but the inspector, kicking aside the dead flowers, noticed that the shuffling track that was not of his making had been swept to a cupboard in the corner. In the upper part of the door of the cupboard was a square panel that looked as if it slid on runners. The door itself was closed. The inspector advanced, put out his hand to the little knob and slid the hatch along its groove. Then he took an involuntary step back again. Framed in the aperture and falling forward a little before it jammed again in its frame was the something that resembled a large lumpy pudding done up in a pudding bag of faded browny red frieze. Ah, said the inspector. To close the hatch again, he would have had to thrust that pudding back with his hand, and somehow he didn't quite like the idea of touching it. Instead, he turned the handle of the cupboard itself. There was weight behind it, so much weight that after opening the door three or four inches and peering aside, he had to put his shoulder to it in order to close it again. In closing it, he left sticking out a few inches from the door, a triangle of black and white checked skirt. He went into the small hall. All right, he called. They had got Oleron into his clothes. He still used his hands as blinkers, and his brain was very confused. A number of things were happening that he couldn't understand. He couldn't understand the extraordinary mess of dead flowers that seemed to be everywhere. He couldn't understand why there should be police officers in his room. He couldn't understand why one of these should be sent for a four-wheeler and a stretcher, and he couldn't understand what heavy article they seemed to be moving about in the kitchen, his kitchen. What, what's the matter? He muttered sleepily. 
Then he heard a murmur in the square and the stopping of a four-wheeler outside. A police officer was at his elbow again. An older one wondered why, when he whispered something to him, he should run off with a string of words, something about used in evidence against you. They had lifted him to his feet and were assisting him towards the door. No, the older one couldn't understand it at all. They got him down the stairs and along the alley. Olderon was aware of confused, angry shoutings. He gathered that a number of people wanted to lynch somebody or other. Then his attention became fixed on a little fat, frightened-eyed man who appeared to be making a statement that an officer was taking down in a notebook. I'd seen her with him. They was often together. She came into my shop and said it was for him. I thought it was all right. 111-333, the number was, the man was saying. The people seemed to be very angry. Many police were keeping them back, but one of the inspectors had a voice that old one thought quite kind and friendly. He was telling somebody to get somebody else into the cab before something or other was brought out. An older one noticed that a four-wheeler was drawn up at the gate. It appeared that it was himself who was to be put into it. And as they lifted him up, he saw that the inspector tried to stand between him and something that stood behind the cab. It was not quick enough to prevent older ones seeing that this something was a hooded stretcher. The angry voices sounded like the sea. Something hard like a stone hit the back of the cab, and the inspector followed older one in and stood with his back to the window near the side where the people were. The door they had put older one in at remained open, apparently till the other inspector should come. And through the opening, older one had a glimpse of the hatchet like collect boards among the privet trees. One of them said that the key was at number six. Suddenly, the raging of voices was hushed. Along the entrance alley, shuffling steps were heard, and the other inspector appeared at the cab door. Right away, he said to the driver. He entered, fastened the door after him, and blocked up the second window with his back. Between the two inspectors, Oleron slept peacefully. The cab moved down the square. The other vehicle went up the hill. The mortuary lay that way. That was The Beckoning Fair One, written by Oliver Onions and narrated by Tony Walker. is The Long Road Ahead by Kevin MacLeod. <laughs>